In this lesson, we want to review the coordinate plane. So in this section of our course, we will review graphing equations with two variables involved, and we're also going to discuss functions. So before we can kind of get into those topics, we need to make sure that everyone understands the basics. So today we're just gonna start out the section by reviewing the coordinate plane and again, how to plot an ordered pair. So before we jump in and start talking about the coordinate plane, let's first review the concept of an ordered pair. So pretty much up to this point in our course, we have exclusively worked with equations that have only one variable involved. In this new section, we're gonna look at a lot of equations with two variables involved, normally X and Y. Okay, so suppose we saw the following equation. Suppose we had something like 2x and then plus 9y is equal to 20. Okay, so this type of equation is known as a linear equation in two variables. Most of you have seen this if you've taken an Algebra 1 or an Intermediate Algebra course. You've seen this type of equation and you know when you graph this type of equation, you get a line, right? Henceforth the term linear equation. Okay, so when we work with these types of equations, we find that there's an infinite number of solutions. Okay, so there's an infinite number of kind of X and Y combinations that satisfy the equation, or again, you could say make the equation true. So in order to get kind of a visual representation of the solution set, it's normal for us to graph this type of equation on our coordinate plane to kind of see what's going on. So we're gonna graph linear equations in a few lessons, but most of you already know this is a pretty easy process. For now, we just need to understand how we can write solutions for our equation using ordered pairs, okay? So basically an ordered pair consists of two components which are written inside of parentheses and separated by a comma. So when we write an ordered pair, the order of the components are important. Now, normally in our studies with algebra, you're gonna see them written like this. You're gonna see, again, inside of parentheses, your x value, comma, your y value. So it's easy to remember because it's in alphabetical order. X is before y in the alphabet, and x is before y in the ordered pair. Okay, so you can just remember it like that. So as an example, one solution for this linear equation in two variables would be that x equals 10. So I'm just gonna write this over here. I'm gonna say x equals 10, and y is equal to zero. So you've gotta have two values there, one for x and one for y. We're gonna plug both of those in and show that this is a solution. So if I plug in a 10 here and I plug a zero in there, let me kind of scooch this over and out of our way. You'd see that two times 10 is 20 plus nine times zero is zero. So you can basically just say this is 20 is equal to 20. So we know that this guy is correct. So to write this solution as an ordered pair, again, I just follow this format. All I'm gonna do is put my x value first. So in this case, the x value is 10, then comma, my y value comes second. So that's gonna be a zero there. So you've got 10 comma zero, right? Again, enclosed inside of parentheses, your x value is first, your y value is second. Okay, so that's how you write your ordered pair. As another example, we could show another solution. So let's say that x is equal to three and y is equal to 14 ninths. Now, don't worry about where I'm getting these solutions from. We'll talk about these types of equations in a few lessons. Right now, we're just getting the basics down. We're learning how to write some ordered pairs. So again, if you wanted to check this, you could plug in a three for X. You could plug in a three for X and you could plug in a 14 ninths for Y. Let me erase this so we can just check this real quick. Two times three is six plus nine times 14 ninths. We know that the nines would cancel. So we'll go ahead and just cancel this with this. I'm left with a 14. And essentially you have six plus 14, which is 20. So you would have that 20 is equal to 20. So this guy is gonna check out as well. Okay, so let me erase this. We don't need this information anymore. So how would I write X equals three, Y equals 14 ninths as an ordered pair? Again, just follow this format. The X value comes first. So I'm gonna put a three, then comma, the Y value is second. So it's 14 ninths. Again, they're separated by a comma and they're inside of a set of parentheses. All right, so now that we understand what an ordered pair is and kind of how to write an ordered pair, let's move on and talk about the coordinate plane and then we'll get into how we can plot an ordered pair on our coordinate plane. So we've all seen this basic number line. We pretty much haven't done much in the way of graphing up to this point in the course. 
we pretty much just use our number line for working with inequalities, right? So if we had something simple like, let's say 2x minus 3 equals 7, we could actually graph our solution for something simple like this using a horizontal number line. If we just add 3 to both sides of the equation, we would find that 2x is equal to 10. We divide both sides by 2, and we would find that x is equal to 5, right? So this is our solution. Very easy to get. Everyone at this point should understand that. So graphically, on a horizontal number line, I could just say that at 5, I could just put in a filled-in circle or a filled-in dot, however you want to think about that. That represents my solution, right? This value here of 5. But when we move in and start talking about an equation with two variables, we're now going to need two number lines. So we're going to need to look at something like this, right? So this is our coordinate plane. You have two number lines involved. And when I say coordinate plane, I don't want you to get confused because there's a lot of different names floating around for this thing. You might hear the Cartesian coordinate plane, okay, that's named after its founder. You might hear the rectangular coordinate plane. There's a lot of different names floating around for this. I'm just going to refer to this as the coordinate plane, okay, just to make it real simple. Now, what you'll notice here is that you have these two intersecting number lines. So we've got our horizontal number line that we're used to. Okay, this one's going kind of left and right. And then we have this new addition, this vertical number line. Okay, we're not used to that. But what you'll notice is that they intersect at the point where each number line is zero. So this spot right here is the point of intersection. It has a special name. It's known as the origin. Now let me write this off to the side because I'm going to end up erasing this. So this is the origin. And this occurs at the point 0, 0. The x value is 0, the y value is 0, okay? So that's why I wrote 0, 0 as an ordered pair. So this is the origin, x is 0, y is 0. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about this coordinate plane. So the horizontal number line, the number line that we're used to working with up to this point, is known as the x-axis, okay? You see this little x here? I can put x-axis for the sake of completeness. And basically, this number line represents our x values, okay? So what we can see here, just like we're used to, numbers increase as we move to the right, and they decrease as we move to the left. So if a number on this x-axis is to the right of another, then it's a bigger number. If a number on the x-axis is to the left of another, then it's a smaller number, okay? So anything to the right of this kind of origin or to the right of zero is going to be a positive number, okay? We need to note that. So anything in this direction is positive. Then anything to the left of the origin on the x-axis or to the left of zero is going to be negative, okay? So it's very important you understand that for the purposes of what we're gonna do in a minute when we start talking about quadrants. So to the right of the origin or to the right of zero on the x-axis is positive. To the left of zero or to the left of the origin on the x-axis is going to be negative, okay? Now, we also have this vertical number line. Basically, we just took this number line and rotated it, okay? So this is known as the y-axis, and it represents y values. So I can just say this is the y-axis. And essentially, what we see is that numbers increase as we move up, okay? So they increase as we go up. So if a number is above another number, then it's a bigger number. They decrease as they go down. Okay, so if a number is below another number, then it's going to be a smaller number, okay? Now, anything above zero or anything above your origin is going to be positive. So this is going to be your positive values here, kind of going up. And then anything below the origin or anything below zero is going to be negative. So now let's move in and talk about the quadrants, okay? So we can split our coordinate plane, and I'm just going to erase this, up into four quadrants. And I'm going to erase this too. We don't need this anymore. So essentially what I have is a movement that goes counterclockwise starting with the top right. So this guy right here would be quadrant one. Okay, that's the top right. We move counterclockwise, so we're going this way. This guy right here will be quadrant two. We're moving this way. This guy right here will be quadrant three. We're moving this way. This guy right here will be quadrant four, okay? When you first start working with your coordinate plane, you're going to be asked to plot ordered pairs and then to also determine what quadrant it's located in. So the main thing is to understand the kind of signs of your numbers involved. So when we look at quadrant one, we can see that X values are positive and Y values are positive. How do we know that? Well, if we look at our X axis, we're to the right of zero. If we look at our Y axis, we're above zero. 
Okay, so any x value here would be positive, any y value would be positive as well. When we move into quadrant two, when we look at our x-axis, we're to the left of zero now. So our x values are gonna be negative. Our y values are gonna be positive though because we're still above zero on the y-axis. So we're good to go there. Then for quadrant three, we're still to the left of zero on the x-axis. So that means x values would be negative. We're below zero on the y-axis. So that means y values will also be negative. Then when we get into quadrant four, we can see that our x values are gonna be positive, right? Because we're to the right of zero on the x-axis. And then our y values are gonna be negative because we're below zero on the y-axis, okay? So just remember this, you might wanna write this down in your notes. For quadrant one, it's positive, positive, right? X value is positive, Y value is positive. For quadrant two, it's going to be negative, positive, okay? So you have X values that are negative, Y values that are positive. For quadrant three, we have negative, negative. So X values are negative, Y values are negative. And then for quadrant four, kind of to wrap this up, we see that our X values are positive and our Y values are negative. Okay, so something you might want to write down because something you just want to remember for kind of reference sake. If you don't want to write it down, just remember that the top right is the first quadrant and then it goes counterclockwise. So you can just derive this. You can say, okay, this is two, this is three, this is four. And then you can just look and see, okay, are my values positive or are my values negative for each quadrant? Now, it's very important to note this because this comes up as kind of a trap question. If you were located on the x-axis or the y-axis, right? So let's say I got a point that was something like six comma zero. So that's gonna be right here. We'll talk about plotting order pairs in a minute, but this is six comma zero. So this is on the x-axis. This is not located in any quadrant, okay? So if you get asked that question, it's not located in any of them. A lot of students will make the mistake and say, okay, well, it's in quadrant one, right? Because they'll say, okay, well, the ordered pair six comma zero. They'll incorrectly say, well, Six is positive, that's true. But they'll incorrectly say, well, zero is positive. Zero is not a positive number. Zero is not positive, it's not negative, it's neither, okay? So don't make the mistake of trying to match that up and say, well, in quadrant one, things are both positive, and then six comma zero, each thing is positive. That's incorrect, right? Because zero is not a positive number. All right, so now let's move on and look at a little exercise that's gonna help us understand how to plot an ordered pair. Most of you know how to do this, and you understand the process is very, very simple. So an ordered pair, when we work with them, it's usually referred to as a point, okay? So we could say we're gonna plot the point. That's just meaning we're gonna plot an ordered pair, okay? So we're just finding the meeting point of the X location and the Y location. We're gonna draw a little closed circle at that point. And then we're sometimes gonna write the ordered pair next to it. In some cases, you'll also have like a capital letter associated with it. You might wanna write that there, just depending on what they give you. We'll see the capital letters in the exercises that are associated with this lesson. Okay, so what we wanna do here again is just plot each ordered pair, and then we're gonna determine its quadrant, okay? So we're gonna start with negative five comma five. So this ordered pair here. So I'm gonna come down to my coordinate plane. So negative five comma five, and then for my quadrant, I'm just gonna put Q. And I'm gonna put a question mark for right now. We'll figure that out in a minute. So how do we plot this, or how do we graph this ordered pair? Well, essentially, I've gotta think about the fact that, again, let me kinda of slide this down. This guy right here is an X value, okay? This is an X value. This guy right here is my Y value. Think about how this is constructed. The X values are on the horizontal axis or the horizontal number line. The Y values are on the vertical axis or the vertical number line. So the X value tells me how much I'm moving horizontally, right, left and right. The Y value tells me how much I'm moving vertically up and down. If you have a negative, you're going to the left. If you have a positive, you're going to the right in terms of the X values. With the Y values, a positive is gonna go up and a negative is gonna go down, okay? And it's a lot of information at first, but after you do a few of these, it's very intuitive, okay? So if I start at the origin, and I just kind of use my information here to kind of move, my X value is negative five. So just go five units to the left or just go to negative five on the X axis. So that's right here, this is negative five. Then my Y value is five. So that tells me vertically, I wanna move five units up. It's a positive five. So from negative five, I'm just gonna go one, two, three, four, five units up. And what you see is that this is basically the meeting point of an X value of negative five and a Y value of positive five, okay? If I drew kind of a little line extending this and a little line extending this, 
you can see that's the meeting point, right? So this is negative five comma five. So that's one way you can do it. There's obviously quicker ways. What I basically do when I do this now, and I kind of erase my points, so let me draw that back in. So this is gonna be right here. What I do when I do this now is I just go to the X location first, and then I move up or down based on the Y location I'm given, okay? So in this case, I would just go to negative five first. I don't need to start at the origin. And then my Y location is five, so I just go up five units, okay? That's all I need to do. Now, what quadrant does this lie in? Remember, the top right is quadrant one, and we go counterclockwise. So this is gonna be in quadrant two, right? This would be quadrant three. This would be quadrant four, okay? So the quadrant that it's in would be quadrant two. All right, let's grab the next one. So the next one is three comma negative seven. So three comma negative seven. So let me erase this and I will put three comma negative seven there. I'll erase this because we don't know what quadrant it's in yet. So again, you could start at an X value of three. So that's right here. And then the Y value is negative seven. So a negative in terms of a vertical number line just tells me I'm going down, right? I need to go down. So I'm gonna go down by seven units. So start at three on the X axis and go down by seven units. So basically right here. Now you can see the Y value here is gonna be negative seven. So if you extend from here, you see that's the meeting point between those two. So this is gonna be three comma negative seven. And if you wanted to do this differently, you could. You could start out at the Y location. So I could have started out at negative seven. So right there. And then my X location or my X value is three. So it just tells me I wanna to move to the right by three units. Again, that'll get me to three comma negative seven. So that's going to be my location. Now, for the quadrant, this guy is located in quadrant four. So the quadrant is quadrant four. All right, so now we wanna look at negative four comma negative four. So let me erase this and I'll put a negative four here and a negative four here. So what we wanna do, again, is go four units to the left. I wanna start out at negative four on my X axis. This is negative four. And then I have a Y value of negative four. So that just means I'm going down by four units. So I'm gonna find basically negative four on the Y axis. It's the meeting point between the two. So four units to the left and four units down. That's gonna be right there. So this is negative four comma negative four. And this is located in quadrant three, okay? All right, now we have negative two comma eight. So negative two comma eight. Let's erase this and this. So negative two eight. So we would, again, I'll kind of mix this up just because you can do it either way. I'm gonna start out by going to eight on the y-axis, right? Because I'm going eight units up. So this is eight, I'll just kind of circle that. Now my x value is negative two. So horizontally, I just wanna move two units to the left. Again, if this is negative, it's telling me to go to the left. So I go up eight units and then I go left two units. And this is kind of in the way. So let me kind of move this. So again, I would just go two units to the left. So one, two. So this right here would be negative two comma eight. So negative two comma eight. And it's kind of squished in there. So let me erase that and I'll put it up here. So negative two comma eight. That's a little better. So let me write that the quadrant here is gonna be quadrant two, okay? And again, you could have done this a different way. You could have started at the origin and moved two units to the left and eight units up. That'll get you there also. Or you could start at negative two and just go eight units up. Or again, like we did, you could start at eight and just go two units to the left. A lot of different ways to do these. Again, for me, I always just start at the X location. So I would have started at negative two. My Y location is eight, so I would just go up eight units. All right, the last one is six comma zero. And if you remember, we talked about this earlier in the lesson. So let me erase this and put six comma zero. So six here and zero here. So what are we gonna see? So again, my X value is six. So from the origin, I can move six units to the right or I could just go to six. So that's right here. Now, what am I gonna do when I have a Y value of zero? Well, essentially, if I look at just the vertical number line, if I highlight that, where is it zero? It's zero on the X axis, right? So on the X axis where I don't move at all up or down. So I'm just gonna stay at that point, right? I'm just gonna stay right here. I move horizontally, but I don't move vertically, right? In terms of the origin. I can go six units to the right, or again, I could just start at six and I don't move at all vertically, okay? So this guy right here is on the X axis. And when it's on the X axis or on the Y axis, you are not in any quadrant. So we can say not in any quadrant, okay? And that's a common trap question on a test to give you a point on an axis 
either the y-axis or the x-axis and say what quadrants it's in. It's not in any quadrant. In this lesson, we want to review finding the distance between two points using the distance formula. So in our last lesson, we reviewed the coordinate plane and how to plot points or ordered pairs on the coordinate plane. So now what we're going to do is just discuss how we can find the distance between two points or again, two ordered pairs on our coordinate plane. So to accomplish this task, we have a very simple formula. It's known as the distance formula. Now this is not to be confused with the distance formula, the distance equals rate of speed times time traveled that we used with motion word problems. Although it does have the same name, it accomplishes a very different task. So this formula we're gonna get today is something we could just plug into, we're gonna evaluate, and we're basically gonna have our answer right away, okay? But the purpose of this lesson is not to just give you this easy formula. We want you to understand where it comes from and essentially it's gonna come from the Pythagorean theorem or you could say the Pythagorean formula. So we talked about the Pythagorean formula already in our lesson on applications of quadratic equations. This is also something you would have learned in an elementary algebra course or an intermediate algebra course. It's something that comes up a lot. So basically the Pythagorean formula relates the lengths of the sides of a right triangle or a triangle with a 90 degree angle. So on our screen, what we have here is a right triangle. And we know it's a right triangle because of this symbol right here. This guy is telling us that we have a 90 degree angle. So you'll also notice that we've labeled each of the three sides of the right triangle. A right triangle is gonna consist of two legs and we've labeled each leg here. So we have leg A, which is basically from here to here. Let me just highlight that real quick. So this is leg A and then we have leg B which is basically from here to here, okay? Let me highlight that as well. So this is our leg B. And then we have a hypotenuse, okay? So the hypotenuse is the side that's opposite of the 90 degree angle. So in this particular case, it's going to be from here to here, okay? So that's gonna be my hypotenuse. So the right triangle is gonna have two legs and a hypotenuse. And again, the hypotenuse is always opposite of the 90 degree angle the hypotenuse is always going to be the longest side, okay? So the two shorter sides are known as legs. The longest side is known as the hypotenuse. Now our Pythagorean formula tells us that if we sum the squares of the two legs, okay, the two shorter sides, it will be equal to the square of the hypotenuse or again, the longest side. So for the Pythagorean formula, we get that this distance here for leg A, that guy squared plus this distance here for leg B, that amount squared. If we sum these again, two shorter sides, those amounts squared, we get the hypotenuse or C squared. Okay, so this is the relationship between the sides in a right triangle. Okay, so let's take a look at a quick example. So one common application of this formula is that if you have a right triangle and you know two of the three sides, you can solve for the third unknown. Okay, so this is basically what we're gonna be doing when we derive our distance formula. So as a quick example, suppose that we know that leg B is going to be eight. Okay, so that's the distance there. From here to here, that's my leg B, that's eight. We don't know what leg A is. So we don't know what this to this is, but we do know what the hypotenuse or C is. Let me kind of write this in as C there. So this guy's gonna be 17. So again, we know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So what I can do for this example is plug in for B, we know that's eight, so I'm gonna plug that in there, and I could plug in for C, we know the hypotenuse is 17, so we would end up with A squared plus eight squared is 64, and this is equal to 17 squared, which is 289. To solve for A, what I'd wanna do is get this guy by itself first, so I would subtract 64 away from each side of the equation. We would have a squared is equal to 289 minus 64 is 225. Now, here's where you gotta kinda pay attention to what's going on. We know how to solve this type of equation. So let me write this over here. We have a squared is equal to, again, 225. Up to this point, we've pretty much just taken the square root of each side. But when I take the square root of this side on the right, I have to go plus or minus to kind of account for all the possible solutions. Now, there's an issue with that in this particular case. 
we'd end up with a is equal to plus or minus 15. Now, a here is again a length, it's a distance. So it can't be negative 15. So you'd wanna throw this solution out and just say that a here is gonna be 15. Okay, so let me erase this. We'll kind of come back up here and I'll just write here that this guy is 15, okay? So this triangle here, we have leg B that's eight, we have leg A that's 15, and we have C, our hypotenuse, that's going to be 17. All right, so now let's move on and talk about how to find the distance between two points on a coordinate plane using our Pythagorean formula. We're gonna start with this example here. So we wanna find the distance between six comma four and zero comma negative four. I'll show you how to do this the long way, and then we'll move into kind of deriving the distance formula. And then from then on, once we use that formula, it'll be very, very easy. So let's go down to the coordinate plane and let's first write our ordered pairs. We have six comma four, and then we have zero comma negative four, okay? So for six comma four, if we plot that, we start at the origin, we we'll go six units to the right and four units up, so that's right there. So this is six comma four. For zero comma negative four, starting at the origin, I just drop down four units. So this would be zero comma negative four. Okay, I'll put that there. And essentially what we're gonna end up doing is finding the distance between these two points. So let me just draw a little line that connects the two. So this line right here is gonna end up being our hypotenuse or longest side of the right triangle. So how can we end up drawing our right triangle? Well, what we're gonna need is one additional endpoint, right, for the right triangle or one additional corner, or you could say one additional vertex. Now, how do we get that? Some of you can see that it's gonna end up being right here, okay? But the way you can draw this is you can take an X value from one of the points. So let's just say I take six. Then I've gotta take a Y value from the opposite point. Okay, so now I'm gonna take a Y value of negative four. So that's how I get this point here, which is six comma negative four. Okay, so I can use this to kind of complete my right triangle. Now, I can also make a right triangle by using alternate kind of coordinates. So I can take the X value from here, which is zero, and the Y value from here, which is four. So if I erase this and I go to zero comma four, we could also draw a right triangle that way. This way is gonna be a little bit better for me to kind of show things. So I'm just gonna stick with the original one that I came up with. So an X value of six and then a Y value of negative four. Okay, so that'll be kind of our third point on this right triangle, okay? So let me kind of draw this in. Okay, so not perfect, but we get the idea here. So let me kind of draw my symbol here for the 90 degree angle. So this is our right triangle. And essentially we know that this side right here that's opposite of the 90 degree angle is the hypotenuse. So I'm gonna label that as C. And then the two shorter sides, I can label that as A and B. So I'm just gonna stay consistent with what I've done previously. And I'm gonna say that this horizontal leg, this kind of side that's horizontal or parallel to the X axis, I'm gonna call that leg B. This vertical leg or this kind of side that is parallel to the y-axis, I'm gonna call that leg A, okay? But you can interchange these two, it's not a big deal, right? As long as the hypotenuse is labeled as C, the formula I gave you will work. So it's pretty easy to find the length of the legs. For B, the horizontal leg, we just find the distance by subtracting the x values, okay? And the reason we do that is because the x-axis or the horizontal axis are movements left and right. Right, you think about this line as being a horizontal line. So all we need to really consider is the X value here of zero, which is kind of the X value for that point there. And the X value here of six, which is the X value for this point there. So if you wanna think about this, you can think about this as being on a horizontal number line like this. Let's say that this point right here is six and this point right here is zero. So what I'd end up doing here is just subtracting and I wanna do this inside of an absolute value operation so that I end up getting a positive result, right? Distance is never gonna be negative, so that's why you do that. So I could do the absolute value of six minus zero, which is the absolute value of six, which is just six, or I could do the absolute value of zero minus six, which is the absolute value of negative six, which is also six. So I know that my B here, let me kinda of write this here, my B is going to be six. Okay, so what about A? 
Well, with A, this is our vertical leg, and we want to find the distance by subtracting Y values, okay? Because again, when we think about Y, it's our vertical axis, it's our vertical number line, the Y values are movements up and down. So if I think about kind of this point here and this point here, the Y values are going to be 4 and negative 4, okay? So I want to think about the fact that to go from here to here, I would have to go from 4 to 0, which is 4 units, and then another 4 units down would give me another 4. So 4 plus 4 would give me 8. But again, you find that through subtraction. So you could do 4 minus a negative 4. So 4 minus a negative 4 is the same thing as 4 plus 4. You do that inside of an absolute value operation. So this ends up being the absolute value of 8, which is 8. Or you could do it the other way. You could say that you have negative 4 minus 4. Again, inside of absolute value bars. So this ends up being the absolute value of negative 8, which is also 8. Okay, so you see that distance from here to here is going to be 8. So I'm going to put that A is 8. Now, once we have this information, we're basically good to go, right? Because we can just plug into the formula. We know that A squared, so A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So I know what A is, it's 8, so I'm going to plug that in there. I know what B is, that's 6, so I'm going to plug that in there. I don't know what C is, but again, I can find it pretty easily here. So I'll have 8 squared plus 6 squared equals C squared. So 8 squared is 64. This is 64. Then plus 6 squared is 36. This equals C squared. 64 plus 36 is 100. So you get 100 is equal to C squared. I'm just going to take the principal square root of each side. I don't need the plus or minus over here on the left. So I'm just going to have that 10 is equal to C. Okay. So let me erase all this. And I'll write that C here equals 10. So that's this value right here. So this guy is going to be 10. And I can write the other values in if I want. We know that A is 8, and we know that B is 6, okay? Instead of having to graph things each time, we have this very easy formula that we can use. We can just basically plug into this guy. This is called the distance formula. And what it is is we've taken the Pythagorean formula, and we've taken our points that we're working with, and we've kind of set everything up. So essentially, if I have these two points, Again, we were working with 6, 4, and we were working with 0, negative 4. I'm going to label one of the points as x sub 1, y sub 1, and the other as x sub 2, y sub 2. It doesn't matter which I label as which. So I'm just going to say this is x sub 1, y sub 1, and I'm going to say this is x sub 2, y sub 2. Okay? So if I plug in here, for x sub 2, I've got a 0, and then minus for x sub 1, I've got a 6, so you'll notice that what this gives us is the kind of horizontal distance. If I go back up, we see that from here to here, we have a horizontal distance of 6, right? We can find that by doing the absolute value of 6 minus 0, or we can find that by doing the absolute value of 0 minus 6. Either way, we get a distance of 6 units. Now, in this particular case, you don't see absolute value signs, and that's because we end up squaring this guy. So if we get a negative, it doesn't matter. Right, it ends up making it positive. If I did 6 minus 0, I would get 6. If I square it, I get 36. If I do 0 minus 6, I get negative 6. If I square it, I still get 36. Okay, So that's why we don't have absolute value signs involved. Then plus, here you have the difference in y values. So we have y sub 2, which is going to be negative 4. And then minus y sub 1, which is going to be 4. Again, we're squaring this result. If I go back... We see that's the difference in y values, right, or the vertical distance. So we see that we have, what, negative 4 down here and positive 4 here. So I do the absolute value of negative 4 minus 4 to get that distance. Okay, that gives me the absolute value of negative 8, which is 8. Again, we don't need to use absolute value bars here because we're squaring the result. So let me just kind of do this off to the side. We have d is equal to the square root of 0 minus 6 is negative 6. Negative 6 squared is 36. Then plus negative 4 minus 4 is negative 8. Negative 8 squared is 64. So you remember this is what we ended up getting when we squared A and B. Okay? So if we were at this point right here, let me label this as C. So right now we would have C squared is equal to what? You'd have A squared plus B squared. So to solve for C or the distance between those two points, all I did was I renamed this C as D, right, to count for distance. And I just took the square root of each side, so this becomes just d by itself, and this becomes the square root over here. Okay, so that's where this comes from. So now we just quickly say 36 plus 64 is 100. We take the square root of 100, 
and we get that D is equal to 10, okay? So you can see I found that in just a few seconds, or you could say pretty much instantly with this formula versus having to go to a coordinate plane and kind of, you know, draw a right triangle and go through it each time, okay? So this is definitely what we're gonna be using for application purposes, but we wanted to make sure you understand where it came from. All right, so let's run through a few examples now. So we wanna find the distance between each pair of points, and we're just gonna use our distance formula. So we have two comma one and we have negative three comma negative 11. Okay, so the distance formula, we say that D is equal to the square root of, you've got this X sub two minus X sub one, this quantity squared. Again, this is the difference in X values or your horizontal leg, right? That distance there. Then plus you have Y sub two minus Y sub one, this quantity squared. Again, this is the difference in kind of Y values. That's gonna give you your vertical leg. Okay, let me kind of make this better. Okay, so I'm gonna label one of these points as X sub one, Y sub one, and the other as X sub two, Y sub two. It doesn't matter which I label as which. So we'll say this is X sub one, Y sub one. We'll say this is X sub two, Y sub two. Okay, just to keep it nice and simple. So for X sub two, I have negative three. For X sub one, I have two. So let me erase these and just plug in. So this is negative three minus two there. And then I can erase this. For y sub two, I have negative 11. So I have negative 11. For y sub one, I have one. So let me plug that in. So negative three minus two is negative five. Negative five squared is 25. So this is 25. Negative 11 minus one is gonna be negative 12. Negative 12 squared is 144. So if I sum 25 and 144, I get 169. And if I take the square of 169, I get 13, okay? So the distance between these two points is 13. Let's take a look at another one. So we have 19 comma negative four, and we have three comma negative 34. So the distance between these two points, again, the D for distance is equal to the square root of, you've got X sub two minus X sub one, this quantity squared, then plus you've got Y sub two minus Y sub one, again, this quantity squared. For this guy right here, I'll just switch it up and say this is x sub two, y sub two, and I'll say this is x sub one, y sub one. So let's just plug in. So we have that x sub two is 19. So this is 19. We have that x sub one is three. Then we have that y sub two is going to be negative four. We have that y sub one is going to be negative 34. So minus a negative 34 is plus 34. Let's write that in like that. 19 minus three is 16, so you'd have 16 squared, which is going to be 256. So let me just write this as 256 here. And then negative four plus 34 is 30. If you square 30, you get 900. Okay, so this is 900 here. So what is 256 plus 900? That's 1,156. And if you take the square root of that, you end up with 34. Okay, so we'll put that the distance here is 34. All right, let's take a look at one more example. Again, when you use the formula, it's extremely easy. So the distance between these two points, you have negative 10 comma 15, and you have 12 comma 17. So my distance, my D is equal to the square root of, you've got your X sub two minus your X sub one squared, then plus your Y sub two minus your Y sub one squared, okay? So I'm just gonna label this guy as X sub one, Y sub one, I'll label this guy as x sub two, y sub two, okay? So I'm just gonna plug it. So we have that x sub two is going to be 12. We have that x sub one is going to be negative 10. So minus a negative 10 is plus 10. We have that y sub two is going to be 17, okay, 17. We have that y sub one is going to be 50, okay? So pretty easy here. So 12 plus 10 is 22. 22 squared is 484. And then 17 minus 15 is two, two squared is four. So if I add 484 and four, I get 488. So 488. Now, 488 is not a perfect square. So to kind of simplify this, 488 divided by four is 122. So I'm gonna write this as the square root of four, which is two, times the square root of 122. Now I can't do anything with the square root of 122, I'm just gonna leave that as it is. So this is my kind of simplified answer. We have the distance is equal to two times the square root of 122.
In this lesson, we want to look at determining whether three points are the vertices of a right triangle. So in our last lesson, we learned about the distance formula. This formula allows us to calculate the distance between any two points on the coordinate plane. And basically, we derive this formula from our Pythagorean formula. Okay, This relates to the sides of a right triangle. Again, if you have a right triangle like this guy right here, again, you know it's a right triangle because of this 90 degree angle here then essentially the Pythagorean formula relates the sides of a right triangle. So you have these two shorter sides, which are called legs, and then you have the longest side, which is opposite of the 90 degree angle, which is your hypotenuse. And essentially it tells us that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Now we can basically use this guy here to come up with a distance formula to find the distance between this point and this point when the two legs are known. Right? So if you know the two legs, which are easy to find kind of on a coordinate plane, then you can easily find the distance between two points, which would be your hypotenuse. Okay, So to kind of summarize here, we found that the distance between two points, we label it as D, it's equal to the square root of, you have X sub 2 minus X sub 1, that quantity squared, then plus you have your Y sub 2 minus Y sub 1, that quantity squared. Okay, What we can do here is if we're given three points, okay? So let's say there's a point here, and let me kind of do this in a different color. So let's say there's a point here, here, and here. If it's true that we have a right triangle, then the distance for this guy right here, for leg A, if we square that, plus the distance for this guy right here for leg B, if we square that, should be equal to the distance of the hypotenuse squared, okay? So we know how to get the distance between any two points just using this distance formula. Okay, so let's look at an example. So we want the three points here. We have them labeled as A, B, and C. So we have 2, 4, negative 1, 0, and 2, 0. We want to know if these are the vertices or the endpoints or the corners of a right triangle. So what I need to do is look at the distance between each pair of points involved. Okay. So basically, the longest distance that I get, if it's a right triangle, would be my hypotenuse. So I would square the two kind of shorter distances. I would sum those amounts, and it should be equal to the longest distance that I have, or the largest distance squared, okay, if it's a right triangle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find three distances. I'm going to say distance one, I'm going to say distance two, and I'm going to say distance three, okay? So first, I'm going to do the distance between A and B. So I'm going to say this is going to be the distance between A and B. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, again, these two points here. And I'm going to use my distance formula. So the distance formula is what? It's the quantity x sub 2 minus x sub 1 squared plus the quantity y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared. And again, we're taking the square root of this. And this would give me my distance between those two points. So I'm just going to plug in here. And I'm going to label this as x sub 1, y sub 1. I'm going to label this x sub 2, y sub 2. Okay. So I'm just going to erase and just kind of plug in. For x sub 2, I have negative 1. For x sub 1, I have 2. For y sub 2, I'm going to have 0. For y sub 1, I'm going to have 4. Okay. So if I run through this real quick, Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. Square that and you get 9. And then 0 minus 4 is negative 4. Square that and you get 16. If I sum 9 and 16, I get 25. The principal square root of 25 is 5. Okay. So the distance between these two guys here, A and B, is going to be 5. Now, let's do a distance 2. And we're going to say this is the distance between, let's say, A and C. So A and C. So again, I use my distance formula. So the square root of, you've got x sub 2 minus x sub 1, that quantity squared, plus you've got y sub 2 minus y sub 1, that quantity squared. Okay, so for x sub 2, let me kind of label this guy over here. I'm going to say this is x sub 2, y sub 2. So for x sub 2, I'm going to say that's 2. For x sub 1, I'm going to say that's 2. So 2 minus 2 is 0, 0 squared is 0, so you just get rid of this. Then for y sub 2, I have 0. For y sub 1, I have 4. So basically, I have 0 minus 4, which is negative 4. Negative 4 squared is 16. So the square root of 16 is 4. So this guy's going to be 4 right here. Now, for the distance 
three, I'm going to say the distance between what? Well, I need to do B and C now. So B and C, okay? So what's that going to be? Let me kind of slide this over and say this is now X sub one, Y sub one. So again, it's the square root of, you've got X sub two minus X sub one, that quantity squared. So two minus a negative one, two minus a negative one, that amount squared. Two minus negative one is two plus one. Two plus one is three, three squared is nine. So this is going to be nine. And then plus, you've got your Y sub two, which is zero, minus your Y sub one, which is zero, that quantity squared. Zero minus zero is obviously zero. Zero squared is going to be zero. So you can get rid of this. Square root of nine is just three. Now, the largest number is five. So if this is a right triangle, this guy would represent my hypotenuse. And these two guys right here would be the shorter sides, the A and B. So it would be true that three squared plus four squared is equal to five squared if these are the endpoints of a right triangle. And you see that works itself out. So this is gonna be true, right? We're gonna end up with a three, four, five right triangle. Three squared is nine plus four squared is 16. If you sum these, you do get five squared, which is 25, right? You get 25 equals 25. So these are the endpoints for a right triangle. All right, let's take a look at a few more of these. So we have these points here, A, B, and C. So you've got negative two comma five, 12 comma three, and 10 comma negative 11. Again, we wanna find out if these are the endpoints or the corners or the vertices of a right triangle. So again, all I wanna do is find the distance between the points. So my first distance, I'm gonna say this is the distance between A and B. And then my second distance, I'll say that's the distance between A and C. And then my third distance, I'll say that's the distance between B and C, okay? So let's kind of crank this out really quickly. I'll just kind of set this up in each case real fast, and then we'll go through and do it. So for the first kind of situation we have, we're looking at the distance between A and B. I'll go ahead and say this is X sub one, Y sub one. And I'll say that this is X sub two, Y sub two. So if I just plug in, X sub two is gonna be 12, and X sub one is gonna be negative two. So this would be plus two, right? Ne minus a negative is plus a positive. For Y sub two, I'm gonna have three. For Y sub one, I'm gonna have five, okay? So if I crank this out, 12 plus two is 14. 14 squared is 196. So you've got 196 here. And then three minus five is negative two. Negative two squared is gonna be positive four. So 196 plus four is 200. The square root of 200, so we know that the square root of 200 is not a rational number, but I could simplify this. 200 is what? It's two times 100. And I know that the square root of 100 is 10, so I can say this is 10 times the square root of two. So I'll put that this is 10 times the square root of two. Okay, let's move on to the distance between A and C. So let's kind of slide this over and say that this is x sub two, y sub two. So for x sub two, I'm gonna plug in a 10. For x sub one, I'm gonna plug in a negative two, so this would be plus two. For y sub two, I'm gonna plug in a negative 11. For y sub one, I'm gonna plug in a five. So 10 plus two is 12, 12 squared is 144. So this is 144. And then negative 11 minus five is going to be negative 16. And negative 16 squared is 256. So this is plus 256. If I sum 144 and 256, I get 400. So the square root of 400 is 20. So this would be 20 here. Okay, so now let's talk about the distance between B and C. So I'm just going to kind of slide this over. So for X sub two, I'm gonna have 10. For X sub one, I'm gonna have 12. And 10 minus 12 is negative two, negative two squared is four. So let's go ahead and do that. Y sub two is going to be negative 11. So this is negative 11. Y sub one is gonna be three. So negative 11 minus three is negative 14. If I square negative 14, I get 196. So four plus 196 again is 200. And we already know that the square root of 200 is gonna simplify to 10 times the square root of two. Now, let's go ahead and show that if we have a right triangle, Again, we know that 20 is the biggest number here, right? So this would be the hypotenuse if this was a right triangle. So it would have to be true that this guy squared, so the 10 times the square root of two squared 
plus, again, your 10 times the square root of 2 squared would be equal to 20 squared. So is that true? Let's kind of scroll down and get some room going. So if I square 10, I get 100. If I square the square root of 2, I get 2. So this would be 100 times 2, which is 200. So you basically have 200 plus 200, which is 400. Is that equal to 20 squared? Yes, it is. 20 squared is 400. So we can say that these three points, we had negative 2 comma 5, 12 comma 3, and 10 comma negative 11, are the vertices of a right triangle. All right, let's take a look at one more problem. So we have A, B, and C here for our points. A is 4 comma 1, B is 2 comma 4, and C is 0 comma 2. So again, what I want to do is find the distance between each kind of pair of points. And to do that, I've already kind of written it. So let me just paste this in. And I'll put this over here, just save us a little bit of time. So our first distance will be the distance between A and B. The second will be the distance between A and C. And the third will be the distance between B and C. So all I got to do is just kind of label things and then plug in. So I'm going to label this one as x sub 1, y sub 1 to start. I'll label this as x sub 2, y sub 2. So I'm going to start with the distance between A and B. So for x sub 2, I can erase this and put in A2. For x sub 1, I can erase this and put in a 4. Over here for y sub 2, I can put in a 4. For y sub 1, I can put in a 1. Okay. So 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Negative 2 squared is going to be positive 4. And then 4 minus 1 is 3. 3 squared is 9. So 4 plus 9 is 13. So this would end up being the square root of 13. So square root of 13. Okay, so now we're looking at the distance between A and C. So let me erase this, and I will put this as x sub 2, y sub 2. So for x sub 2, I've got 0. For x sub 1, I've got 4. And then for y sub 2, I've got 2. And for y sub 1, I've got 1. So 0 minus 4 is negative 4. Negative 4 squared is 16. So this is 16 here. And then 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 squared is obviously 1. So 16 plus 1 is 17. So this would be the square root of 17. So square root of 17. Then lastly, we want the distance between B and C. So let me kind of erase this. I'll do this as x sub 1, y sub 1. So for x sub 2, I've got 0. For x sub 1, I've got 2. For y sub 2, I've got 2. And for y sub 1, I've got 4. Okay, so we just crank this out. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 squared is 4. So this is 4 here. 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Negative 2 squared is, again, 4. So you've got 4 plus 4, which is 8 here. So this would be the square root of 8. Okay? Now, I can simplify the square root of 8 because it's what? It's the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. I could write this as the square root of 4 times 2. The square root of 4 is 2, so you could write this as 2 times the square root of 2. Okay, just to make it simple. All right, so what's the largest kind of value that we have here? That would be the hypotenuse if we had a right triangle. Well, the square root of 13 is approximately 3.61. The square root of 17 is approximately 4.12. And 2 times the square root of 2 is approximately 2.83, okay? These are all irrational numbers, so you can't get an exact value. But if we approximate it, it's, it gives us a good idea of what would the largest one be. Obviously, the square root of 17 would be the clear winner. So this guy right here should be the hypotenuse if we have a right triangle, okay? So what I'd want to do, because this guy right here and this guy right here, those would be the legs, right, if we were working with the right triangle. I would take the square root of 13 squared. Then I would add that to 2 times the square root of 2 squared. And I would say, does this equal the square root of 17 squared, okay? So let's scroll down and get a little bit of room going. Square root of 13 squared is obviously 13. Then plus 2 times square root of 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. Square root of 2 squared is 2. 4 times 2 is 8. So this would be 13 plus 8, which we know is 21. So this is 21. Does that equal the square root of 17 squared? No, it doesn't, right? Square root of 17 squared is 17. And I forgot to put a 1 there. So this is 21, and this is not going to equal 17, right? We can put this as false. So this tells us that basically these are not the vertices of a right triangle. Okay, so these points that we had 4 comma 1, 2 comma 4, and 0 comma 2, they're not the vertices or the endpoints or the corners of a right triangle. In this lesson, we want to discuss how to determine whether the three points are collinear. All right, so in our last lesson, we used our distance formula to determine if three points were the vertices, or you could say the corners, of a right triangle. 
Now we're going to look at another application of our distance formula. And basically, we're going to use our distance formula to determine if three points are collinear, which just means they lie on the same line. Now, for most of you that, again, took lower level algebra courses, you know that there are many different methods we can use for this task. This is probably one of the more tedious methods. Generally, at this kind of level, where we're talking about the coordinate plane, you would use slopes for this process, right? It would be a little bit faster. But again, for the sake of completeness, we'll use this method. And then as we move throughout the course, we'll look at collinearity with slopes and then a few other methods that are much more efficient. So we're going to start out with this first example where we have point A, which is 0, negative 4, point B, which is 3, negative 2, and point C, which is 6, 0. So we want to know if these three points are collinear, meaning they lie on the same line. So I'll just tell you for the first example, they will be collinear. And we're going to look at a graph in a minute. We'll see that I've kind of already sketched a line that goes through the three points. But the idea here is that to find the distance between each pair of points, we use our distance formula. So with three points, you're going to have three distances. Let me kind of paste this in here. So you're going to have the first distance, which is the distance between point A and point B. The second distance, which is the distance between point A and point C. And the third distance, which is the distance between point B and point C. Okay, so the idea here is that the sum of the two smaller distances is going to be equal to the largest distance if these three points are collinear, okay? So visually, we can see that that would be true, okay? So I've already sketched the line that goes through these three points. Again, for reference sake, 0, negative 4, this is going to be point A. So this is point A. 3, negative 2, this is going to be point B. And then 6, 0, this is going to be point C, okay? All we're saying is that the largest distance here, which we can see is from A to C, okay? That's the largest distance. That should be made up of these two smaller distances summed together. Okay, in this case, that's going to be from A to B and then from B to C. So if I sum those two amounts together, I should get the largest one, which is from A to C, if these three points are collinear or lie on the same line. So let's go back and plug into our formula and we'll prove that this is the case. Okay, so I'm just going to label point A as x sub 1, y sub 1. Let me do this in a different color so we don't get confused. So this is going to be x sub 1, y sub 1. I'm going to label point B as x sub 2, y sub 2. Okay, let me erase this. And we're just going to plug into the formula, and we'll get our first distance. So the distance between A and B, for x sub 2, I'm going to plug in 1. I'm going to plug in a 3. For x sub 1, I'm going to plug in a 0. So 3 minus 0 is 3. 3 squared is 9. So let's put a 9 there. Then plus for y sub 2, I'm going to have negative 2. And then for y sub 1, I'm going to have a negative 4. So minus a negative 4 is plus 4. So this is plus 4. Negative 2 plus 4 is 2. 2 squared is 4. So you have 9 plus 4, which is 13. So this is going to be the square root of 13. Okay, So that's the distance between point A and point B. So let me go back to this right here. Let me kind of erase this. And again, this is A, this is B, and this is C. So from point A to point B, so basically from here to here, this guy right here, we've said that's square root of 13. Well, now we're looking at the distance between A and C. So let me erase this, and I'll kind of put it over here. So this is my X sub 2, Y sub 2 now. So for X sub 2, I'm going to plug in Y. I'm going to plug in a 6. For x sub 1, I'm going to plug in a 0. And then for y sub 2, I'm going to plug in what? I'm going to plug in a 0. And for y sub 1, I'm going to plug in a negative 4. Minus a negative 4 is plus 4. So 6 minus 0 is 6. 6 squared is 36. So this is 36. And then 0 plus 4 is 4. 4 squared is 16. So if you have 36 plus 16, that's going to give you 52. Now, the square root of 52 can be simplified. Right, 52 is 4 times 13. So this is 4 times 13 underneath my square root symbol. Square root of 4 is 2. So I can say this is 2 times the square root of 13. Now, let me go back. We know that from A to C, so this guy right here from A to C, this is 2 times square root of 13. Okay, From A to B is square root of 13, and from A to C is 2 times square root of 13. So these points will be collinear if this guy right here from B to C is square root of 13. Let's go ahead and prove that's the case. 
So this guy right here, for the distance between B and C, let me kind of erase this, and let me write it in here. We'll say this is X sub one, Y sub one. So X sub two now, if I'm plugging in, is gonna be six. X sub one is gonna be three. And we'll do this in a second. Y sub two is gonna be zero. And Y sub one is gonna be negative two. Minus the negative two is plus two. So six minus three over here is three. Three squared is nine. So this is nine. And then zero plus two is two. Two squared is four. So again, nine plus four is 13. So we do get square root of 13 here, okay? So you can see that the sum of the two smaller distances from A to B and from B to C, square root of 13 plus square root of 13, does give me the largest kind of distance, right? So two times square root of 13, which is the distance between A and C, right? So you can show this, square root of 13 plus square root of 13 is equal to two times square root of 13, right? This over here on the left, would become two times square root of 13. So this is a true statement. So we can say these three points are collinear or rely on the same line, right? So if we go back, again, we're looking at the distance between B and C. So from here to here, and we found that this was square root of 13 as well. So again, just to kind of wrap this up, we have the distance from A to B. So let me just kind of write this out. So the distance from A to B, so between those two points is again, the square root of 13. Then we also have the distance from B to C. So let me write that out. So the distance from B to C, and that's also the square root of 13. And again, what we're saying here is that because these three points are collinear, when I sum these two smaller distances together, what I get is the largest distance, okay, which is from A right here to C right here, which again is two times square root of 13. So the distance between, again, A and C is gonna be two times the square root of 13. So this is always going to be true when we have three points that lie on the same line, or you could say when they are collinear. Let's go ahead and take a look at another one. Very easy concept, just something that's very, very tedious. So we have our first point A, which is negative two comma zero. We have our second point B, which is two comma seven. And our third point C, which is negative one comma four. So let me kind of paste this in. And to start, I'm just gonna label this one as x sub one, y sub one, and this one x sub two, y sub two. And let's just plug into the formula. So this guy right here, x sub two is gonna be two, and x sub one is gonna be negative two, minus a negative two is plus two. And then for y sub two, I'm gonna have seven. For y sub one, I'm gonna have zero. So two plus two is four, four squared is 16. 7 minus 0 is 7. 7 squared is 49. So what is 16 plus 49? That's going to be 65. So we'd have square root of 65. All right, then for the distance between A and C, let me erase this, and I'll put this one over here. Let me kind of make this a little bit better. So I'll say that this guy over here is going to be x sub 2, y sub 2 now. So for x sub 2, we're going to plug in a negative 1. For x sub one, we're gonna plug in a negative two, minus a negative two is plus two. And then for y sub two, we're gonna plug in a four. For y sub one, we're gonna plug in a zero, okay? So negative one plus two is one. So that's one squared, which would be just one. Four minus zero is four, four squared is 16. Okay, so one plus 16 is going to give me 17. So this is the square root of 17 here. So square root of 17. So for my third distance, the distance between B and C, let me kind of slide this down real quick. So B will now be X sub one, Y sub one. So let me erase this. X sub two will be negative one. Then X sub one will be two. Negative one minus two will be negative three. Negative three squared is nine. So let's just put that there. Y sub two is four. And then Y sub one is going to be seven. Okay, so four minus seven is gonna be negative three. Negative three squared is nine, okay? So you have nine plus nine, which is 18. Now, I can simplify that. 18 is what? It's nine times two, and nine is a perfect square. Nine is three times three. So basically, square root of nine is three. So I can write this as three times square root of two. So three times square root of two. So which one of these guys is the largest? Well, square root of 65 is gonna be the largest. Again, this is an irrational number. But if you approximate it, it's about 8.06.
For square root of 17, if you approximate that, it's about 4.12. And then for three times square root of two, if you approximate that, it's about 4.24. So this guy right here should be the largest distance, right, from A to B. So basically we would see that the square root of 17 plus three times the square root of two would be equal to the square root of 65, and that's gonna be false, right? This is not gonna work itself out. If you wanna use an approximation for each, we could say that again, the square root of 65 is about, okay, about 8.06, okay? And then the square root of 17 is about 4.12. And then three times the square root of two is about 4.24, okay? Just generally speaking, approximately speaking, are these equal? Well, 4.12 plus 4.24 is 8.36, right? So these aren't gonna be equal, okay? So we can just erase this, we don't need this, okay? Even though we used approximations, we can clearly see that these aren't gonna be equal. This is false. So these three points are not going to be collinear. All right, let's just take a look at one more of these. So we have point A, which is negative four comma three, point B, which is two comma five, and point C, which is negative one comma four. Again, are they collinear? So let's paste in our distance formulas. And I'm just gonna start out with the first distance between A and B. Again, I'm gonna label this guy as x sub one, y sub one. I'll label this as x sub two, y sub two. So x sub two is two. Let me kind of write that in. And then x sub one is negative four, minus the negative four is plus four. y sub two is five. And then y sub one is three. Okay, so this is three. All right, so two plus four is six. Six squared is 36. So this is 36. And then five minus three is two. Two squared is four. So 36 plus four is gonna give me 40. So this is the square root of 40. Now, so we can simplify this because 40 is four times 10. We know the square root of four is two. So I can write the answer here as two times square root of 10. All right, let's kind of slide this down here and look at the distance between A and C. And let me kind of move this over so it's not in the way. So two times square root of 10. Okay, so for X sub two, we have negative one. For X sub one, we have negative four. So minus the negative four is plus four. For y sub two is four, then for y sub one, it's three, okay? So we have negative one plus four, which is three. Three squared is nine. Then we have four minus three, which is one. One squared is one. So you have nine plus one, which is 10. So this is square root of 10. So this is square root of 10. Okay, so now let's look at B and C. So let's move this down. So for x sub two, I'm gonna plug in a negative one. For x sub one, I'm gonna plug in a two. For y sub two, I'm gonna plug in a four. And then for y sub one, I'm gonna plug in a five, okay? So negative one minus two is negative three. Negative three squared is nine. Okay, so this is nine. Four minus five is negative one. Negative one squared is one. So this is nine plus one or 10. So this is gonna be the square root of 10. So let me make that a little cleaner. And just say this is the square root of 10. So you can already see this is gonna work out, right? Because two times square root of 10 is the largest distance here. And the two smaller distances are gonna to sum to that, right? So you can kind of say that the square root of 10, which is the distance between A and C, plus the square root of 10, which is the distance between B and C, is gonna be equal to kind of the largest distance, which is the distance between A and B, which is, if I can fit this on the screen here, let me kind of move this down. Again, which is two times square root of 10. Okay, so this does work itself out. You end up saying that the left side here is two times square root of 10, and the right side here is two times square root of 10. So this is gonna be true, right? These three points, A, B, and C, A being negative four comma three, B being two comma five, and C being negative one comma four are collinear or they lie on the same line. In this lesson, we wanna discuss the midpoint formula. All right, so over the course of the last few lessons, we've been talking about the coordinate plane and various related topics. So we already talked about how to find the distance between two points. We talked about finding if three points are the vertices of a right triangle. And we talked about how to determine if three points were collinear, again, meaning they lie on the same line. So now we wanna talk about how to find the midpoint or the middle of a line segment. So first and foremost, let's clarify what we mean by a line segment. So a line on our coordinate plane extends indefinitely in both directions. So you'll see on the coordinate plane here, I've graphed a sample line. And most of you work with lines in your algebra one or intermediate algebra course. But in case you haven't, we'll get to lines in a few lessons. 
For now, we just need to know that, again, lines continue in each direction forever. That's why we have an arrow at each end. So this guy right here and this guy right here. Again, that's just telling me that the line continues indefinitely in each direction. So because of that fact, we're not going to be able to find the middle or the midpoint of a line. But what we can do is we can find the middle or the midpoint of a line segment. Okay, So a line segment is just a piece of a line. It's going to have two endpoints. And so because it has a defined length, we'll be able to find the middle of it, or again, the midpoint. Okay, So the midpoint is just the point that is equidistant, which means it has the same distance Okay, from the endpoints of our line segment. So again, just to be clear, what this means is that the midpoint will cut the line segment completely in half. So from the midpoint to one endpoint is going to be the same distance as from the midpoint to the other endpoint. So if we look at our graph here, you're going to see that we have three plotted points. So let me erase this. And you'll see that we have a plotted point here and here and here. Okay. So for reference sake, let's label these using A, B, and C. So I'm going to take this point right here. I'm going to call this point A. And this is going to be at negative 5, comma, negative 6. So point A is at negative 5, comma, negative 6. And then I'm going to call this guy right here. This is going to be B. Let me write this down here just so it's a little cleaner. So we'll put B down there. So for point B, this is going to be at 0, comma, negative 3. And then this guy right here, I'm going to call this C. So C is going to be at 5, comma, 0. So what we're going to see here is that B is going to be the midpoint for this line segment that's made up of from A to C. So from right here to right here, this line segment, if I kind of draw that in, what's going to happen is B is going to be the midpoint. So right here, if I just kind of cut this down like that, you'll see that the distance from A to B and the distance from B to C, that's going to be the exact same distance. Okay. So how can we find these coordinates in general, right? The coordinates of the midpoint. Well, let's go down and we'll come back up. All right. So I just want to show you this on a clean graph with no numbers involved. Basically, we're going to derive our formula. And you're going to see once you have the formula, this is very, very easy. So suppose we have two known points. So we have two known points. And this is usually the scenario where you're trying to find the midpoint. You know two of the points. So let's call them x sub 1, y sub 1. And we're going to say x sub 2, y sub 2. Okay. So again, these points are known. Then what you don't know is the midpoint. So the coordinates for that... For the midpoint, we're just going to say this is x comma y. Okay, so you see I have this labeled on the graph. So this is your x sub two y sub two. This is your x sub one y sub one. So these are the endpoints of our line segments. And this guy right here, this x comma y, this is your midpoint. Okay, so again, think about what this means. If I draw like a little vertical line here, you could say that the distance from here to here is the same as the distance from here to here. Right, so it cuts it in half, or it's the middle. Now, how can we mathematically determine what the midpoint is? Well, if I think about how to find the x value here for the midpoint, just think about this mathematical fact. If I kind of come up here and say this x value here to this x value here, so the x value for x sub 1 and the x value for x, the distance there would be the same as the distance from this x to kind of this x value here for x sub 2. Okay, so those distances would be equal. So mathematically, we can set up an equation that says that x sub 2 minus x is the same as or is equal to x minus x sub 1. Because again, those distances are equal. From here to here is going to be equal to or the same as from here to here. Okay, so let's just go ahead and solve this equation. And you'll see that we derive the x value for the midpoint. Okay, so x sub 2 minus x equals x minus x sub 1. So what's unknown here is x, so we want to solve for that. So the first thing we want to do is get all the x's to one side. And I know it's confusing here because you have a lot of different notation, but basically the x sub 2 and the x sub 1, that needs to be on one side, and all the kind of x's need to be on the other side. So I'm going to subtract x sub 2 away from each side of the equation. And what's going to happen is this would cancel. And I'm also going to subtract x away from each side of the equation, so that's going to cancel. All right, so what we're going to have here is that you have negative x minus x, which is negative 2x. This will be equal to, 
you're going to have negative x sub 1 minus x sub 2. Okay, so how can we solve this? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out a negative from the right-hand side. So I'm going to write this as negative 1 times the quantity x sub 1 plus x sub 2. Okay, so all I did was I factored out a negative 1. If I went back through and said negative 1 times x sub 1, I'd have my negative x sub 1. And then if I did negative 1 times x sub 2, I'd have my negative x sub 2. Okay, so I didn't do anything illegal. Then over here I have my negative 2x. And now I just want to solve for what's unknown. So I want to solve for this x right here. And the way I'm going to do that, since I'm multiplying by negative 2, I'm just going to divide by negative 2. Okay, I'm going to do that to both sides. We kind of make that better. So what's going to happen is, this is going to cancel, and I'm going to just have x on the left-hand side, and this will be equal to, on the right-hand side, you can cancel this negative 1 with this negative here, and you're going to have that x sub 1 plus x sub 2 over 2. So this is how you find the x value, or your x coordinate for the midpoint. So we're just basically finding the average of the two x values. If we go back, and we look at these two endpoints. So you have A and you have C. So A has an X value of negative 5. C has an X value of 5. So if I add those two together and I divide by 2, negative 5 plus 5 is 0. 0 over 2 is 0. So look at the X coordinate for the midpoint. It's 0, right? We can see that right there. So that's how that was found. So let me erase this. Let's talk about the Y value. So for the Y value, it's going to be the same concept. So what's going to happen is if I kind of draw a line going over here, so this guy right here, this y value, this is my y sub 2. This y value right here, this is my y. And this y value right here, this is my y sub 1. So this guy is known and this guy is known. And again, we know that the distance between here and here and the distance between here and here are going to be the same. Okay, so I can do the, basically the same thing. And I can say that y sub 2 minus y is equal to y minus y sub 1, okay? And when we solve this, we're going to see the same thing, right? We basically want to take the average of the y values. So let's subtract y sub 2 away from each side of the equation. And let's subtract y away from each side of the equation. So we know that this is going to cancel. We know that this is going to cancel. Negative y minus y is negative 2y. This equals, you're going to have negative y sub 1 minus y sub 2. Again, I'm going to do the same thing. Just going to factor a negative 1 out from the right side. So this would be negative 1 times the quantity, y sub 1 plus y sub 2. Over here, I'll have my negative 2y. And when I solve this, I just divide both sides of the equation by negative 2. And so this is going to cancel with this. I'll have y is equal to the negative 1 cancels with the negative here. You have your y sub 1 plus your y sub 2 over 2. All right, so again, this is just the average of the y values. So if we go back up, so if I wanted to find the y coordinate, this negative 3 here in the midpoint, I would take my negative 6, the y coordinate of a, one of the endpoints, then add to that my 0, the y coordinate from c, another endpoint, and I would just divide by 2. Okay, so negative 6 plus 0 is negative 6. Negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3. And so that's how you get this negative 3 right there. Okay, so a very, very easy formula to kind of come up with. We would say that capital M, so capital letter M, not lowercase m, that's used for slope, is equal to, we'll have x sub 1 plus x sub 2 divided by 2, then comma, you have y sub 1 plus y sub 2 divided by 2, okay? So this is how you can get your kind of coordinates for the midpoint. Very, very easy. You're just taking the average of the x values. That's how you get your x coordinate. And then you're taking the average of the y values. That's how you get your y coordinate. Okay, so very, very simple. Now, if we really wanted to prove this, we could calculate the distance between A and B, and we could calculate the distance between B and C. And again, if we've correctly found this midpoint as B, then the distances will be the same, okay? So I'm not gonna do that in the interest of time. I'm just gonna tell you that the distance between A and B is the square root of 34, and the distance between B and C is also the square root of 34, Okay, so this is a way you can check this. The distances are equal, so we know we've found the correct midpoint. All right, let's run through a few examples real quick. So suppose you had 2 comma negative 6 and 8 comma negative 1, and you wanted to find the midpoint. Well, again, all you need to do is label one of the points as x sub 1, y sub 1, and the other is x sub 2, y sub 2. And all we're going to do is plug into our formula. So capital M, okay, capital M is equal to, 
you've got x sub one plus x sub two over two, and then comma, you've got y sub one plus y sub two over two, okay? So if I plug into this guy, x sub one is two, so m will be equal to, you're gonna have a two plus, your x sub two is gonna be eight, okay, and we're gonna divide by two. And then for the y, you're gonna have y sub one, which is gonna be negative six, and then plus your y sub two is gonna be negative one. So you might as well do just negative six minus one. Okay, and this is gonna be over two. So two plus eight is 10, 10 divided by two is five. So this would be five, and then negative six minus one is gonna be negative seven. Negative seven divided by two. You can just write negative seven halves if you want. So you can say this is negative seven halves like this, or you can say negative 3.5 if you want a decimal, okay? So this is gonna be the midpoint, five comma negative seven halves of these two comma points, this line segment that they form. So from two comma negative six to eight comma negative one. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have negative four comma negative 13 and five comma nine. So again, we wanna find the midpoint. So the midpoint formula, capital M is equal to You've got x sub one plus x sub two over two. Let me make that better. And then comma, you've got y sub one plus y sub two over two. Okay, so if I label this one, just kind of change things up as x sub two, y sub two, and this one as x sub one, y sub one, and I just plug into my formula. So M, capital M for midpoint will be equal to, you're gonna have your x sub one, which is five, plus your x sub two, which is gonna be negative four. So five plus negative four would be five minus four, which is basically just one, okay? Then over two, so that's one half. Then for the y coordinate, you've got y sub one, which is nine, plus y sub two, which is negative 13. So you might as well say you have nine minus 13. So nine minus 13, which is negative four. So you're gonna have negative four, then over two, so over two, and negative four over two is gonna be negative two. So my midpoint is gonna be at one half comma negative two. All right, let's take a look at one more of these and then I'll give you a different type of problem. So we have 11 comma seven and nine comma two. So again, our midpoint, I'm gonna put capital letter M is equal to, you've got your X sub one plus your X sub two over two comma, you've got your Y sub one plus your Y sub two over two. Okay, so let's label this as X sub one, Y sub one. Let's label this as x sub two, y sub two. Again, just plug into the formula, very, very easy. You've got capital M for midpoint is equal to. For your x, you've got x sub one, which is 11, and x sub two, which is nine. So 11 plus nine is 20. So you'd have 20 over two, which is just 10. Okay, so this is 10. Then comma, for the y value, you've got y sub one, which is seven, and y sub two, which is two. So you've got seven plus two, which is nine over two. So the midpoint here is gonna occur at 10 comma nine halves. And if you wanted a decimal form for nine halves, you could just do 4.5. All right, for the last problem we're gonna look at, we're gonna know the midpoint and we're gonna know one endpoint, but one of the endpoints is gonna be unknown and that's what we're gonna to try to figure out. So our midpoint is gonna occur at five comma one. And then the known endpoint, I'm just gonna label this as X sub one, Y sub one. This guy's gonna occur at negative six comma negative three. And the unknown endpoint, we just have x sub two, y sub two as kind of a stand-in, okay? We don't know what it is yet. So again, if I plug into the midpoint formula, capital M is equal to, you have your x sub one plus your x sub two over two. Let me make that two a little better. And then comma, you have your y sub one plus your y sub two over two. Now, let's think about this for a second. We know that the x value here for the midpoint is five. So I can take this guy right here, this x sub one plus x sub two over two, and I can set it equal to five, right? Because if I knew what x sub two was, I know what x sub one is, but if I knew what x sub two is, I could plug in here and here, and I could evaluate and I should get a five, okay? So let's use this to kind of get our unknown value. So I know that x sub one is negative six. So I know this is negative six. So let's just solve this equation. Let's multiply both sides by two. Let me kind of scroll down and get some room going. We'll come back up. So I'll multiply this by two. Let me kind of scooch this over just a little bit. And I'm gonna multiply this side by two. We know that this would cancel with this. So I would have negative six plus x sub two is equal to 10. 
And to solve for x sub 2, I just got to add 6 to both sides of the equation. And so what I'm going to have is that x sub 2 is equal to 16. Okay, so let me erase all this. So again, my x sub 2, I'm just going to put a 16 right there. Okay, and you can verify that's the case because 16 plus negative 6 is going to give me 10. 10 divided by 2 would give me this value here of 5. Okay, so that does work itself out. Now, if I want y sub 2, I'm going to use a similar procedure. Okay, so I know y sub 1. So I'm going to say that negative 3, that's y sub 1, plus my unknown, which is y sub 2, divided by 2 would be equal to what? It would be equal to 1. So if I multiply both sides by 2, let me kind of scooch this over just a little bit. Again, if I multiply both sides by 2, so multiply this side by 2 and this side by 2, well, this is going to cancel with this. I'm going to have negative 3 plus y sub 2 is equal to 2. Let me kind of scroll down just a little bit. Let me add 3 to both sides of the equation so that I can isolate y sub 2. That'll cancel. You'll have y sub 2 is equal to 5. Okay, so very, very easy. Let me erase this. And we said that y sub 2 was 5. Okay, and you can verify that. Negative 3 plus 5 is going to give you 2. 2 divided by 2 is going to give you 1. So we know that this is correct, right? Our unknown endpoint here, our x sub 2, y sub 2 is going to be 16 comma 5. Okay, that's what we're trying to find. In this lesson, we want to talk about plotting complex numbers on the complex plane. So at this point in our course, we already know and understand how to use the imaginary unit i. i, again, is defined as the square root of negative 1, or you could say i squared is equal to negative 1. So we found that this came in handy when we're solving quadratic equations, right? In some situations, you won't be able to get a real solution, and so you need to turn to the imaginary unit i to gain a solution. Now, we have also talked about complex numbers, and complex numbers are of the form a plus bi. So we've seen these before, we've performed operations with them before, and we should know that a, this part right here, is known as the real part of the complex number. And B, this part right here that's multiplying I, the imaginary unit, is known as the imaginary part of the complex number. Now, some books will say BI is the imaginary part, but for the purposes of this lesson, we're just going to stick to saying that B is the imaginary part. Now, how can we plot a complex number, such as A plus BI, on the complex plane? Well, let's go down to our complex plane, and suppose we wanted to plot something like 5 plus 3I. Well, I'm just going to kind of match this up real quick. I'm going to say this is a plus bi. So my a here is 5 and my b here is 3. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, the complex plane, if you're looking at it, you might say, well, that looks just like the coordinate plane I'm used to working with when we see real numbers. Well, it does. It looks exactly the same. The difference is, is that instead of the horizontal axis being labeled with x, now it says real. Instead of the vertical axis being labeled with y, now it says imaginary. So it's very easy to plot 5 plus 3i. Again, the a or the real part is 5. So on the real axis, I'm just looking for 5. So that's going to be right here. So I'm just going to circle that. Then I'm looking for 3 on the imaginary axis because the b here or the imaginary part is 3. So on the imaginary axis, I'm just going up three. So that's right here. And I'm just finding the meeting point between the two. So this is just like if I had five comma three in the real number system, it's the same process. OK, so I'm going to go five units to the right on the real axis and three units up on the imaginary axis. So I'm going to be right here. This is going to be my five plus three I. OK, it's just that simple. All right, let's go ahead and try another one. So again, I'm going to write this in the format. I'm going to say this is A plus B I. OK, now in this case, my a is negative 2. So that means on the real axis, I want to go two units to the left. So that's going to be right here. And let me use a different color because that doesn't show up very well. So let me use kind of a reddish or purple. I'm not sure what you call that color. Maybe it's magenta. And then for my b, I'm thinking about the fact that this is negative. So really, if I want to stay consistent with this, I'm going to write this as plus negative 4i, OK? So my b here is a negative 4. So that means I want to start on the imaginary axis at 0, and I want to drop down 4 units. So that's going to be right there. So this is just like if you had negative 2 comma negative 4 if you were working in the real number system. So I'm just going to go 2 units to the left on the real axis, and I'm going to go 4 units down on the imaginary axis, and that's going to be right there. So this is going to be my negative 2 and then I'll put minus 4i. Again, you could put plus negative 4i. doesn't matter. It's the same thing. All right, what about 8 minus 6i? 
So again, let's just match this up. This is my A. And again, I'm going to put plus negative here. This is my B. Okay. So I want a real location of eight. So I'm going to go eight units to the right on my real axis. So that's here. And then I want a negative six for my imaginary axis. So I'm just going to go down six units. So that's going to be right there. So I go eight units to the right on the real axis and six units down on the imaginary axis. So that's right there. And this is going to be eight minus six I, or again, eight plus negative six I. All right, so let's look at another one. So we have negative five minus seven I. So this guy right here is my A. And again, I'm going to put plus negative here. So that's going to be my B. So again, on the real axis, I'm going to negative five. So that's going to be right here. On my imaginary axis, I'm going to negative seven. So I'm going to drop seven units. That's here. So again, five units to the left on the real axis, seven units down on the imaginary axis. That's going to be right there. And let me label this below it. So I'm going to put negative five and I'm going to do minus seven high. So that's that point right there. Okay. So what if they throw a curveball at you? This is one that kind of trips people up a lot. Let's say you're working on the complex plane and someone says to plot negative eight. What do you do? Well, some of you will immediately say, okay, well, I know that negative eight is a real number. So I'm probably just going to go to a negative eight on the real axis. And I'm just going to put a point there and you'd be correct. But another way you can think about this is you can still follow the format of a plus b i, okay? Because a here is negative eight, but I can say plus zero i, okay? And so my b here is just zero. So if I go eight units to the left on the real axis and zero units up on the imaginary axis, I am at this negative eight on the real axis, okay? So this right here would just be negative eight, or you put negative eight plus zero i if you wanted to write it in the complex number form. What about something just like nine i? Well, again, we can use the same technique. We can write this as a plus b i by just saying that this is my b here. So I can put a plus here and I can just put a zero here, okay? So my a here is just zero. So that means on the real axis, I'm not gonna move at all. I'm not going left or right at all, okay? All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna travel nine units up on my imaginary axis. So I'm just gonna go up nine units. So I'm just going to place my circle there. And this will be zero plus nine I. In this lesson, we wanna talk about finding the absolute value of a complex number. So at this point in our course, we should fully understand the concept of taking the absolute value of some real number, okay? We should know that the absolute value of a number is just a measure of the distance from zero to that number that we're taking the absolute value of on our number line, okay? So we know that if we take the absolute value of zero, it's just zero. If we take the absolute value of some positive number, it's just the number itself. If we take the absolute value of a negative number, we just take the opposite of the number, you could say make it positive, and so we can see that very clearly with these two examples, right? So something like the absolute value of positive five is just equal to five, right? If I look at my kind of sample number line here, I have zero highlighted and five highlighted. So basically five is five units away from zero on the number line. This is true whenever you take the absolute value of any positive number. It could be a million, it could be a trillion, whatever it is, it's always gonna be that number of units away from zero on the number line, okay? When we think about the absolute value of a negative number, something like the absolute value of negative five, we said that we just take the opposite of the number, or again, we just make it positive, okay? So in this case, you see negative five is highlighted, zero is highlighted. So negative five is also five units away from zero on the number line. Again, this is true for any negative number that you work with. So the absolute value of negative one million would be one million, right? The absolute value of any negative number is just going to be the opposite of that number, units away from zero on the number line. So again, that's how we find our answer. We just take the opposite or again, make it positive. So now when we talk about taking the absolute value of a complex number, the concept is the same, okay? The absolute value of a complex number is also a measure of its distance from zero. The only difference is now we're gonna be measuring the distance on the complex plane, okay? So this is something we talked about in the last lesson. We talked about how to plot a complex number on the complex plane. So hopefully you saw that lesson. In case you didn't, I can just kind of walk you through this really quickly. Basically with the complex plane, it looks the same as the kind of coordinate plane that you've worked with throughout all of algebra, right? Instead of having a Y axis, the vertical axis that you're used to, now this guy is labeled as the imaginary axis, okay? 
then instead of having the kind of horizontal axis or the x-axis that you're used to, the horizontal axis is now labeled as the real axis, okay? So you've just got to know that the horizontal axis is the real axis and the vertical axis is the imaginary axis. So once you understand those two things, once you commit that to memory, you should recall that a complex number flows in the format of A plus BI when it's in standard form, okay? So this number here, this A, is the real part. In this case, this is three, okay? This number B, the number that's multiplying I, the imaginary unit, that's the imaginary part. So that, in this case, is going to be four, okay? That's what's multiplying I. Let me make that a little bit better. So to plot three plus four I on the complex plane, it's just like plotting three comma four on the coordinate plane we're used to working with. I basically want to think about a real location of three, so that's here. And I want to think about an imaginary location of four, so go up four units, that's here. What's the meeting point between those two? So three units to the right on the real axis and four units up on the imaginary axis. So this is three plus four I, okay? So that's the point three plus four I. Now, when we think about getting the absolute value of three plus four I, so the absolute value of three plus four I, what is this? Well, it's the distance from this three plus four I, this point here, to this origin here, which has a real location of zero and an imaginary location of zero. So you can say really it's zero plus zero I for the origin. So we already know how to find the distance between two points on a coordinate plane. We know that we can use our Pythagorean formula to do this. And we know we've already derived a distance formula, right, to find this. But I want to go through this process again. And we're going to derive a formula for finding the absolute value of any complex number. Let me just kind of draw a line connecting these. And again, we're just thinking about the measure of this line here, the line that's going to connect those two points, okay? So we could find this by, again, dropping a point here where we're at three on the real axis, or we could also drop a point at four on the imaginary axis. Either one of those could be used to complete our right triangle. So we went ahead and just drew the right triangle already. It's just a little bit cleaner when it's pre-drawn. So you'll notice that we dropped a point in here at three on the real axis. Again, you could have also dropped a point in at four on the imaginary axis. You could have completed a right triangle in that manner as well. So once we have this drawn, we can kind of think about the concept using the Pythagorean formula. So we remember this is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b are the lengths of the two kind of shorter sides. We call them legs. And then the C is the hypotenuse, the longest side, okay? So this is the hypotenuse, and that's what we want to figure out. This is C, and again, this is going to represent what? The distance from 3 plus 4i to 0 plus 0i, or the origin. So it's the absolute value of 3 plus 4i. That's what we want to find. So I'm going to go ahead and just say this is the absolute value of 3 plus 4i, and I'm going to square that. So what we need to figure out is A and B. So we know that we could label this as A and this as B, okay? So A is just the measure from here to here. Now, we can do this inside of absolute value bars, but again, because we're squaring the result, it's really not necessary. You're really thinking about what? It's the difference between the imaginary values. So at the top, you're at four, right? This is a four here. And at the bottom, you're at zero. So four minus zero is going to be four. Or again, you could do zero minus four, which is negative four. Either way, when you square it, you're gonna get 16. Right, so I'm just going to go ahead and say this is 4 squared. Then plus, you want to also think about B, which is going to be this horizontal measure here. So the difference between 3 and 0, right? You have a real location here of 3 and a real location here of 0. So you could do 3 minus 0, which is 3, or you could do 0 minus 3, which is negative 3. Again, you don't need absolute value because you're going to be squaring it. 3 squared is 9. Negative 3 squared is 9 is the same either way, right? So I'm just going to put 3 squared here, okay? So we find that... The absolute value of 3 plus 4i, which is what we're trying to find, squared, is equal to 4 squared plus 3 squared, okay? So what I want to do is just take the square root of each side. So take the square root of that side. That's going to cancel this and take the square root of this side. And so 4 squared is 16, 3 squared is 9, 16 plus 9 is 25. You have the principal square root of 25 is equal to the absolute value of 3 plus 4i. And then we end up with 5 is equal to the absolute value of 3 plus 4i, okay? So very, very easy to go through and figure that out, but it was kind of a lengthy process. So we don't want to have to, again, pull out a complex plane each time and go through this to figure out the absolute value of a complex number. 
you got to be thinking like there must be an easier way. And in fact, there is. So just like we derived a distance formula, okay, when we worked with finding the distance between two points on a coordinate plane, we can do the same thing for finding the absolute value of any complex number. So let me erase everything. And first, I just want to rewrite kind of the distance formula that we know. So d, the distance between two points, is equal to the square root of, you have the difference in x value. So x sub 2 minus x sub 1 squared. Then plus, you have the difference in y values. So y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared. Okay. So this is the distance formula that we know. So d in this case would just take the place of the absolute value of some complex number. Okay. So this would be a plus bi. Okay. In this case, it was just 3 plus 4i, but it could be any complex number that you're trying to find the absolute value of. So this is equal to what? The square root of, so when we think about the difference in x values, well, now we don't have x values. We have real values, okay? So because I'm always working with this guy as a point, 0 plus 0i, one of these guys is going to be 0, okay? It's easier to kind of see what's going on if I just put this as 0. So if you have x sub 2 minus 0, or in this case, you could say your real value that you're given, which is one of them is going to be a, and one of them is going to be 0. So really, I could just say it's a minus 0 squared. Okay, you can easily see that in this case, I could put three and say three minus zero squared, or again, I could reverse that and say zero minus three squared. Either way, I'm gonna get the same result because I'm squaring it. So in either case, this is gonna simplify to just a squared. Okay, so a squared. So this value here gets squared. Then plus, for y sub two minus y sub one, again, I don't have y values anymore. I have imaginary values. So now I'm thinking about, okay, well, the difference here, because I have zero as a location of one of the imaginary values, well, I could erase this and just put zero. Okay, I could just put zero. So again, if I think about that, my y sub two, one of those guys, when I think about this in terms of the imaginary values, it's just gonna be b, right? I would have b as one of them, then minus zero as the other, and this is squared. This again simplifies to just b squared. So it's very easy to find the absolute value of a complex number. The absolute value of a plus bi is just going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared. And we found that already. We found that the absolute value of 3 plus 4i was just the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. Okay, let me make that better. Okay, so 3 squared is again 9, 4 squared is 16. It was the absolute value of... 25, which is 16 plus 9, which is 5. Okay. Very, very easy once you get this formula. But I just wanted you to see where it came from. A lot of times, you know, you're working through things, you just get the formula and you don't understand where it came from. So it's kind of worth it to spend the, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to understand where this comes from. That way, if you get in a pinch and you're asked to kind of, you know, explain where it comes from, you're able to do it. Okay. So I have a cleaner version where I've represented this. Again, the absolute value of a plus bi is just equal to the square root of a squared, so the real part squared, plus b squared, okay, the imaginary part squared. All right, let's just go through a few examples real quick. Very easy concept overall. So again, let me just write the formula here. The absolute value of a plus bi is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared, okay? So this guy right here would be equal to what? This is my a, this is my b. So it's the square root of a is negative 5, negative 5 squared is 25, plus 7 is my b, 7 squared is 49. So what's 25 plus 49? Well, that's going to be 74. So this is equal to the square root of 74. Now, 74 is divisible by 2, but it's 37 times 2, and 37 is a prime number. So we can't really simplify this any further. So we just write the square root of 74. All right, let's take a look at another one. Again, let me write the formula. The absolute value of a plus bi is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. Okay, so in this case, I have the absolute value of negative 16 plus 10i. This is equal to the square root of a is negative 16. So if I square that, I would get positive 256. Then plus b here is 10. 10 squared is 100. So this would be the square root of 356. So 356 is 4 times 89. So 4 times 89. So we know 4 is a perfect square. So I could say this is 2 times the square root of 89, right? 2 times square root of 89. And 89 is going to be a prime number, so we can't do anything more with that. All right, so what about the absolute value of negative 3 minus 29i? So again, let me write my formula. 
it's the absolute value of a plus bi is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. So again, this is equal to a here is negative three, negative three squared is nine. So the square root of nine, then plus b here is negative 29. You could write this as plus negative. So negative 29 squared is 841. So if I sum those two, I'm gonna get 850, right, under the square root sign. So 850 is 25 times 34. It's 25 times 34. We know 25 is a perfect square. Square root of 25 is five. So I can say this is five, five times square root of 34. And we know 34 is just 17 times two. So you can't really do anything else with that. All right, for the last one, I gave you one that students kind of struggle with. What if I asked you for the absolute value of nine i? Well, it just so happens that you can still use the formula. If you got the absolute value of nine i, again, the absolute value of a plus b i is equal to the square root of, again, a squared plus b squared. So in this case, a is just zero, right? You can say the absolute value of zero plus nine i, this is the square root of, zero squared is just zero, so forget about it. You would just take your b, which is nine, and square that, so that's 81. Square root of 81 is just nine, okay? Why does that make sense? Well, if you think about this graphically, if I look at 9i on my complex plane, that's right here, okay? So how far away is it from here to here? Well, it's just nine units, right? If I made a line here kind of connecting these two points, you would say that's nine units, right? If I rotated that and you saw it as kind of a horizontal number line, right? If I was measuring from here to here, you could easily see that that distance is nine units. It's the same thing if we're going vertical. Right? So that should make sense to you that the absolute value of 9i is going to be positive 9. In this lesson, we want to talk about the distance and midpoint formulas in the complex plane. So over the course of the last two lessons, we've been working with the complex plane. We've already seen how to plot complex numbers and also how to find the absolute value of a complex number. So now we're going to go to the kind of next topic, and we're going to talk about how to find the distance between two complex numbers on the complex plane. And then later on, we'll talk about the midpoint formula on our complex plane. So I want you to recall that we have a distance formula that we've been using throughout, you could say lower level algebra or whatever algebra course you're in, you should be familiar with this kind of distance formula. Again, we talked about it in this course, it's derived from the Pythagorean formula, right? So the D stands for distance between two points. This is equal to the square root of you have your difference in x value, so x sub two minus x sub one, and then this is squared. Then plus you have your difference in y values, so y sub two minus y sub one, and this is squared, okay? So if we had something like eight comma three and four comma one, we could just label one of these as x sub one, y sub one, and it doesn't matter which one gets labeled as which, and the other as x sub two, y sub two, okay? Just plug into the formula. So for x sub two, you're going to have a four, for x sub one, you're gonna have an eight. For y sub two, you're gonna have a one. And for y sub one, you're gonna have a three, okay? So if we could just kind of crank this out real quick, the distance between these two points, you would basically have what? The square root of, you would have four minus eight, which is negative four. Negative four squared is 16. Then plus, you'd have one minus three. That's going to be negative two. If I square negative two, I would get four, right? So 16 plus four is going to give me 20. So this would be that the distance between these two points is the square root of 20. Now we know that 20 is four times five and four is a perfect square. So I could say this is two times the square root of five, right? If I wanted to simplify that. All right, so let's take a look at an example using complex numbers now. And you're gonna see that the concept is exactly the same, okay? So we're gonna do it using this formula, but we're gonna have some modifications. We just wanna remember a few things. When we work with our complex plane, we don't have x values anymore. The horizontal axis is now labeled as the real axis. And then similarly, we're not looking at y values anymore. The vertical axis is now labeled as the imaginary axis. So we have imaginary values that we're working with, okay? So when we think about a complex number, we have to think about it as a, the real part, plus b, the imaginary part, times i, the imaginary unit. Okay, so this right here is the real part. This is the real part. And this right here is the imaginary part. So this is the imaginary, K 
okay, the imaginary part. All right, so when we look at this kind of formula that's been modified, the distance between two complex numbers, this is equal to the square root of, you see a sub two minus a sub one squared, then plus you see b sub two minus b sub one squared. So this guy right here would be the difference in a values or the difference in real values, okay? And we have the a sub two and the a sub one, that's just notating two different a values. Similarly, we have the difference in imaginary values. And again, we're using b sub two and b sub one to kind of notate the two different ones. So if I look at these two complex numbers, I have z equals three plus nine i, and I have w equals seven plus five i. So this is my a and this is my b, okay? This is my a and this is my b, okay? So I can label one of them as a sub one, b sub one, and the other as a sub two, b sub two, okay? It doesn't matter which one gets labeled as which because we're squaring this guy. So whether it turns out being positive or negative, when you square it, it's gonna be non-negative, okay? So let's just say this is a sub one and this is b sub one, and this is a sub two and this is b sub two. So now we can just plug into the formula Okay, just like we did before. And so for a sub two, I'm gonna have seven. For a sub one, I'm gonna have three. For b sub two, I'm gonna have five. And for b sub one, I'm gonna have nine, okay? So the distance between these two points would be what? The square root of, you have seven minus three, which is four, four squared is 16. Then plus you have five minus nine, which is negative four. Negative four squared is also 16. So 16 plus 16 is 32. Okay, 32, but we know that 32 factors into 16 times two because we just added 16 and 16 to get to that. And we know that 16 is a perfect square. So we could say the distance is equal to the square root of, we could say this is two times 16, 16, if I take the square root of that is four. So I could say the distance is equal to four times the square root of two, okay? So very, very simple, very, very easy. One of the things you want to watch out for, a lot of students mistakenly try to work with I in these formulas that we get. You see that when you're taking the absolute value of a complex number. You see that when you're trying to work with the distance between two complex numbers. I is not involved. A is the real part of a complex number. B is the imaginary part of the complex number. The imaginary unit I is not involved in any of these calculations. All right, so to see this visually, let's look at our complex plane. And you'll notice that I've already kind of gotten things started. I've already pre-drawn the right triangle for us. I plotted three plus nine I, so that's a real location of three and an imaginary location of nine. So go three is to the right and nine units up. That's how I got that. And then I've also plotted seven plus five I, so that's a real location of seven and an imaginary location of five. So seven units to the right, five units up. So that's how I got that. And then I threw in a third point to form the right triangle. So to do that, I used a real location of three and I used an imaginary location of five. So this right here would be three plus five I. You could have also done seven plus nine I if you wanted to, okay? So that could be another way you could draw a right triangle. I did this one because it's a little bit easier to see. Okay, so now that we have the right triangle, we should remember that we have these two shorter sides which are known as legs. Typically we'll say this vertical leg is A, we'll say this horizontal leg is B, and then the hypotenuse, what we're trying to figure out here is C. That's the distance between these two complex numbers, three plus nine I and seven plus five I. So we should know at this point, the Pythagorean formula is what? It's A squared, so this guy here, the measure from here to here squared, plus B squared, again, from here to here squared, is equal to C, the hypotenuse squared. Now, typically when we're working with kind of trying to find a distance, we replace C with D to stand for distance. And we can solve for this. We say D squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. We take the square root of each side and we say D is equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared. Okay, so let's work with it in this format. Let me kind of scooch this up a little bit. And let's just think about why this makes sense. So D, the distance between the two is equal to the square root of, what is A? A is the measure from here to here. So it's the difference in imaginary values, okay? So we see, when we looked at this formula here, we had B sub two minus B sub one. Each B here represents one of the imaginary values. We had an imaginary value of five and an imaginary value of nine. So if I go back, you see that's the case here. You have nine and you have five. It doesn't matter the order you do this in because you're squaring it, the result's gonna be nine negative. So nine minus five is four, or five minus nine is negative four. Either way, when you square it, you get 16. 
So let me just put this in for a, I'm gonna say this is nine minus five, and this is gonna be squared, okay? And again, all this is, is my kind of b sub two minus my b sub one. It's the difference in imaginary values that we saw in our formula. Okay, then plus, what are we gonna have for b? Well, that's gonna be the difference in real values. So in this case, we have three and we have seven. Again, if we go back to the formula, we had a sub two minus a sub one, you have seven minus three, could have also done three minus seven, because again, when you square it, you get the same result. So let's just go ahead and say we have seven minus three, this quantity squared. And you can see from where we have this here, it's the same thing as the formula we had. Again, it's just an application of the Pythagorean formula. Very easy to kind of come up with this. So the distance between these two complex numbers, again, is the square root of, we already know this, this is four and this is four, four squared is 16, four squared is 16. So you get 16 plus 16 is 32. And we know that the square root of 32 is gonna simplify to four times the square root of two. Okay, so the distance is equal to four times the square root of two. So if you wanted to, you can kind of label this and say this is four times square root of two. You can label this B and say this is four. You can also label this and say this is four, right? So you get four, four, and then four times square root of two. All right, so let's take a look at a few more examples. So again, if I have two complex numbers, one is Z and one is W. So we're just gonna go through and label one of these as A sub one and then B sub one. And the other is gonna be A sub two and then B sub two. Again, it doesn't matter what you label as which. I just wanna make sure that you don't involve I. Okay, just make sure you don't do that. That's the common mistake. So the distance is gonna be equal to what? The square root of, if I plug in for A sub two, I'm gonna have a 13. If I plug in for a sub one, I'm going to have an 11. 13 minus 11 is two, so you'd have two squared, and then plus. For b sub two, we have two. For b sub one, we have four. Two minus four is negative two, so you'd have negative two squared, okay, negative two squared. So the distance is equal to the square root of two squared is four, negative two squared is four. So you basically have four plus four, which is eight, okay, eight. And we know that turns into what? So the distance is equal to the square root of, you have four times two under here, square root of four is two. So I could simplify this and say the distance is equal to two times the square root of two. All right, let's take a look at one more of these. Again, a very simple concept overall. So we have Z, which is just equal to negative five and W, which equals 12 plus seven I. So don't freak out if you get this, you might say, okay, well, this is a real number. This is a complex number. Every real number that you work with is also a complex number, right? The real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers. So I can write this as a complex number by putting plus zero i, okay? Very, very easy. So again, I can just label now. I can say this is a sub one and this is b sub one. And I could say this is a sub two and this is b sub two. And then I can just plug into the formula. So the distance is equal to the square root of for a sub two, we would say this is 12. For a sub one, we would say this is negative five. For b sub two, we're gonna say that's seven. And for b sub one, we're gonna say that's zero. So 12 minus a negative five is the same as 12 plus five. That's gonna be 17. So you would have 17 squared, then plus seven minus zero is obviously seven. So you'd have seven squared. So the distance is equal to the square root of, 17 squared is 289 plus seven squared is 49. So if I sum these two amounts together, I get 338. So the distance is equal to the square root of 338. And 338 is two times 169. So I can simplify this further. I can say that the distance is equal to the square root of 169 times two. The square root of 169 is 13. So I can finish this up and say, the distance between these two kind of complex numbers, Z and W would be equal to 13 times the square root of two. All right, so now let's talk about using the midpoint formula with two complex numbers as kind of endpoints of a line segment on the complex plane. So we previously saw that the midpoint formula can basically be used to find the coordinates of the midpoint of a line segment. Again, this is just on the regular coordinate plane we're used to working with. In the real number system, if you have two points that are given, one x sub one, y sub one, and the other x sub two, y sub two, you could just plug into this formula M or capital M you would say is equal to what? It's the average of the X values and then the average of the Y values. Those are your two coordinates, right? And that should make sense because if I'm trying to find the kind of halfway point, I would wanna find the average of the X values and then the halfway point, the average of the Y values, right? So that's what I'm doing. So for this guy, this is X sub one, Y sub one. 
This is X sub two, Y sub two. Again, it doesn't matter the order that you label things. So if I plug this in, the midpoint here would be found at, you would have three plus seven, which is 10. 10 divided by two is five. And then you would have five plus eight, which is 13. 13 divided by two, you could say it's 13 halves, or you could say it's 6.5, either way. So the midpoint of a line segment with these two points as endpoints, three comma five and seven comma eight, would be at five comma 13 halves, or again, you could say five comma 6.5. So again, when we work with complex numbers, it's basically gonna be the same formula with some minor notational adjustments. So a line segment with two endpoints, let's say a sub one, b sub one, and a sub two, b sub two, in the complex plane, we just adjust the formula, right? So this is one of the a values, this is the other, right? You sum them and you divide by two, you're just getting the average. This is one of the imaginary values, this is the other, you sum those, you divide by two, you get the average, okay? So it's the same process. So let's say we have a line segment and it's got endpoints z and w. So z is three minus two i, w is one plus six i. Okay, so all I'm gonna do is label one of these as a sub one and then b sub one, and the other will label as a sub two, b sub two. Okay, so just like we did with the distance formula. So I'm just gonna plug in, so the midpoint is equal to what? You're going to have one plus three, which is four, four divided by two is two, and then you're going to have six minus two, or you could say six plus negative two, that's also four, four divided by two is two, okay? So this guy has a complex number, if I have a real location of two, and I have an imaginary location of two, it's two plus two i. So it's two plus two i. So to visually see this, we can come to the complex plane, we can show this line segment here with endpoints of one plus six i, so that's one endpoint, and another would be three minus two i, again, that's another endpoint. So we're saying that the midpoint, or the point that kind of cuts this line segment in half, where you could say splits it into two equal halves is here, this two plus two i, okay? So we're saying this distance from here to here is equal to this distance from here to here, okay? So basically when we think about this, if I think about where should the real location be, well again, if I think about the total movement along the real axis, well, I'm going from here, right, from one all the way to three, so that's a total of two units in terms of how far I'm moving. So half of two would just be one. So if I start here, I'm just going one unit to kind of the right. If I start here, I would just go one unit to the left. So that gives me a real location of two. And again, another way to think about that is if I just average the real values, I have a real location of three and again, a real location of one. Add those together, three plus one is gonna give me four. Divide by two, I get to two. Okay, so either way you wanna look at that. The other thing to think about would be the imaginary location. So here I have a value of six, and here I have a value of negative two. So that's a total distance of eight units, right? I would go from negative two up to zero, and then from zero up to six. So that's a total value of eight units. Half of eight would be four. So if I started here and went up four units, I'd end up here. Or if I started here and went down four units, I'd end up here. So that should make sense to you as to why this kind of imaginary location would be here at Okay, and again, you can also find this by taking six plus negative two, right? Those two imaginary values, you sum those together, six plus negative two is four, and then just divide by two, four divided by two is two. So again, that's how you get this spot here as the midpoint, two for the real location, plus two for the imaginary location times i, so two plus two i. All right, so let's just look at one more example of this. It's a very, very easy concept. Once you know the formula, you just kind of plug in. So again, the midpoint, I'll put M, capital M, is equal to, you're gonna have the average of the real parts, so A sub one plus A sub two over two. Let me kind of slide this down so it fits on my screen. And then comma, you're gonna have the average of the imaginary parts, so you're gonna have B sub one plus B sub two, again, over two. So that would be your location. So what we're gonna do here is find the midpoint of a line segment with these two endpoints, so Z and W. So for Z, let's just label this seven as A sub one, and let's label this three as B sub one. Again, I wanna be clear, we're not touching this I at all. That's the most common mistake in this section where people try to do stuff with I. We're just working with seven as A, and three, the number that's multiplying I, as B, okay? So this is A sub one, this is B sub one. 
Then down here for W, I'm going to label this 11 as A sub 2. And then we have I by itself. So understand that I could write this as 1I, right? Because 1 times I is still just I. So then this part right here will be my B sub 2, okay? That number 1. So if I just plug into the formula, M is going to be equal to what? Well, A sub 1 is 7 and A sub 2 is 11. So 7 plus 11 is 18. 18 divided by 2 would be 9. So this part would be 9. And then for this part, the imaginary part, we have 3 for B sub 1 and we have 1 for B sub 2. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 divided by 2 is 2. Okay. So this would correspond to a complex number that is 9 for the real part plus 2 for the imaginary part times I. So this would be the complex number that's the midpoint of a line segment with endpoints Z, which is 7 plus 3I, and W, which is 11 plus I. In this lesson, we want to review finding the equation of a circle, and we also want to review how to graph a circle on the coordinate plane. So I know for most of you, you've already taken an intermediate algebra course, and so when you studied conic sections, you talked about circles, you talked about finding the equation of a circle, you talked about graphing circles on the coordinate plane, so this is just a review for you. For others, you might not have ever seen this topic before, and I can assure you that this is a very, very easy topic to learn, and you'll be able to pick it up from just this lesson. So let's just start out by talking about the definition of a circle. So in your textbook, you'll probably read that a circle is just the set of all points in a plane that lie a fixed distance from its center, okay? A fixed distance from its center. So the fixed distance from the center to any point on the circle it has a special name, it's known as a radius, okay? So let's write radius here. We're gonna hear about this throughout our lesson. And generally we denote the radius with the lowercase r. Okay, so when you see the lowercase r, we're talking about a radius, and this is what we're referring to. If you look at the center here, which I've put as h comma k, and we'll talk more about that in a second, and you look at this point here, which I've labeled as x comma y, we'll talk more about that in a second. This distance from the center of the circle to this given point is going to be the radius r. Okay, and it would be the same if I put a point here on the circle and I drew a line from here to here. That distance would be the same as this one that's already drawn. Or if I put a point here and I drew a line from here to here, all of these would be the same distance. Okay, so let me erase this. And let's talk about some other things you'll see with the circle. So generally we denote our center with h comma k. The h is the x value, the k is the y value. So h comma k. All right, in this particular case, we have actual coordinates. The center occurs at negative four comma four, okay? But generically, we would say that this is the center when we're working with a circle, okay? And then a given point could be labeled as x comma y, right? If we don't know the coordinates in advance. In this particular case, what I've labeled as x comma y, we already know this would be one comma four, okay? But we can refer to a point on the circle as just x comma y. So the reason I talk about this is because we're going to use kind of the concept of the distance from the center to a given point to derive an equation for a circle, and this comes from using our distance formula. So let me show you this equation real quick, and then we'll show you how it gets derived. So if we look at this center radius form of a circle, this is also called standard form, you have this x minus h, this quantity squared, then plus this y minus k, this quantity squared, and this equals r, the radius squared. So if you have an equation in this format, it's very easy to graph the circle because you're gonna know the center of the circle, which would occur at h comma k. So you have your h and you have your k. So immediately I can say, okay, this is my center. And you're gonna know your radius, right? It's the r, not the r squared, it's the r. So I would need to take the principal square root of r squared to find the radius r. Now, why don't I want the negative square root? Well, because the radius is a distance and I don't wanna end up with a negative distance. So where does this equation come from? A lot of times we see these equations and they're given to us, and it's really cool to just be able to kind of plug it into your homework, but I want you to understand where it came from. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's revisit our distance formula that we've worked with so much in this course. So we know the distance between any two points is equal to the square root of, we have the x sub two minus x sub one squared, plus the y sub two minus y sub one squared. Okay, so the difference in x value squared plus the difference in y value squared, this is under a square root symbol, okay? So in this particular case, we know what? Let's say we have a given point of x comma y, and we have a center that is h comma k. So these are two points that we know, okay? And we know the distance between a given point in the circle and the center is the radius. So I know that 
the radius would be my d, my distance between these two points. Okay, so I can say r is equal to the square root of, and then I could just kind of plug in for these kind of points. Normally I work with what? I have x sub one, y sub one, and I have x sub two, y sub two that I'm dealing with. Well, in this case, I can just let x comma y take the place of x sub two, y sub two, and I can let h comma k take the place of x sub one, y sub one. So let's just set this up and say that we have x minus h. Okay, I just took this guy minus this guy. So it's still the difference in x values. And then I'm squaring that. And then plus, I would take the difference in y values. So I'm gonna go y minus k. So y minus k. And then this quantity squared. So let me erase all this just so we have some room to work. Okay, so let me scooch this back up. And so all we need to do to get into our center radius form is just square both sides. If I square this side and I square this side, well, we know that this guy right here is gonna cancel with this index here. And so I can just basically remove this and then I have my center radius form, right? I can flip this R squared around because normally it's on the right side of the equation. So I can just say it's X minus H, that quantity squared, plus my Y minus K, that quantity squared, and this equals R squared, okay? So exactly what we saw, on the previous page, right? X minus H, that quantity squared, plus Y minus K, that quantity squared, and this equals the radius squared. So that's where this equation comes from. So one of the first kind of tasks that you encounter in this section, you're gonna be given a center and you're gonna be given a radius, and they're gonna say, write the equation of the circle in center radius form. So all you have to do is just kind of match things up. So again, we have the quantity X minus H squared, then plus we have the quantity y minus k squared. This is equal to the radius squared, okay? So I'm just gonna plug in. I know my center occurs at h comma k. So this guy right here, this four is gonna be my h, and this guy right here, my five is gonna be my k, okay? So I'm just gonna plug in. I'm gonna plug in a four here, and I'm gonna plug in a five there. And then for the radius, it's the square root of seven, so I'm gonna be plugging that in there, okay? So what do we have? We'd have the quantity x minus four squared, then plus the quantity y minus five squared, and this equals, if I take the square root of seven and square it, I just get seven. So this is my center radius form for a circle with a center four comma five and a radius of square root of seven. All right, let's try one more of these and then we'll just kind of move on to something that's a little bit more complicated. So we have a center that occurs at negative 13 comma negative two and a radius that occurs at the square root of 11. So again, let me rewrite our center radius form. This is x minus h, this quantity squared. Then plus you have your y minus k, this quantity squared, and this equals the radius squared. Okay, so again, this is gonna be my h, and this is gonna be my k. Now you have to be careful here because you have a negative 13 and a negative two, okay? So you have to match this up perfectly. If I'm plugging in for h, and h is negative 13, what I have here is minus a negative 13, okay? So minus a negative 13 is plus 13. So I've gotta be careful. So I'm gonna say x plus 13, this quantity squared, okay? A lot of students make the mistake when they have a negative involved, they just plug in kind of, in this case, you'd say I just plug in x minus 13, okay? That would be wrong. So then plus, I'm doing the same thing here. I'm plugging in a negative two. So y minus a negative two is the same thing as y plus two, and this is squared. This equals my radius. I'm gonna plug in the square root of 11 there. So the square root of 11 squared is just 11, okay? So x plus 13, this quantity squared, plus y plus two, this quantity squared, and this equals 11. That's the center radius form for this circle that has a center of negative 13 comma negative two and a radius of square root of 11. All right, so now let's move on and talk about something that's a little bit more complex. So we also have a general form of a circle. Okay, so when it's in general form, generally you have to do a little bit of work. You're gonna use the method known as completing the square that we talked about with quadratic equations, and we're gonna put it back into our standard form or our center radius form. So general form of a circle looks like this. You have x squared plus y squared plus cx plus dy plus e equals zero. And basically this guy can be obtained if we start with our kind of standard form and we expand those two kind of binomials that are squared. Okay, so for example, let's say I start with this guy. So I'm gonna start with this, I'm gonna put it in general form, and then I'm gonna go backwards, and I'm gonna put it back in kind of standard form. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just expand these two right here. So if I do that, then x minus three, that quantity squared, we know that's x squared, 
we know it's minus two times this guy times this guy. So two times three is six, six times x is six x. And then we know it's plus this guy squared. And then we'd have plus, I'm gonna have y plus two that quantity squared, so this guy squared. Then plus two times this guy times this guy, two times two is four, four times y is four y. And then plus, we have this last guy two squared, which is four. This equals nine. Now I can combine some things here. I can write this as x squared, and then minus six x, and then I'm gonna put plus y squared, and then plus four y, and then nine plus four is going to be 13. But before I do that, realize you have a nine here and a nine here. If I subtract nine away from each side of the equation, it would cancel, right? So I can just put plus four equals zero, and that would be my general form, okay? So from this, I can go back to this. So let's say I'm presented with this and I'm asked to kind of put it in standard form. Well, essentially what I wanna do is I wanna complete the square, right? What is completing the square? It's where you create a perfect square trinomial, right? A perfect square trinomial can be factored into a binomial squared, right? That's exactly what we have here. We have a binomial squared and a binomial squared. So we're gonna to need to kind of add a number to this guy to get a binomial squared. We're gonna to need to add a number to this guy to get a binomial squared. But there's some things we need to do to make sure that's legal. So let me scroll down. We'll come back up to this when we're done. So the very first thing, in case you forgot how to complete the square, is to move the constant to the right side. So I'm just gonna subtract four away from each side of the equation. And that's gonna give me x squared minus six x plus y squared plus four y is equal to negative four, okay? That's the first step. The next thing you wanna do is make sure the coefficient of all the square terms. So we have x squared and we have y squared. You wanna make sure this is a one. Now in this case, this is an easier example, so it's already done for us, so we don't have the additional work. But if it wasn't, you would need to divide, right, both sides of the equation by whatever was necessary to kind of clear that. All right, so now what we wanna do is group the x terms together and group the y terms together. That's kind of already done for us, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just wrap them in parentheses. So I'm gonna say this is x squared minus six x. And then I'm just gonna put a blank space here because we're gonna add something to that. And then plus, you're gonna have y squared plus four y. I'm gonna put a blank space because we're gonna add something to that. This equals negative four. All right, so what we wanna do now is kind of the step that everyone forgets. We wanna take one half of the coefficient of the first degree term squared and we wanna add that to each side of the equation, okay? So in this particular case, again, this variable is raised to the first power, this variable is raised to the first power. So I look at the coefficient. This is negative six. What is one half of negative six? A lot of times I say cut it in half. Just divide it by two, that gives you negative three. Once you get that, you wanna square it. So negative three squared would be nine. So I'm gonna add nine here, but to make it legal, I've gotta add nine on the other side of the equation. So I'm gonna add nine over here as well. Then I'm gonna do the same thing over here. If I take four, this coefficient for y to the first power, and I cut it in half, four divided by two is two. If I square two, I get four, so plus four. But again, to make it legal, I've gotta add four on this side as well. Let me erase this, let me kind of scroll down. And so what I end up with is exactly what I started with, right? If I factor this now, I would have x minus three, that quantity squared, then plus, if I factor this, I would have y plus two, that quantity squared, and then negative four plus four is zero, then I just have positive nine, so this equals positive nine. So if I look at this guy right here, I can see it's exactly what I started with. If I go back up, so let me just kind of paste this in so we can kind of compare what we have. So we started with the standard form, x minus three, that quantity squared, plus we have y plus two, that quantity squared, and this equals nine. Then we expanded our binomial, so we got the general form, right? x squared minus six x plus y squared plus four y plus four equals zero. That's general form. And then we went through the process and we completed the square for each, and we ended up with the standard form again, right? So we went from standard form to general form back to standard form. So it can be tedious in some situations, but not really a hard process overall. As long as you understand how to complete the square, it's pretty easy. All right, let's look at another example of this, and then we'll move on and talk about graphing. Okay, so let's suppose you're given this equation here, which is a circle in general form. So let's say you're asked to put it in standard form. Again, you're just gonna go through the process. So the first thing I wanna do is move this guy, this constant to the other side. So let's say we have two x squared plus two y squared minus four x minus 48 y, and this is gonna be equal to, if I subtract 218 away from each side of the equation, I'm just gonna say this is equal to negative 218, okay? 
Then what you want to notice is that the coefficient on x squared and y squared is a 2. Okay, you want that to be a 1. So what we're going to do is divide each side of the equation by 2. So I'm going to divide every part here by 2. And what are we going to get? Well, this is going to cancel. You'll have x squared. Then plus, this is going to cancel. You're going to have y squared. Then minus 4 over 2 is 2, so 2x. Then minus 48 over 2 is 24. So this would be 24y. And this equals negative 218 divided by 2 is going to be negative 109. OK, let me scroll down to get some room going. So what do we want to do now? Now we want to complete the square. So let me group all these x terms together. So I'm going to put this as x squared minus 2x. I'll put a little blank here. And then plus, I'm going to group my y terms together. So y squared minus 24y, put my blank. And this equals negative 109. Let me kind of slide that down just a little bit so we have enough room. OK, so what I want to do is I want to take the coefficient for each variable raised to the first power. So in this case, this guy's raised to the first power, this guy's raised to the first power. So take the coefficient, so I'm going to have negative 2. Let me make that better. So I'm going to have negative 2, and I'm going to have negative 24. I want to cut it in half and then square it. I want to take that value and add it to both sides of the equation. So negative 2, if I cut that in half, so times a half, the 2's cancel and I'm left with negative 1. If I square negative 1, I get 1. So I want to put plus 1 there, okay? But again, to make that legal, I want to add 1 over there. Now, for negative 24, if I cut that in half, if I divide it by 2 or multiply by half, whatever you want to do, that's going to end up giving me a negative 12. If I square negative 12, I get plus 144. And again, I've got to do that over here. I've got to add 144 to make it legal. All right, so let's see what we got now. So this guy right here is going to factor into x minus 1, that quantity squared. And plus, this guy right here is going to factor into y minus 12, that quantity squared. And this will be equal to, if I take 1 and I add it to 144, I get 145. If I have 145 minus 109, I'm going to get 36, right? 36. And essentially, the square root of 36 is 6. So you know the radius is 6 in this case. And you know your center occurs at 1 comma 12, right? So my center is 1 comma 12, and my radius is going to be 6, okay? So looking at this piece of information here, I can get the center, and I can get the radius. If I looked at the original equation, you can't really get information out of it because it's it's got too much going on, right? So when you put it in this format, it makes it easier to grab the center and the radius, and then you can graph stuff pretty quickly. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about graphing circles. This is probably the easiest thing you're going to do in this section. Basically, to graph the circle, if it's in standard form, okay, which we already know how to get to from general form, or if we're just given standard form, if we're lucky, basically, I know the center and I know the radius. So I can just kind of use the definition of a circle and say, if I plot my center, okay, I can use the radius to obtain additional points, right? Because from the center to the additional points, it's a distance of the radius. So starting at the center, I can go up by the radius. Starting at the center, I can go to the right by the radius. Starting at the center, I can go to the left by the radius. And starting at the center, I can go down by the radius. So I can use that to kind of plot four points. And then I can just draw a smooth curve connecting those four points. And I'll have my circle drawn. So to make this a little bit more tedious, and to match something you're probably going to get in your course, I'm going to give you this in general form. We're going to derive the standard form. And then we're going to graph it. Okay? So we have x squared plus y squared plus 2x plus 2y minus 23 equals 0. Let's just kind of blow through this. We already know how to do it. Let's add 23 to both sides of the equation. So I'll have x squared plus y squared plus 2x plus 2y is equal to 23. OK, so at this point, I would check to make sure that the coefficient of the squared variables, so x squared and y squared are 1. And in this case, each one is a 1, right? So we don't have to worry about that step. So now we just group the x's together and group the y's together. So I'll say we have x squared plus 2x plus, I'll put a blank here because I'm going to be adding something in there. So then plus over here, I'm going to have y squared plus 2y plus, again, I'll put a blank there. Let me kind of slide this down because I'm going to run out of room. And I'll say this is equal to 23. Okay, so now to complete the square, I'm looking at the variables that are raised to the first power. So this one and this one. And I want to look at the coefficient. So it's a 2 and a 2. So in each case, it's actually the same number. So that makes it nice and easy. 
So I want to cut the number in half, so divide it by 2 or multiply it by half, whatever you want to do, and then square that. So 2 divided by 2 is 1, 1 squared is 1. So I'm going to add 1 here and here to complete the square. But to make that legal, I've added a total of 2 to the left side, so I can add 1 individually like this, or I can just add a total of 2, right? Either way, it's the same thing. So I know that now I can just factor this. So x squared plus 2x plus 1, that factors into x plus 1 quantity squared. This guy is going to factor into y plus 1 quantity squared, right? Because it's basically the same thing with just a different variable. And then this is equal to 23 plus 2 is 25, okay? So now we can go through and we can figure out what is the center, what is the center, and what is the radius, okay? So I know the radius is the principal square root of this number, so that's going to be 5. So that's pretty easy. For the center, again, it occurs at h comma k. So if I just kind of match this up, it's x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals the radius squared. We already know the radius is 5. But for this guy, if you try to match this up, remember, you have a plus here and a plus here. It is not in the format of minus some number, okay? So what you got to do is make a little adjustment, and I can write this as minus a negative 1, minus a negative 1, and I kind of can't fit that in there, so let me make that a little better. So minus a negative 1, and then I'll put minus a negative 1 over here. So again, you've got to match the format that you're given, okay? So now I have a minus and a minus, a minus and a minus. So what I can do is I can just grab the number negative 1 and negative 1. Okay, so my x value for the center will be negative 1, that's my h. My y value for the center will be negative 1, that's my k. So the center here occurs at negative 1 comma negative 1, the radius is 5. All right, so looking at the graph of this guy, it's already pre-drawn for us to make it a little bit cleaner. Also, I'm a terrible drawer. So I want you to notice that you have the center, which is plotted here. We already know that this occurs at negative 1 comma negative 1. Okay, so this is my center. And we already know that the radius is 5, right? We know that already. So this is 5. So from the center, if I go up by 5, so up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I can make a point. Okay, so that's one point on the circle. And this guy is going to occur at what? It's going to be negative 1 for the x location, and it's going to be 4 for the y location. Then from the center, I can go 5 units to the left. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's another point. This would be at negative 6, comma, negative 1. Then from the center, I could drop by five units. So one, two, three, four, five. So right there, that's going to be at negative one comma negative six. And then lastly, I can go five units to the right from the center. So one, two, three, four, five. So that's a point there. That's going to be at four comma negative one. Okay. So with those four points, I can just kind of draw my circle. And I'm just going to trace over what I already have. Hopefully, I don't mess it up too badly. And you can see that I am terrible at tracing and drawing. But you get the idea of what's going on. That's how you can draw a circle. Again, if you're doing this for homework or for a test, the person grading this just wants to know that you know how to find the center and the radius, that you can display those on the graph, and that you can make a somewhat accurate kind of portrait of what's going on. All right, let's take a look at one more of these. So we have 2x squared plus 2y squared plus 12x plus 4y plus 2 equals 0. Again, I can just subtract 2 away from each side of the equation, and I'll have 2x squared plus 2y squared plus 12x plus 4y is equal to negative 2. Notice here that the coefficient for x squared and y squared is a 2. We need that to be a 1, okay, in each case. So just divide everything by 2, and basically I'll have what? x squared plus y squared plus 6x plus 2y is equal to negative 1. Okay, so from here, now I can just go into the step where I'm going to complete the square. And again, I want to group my x terms together, group my y terms together. So we'll have x squared plus 6x and then plus something. And then plus, you're going to have y squared plus, you have your 2y and then plus something, and this equals negative 1. Okay, so I'm looking at the coefficient for the variables that are raised to the first power. So this x, this variable, is raised to the first power. This y, this variable, is raised to the first power. So the coefficient is a 6 and a 2. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. So cut it in half and square it. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 3 squared is 9. Cut it in half and square it. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 1 squared is 1. So this would factor into x plus 3 quantity squared 
This would factor into y plus one quantity squared. And this equals, again, when I added nine here and I added one here, I've got to add a total of 10 to this side of the equation to make that legal. So I'm gonna put plus 10 here. And so negative one plus 10 is nine. And so now we have this guy in center radius form, okay? So what we wanna do again is match it up because you have this plus sign here and plus sign here, it's gonna throw you off, okay? I know already, because I've solved so many of these problems, the center occurs at negative three comma negative one, and the radius is three. But again, if you're just starting out, write your formula and match it up. So x minus h quantity squared, plus you have y minus k quantity squared, and this equals, you're gonna have your radius squared, okay? So the radius is easy, just take the principal square root of nine, that's gonna be three. So the radius is going to be three, and then this guy right here, again, I'm just gonna write it as minus a negative. So x minus a negative three, so that it matches up with what we have there. So my center is gonna occur at negative three comma. Again, this guy, I'm going to write it as y minus a negative one, okay? So this matches up with that. So negative three comma negative one is going to be the center. Okay, so this is my center. All right, so let's plot negative three comma negative one and then use the radius to get additional points. So here's negative three comma negative one. Again, I'll just label that. It's negative three comma negative one. That's our center. And then my radius is three. So I go up by three, one, two, three, plot this point here, which is negative three comma two. And then you can go to the left by three. So one, two, three. So this is gonna be negative six comma negative one. And then you're gonna go down by three. So this guy right here is going to be negative three comma negative four. And then you're gonna go to the right by three. So this guy right here is going to be zero comma negative one. Okay, so those are your four points. And again, I can just connect them with a smooth curve and I'll just have my circle drawn. All right, so let's wrap up our lesson and talk about just one more commonly occurring scenario that you're gonna get when you're working in the section on circles. So you might be asked to find the center radius form of the equation of a circle, given that you have these kind of endpoints that represent the diameter of the circle. So let's suppose that we have a circle that has a diameter with endpoints negative one comma three, and then five comma negative nine. So again, before I kind of jump in and show how to solve this, let's look at a little graph real quick. So I just took the first graph that we looked at with the center labeled as h comma k, and a given point labeled as x comma y. Again, I know there are real coordinates here, but I'm just labeling this generically so we can get an idea that would work for kind of every scenario. Okay, so we know that the radius is the distance from the center, h comma k, to a given point, we said x comma y. So that's this distance from here to here. So that's r, that's the radius. If I doubled that amount, okay, so if I had a radius over here as well, if I drew kind of in a different color from here to here, two of those guys would be known as the diameter, okay? So the diameter is twice the radius. The diameter is the length of a line that passes through the center and touches two points on the edge of the circle. So if I just think about this as one line, I'm gonna do a final color here. So if I think about these two endpoints and I do one line all the way across, that distance there would be the diameter, okay? So that's what we're thinking about here. Now. If I'm asking you to find the center, and let's say I know this and I know this, well, I need the point exactly in the middle of this line segment. How do we find that? We use the midpoint formula. So I wanna go back here and I wanna use my midpoint formula so I can find the center, right? I need to find the center radius form. So I gotta find the center and I gotta find the radius. So the center, again, I use my mid midpoint formula. So the midpoint formula, it's x sub one plus x sub two over two, right? The average of the x values and then the average of the y values. So y sub one plus y sub two over two, okay? So I can label either as whichever you want, right? We can say this is x sub one, y sub one. We'll say this is x sub two, y sub two. And let's just plug in. So you'd have negative one plus five. That's gonna give me four. Four divided by two is two. So this would be two. And then for y, I would have y sub one, which is three, plus y sub two, which is negative nine. Three plus negative nine is negative six. Negative six divided by two is going to give me negative three. Okay, so this is negative three. So this guy is gonna be the location of my center. So this is my center, okay? So I want you to remember, let me just kind of erase this and I'll, 
put this over here. So I'll say my midpoint, and actually I'm just gonna label it as the center. So my center is going to occur at two comma negative three. And we know our center radius form. It's going to be X minus my H. In this case, H is gonna be two, right? So it's gonna be two, that quantity squared. Then plus, I'm gonna have my Y minus K. In this case, K is negative three. Minus a negative three is plus three, and this is squared. This equals my radius squared. So now what I need to do is figure out the radius. I need to figure out the radius. Now, by definition, I know that the distance from the center to any point on that circle is gonna be the radius. So I can just use my distance formula with one point. I'm just gonna choose this one and the center, and that's gonna give me my radius. I can plug it in and I'll be done. So we've got five comma negative nine, five comma negative nine, and we've got two comma negative three, okay? And again, we can switch up the labeling. We can say this is x sub one, y sub one, and this is x sub two, y sub two. And just so you don't get confused, I'm gonna erase this, right? This has nothing to do with what we're doing now. So let me scroll down. All right, so the distance between these two points, again, from a point on the circle and the center is gonna be my radius. So instead of saying D for distance, I'm gonna say R for radius. This is equal to the square root of the difference in x value. So you have x sub two minus x sub one. So two minus five. So two minus five, that quantity squared, plus the difference in y values. So y sub two, which is negative three, minus y sub one, which is negative nine, minus the negative nine is plus nine, this quantity squared, okay? So two minus five is going to be negative three. Negative three squared is positive nine. So this is nine. Negative three plus nine is six. Six squared is 36. So if I add nine and 36, I get 45. So I get the square root of 45 here. And let me just kind of clean this up a little bit. So I know that 45 is what? It's nine times five. So it's nine times five. Square root of nine is three. So I can say this is three times square root of five. And so this is my radius. So I can plug that in here. So I would have what? I would have three times square root of five, but then this guy is squared, okay? So let me erase all this. So to finish this up, if I square this guy, remember to square each part. Three is gonna be squared, which gives me nine. And the square root of five is gonna be squared, which gives me five. So nine times five is 45. So this becomes my equation of this circle in center radius form. You have x minus two, that quantity squared, plus you have y plus three, that quantity squared, and this equals 45. In this lesson, we wanna review relations and functions. So I know most of you took Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 before joining this course. And essentially, you already know what a relation is and what a function is, right? You have those concepts down. So this is basically a review for you. But it never hurts because functions are something that are so important and used throughout the study of algebra and all your higher level math courses. So a review is not something that's going to really kill you, right? You want to make sure you really understand this topic. So we'll talk about functions here, and then over the course of the next few lessons, we'll talk about function notation, we'll talk about domain and range, and we'll talk about using the vertical line test. All right, so let's start out with the basic definition of a relation, and then we'll kind of move into functions. So a relation is any set of ordered pairs. Now, before I kind of move on from this, let's think about what an ordered pair is used for. Normally, we see ordered pairs when we work with equations with two variables involved, normally x and y. So something simple like x plus y equals three, I can display the solutions for this equation using ordered pairs, right? Let's say x was zero, I would have y equals three, right? So an x value of zero and a y value of three, those guys are related to each other because they represent a solution to this equation. So I could write this as an ordered pair, zero comma three, right? An x value of zero is related to a y value of three. That again, solves this equation. I could also do an x value of one and a y value of two. So I could have an x value of one and a y value of two, right? So on and so forth. I could do two comma one, right? If I wanted to, an x value of two and a y value of one. Now, there's an infinite number of ordered pairs as solutions for this equation. So I'm not gonna continue further beyond this point. But I want you to understand that ordered pairs are really just a nice way to write two pieces of associated information or two pieces of related information. Here, the X and the Y values are associated with each other because they represent two values that when plugged in for this equation are gonna give us a true statement, right? They're solutions for the equation. 
but we could also have some kind of random information. Let's say we had set A here, and set A just contained these kind of four random ordered pairs, okay? So I have three comma five, nine comma six, one comma three, and eight comma seven. So we don't know the association between these numbers. We're not given any type of equation or any type of like back information on this, but this is something you'll see in this section pretty often, just so you can get the concept down of what a relation is. Again, it's just a set of ordered pairs. Something like set B, again, this is equal to, we have three ordered pairs here, one comma negative four, six comma negative seven, and negative four comma four. Now, Ordered pairs don't have to just relate kind of numerical information. It doesn't have to be solutions for equations or it can really be any two pieces of related information kind of put together nicely. Okay, so for C here, what we have is numerical grades and then associated letter grades. So a grade of 38, if you get that on a test, you get an F, right? So 38 is associated with a letter grade of F or it's related to a letter grade of F. 73 with a D, 81 with a C, 95 with an A. Then something like set D, let's say we related kind of people in a group and their pets. So let's say John has a cat, Mary has a dog, James has a bird, Lacey has a hamster. So in each case, the ordered pair is just giving us two pieces of related information. It's wrapped inside of parentheses, it's separated by a comma. So whenever we have a set of ordered pairs, we have a relation. All right, so let's look at a kind of real world situation. We'll set up a little equation. We'll go through some of the kind of vocabulary that's gonna be involved in this section. So we have here that Heather purchases gas from the local station for $5 per gallon, which includes all taxes and fees. So $5 per gallon, okay? So let's set up a little equation and we're gonna use X and Y. And I've already kind of pre-written this stuff for us. So we're gonna let X equal the amount of gas in gallons that she's gonna to choose to purchase. And then y is going to equal the total dollar amount of her purchase. So the equation we end up setting up is y, again, this is the total dollar amount of her purchase, is equal to or the same as 5, the cost per gallon of gas, times x, the amount of gas in gallons she's going to buy. Okay, And you can think about this if I plugged in a 1 here. Well, it's $5 per gallon. She buys 1 gallon. This guy is going to be 5. right? If I plugged in a 2 here... She buys two gallons of gas and multiply it by five, the cost per gallon, I get a Y value of 10, so on and so forth. Now, there's a couple of things that I have related to this. First, I've said that Y is the dependent variable and I've said that X is the independent variable. What do those two terms mean? Y is the dependent variable because it depends on her choice of X, right? The independent variable, okay? So the independent variable is something she chooses, the dependent variable is something that comes as a result of her choice. She chooses how much gas to buy, right? She rolls up to the station and she chooses to buy what? She chooses to buy no gas. She gets upset at the price and says, I can't afford it or I don't like it or whatever. She leaves. She doesn't buy anything, okay? So she chooses in that case to buy zero gallons. She pays zero dollars, okay? If she rolls up to the station and buys one gallon, she pays five dollars, right? I multiply one times five, I get five. Again, I showed you that already. So again, the independent variable here is X is something she chooses, and Y is the dependent variable, it's something that is a result of her choice, okay? Now we also have other names for the independent and dependent variables. For the independent variable, we call it an input. It's something we're gonna plug in. So in this case, again, let's just say she buys three gallons of gas. That's my input, okay? In this case, it's three. And my output is another name for the dependent variable. So I plug in a three, that's my input. I multiply it by five, and then I get 15 as an output. So we would say this is 15, or this is my output, okay? So you'll hear that a lot in this section. Now, in this particular case, I gave you something known as a domain restriction. We're gonna talk about domain and range very shortly. I know most of you already know what a domain is, but again, we'll cover it in a second. I said that X here, the independent variable, has to be greater than or equal to zero. So I put that in there in this particular case because she can't go on and buy a negative amount of gas, okay? When you describe a real world situation, you have to think about these things. If she rolls up to the pump and she decides not to buy anything, that's fine. She could buy zero gallons. She could buy some positive amount up to the point to where her car is full or the station has no more gas, right? Those are the kind of constraints in the real world. But she can't roll up to the station and pump a negative amount of gas, right? She can't siphon gas out or something silly like that. So we put this constraint in here to say that X, the amount of gas in gallons she's going to buy, is going to be greater than or equal to zero. In this example here, I'm going to further constrain X. And I'm going to say that X is going to be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to five. And X is an integer. 
okay? So that means she could roll up to the pump and buy no gas, a gallon, two, three, four, five gallons of gas. Those are her only choices, okay? Just to make it nice and easy so we can end up with a set of these ordered pairs. So we have 0, 0, 1, 5, 2, 10, 3, 15, 4, 20, and 5, 25, right? Each of these represents solutions to this equation. Again, given these two constraints, these are the only possibilities. OK, and you can see that these values are related to each other. Buying zero gallons of gas is related to spending zero dollars. Choosing to buy one gallon of gas is related to spending five dollars. Right. So on and so forth. Now, a cool way to look at this is with a little table. A lot of times you'll kind of set this up with real world information. So if we have gallons of gas here is X amount paid is Y. And again, our ordered pair X comma Y. So we have zero gallons of gas means she pays zero, zero comma zero. Right. Going all the way through this again, if she bought five gallons of gas, she pays twenty five dollars total. It's five comma twenty five as an ordered pair. Now, we're going to revisit that example in just a second so I can give you a definition of a function. But before we do that, I want you to understand what the domain and range represent when we're talking about a relation or a function. OK, so the domain is the set of allowable values for X and the range is a set of allowable or possible values for Y. So previously, when we talked about domain in this course, it's been things that have been restricted, right? Dividing by zero. If you had X in the denominator, you couldn't put an X value of zero there because division by zero was undefined. So as an example here, we have Y equals 2X. And I think about what's possible for X. Is there anything that would restrict me from plugging in something for X? The answer to that is no, right? I can plug in anything for X and multiply it by two. So the domain here would be all real numbers. And because I can plug in anything I want for X, I can make Y as small or as large as I want. So for the domain, I could say that it's all real numbers and I could write it out like this, okay? But that's a little bit lengthy and I don't really like to do that. So I'm just gonna use interval notation and I'm gonna say this is from negative infinity to positive infinity because it just includes all real numbers. And then for the range is going to be the same thing for this guy. So from negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, let's think about this guy right here. So we have y equals the square root of x minus 1. So what would my restriction be here? Think about the fact that you cannot, in the real number system, take the square root of a negative number. Okay, that's not allowed. You can do it with the complex number system. But if we're working in the real number system, which we're doing right now, we're not going to be allowed to take the square root of a negative number. So what I would have to do is I would have to take this radicand here, this x minus 1, and I would have to say this needs to be greater than or equal to zero, okay? I would add one to both sides of this inequality. And so for my domain, my domain, I would basically say that it needs to be greater than or equal to one, okay? So it could be one that could be included. And then anything out to positive infinity, right? So if I plugged in a one there, I'm okay. One minus one is zero. I can take square root of zero, that's fine, it's just zero. And then I could take the square root of any positive number. So if I plugged in a 2, right, 2 minus 1 is 1, square root of 1 is 1, I'm fine. But if I plugged in something like, let's say, 0, 0 minus 1 is negative 1, square root of negative 1, again, in the real number system, that's not possible, okay? So let's erase this and this. So my domain basically is from 1, including 1, out to positive infinity. Real quick as a side note, you might see this in your course. You might see them write it this way. So they might say something like the set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 1. Now, this is set builder notation, okay? And all this means is that x is a real number, and this vertical bar means such that the x that we said was a real number has to be greater than or equal to the number 1, okay? So it's just giving you the conditions. The set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so that's set builder notation. I'm not going to use it here, but you might see it in your book. So now let's think about the range. So what is the range? So if we think about this carefully, again, the smallest value I can plug in for x is going to be a 1. If I plug that in, 1 minus 1 is 0. Square root of 0 is 0. So the range would start at 0. That's the smallest it can be. And then it can be any positive number out to positive infinity. So from 0, including 0, out to positive infinity. OK, so we'll go more into depth on domain and range in the next lesson. We'll go way more into depth on it, actually. But for right now, this is just kind of the basic idea of domain and range. The domain is the set of allowable values for X or basically all your X values. The range is the allowable values for Y or all the Y values for that relation or that function. All right. So kind of revisiting these ordered pairs that came from our Y equals 5X. 
If I asked you for the domain and range for this example, all you would do for the domain is find the X values for the ordered pairs you have. So the domain is just basically one. It's each first component. So each first entry, so the leftmost entry of each, each X value. So I'm highlighting all of those now. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. So that's your domain, right? This set would be zero, one, two, three, four, and then five. Okay, so that's the domain. And then the range is very simple also. It's just the kind of Y values that are involved here. So zero, five, 10, 15, 20, and 25. So for the range, we have zero, five, 10, 15, 20, and 25. Okay, so that's your range. All right, so now that we understand the concept of domain and range, let's talk about the definition of a function. So this is something you really wanna pay attention to. And there's several different definitions that kind of go with this. So I'll read a few of them and you just take the one that you like. So essentially a function is a special type of relation where each X value or member of the domain is associated with only one Y value or member of the range, okay? So all functions are relations, but not all relations are functions. Now, let me read you a few alternative definitions you may hear. So a function is a relation in which for each value of the first component of the ordered pairs, there's exactly one value of the second component. Another definition, a function is a set of ordered pairs in which no first component is repeated. So you'll see this in these examples here. If you have a duplicate first component or a duplicate X value, you're not gonna have a function. Then you might also hear a function is a rule or a correspondence, okay, that assigns exactly one range value, that's a Y value, to each domain value. Again, that's an X value. The definition that I like the most, the definition that always stuck with me is for each X, there's one Y, okay? That's as simple as it can get. For each X, there's one Y. So for each X or member of the domain, there's one Y or member of the range that's gonna be associated with it. So what I did was I took the kind of ordered pairs we were working with from the y equals 5x. And basically, I set up a mapping diagram. So we're showing the association between the members of the domain and the members of the range. And this is very common to see this in this section in your textbook. So an x value of 0 is corresponding to or linked up with or associated with a y value of 0. An x value of 1 is associated with a y value of 5. An X value of two is associated with a Y value of 10. X value of three is associated with a Y value of 15. An X value of four is associated with a Y value of 20. And then an X value of five is associated with a Y value of 25. So this relation, this set of ordered pairs represents a function because for each X value or member of the domain, there's exactly one Y value or member of the range that it's associated with. So this guy is a function. All right, so let's go through and just look at a few examples. And then again, as we move on throughout the next few lessons, we'll start working with this in the format of an equation. It'll be a little bit more challenging, but we'll get through it. So here we have F and F is again, just a set of ordered pairs. So we have two comma six, nine comma one, two comma 13 and eight comma seven. Is this a function? Remember one of the definitions I read to you, you basically find out if you have a duplicate X value, you don't have a function, right? Here you have a two and here you have a two. Well, what's the problem? Two is associated with six, and then two is associated with 13. And you can see that very clearly in the mapping diagram. An X value of two is associated with or linked up with a Y value of six, and also a Y value of 13. So there is no clear association here. If I said, hey, if X is two, what's Y? Your answer could be six or it could be 13. You don't know what to answer. For a function, essentially, if I give you a value for X, if I give you an input, you have to be able to give me a very specific output right? Or a value for Y or a value from the range. So for two, again, it's associated with six and also 13. So this is not a function, right? The fact that nine is associated with one and eight is associated with seven, those are fine. It doesn't violate the definition, but because this fails, the whole thing fails. So we would say this is not a function. Let's look at another one. So we have G here and it equals, again, just a set of ordered pairs, one comma four, negative seven comma three, two comma five and eight comma six. So any duplicate X values, no, right? So you can say that you have a function here. An X value of one is associated with a Y value of four. An X value of negative seven is associated with a Y value of three. An X value of two is associated with a Y value of five. And an X value of eight is associated with a Y value of six. So for each X, there's one Y value that's associated with it. So this is a function. All right, let's take a look at another one. 
This one I'm going to tell you in advance is a little bit tricky. So we have h is equal to, again, we have a set of ordered pairs. So negative 2 comma negative 1, 3 comma 4, 6 comma negative 1, and 9 comma 8. Okay, so some of you would immediately say, okay, you have a duplicate y value here of negative 1, not a function. But you'd be wrong if you said that. We say that for each x value, it's associated with or linked up with or corresponds to one y value. If I said, hey, what is y when x is negative 2? There's a clear answer. It's negative 1. What is y when x equals 6? There's a clear answer. It's negative 1. It doesn't matter that these two x values are linked up to one single y value. That's all right. It doesn't violate the definition of a function, right? The problem comes when one x is linked up to more than one y, but two different x values, or you could say two or more x values, could be linked up to the same y, right? That's fine. So for each x here, there is one y value that's associated with it. Negative 2 is associated with negative 1. 6 is associated with negative 1. 3 is associated with 4. 9 is associated with 8. So this is a function. Let's look at two examples with some non-numerical information. You'll get these also. So what this set is representing, this guy f, it's going to represent takeoff cities, so you're kind of flying somewhere, and destination cities, okay? So the first guy is where you're taking off from. The second guy is where you're kind of landing or your destination. So you have New York, comma, Miami. You have Boise, comma, San Diego. Baton Rouge, comma, Orlando. And Denver, comma, Dallas. So again, I'm just looking for duplicate first components here, right? Duplicate input value. So the idea here is that I input a value for the takeoff city, and I should get an output as the destination city. So I have New York, Boise, Baton Rouge, and Denver. None of those are repeated, right? So this guy's going to be a function. We can see it more clearly with this mapping diagram. Again, the X are the domain. Those are the takeoff cities. The Y are the range. That's going to be the destination cities. A flight from New York is associated with the destination of Miami. A flight from Boise is associated with a destination of San Diego. A flight from Baton Rouge is associated with a destination of Orlando. And a flight from Denver is associated with a destination of Dallas. So each X or member of the domain each takeoff city is associated with one and only one y, or remember the range, or destination city. So we can say this is a function. Let's look at one more problem, and then we'll kind of move on. Again, in the next lesson, we'll start looking at things that are much more complicated. So for g here, again, we're going to have the same thing, takeoff cities and destination cities. So it's equal to, we have this set with Portland, comma, Chicago, Seattle, comma, Houston, Los Angeles, comma, Pensacola, and Los Angeles, comma, Little Rock. So immediately you see the first component here and here. Those are the same. So this violates the definition of a function, right? I'm taking off from Los Angeles, and there's no clear association between my destination city. Am I going to Pensacola? Am I going to Little Rock? You can see this more clearly in the diagram where we show the mapping. Again, from X, the domain, the takeoff cities, to Y, the range, the destination cities. So a flight from Portland lands in Chicago. A flight from Seattle lands in Houston. A flight from Los Angeles lands in Pensacola and Little Rock, okay? So that's where you get the problem. This X value, this member of the domain, Los Angeles, is associated with Pensacola and also Little Rock. So if I take off from Los Angeles, I don't know where I'm going to land. Am I landing in Pensacola? Am I landing in Little Rock? That might be a problem if I'm trying to book a hotel or have somebody pick me up. So this guy is not a function. In this lesson, we want to review domain and range. So in the last lesson, we talked about relations and functions. And we also touched on domain and range, but we didn't quite go as far as we needed to. Essentially, in our course, we're going to come across a lot of different functions. And we need to understand the thought process involved in determining what the domain is and what the range is. So before we kind of get into this, let's start out with an easy example and just recap what we know. So we have f here, and f is a relation, and it's also a function. So we talked about, again, in the last lesson that a relation is any set of ordered pairs. So f here, again, it's equal to, we have four ordered pairs, 3 comma 7, 2 comma 6, 8 comma 1, 4 comma 5. Then we also talked about the fact that a function is a special type of relation where for each x or member of the domain, there's one y or member of the range that's associated with it, or you could say linked up with it or paired with it, whatever kind of word or phrasing you want to use for that. Essentially, with f here, we know that it's a function because an x value of 3 is linked up with just a y value of 7. 
then an x value of 2 is linked up with just a y value of 6, an x value of 8 is linked up with a y value of 1, and then an x value of 4 is linked up with a y value of 5. So for each x value here, or member of the domain, it's linked up with exactly one y value or member of the range. Now, this is a very easy example. We're gonna look at some equations here and that's what we're gonna see kind of moving forward. These examples are just so that we can get the concept of you know relations and functions and then domain and range under our belt. So real quick, what's the domain and what's the range here? Again, the domain of a relation is just the set of allowable x values, okay? And then the range for a relation is the set of kind of y values that you're gonna have. So for this guy f, if I ask for the domain and I say, okay, the x values here are three, two, eight, and four. That's all the possible values because I only have four of them, right? So the domain here, if I just wanna put it inside of a set of curly braces, I would say it's three, two, eight, and four. Okay, so it's a set with four elements. Then the range, okay, the range is going to be very similar. So it's just the y values. So it's seven, six, one, and five. Okay, so seven, six, one, and five. So everything's constrained here because we have four ordered pairs involved. So I just have four x values and four y values. Now, as we move forward in our course, obviously things get more complex. We're gonna get equations that are relations. We're gonna get equations that are functions. And we need to know how to find the domain and the range. So for something like this, we have y equals three x minus four. So most of you know this is a linear equation in two variables, and it's also considered a linear function because for each x value here, we're gonna have one y value. But we'll talk more about how to determine if a relation is a function in kind of an equation format in the next lesson when we look at the vertical line test. Here, we're specifically gonna just focus on domain and range. So for this guy here, if you wanna find the domain, you wanna start by asking yourself a very simple question. Since the domain is the set of allowable values for X, is there anything that I can't plug in there for X? Is there some type of restriction? That's what you wanna ask yourself. Is there something that's not allowed, okay? Something illegal. Well, I'm multiplying x by three, and then the result of that, I'm just subtracting four away from it. And that's what's gonna give me my output or y. So the answer to that is no. I can make x negative, I can make x positive, I can plug in square root of two, I can do whatever I want. So for x there, really it could be any real number to be plugged in, right? So the domain is a set of all real numbers. So the domain is the set of all real numbers. So there's a lot of ways you could write that. I'm going to choose to write this in interval notation because I feel like this is the most convenient way to do it. You might see a variety of different ways to write this in your textbook. You might see set builder notation, which I'll show you in a little while. And you might also see them just put all real numbers inside of some kind of curly braces. As long as you notate that it's all real numbers, it really doesn't matter how you do it. Then for the range, for the range, Let's think about the possible outcomes for y. So I'm plugging in something for x. It's the independent variable. It's the input. It's what I'm choosing. I choose something for x. I multiply by three. I subtract away four. I get a result or an output for y, right? That's the dependent variable. So the range is going to be all real numbers as well because, again, if I can make x as large as I want or as small as I want, then y can be as large as I want or as small as I want, right? If I chose negative one trillion and I plugged it in for X, I can make Y really small, right? And I can make Y even smaller than that by choosing even smaller numbers for X. I can also make Y very big by choosing one trillion, right? Positive one trillion for X. And again, I can go above that if I wanna make Y even larger. So for the range, it's all real numbers as well. So for a negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, now graphically we see this this is the equation y equals 3x minus 4, and this is graph for us already. We'll review how to graph linear functions or linear equations in two variables in a few lessons. For right now, just take the graph as given. And essentially, you can see that the arrows at each end of the line indicate that the line continues in each direction forever. So we can see visually that the domain or the set of all possible x values is gonna be all real numbers. And the same for the range or the set of all possible y values, that's gonna be all real numbers as well. Let's look at one that's a little bit more challenging. So now we have y equals one over x minus four. 
So again, if you wanna find the domain, start with X and just say, is there something I can't do? Well, if you have X in the denominator, we already know from our section on rational expressions, we have a restricted value here because we can't divide by zero, okay? So when a variable's in the denominator, you've gotta think about what would make this denominator zero? So I would set X minus four equal to zero, and I would solve that very simple equation. So add four to each side, this cancels, you get X is equal to four. So essentially the domain here is any real number, okay? Because I can do anything else I want, except for four, right? I can't plug in a four there because I'm dividing by zero, but anything else is fine. So for the domain, for the domain, I could put an interval notation from negative infinity up to, but not including four, and the union width from four, again, not including that, out to positive infinity, okay? So that's one way to write it. This guy right here would probably be faster to write in set builder notation. You might see this in your textbook. So it looks like this. So inside of some set braces, you have X and you say the set of all X. It just means that we have real numbers. And then you see this vertical bar, that means such that and then you'll have your condition, okay? So the condition here is that X does not equal four, okay? So basically the set of all X just means that you have real numbers involved such that that real number, okay, is not equal to four. That's all this is saying. It's just a fancy way to say it. In this case, it's a little bit shorter, but I'm gonna stick with my method. Okay, so for the range, it's a lot more complex to think about. When you look at this graphically, which we'll see in a minute, it's very easy to see. But when you think about this, just by looking at the equation, it can be a little bit tough at first. So I want you to think about the fact that you're gonna get an output for Y based on what you plug in for X. Okay, I have one, which is a fixed value, divided by X minus four, which is not fixed, right? Because X can be changed. So if I divide by larger and larger values here, I'm taking one and I'm dividing it by larger and larger values, Y is going to get smaller and smaller but it's never going to actually get to zero, okay? And the reason for that is, is that if I wanna divide and get a result of zero, I've gotta do zero divided by some non-zero number. This is fixed, it will never be zero, okay? So the result of this, or you could say Y, will never be zero. So automatically I know that Y will not be zero, okay? Because I'd have to have a zero in the numerator and it's fixed at one, okay? So that's not possible. So now you can start thinking about can I make Y really, really big? Can I make Y really, really negative? The answer to that question is yes. I can basically do anything except make it zero. So I could plug in something like five for X. Five minus four is one, one over one is one. So I know that Y would be equal to one if X was equal to five, okay? So if X equals five, Y is one. As I increase X, what happens is again, I'm dividing one by a larger and larger number this Y gets closer and closer to zero. So let's say I said X was 14. Okay, well in this case, Y is gonna be 110, right? Because 14 minus four is 10, you'd have one over 10, so that's 0.1. Again, as I increase X, I'll get closer and closer to zero. Now, if I wanted to make Y really large on the positive scale, then what I'd do is I'd choose a number between five and four, okay? So let's say I chose 4.5, just to give you an example. 4.5 minus four would be 0.5, one divided by 0.5 is equal to one times two, okay? And that equals two. So I'm increasing now. I'm starting with one and I'm going to two. So as I get closer and closer to four without touching four, what happens is I make Y infinitely large. So let's say that I chose a value like, let's say 4.0001, okay? Just to make it interesting. Well, I'm subtracting away four, so I'm gonna end up with one divided by 0 0.0001, and what's that equal to? Well, that's gonna give me 10,000, right, as a result. So you can see how large I made this, and again, I can make this infinitely large. If I just keep getting closer and closer to four without touching it, I could erase this one here and make a lot of zeros. I can keep going out forever and ever and ever, and then put a one at the end. Again, when I subtract away four, I'm left with kind of this part of the number, in my denominator, one divided by that's gonna be really, really large, okay? So I know that Y can't be zero. I know that Y can be infinitely close to zero, and I know Y can be as large as I want. So now let's think about what happens on the negative side of things. Can I get close to zero from the negative side? Meaning, can I get something like 
negative 0.00001 or something like that. And then can I go to negative infinity? Well, the answer to that is yes, right? You're just coming from the other side. So you think about plugging in a three there, three minus four is negative one. One over negative one is negative one, okay? So we know we can do that. As I increase three going towards four, right? Getting very close to four, but not touching it. What happens is I'm gonna make Y infinitely negatively big, okay? So I'm gonna have a really, really small number. Let's say I did something like 3.9 nine, nine, as an example. Well, if I subtract that, what I'm going to get is one over negative point zero zero one. And if I do this, I'm going to end up with negative 1000. Okay. But I can go out further. I can do a nine, a nine, a nine, a nine. I can just keep going and going and going. So I can make Y as big negatively, or you could say a really, really small number. I can do that as far out to negative infinity. Okay. So that's not an issue. And again, I can also get close to zero coming from the other direction if I plug in smaller and smaller numbers for x. Let's say I plug in a negative six here. Well, negative six minus four is negative 10. Y would be equal to what? It would be one over negative 10, which is negative one tenth or negative 0.1. And you can keep decreasing x as much as you want. You'll get as close to zero as you want, but you'll never actually touch it. So from this kind of experimentation that we've done here, we can see that Y just can't be zero. It can be as small as we want. It can be as large as we want. It can be as close to zero as we want, but it just can't ever be zero. So we'll use the same kind of notation. We'll say from negative infinity up to, but not including zero and the union with not including zero out to positive infinity. Again, you can see this in set builder notation, the set of all Y, again, this is just meaning that Y is some real number such that in your condition, y is not equal to zero, okay? So that's your set builder notation. All right, so graphically, this is gonna be a lot easier to see. And I would say that in most cases, you're just gonna graph these things and just kind of observe what the domain is, what the range is. If we look at the x values, again, that's the horizontal axis. Notice that the graph from either direction does not touch an x value of four. This is an x value of four right there. You have this vertical line that's kind of drawn here. It's a dashed line at x equals four. And you see that coming from the left and going to the right, we approach the line, but don't touch it. Coming from the right and going to the left, we approach the line, but don't touch it. This vertical line is known as an asymptote. And we'll talk more about these when we start graphing polynomial functions and rational functions. This is gonna be in the next section of our course. But for now, you can see that the graph of this equation does not ever go where x is four, okay? It does not go where x is four. Again, this is y equals one over x minus four. And the reason for that is if we plug in a four for x, we have division by zero, which is undefined, okay? Now, additionally, you have the same phenomenon that's horizontally occurring at a y value of zero, okay? See where y is zero, that's right there, okay? You have a horizontal dashed line. Again, that's an asymptote you'll see that coming from the left and going to the right, our graph approaches that line, but won't ever touch it. And it's the same thing if we say coming from the right and going to the left, it's gonna approach the line, but not touch it. So again, graphically, we can see that the domain consists of all values except for an X value of four. Okay, you can see horizontally, there's no X value of four on either part of that graph. Then again, vertically, if you look at the Y values, the range here, it's gonna just exclude zero. So all real numbers except for zero. All right, let's look at another example. So here we have Y is equal to the square root of X plus one. So what do we know about square roots? What can't we do? We can't in the real number system take the square root of a negative. So that means when I'm considering here my X or my domain values, what can I do? I can't take the square root of a negative. So that means this radicand here, this x plus one has to be zero or positive. So it has to be non-negative. So I would say that x plus one must be greater than or equal to zero. I would solve this inequality. I'd have find that x has to be greater than or equal to negative one. So my domain here, my domain is from what? It starts at negative one and includes negative one, and it's out to positive infinity. Now, let's think about the range. This one isn't too difficult. 
we think about the fact that if I plugged in a negative one for x, negative one plus one would give me zero. So I know zero is possible because the square root of zero is zero. So for the range, I know that I could get a value of zero. Okay, that would be included. Can I get something larger? Well, yeah, I can just keep making x larger and larger. I can make it infinitely large if I want. And so the y values would increase infinitely, right? It would go out to positive infinity. I can't ever get below zero because if I decrease x below negative one, I get something that has to involve the complex number system and we're only dealing with real numbers now. So I don't want to take the square root of a negative. So my range is kind of constrained to be zero at the smallest and zero is included out to positive infinity. Okay, so the domain again from negative one, including that out to positive infinity and the range from zero out to positive infinity. All right, so this guy, we can see it graphically. So again, we have Y is equal to the square root of X plus one. So you can see that the smallest value, again, when you look at this horizontally, when you look at the X values, this guy is negative one. That's the smallest value this graph takes on. And then it's anything going out to kind of positive infinity. I'll put my arrow there. Let me use this color here. It's a little bit closer. And for the range, although it doesn't seem like it, it's going to keep increasing, right? It's going to keep increasing. So it would also go out to positive infinity. The smallest value on the kind of Y axis is here, right? That's zero. So it starts at zero and goes out to positive infinity. For the X values, it starts at negative one and goes out to positive infinity. So again, the domain is anything from negative one out to positive infinity. The range is from zero to positive infinity. All right, let's look at one more of these and then we'll get into some more complicated examples. So now we have Y equals X squared. So Y equals X squared. So let's think about this again. Is there anything that I'm restricted from when plugging in for X? Well, no, I can plug in anything for X and square it. I can plug in a negative. I can plug in a positive. I can plug in zero. I can plug in square root of two, square root of 10, whatever I want, right? It doesn't matter. So my domain would be all real numbers. My domain would be all real numbers. So from negative infinity to positive infinity, there's no issues. But what about the range? Okay, what about the range? Well, when I square something, I know that the result is what? It's either zero or it's positive. It can't be negative. If I take a negative and I square it, I get a positive. If I square zero, I get zero. Square a positive, I get a positive. So the range, the smallest this guy can be is a zero. And that only happens when I square zero. So the range would be from zero and including zero out to positive infinity. So we can see this again, if I think about the X values and I'm just gonna put these arrows in here. So the X values, I think about the horizontal axis, this guy's gonna continue going this way and this way forever, okay? So this is gonna keep expanding left and right. So my domain values, it's just all real numbers. Anything I wanna choose, I can plug it in for X and I can square it. For the range values, again, what happens is when I square my X, it makes it non-negative. So the smallest value that Y can take on, again, if I look at this guy, let me use a different color because it's not showing up. Y, the smallest it is, is zero. And then it can take on any value larger than zero. So again, the domain consists of all real numbers and the range consists of zero and then anything positive out to positive infinity. All right, so let's look at a typical example you'll see in this section. So in this example, I'm only gonna ask you for the domain. So Y equals, we have two X squared plus nine X minus one over, we have the square root of five X minus three. Now, if we think about just the domain, you have an X here, here, and here. So are there any restrictions in the numerator? If I just gave you y equals 2x squared plus 9x minus 1, is there anything I can't plug in for x there? The answer to that is no, right? I can plug in whatever I want. When I think about the denominator, there's a problem because I have the square root operation. And also in a denominator, I can't divide by zero. So there's two things you really have to consider here. The first thing is that this radicand, 5x minus 3, has to be greater than or equal to zero. And then also we have to have that five X minus three is not gonna be equal to zero. Okay, so those are two different restrictions we have to consider. So for the first one, let's add three to both sides of the inequality. We'll find that five X is greater than or equal to three. Let's divide both sides of the inequality by five. And we're gonna get that X is greater than or equal to three fifths. So at this point, we know that X needs to be greater than or equal to three fifths. 
But also we have to consider this value here that's gonna be restricted. So let's solve this equation. Let's add three to both sides and we'll get that five X is equal to three. Let's divide both sides by five and we're gonna get that X is equal to three fifths. So what we found is that what? We found that X is greater than or equal to three fifths allows us to plug in a three fifths here. Five times three fifths would give me a three. Three minus three is zero. Square root of zero is zero. So that's okay, we can take the square root of zero, right? That's fine, but I can't divide by zero. So what I have to do is take this guy into consideration and remove this kind of non-strict inequality and make it a strict inequality, right? Because three-fifths has to be restricted because it makes the denominator zero. So here, x needs to be strictly greater than three-fifths. So for this one, I'll just put that the domain is gonna be anything larger than three-fifths. So three-fifths is not included out to positive infinity. All right, let's wrap up the lesson with one that's a little bit more tedious. So again, I'm just looking for the domain. So y equals, we have the square root of two x minus three. This is over seven x squared minus 36 x plus five. So again, when I think about my x values involved, we're considering two things here. For one, I have a square root operation involved. So two x minus three, 2x minus 3, which is my radicand, has to be greater than or equal to 0. Then additionally, since this is in the denominator, this 7x squared minus 36x plus 5, it can't be equal to 0. So 7x squared minus 36x plus 5 cannot be 0. Okay, so let's think about this one first, and then we'll consider this one, and then we will kind of merge the two. So for this guy right here, let me add three to both sides. That's gonna cancel. I get two X is greater than or equal to three. I'll divide both sides by two and find that X needs to be greater than or equal to three halves. So X is greater than or equal to three halves. So let me erase this. Let me just write that up there. So again, for this first part, X is greater than or equal to three halves. Now, let us consider this guy right here this is a quadratic equation that we need to solve. Again, the values here that I find that satisfy the equation are gonna make the denominator zero, so they've gotta be restricted. So let's solve this with factoring. This one's pretty easy to use reverse foil for because seven's a prime number. So I'll do seven X and X. And what do I want? Well, I know that this last guy is five here, right? This is five. And five can only come from one. It can come from negative one times negative five, or it can come from positive one times positive five. Now this middle term here is negative, so I know I need a negative one and a negative five. Now what's the order gonna be? Well, we know that you're gonna need a big number here that's negative, so I would put a negative five here and a negative one there. The outer would be negative 35x, the inner would be negative x, negative 35x plus negative x would give me the negative 36x, and negative one times negative five would give me positive five. So this is the correct factorization. So all I need to do now is just set each factor equal to zero. So seven x minus one equals zero, or x minus five equals zero. For this one, let me add five to both sides. I'll get that x is equal to five. So that's one restricted value. So x can't be five. And then for the other one, let me add one to both sides of the equation. I'll get seven X is equal to one. Let me divide both sides by seven. I'll get X is equal to one seventh. So X can't be equal to one seventh. Now, let's think about all these restrictions together and we'll come up with something that's conclusive. Now, we said specifically that X needs to be greater than or equal to three halves. In decimal form, this is 1.5. X can't be one seventh, but one seventh is already less than three halves, right? It's less than 1.5. If I divide one by seven, I'm gonna get about 0.14, okay? Not exactly, but about 0.14. So this guy, I don't even need to list it because it's going to be less than this. And I've already restricted the domain to say it's gotta be greater than or equal to three halves. So what I can say, since five is larger than that, is that the domain, is going to consist of numbers starting with three halves, that would be included, up to but not including five, and then the union with anything larger than five out to positive infinity. In this lesson, we wanna review the vertical line test. So over the course of the last few lessons, we've been reviewing relations and functions along with related topics such as domain and range. 
So at this point, we should fully understand the definition of both a relation and a function, and also how to find the domain and range of a relation. So now we're just gonna go a step further and review the vertical line test. So again, I know most of you took Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 prior to joining this course. And essentially, you already know what the vertical line test is. But in case you've never seen this topic before, the vertical line test is just a visual way to determine if a relation is a function. Now, before we go too far into this, I want to make sure that you understand the concept of a vertical line itself. So with a vertical line, no matter what value you choose for y, x always just equals some number. So the way this equation is set up is it's x equals some real number, let's just call it a. So a could be square root of two, a could be negative a trillion, a could be positive one billion, it could be any real number you want it to be. Essentially, no matter what you choose for y, x just equals a. And a lot of people just say, oh, well, where's y? There's no y involved in this equation. We can use a little trick and say that this is x plus, I can put a zero as the coefficient of y, and then put y, and this equals a. So now I've written it as a linear equation in two variables, and I can put it on my coordinate plane. So this is a way that we can kind of graph this guy and see what it looks like visually. So again, no matter what I choose for y, I'm multiplying it by zero, so it goes away, and x just equals this real number a. So to see an example of this, suppose we're given x equals negative four. The quickest way to graph this is just to go to negative four in the x-axis and draw a vertical line. This is what you're gonna do throughout most of the time that you're graphing these guys. But when you first start out, you might see it in this format just to make it crystal clear what's going on. So again, you might expand it and say x plus zero y equals negative four. You might choose some values for y just to see what's going on. So you might say, let y be negative four, let y be zero, let y be positive four. Well, okay, if I plug in a negative four for y, what's x? Well, zero times negative four is zero, x is negative four. Same thing goes if I plug in a zero for y, zero times zero is zero, x is negative four. And with four as well, zero times four is zero, x is negative four. So the idea here is that x is always negative four, no matter what you choose for y. So this is gonna be important for us to understand when we look at a vertical line, it's always gonna have the same x value, okay? The x value will not change. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a minute. But let's just write these ordered pairs out. So this one's negative four comma negative four. This one's negative four comma zero. And this one's negative four comma four. Okay, so let's go down to the coordinate plane. So here's our graph of x equals negative four. And I've already pre-drawn this stuff just to make it a little quicker. We found some ordered pairs. We said we had negative four comma negative four, which would be right here, right? Four units to the left, four units down. We had negative four comma zero, which would be here, right? Just four units to the left. And we had negative four comma four. So four units left and four units up. So again, no matter what I choose for y, x is always just negative four, okay? And the quick way to do this is just to go to negative four on the x-axis and sketch your vertical line. As another example of this, suppose you got something like x equals seven. Again, just find seven on the x-axis, draw a vertical line. It's really just that simple. Now, the main takeaway from this is that I want you to understand that, again, with a vertical line, this one single x value is always the same. And you can see that it corresponds to an infinite number of y values, so we don't have a function here. But the basis of how this vertical line test is going to work is that if a vertical line intersects the graph of a relation at more than one point, then the relation is not a function. This is because the single x value, again, a vertical line has a single x value, it's going to correspond to more than one y value because you're impacting the graph in more than one location. Now, if this doesn't make sense right away, that's okay. When you see an example, it will. So let's look at y equals 2x minus 3. So this guy is a linear function. I'm just going to tell you in advance, this is a function. And whenever you work with a linear equation in two variables, as long as it's not a vertical line like we just saw, it's going to be a function. Okay. So for each x, there's one y. Now, when we look at this kind of graphically, I can see that no matter where I draw a vertical line, it's only going to impact the graph once. And so for each x, there's one y. And you can go through and just make some vertical lines. And that should be enough. And I'll just put some arrows at each end just for the sake of completeness. But again, if you observe these, look, they only hit the graph once in each case. So here, 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 and here, right? So when you don't have a function, it's going to hit the graph more than once. So this guy is a function. We'll just label this as a function. 
All right, let's look at one that's not a function. So we have x squared plus y squared equals 36. We already talked about circles in our course. We know this is the graph of a circle that has a center, 0, 0, and has a radius that is 6, okay? But essentially what we want to understand here is that visually we can determine this is not a function by graphing this guy, and then we can draw some vertical lines. We'll see that the vertical lines hit this circle in more than one location. And I'll just show you with three lines. Again, you can just do one. As long as one hits the graph in more than lo one location, you know you don't have a function, right? So this guy hits here and here. This guy hits here and here. This guy hits here and here. So let's think about an x value of zero corresponding to a y value of six and negative six. So for that one x value, you've got two associated y values. Again, six and negative six. To think about why this happens, let's take this equation and solve it for y. So we have x squared plus y squared equals 36. How do we solve it for y? Well, if I want to solve for y, I want to subtract x squared away from each side of the equation. I'll have that y squared is equal to negative x squared plus 36. To get y by itself, I'm going to take the square root of each side. But remember, I've got to take plus or minus the square root of the right side. And this is kind of associated here, so I've got to move this down manually. So negative x squared plus 36. I'm going to go plus or minus the square root of this, and I'm going to take the square root of this. And so I'll have y is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative x squared plus 36. So where does my problem come in at? Well, it's from this plus or minus, right? It's from this plus or minus. Because let's say I plug in my zero here for x. We already said it was associated with a y value of 6 and then also negative 6. So if I plug in a zero there, I plug in a zero there. 0 squared is 0, the negative of 0 is 0, so I just have 36. So I'd have the positive square root of 36, which is 6, and the negative square root of 36, which is negative 6. So you can see that this guy right here is what creates the problem. Okay, For that 1x value of 0, you get two associated y values, again, 6 and negative 6, so this guy is not a function. So we'll come back up here and say this is not a function. But again, you can clearly see that from the graph if a vertical line impacts it in more than one place, not a function. All right, let's look at another example. So this guy is going to be a parabola. So y equals, we have the quantity x minus 3 squared plus 2. We're going to work a lot with parabolas in the next section of the course. This is going to be the graph of a quadratic equation, okay? So let me put some arrows here and here. And what do we notice here? We notice that this is a function, right? If I go through and I draw vertical lines, no vertical line is going to impact this guy in more than one spot. Okay, so I'll just do four. You can see that this guy hits it here. Let me put my arrows at each end just to make this complete. Okay, so this guy hits it here, this guy hits it here, and this guy hits it here. Okay, so any vertical line you draw is only going to hit the graph in one location. So this guy is going to be a function, okay? Well, there's something I want you to observe here, and this confuses a lot of students. Remember, we had these problems that we looked at where a single y value was sometimes associated with more than one x value, and we said that that was still a function, right? That was okay. So in other words, I could have a set of ordered pairs where I had 2 comma 5, and then let's say I had 3 comma 5. This is a function. Right, because 2 is associated with 5. So for this x value of 2, I know that y is 5. And 3 is associated with 5. So for this x value of 3, I know that the y value is 5. So this is okay. The same y value can be linked up to more than one x value. It's just that an x value can't be linked up to more than one y value. Okay. So in this particular case, what you'll notice is that with the exception of a y value of 2, okay, this would be a y value of 2, you'd have an x value of 3 there. Every other y value is linked up with more than one x value. And that's because of this squaring operation here, okay? That's what's creating that. If I plugged in something like, let's say 2 for x, 2 minus 3 is negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1, 1 plus 2 is 3. So I would get a y value of 3 is if x was 2, right? But also if x was 4, I would also get a y value of 3. So if I plugged in a 4 there, 4 minus 3 is 1, 1 squared is also 1, 1 plus 2 is going to give me 3 as well. So that's okay, 
it's okay that an x value of two is associated with a y value of three, and also an x value of four is associated with a y value of three. That's fine, it doesn't violate the definition of a function. So I don't want you to get confused. It's a very common mistake. This guy is going to be a function. All right, let's look at another example where we don't have a function. So this is a sideways parabola. We will talk about these later on also. So in this case, you have the quantity y minus three squared is equal to x plus two. So clearly, if I draw vertical lines, they will impact this graph in more than one location. So I'll just draw those two to show you, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. We'll solve this equation for y and see what's going on. But essentially, you can see that an x value of seven is associated with a y value of zero and also a y value of positive six. And then an x value of two is associated with a y value of one and also of five. Okay, so this violates the definition of a function. So this guy is not a function. All right, so to see why this is the case, let's go down to the next page and I'll rewrite this equation. I wanna solve it for y and I wanna think about this for a minute with you. So y minus three quantity squared equals x plus two. How can we solve this for y? Well, what's going on with y? Y is inside of these parentheses here and three is being subtracted away from it and it's being squared. Right? So the first thing I would do is I wanna undo the squaring operation. So let me take the square to this side. But again, I've gotta go plus or minus over here before I take the square to this side, which again was x plus two, okay? So this is gonna cancel with this. So now what I have is y minus three is equal to plus or minus the square root of x plus two. And then if I add three to both sides, I can get rid of this. And I can essentially say that I have y equals plus or minus the square root of x plus two plus three. Now, this is what's gonna give me the problem. Again, if I think about what I saw up here, an x value of seven gave me a y value of zero and then also a y value of six. So if I plugged in a seven there, I can see y. Seven plus two is nine. The principal square root of nine is three. Three plus three is six. Then if I do seven plus two, again, I get nine. The negative square root of that is negative three. Negative three plus three is zero. Okay, so that's how the x value of seven is corresponding to or linked up with or paired with two different y values, right? In this case, it's zero and then also six. So again, this guy is not a function. For the last one, it's a little bit tricky. We have y minus one, this quantity cubed equals x. So far, every time we've seen y wrapped in some parentheses, we haven't had a function, right? So this is one that kind of throws students off. So let me just put some arrows in here real quick and let's think about this for a second. If I went through and drew vertical lines, you can see that none of them would intersect the graph in more than one location, with the exception of you might think that it would hit more than once if you drew it right here, right, where an x value is zero. It's because of the way the graph gets drawn, but if you really look at it, if you had a computer model and you know, you're know you online and you use one of those kind of graphing calculators, you can zoom way in, you can clearly see that this guy right here is doing this, okay? It's not ever stagnant, okay? So this guy, a vertical line, is not going to intersect that graph in more than one location. If I drew a vertical line at x equals zero, it would only impact the graph in one location. It's just the way it's drawn, okay? So I can go through and make some vertical lines, and I'll draw one at x equals zero. I'll just draw one more over here. And again, in each case, this is gonna impact the graph in one place only. Now, to show you this completely, let's solve this for y, and again, we can think about an x value of zero. So let's go down here. So we have y minus one cubed equals x. How am I gonna solve this for y? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the cube root of each side. So this is gonna what? This will cancel with this. And what I'm gonna have is just y minus one, and this will be equal to the cube root of x, and I can add one to both sides of the equation. So what I'm gonna end up with is just y is equal to, I'll have the cube root of x and then plus one. Okay, so let's think about an x value of zero now. If I plugged in a zero there, am I gonna get two different outputs for y? The answer to that is no. The cube root of zero is just zero, y would just be one and one only. So for the given input of zero, the y value is only gonna be one, and that's the one that we really call in a question. If I kind of erase all this and we go back, a lot of times when you look at this graph, 
Again, if you look at an X value of zero, that's where it looks like a vertical line would kind of hit the graph in more than one location. But once you solve it for Y and you plug in for X, you can see that that's not the case, right? An X value of zero just gives you a Y value of positive one and positive one only. So this guy is going to be a function. And I erased my arrow, so let me draw that back in. So once again, this is a function. In this lesson, we want to review function notation. So up to this point in our course, we worked with functions where we used y as the dependent variable and x as the independent variable. So now we want to go a step further and think about another way to kind of notate a function. This notation is known as function notation. So let's begin by looking at a few basic functions. So we have a linear function, y equals 5x minus 7. We have a quadratic function, y equals x squared minus 3x plus 4. And we have the square root function, y equals the square root of 2x minus 1. So at this point, we should know these three relations are functions. If I input something in for the independent variable x, I'm going to get a unique output for the dependent variable y, right? So for each x, there's going to be one y. Now, when we work with functions, you're going to typically see the name of the function as f, g, or h, although other letters could be used. And then what we're going to do is we're going to replace y with a notation such as f of x, g of x, or h of x. So I'm just going to use a different one in each example. So I'm just going to change my y into f of x. And I'm just going to say f of x is equal to 5x minus 7. Okay, so these are the same. I'm just replacing y with f of x. And I want to note here that these parentheses do not mean multiplication. This is read f of x. Okay, it's not f times x. A lot of students get confused on that. For this one, I'm going to replace it with g of x. So instead of y, I'll just say g of x is equal to, we have x squared minus 3x plus 4. And then for this one, I'm going to use h of x. So I'm going to say that h of x is equal to the square root of 2x minus 1. So I don't want this to confuse you. All we did was we replaced the dependent variable in each case with either f of x, g of x, or h of x. So in other words, this function up here on the top, its name is f, and it's a function of x, so we just say f of x, right, instead of y. Here we name our function as g, so we say g of x. Here we name the function as h, so we say h of x, right? We're just saying that the function depends on x. That's what this notation is for. So you might be asking, why would this notation be used? What can we do with it? Well, one immediate use for this is the ability to quickly indicate what we would like to evaluate a function for given a value of x. So you've seen this kind of exercise before where we say evaluate, you know, some equation. In this case, it's y equals 5x minus 7 for a given value of the variable. In this case, we have x equals 2. So we know at this point we just plug in a 2. It's very easy. So y equals 5 times 2 is 10. 10 minus 7 is 3, right? So y equals 3 when x equals 2. But using function notation, we can kind of shorten this process. What we can do is first say that this is f of x is equal to 5x minus 7. So this is my function here. And if I want to ask for the function's value when x is 2, all I'm going to do is put a 2 in for x in these parentheses here. So I would say f of 2. This is the function's value when x is 2. This equals 5 times, I'm going to plug in a 2 for x, then minus 7, and this equals what? 5 times 2 is 10, 10 minus 7 is 3. So f of 2 equals 3 tells me this is the function's value when the independent variable x is going to be 2. Okay, so f of 2 here is 3. So suppose I wanted to change this up and I wanted to plug in a 9 here. What am I asking for? So f of 9 equals what? Well, I'm asking for the function's value when the independent variable x is 9. So again, I'm just plugging in. It's just like if I said for x equals 9. It's the same thing, okay? So I'm going to have 5 times 9 minus 7. 5 times 9 is 45. Then if I subtract away 7, I get 38. So this equals 38. So again, f of 9 equals 38 is telling me that the function's value when the independent variable x is 9 is 38. All right, let's look at an example with our quadratic function. So instead of y, we have g of x now, and this equals x squared minus 3x plus 4. So again, all I did was replace y with g of x. So if I want to find g of negative 2, g of 5, g of a, and g of a plus 1, all I'm doing when you get this type of example, you're just plugging in for the independent variable what you're given inside of those parentheses. So for example, g of negative 2, 
all I would do is plug in a negative 2 everywhere I see an x. So here and here, okay? So I would have negative 2, that quantity is squared. Make sure you wrap it in parentheses because I'm plugging in for x a negative 2. Okay, so the whole thing's got to be squared. Then minus, you've got 3 times negative 2, then plus 4. Okay, so negative 2 squared is 4. Let me just erase this and put 4. Negative 3 times negative 2, we know that's 6, so this is plus 6. And if we go through here, we know 4 plus 4 is 8, 8 plus 6 is 14. So g of negative 2 is going to be 14. All right, so let me just write this off to the side. g of negative 2 is going to be 14. Okay, so again, that's the function's value when the independent variable x is negative 2. Let me erase this and use some highlighting instead. That might be a little cleaner. All right, so let's go to the next one. So now we have g of 5. Again, all I'm doing is if I have g of 5, I'm saying what is the function's value when the independent variable x is 5, okay? So just plug in. You'd have 5 squared, so 5 squared, minus 3 times 5, then plus 4. Again, all I did was I plugged in a 5 there and there. 5 squared is 25, minus 3 times 5, which is 15, and then plus 4, okay? So 25 minus 15 is 10, and then 10 plus 4 is also 14. So we can say g of 5 is 14 as well. All right, so now let's look at one that might confuse you. So what if you get g of a? Okay, g of a. What do I do for that? So g of a, let me write the whole thing. We have what? We have x squared minus 3x plus 4. So what is g of a? Again, what did I do when I had g of 5? I plugged in a 5 for each occurrence of x, my independent variable. Well, if I have a, I'm just going to do the same thing. Okay, don't let this confuse you. Whatever they give you inside the parentheses, plug it in for the independent variable. Okay, so I'm just going to replace this with a, and I'm going to replace this with a, and g of a is just equal to a squared minus 3a plus 4. That's all it is. All right, so let me kind of slide this up, and let's look at the last one. So now we have g of, we have the quantity a plus 1, and this equals 1. Again, just plug in. So I have x squared, I'm going to kind of give myself a little room, then minus 3 times x, give myself a little room, then plus 4. The reason I gave myself some room in each case is because I'm plugging in this a plus 1 for each occurrence of x. So remember, this has got to be squared. So it's going to be the quantity a plus 1 that's getting plugged in for x, and that whole thing is squared. Then minus 3 times x, so x again, this is the quantity a plus 1, and then nothing else to do there. So let's scroll down and let's kind of simplify this. So a plus one, that quantity squared, we know that would be a squared plus two times a times one. Two times one is two times a is just two a. And then plus one squared is one. And then you'd have this basically negative three times each term. So you'd have minus three a and then minus three and then plus four, okay? So this is my g of a plus one. So don't let this get you confused, okay? Very easy, whatever they're giving you inside the parentheses, just plug it in for the independent variable. In this case, it's x, but it could be any situation that you're given, right? Whatever the independent variable is of that function, plug it in. So now I'm gonna simplify. So g of a plus one, I have a squared, nothing to combine with that. I have two a minus three a, that's negative a, so minus a. Then I have one minus three, which is negative two, then plus four, which is positive two. So g of a plus 1 is equal to a squared minus a plus 2. All right, let's take a look at another example. So we have h of x is equal to x minus 1 over x plus 1. So we want to find h of 1, h of negative 1, h of z, and h of z minus 3. So again, in each case, I'm just plugging in, right? So if I want h of 1, you can do this right here. There's enough room. This is equal to 1. Plug in a 1 here and here, okay? And let me use a highlighter because, again, that's a little cleaner. So what am I going to have? I'm going to have 1 minus 1, which is 0, over 1 plus 1, which is 2. 0 over any non-zero number is 0. So h of 1 is going to be 0, okay? And I can leave that up here. All right, what about h of negative 1? Well, most of you see that you're going to have a problem there, right? Negative 1 is restricted from the domain because if you plug in a negative 1 for x there, you get negative 1 plus 1, that's 0. If you have 0 in the denominator, you have a problem, right? It's undefined. So this guy is restricted from the domain. We could say h of negative 1 is undefined. Okay. Now let's talk about h of z. And again, don't get confused when they give you another kind of letter 
to plug in because it's the same thing. If I had h of 1, I plugged in a 1. If I had h of negative 1, I plugged in a negative 1. If I have h of z, I just plug in a z. So h of z is equal to what? It's z minus 1 instead of x minus 1 over z plus 1. Okay, that's all it is. And then h of z minus 3, let's kind of scroll down and get some room. So h of z minus 3 is going to be equal to what? Again, to rewrite this, I know it's cut off from the screen. It's x minus 1 over x plus 1. So just plug in for x. So I'm going to plug in a z minus 3. So I would have z minus 3, and then we would have minus 1. And then again, I'm going to have z minus 3 and then plus 1. So z minus 3 and then plus 1. Okay. So z minus 3 minus 1, again, you can just drop the parentheses. I just did that to show you that I'm plugging in. Negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4, so you can just put z minus 4 in the numerator. In the denominator, negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2, so let's put z minus 2. And let me make the z a little clearer because it looks like a 2, so let me make that crystal clear. So we end up with h of z, and let me make the z a little cleaner. Again, it looks like a 2. So h of z minus 3 is equal to z minus 4 over z minus 2. All right, so let's wrap up the lesson and talk about something that you might see in your course. So sometimes you're going to see functions in what is known as implicit form, okay? This means the function is not solved for the dependent variable y. So when this occurs, we're going to first solve the equation for y, and then we can just replace y with f of x or g of x or h of x or whatever you're using, okay? So it's just an extra step. So let's say we had something like x squared plus 2y equals 12. The first thing I would do before I tackle any of these kind of examples, I would need to solve it for y. So I want this guy by itself on one side of the equation. So we know the first thing would be to isolate the 2y, okay, the variable term with y involved. So let me kind of do this down here. I would have x squared plus 2y equals 12. Let me subtract x squared away from each side of the equation. And we know that this part right here is just going to cancel. So we're going to have that 2y is equal to negative x squared and then plus 12. Let me scroll down a little bit, and we'll come back up in a minute. All right, so again, we're trying to solve for y. So what we're doing here is we're multiplying y by 2. So to get y by itself, I can just divide both sides of the equation by 2. And we know that this would cancel with this. I would have y is equal to, you'd have negative x squared over 2, and then plus 12 over 2 is 6. So this is my function solved for y, okay? y equals negative x squared over 2 plus 6. Let's erase everything and copy this. So let me just paste this in right here. And I'm just going to put a visible border here. So we started with x squared plus 2y equals 12. And I can erase all this now. We solved it for y. We get y equals negative x squared over 2 plus 6. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to change y into f of x, okay? So I'm just swapping this out and saying this is f of x is going to be equal to negative x squared over 2 plus 6. So that's all you do when this guy is in implicit form. Okay, just solve it for y, and then you can replace y with f of x, g of x, h of x, whatever you're working with. So now we can do the same process as we used in the previous examples. If we want to find f of negative 1, well, then I just plug in a negative 1 for x, and I evaluate. So f of negative 1 is equal to, I have the negative of, you're plugging in a negative 1 for x. Now, be careful here because whatever x is, it's being squared. So I want to wrap my negative 1 inside of parentheses, and I want to square that. And this is over 2 and then plus 6. So negative 1, that quantity squared, the negative and the 1, would be positive 1. So I can erase this and just put 1. Pay close attention because you still have the negative out in front. So really what I have here is negative 1 half plus 6. So let me get a common denominator going. I'm just going to multiply this by 2 over 2. This would be 12 halves. Okay, this is 12 halves. So 12 minus 1 is 11. So basically, this is going to be 11 halves. Okay, so we can say f of negative 1, or the value of this function when the independent variable x is negative 1, is going to be 11 halves. Okay, so let's erase this, and we'll move on to the next one. So now we have f of 8. Okay, so let me write my function f of, and I'm just going to put 8 in this place. This equals negative x squared over 2 plus 6. And again, whatever I have for x, I'm just going to put parentheses around there, just leave a blank, and just plug this in. So I want an 8 plugged in for where x was. 
And so I have eight squared, right? And the negative's out in front, okay? So I'm not squaring that negative. If it's inside the parentheses, I'm gonna square it. If it's outside, I'm not gonna square it. You can really think about it like this. I have the negative of eight squared. So eight squared is 64. So basically you have negative 64 divided by two, which is negative 32. So we get negative 32 plus six, which would give me a final value of negative 26, okay? So again, f of eight is negative 26, or you can say the function's value when the independent variable x is eight is gonna be negative 26. All right, let's erase this. Now we have f of q, so f of q is equal to what? Again, wherever x is, just plug in the q. It doesn't matter that it's a different letter, okay? You're just replacing x with whatever's inside of parentheses. So you're gonna have negative of q squared over two plus six. So that one's really, really simple. All right, let's look at the last one. All right, so we're gonna have f of q minus one. So again, let me start by writing f of, and I'm just gonna put a blank here instead of x because I have to fill it in with this. This is equal to, we have the negative of x squared over two and then plus six. Okay, so inside the parentheses, again, I'm gonna use q minus one. And you have to be careful here because you gotta plug the q minus one in for x and that whole quantity is being squared. So let me scroll down. We don't need any of this information anymore. So what I'm gonna have is f of q minus one is equal to, I have the negative of, inside of parentheses, I'm gonna put q minus one, this quantity, and this guy is being squared, okay? So remember, you have to expand this. You can't just say it's q squared minus one squared. That's a big mistake, okay? Then this is over two, and then we have plus six over here. All right, so let's scroll down a little bit. And the first thing I'm gonna do is just kind of expand this. So I already know how to do the special products formula on that. I would have q squared, right? The first one squared, then minus, right? Because we have a minus involved. Two times the first term times the second term, Two times one is two, two times Q is just two Q, okay? And then we would have plus the last term, which is one squared. One squared is obviously just one, okay? So you have to make sure here that you pay close attention to what you have. So let me kind of slide this out of the way for a second. We have F of Q, let me make that better. Again, F of Q minus one is equal to the negative of this guy, okay? This is what's going to be replacing this right here, but you have to make sure you take the negative of it. It's very important that you don't make a sign mistake. So the negative is outside of the parentheses, and then you have q squared minus two q plus one inside the parentheses. This is all over two, and then we have plus six over here. All right, so let's scroll down and get a little bit more room going. So what we wanna do now is drop our parentheses and distribute the negative to each term inside the parentheses. So I'm going to have f of q minus one is equal to, if I make each term here into its opposite, you'd have negative q squared, then you'd have plus two q, and then you'd have minus one, right? So the negative of q squared is negative two squared, the negative of negative two q is plus two q, and the negative of one is just negative one. Okay, then this is over two, and then we have plus six out here. So I'm not done here because I could get a common denominator going. So I can multiply this by two over two, okay? And what I'd have is f of q minus one is equal to, you'd have your negative q squared, you're not gonna be able to do anything with that. Then plus your two q, you can't do anything with that. Then you have minus one, but look over here. Now you're gonna have 12 over two here. So I have a common denominator, so I can just do plus 12 over here on the numerator. And then let me kind of scroll down. This is going to be over the common denominator of two, okay? So what I can do now is just kind of give a simplified answer where negative one plus 12 is going to give me positive 11. And I can officially say that f of q minus one, where again, the function's value when the independent variable x is q minus one is going to be negative q squared plus two q plus 11. And again, this is all over two. In this lesson, we want to review graphing linear functions. So most of you already know how to graph a linear equation in two variables. This will pretty much be a review for the majority of you. But in case you've never seen this topic before, it's something that's very easy and you can just pick it up from the lesson today. So let's start out with just a basic definition of a linear equation in two variables. We basically have two variables involved. Typically we use X and Y. So we have AX plus BY equals C, where A, B, and C are gonna be real numbers. And we can say that A and B, the coefficients for X and Y, can't both be zero at the same time. Now, 
When we work with a linear equation in two variables, as long as we don't have a vertical line, which we'll talk about later on in today's lesson, you have a function. So for each x, you're going to have one unique y. Okay, so we can call them linear functions. We could say we're graphing linear functions or we're graphing linear equations in two variables. It's the same thing. And I could replace this f of x with just y, right? I could say y is equal to, in this case, a times x and then plus b, okay? So if this guy is solved for y, we can replace y with f of x or g of x or h of x or whatever you want to use if you're writing this in function notation. All right, so how do we sketch the graph of a linear function? Well, right now we have f of x equals 2x minus 5. And essentially, the quickest way to do this is to solve the equation for y, which in this case it actually is, right? I could replace this f of x with y equals 2x minus 5. So you solve it for y, and then you're going to have it in something known as slope-intercept form. You can plot the y-intercept, and you can get additional points using the slope of the line. Now, because it's not typically taught like that in the beginning, I'm going to go through kind of the earlier steps, kind of the more tedious methods that you use to do this. So let's start out by just making a table of values. And then towards the end of the lesson, I'll show you this kind of quicker technique. It's something that you pretty much use after you get out of this section because it's the fastest way to kind of accomplish this task. So when you first start out, you might be told to make a table of values. So in other words, I would choose a value for x and solve for y or choose something for y and solve for x. The problem with using this method is you have to be able to kind of choose these smaller integers, something that's going to fit on the coordinate plane that you can draw yourself, right? So you want smaller integers. You want to make sure they're integers. You don't want to get fractions or decimals, things that are really hard to kind of put into a graph. So what I'm going to do is I've already kind of pre-chosen some points that are going to work well for us. And additionally, if it's solved for Y, I can just plug things in for X and see what I'm going to get for y. So if I choose, let's say, values for x of negative 2, let's say 0 and 5, I'm just going to plug in for x and see what I get. So let's start out with an x value of negative 2. So I can notate this by saying f of negative 2. That's just the function's value when x is negative 2. This equals what? It's 2 times negative 2 and then minus 5. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. Negative 4 minus 5 is negative 9. So f of negative 2 is equal to negative 9. So basically, we have an x value of negative 2 and an f of x value or a y value of negative 9. So x comma y would just say this is negative 2 comma negative 9. So this is going to be a point on the line. Then we have an x value of 0. So I want f of 0. So what's that going to give me? So let's plug in a 0 here. And what are we going to get? Well, 2 times 0 is just 0. So I can just kind of line that out and say, okay, we just have negative 5. So if x is 0, y is negative 5. So we can say 0 comma negative 5. That's my x comma y. And the last one I want to check is an x value of 5. So I want f of 5. So let's see what that gives me. So 2 times 5 is 10. 10 minus 5 is 5. So if x is 5, y is going to be 5 as well. Okay. So this gives us three ordered pairs that we can kind of plot on the coordinate plane. And then once we've plotted those, you draw a straight line through them. And you put arrows at each end to indicate the line is going to continue forever in each direction. The main idea here, when you use this kind of table of values method, you only need two points to make a line, right? But a third one is usually something you want to do just to get a check, just to guard against any errors that you might make. All right, so I've kind of pre-drawn everything just to make it a little quicker. So again, we had negative 2 comma negative 9. And on my coordinate plane, if I go 2 units to the left, 9 units down, that's here. I had 0 comma negative 5 which is starting at the origin, I just dropped five units, so that's right there. And then I also had five comma five. Okay, so at the origin, I go five units to the right and five units up, so that's right there. You can label your points if you want. So we can say this is five comma five. We can say this is zero comma negative five. And over here, I'll label this one to the left. I'll say this is negative two comma negative nine, okay? Now what you would do is, you would make sure that those three points line up, right? The reason you do a third point as a check is, let's say you get a point somewhere over here. Well, you know that you wouldn't have a line that does that, right? That doesn't make any sense. So that third point is guarding against errors for you. And believe me, everybody makes errors when they're doing math, right? There's a lot of silly mistakes that just happen because you might not be paying attention or you might have not be completely focused at the time. Lots of things can happen. So it's good to have three points, again, to guard against errors. So provided these things line up, which in this case they do, you just sketch a line through the points and you put arrows at each end and you're done, right? It's a very simple process. All right, so let's just trace over this. 
And I'm not a good drawer or a good tracer, but I do the best I can. So you can label this. We'll say this is f of x is equal to 2x minus 5. Okay, let me make that a little bit better. We'll just kind of label it over here. Again, f of x, or you could say y if you wanted to, equals 2x minus 5. Okay, so that's the graph of that line. Now, let's talk about intercepts, x-intercepts, y-intercepts. These are concepts that, again, you probably know from your elementary or intermediate algebra courses. Essentially, the intercepts are the kind of spots on the graph where you intersect the axis, right? It could be the x-axis, that's going to be the x-intercept, or the y-axis, that's going to be the y-intercept. So on the next page, I've kind of pre-drawn these in for you. So essentially what you'll see is that the x-intercept, again, if I look at the x-axis, where do I hit the x-axis? Well, I hit right here, okay, right there. So the coordinate is 2.5 comma 0, okay, and I'll talk more about this in a second. For the y-intercept, again, I'm thinking about the y-axis. So for this guy, where am I going to hit? Well, I'm going to impact. I'm going to impact right there, okay? Now, I want you to notice something, and this is very important, something you definitely need to know. When you look at the x-intercept, where is y in terms of its coordinate when you're on the x-axis? Well, it's always going to be a zero, right? If I think about my y values, if I'm on the x-axis, basically I'm, I'm here or I'm here or I'm here, my y value is always zero. So to find the x-intercept, all I need to do is plug in a zero for y and solve for x. So in the equation we had was y, or you could say f of x, so y equals 2x minus 5, plug in a 0 for y, plug in a 0 for y, and solve for x. So add 5 to both sides of the equation. You get that 5 is equal to 2x, divide both sides by 2, and you find that 5 halves is equal to x. And again, that's just my x-coordinate when y is 0 or where it's going to impact the x-axis. So that's my x-intercept. Again, that's right here. 2.5 is the same thing as 5 halves in decimal form, and then comma 0. Okay, so 2.5 comma 0 or 5 halves comma 0 that's the x-intercept. Now, similarly, let me just erase this. If I want to find the y-intercept, think about what happens when you're on the y-axis. The x value or the x coordinate is always going to be zero, right? Because I'm here or I'm here or I'm here or I'm here, right? I'm not moving at all from the origin horizontally. I'm just moving vertically, right? Somewhere on the y-axis is where I am. So what happens is I can solve my equation for y, once I plug in a 0 for x, that'll give me my y-intercept. So let me erase this, and we'll say again we had y was equal to what? It was 2x minus 5, and what I would do is plug a 0 in there, 2 times 0 is 0, I'm just left with negative 5, right? So if x is 0, y is negative 5, so that's my y-intercept. Now, the good thing about kind of the equations we work with, it makes it quicker if you have it solved for y. If you have y equals 2x minus 5, You'll notice that this part right here gave me the y-coordinate of the y-intercept. That is not a coincidence, okay? That's always going to be the case because when it's solved for y, when y is by itself on one side, what happens is you have something times x and then plus some value here. In this case, it's plus negative 5. Well, plugging in something for x here of 0, okay, makes this go away, and I'm just left with this, right? So that gives me my y-intercept every time. Later on, we're going to talk about y equals mx plus b, which is the slope-intercept form of the line. This is the fastest way to graph a line because we'll immediately know the y-intercept, which is one point on the line, and we can generate additional points in that line using our slope. Okay, but we'll get to that later on. All right, let me show you something known as the intercept method. This is something you would see in your textbook. Typically in Algebra 1 or Algebra 2, as you get further along in Algebra, in a college algebra, you get into something like pre-calculus, they won't spend a whole lot of time on this method because, again, it's much faster just to use the slope-intercept form of the line to sketch the graph. But the intercept method just basically relies on you finding the x and the y-intercept as points, a third one to guard against errors if you want to check, but you really only need two points to make a line. So in other words, I would plug in a 0 for x, and I would plug in a 0 for y, so I would find the x and the y-intercept. That gives me two points. Again, if I don't want a third point as a check, I'm pretty much good to go, right? I can graph my line. So let's go ahead and do this real quick. We have y equals x minus 4. Again, I just replace f of x with y. And if I want to find out what is the function's value when x is 0, again, what I'm going to do here is just plug in a 0 for x. So it's just like if I had f of 0, and this equals what? 0 minus 4, which is negative 4. So if x is 0, y is negative 4, so we have 0 comma negative 4, okay? 
me erase that. And then what about if y is zero? So basically this guy right here is zero. Let me just erase this and I'll just kind of do this over here. Let's replace f of x with y to make it a little, little bit easier for you. So y equals x minus four. Replace y or again f of x with zero. What do we get? We'll just add four to both sides of the equation. You're gonna find that x is equal to four, okay? So this guy's four, so we would have four comma zero. So you can get a third point as a check. Again, I always recommend this because you might make some mistake. So let's go ahead and say that we wanna find the value of y when x is just two, okay? So f of two is what we're trying to find. So we'd have two minus four, which equals negative two. So we would basically have negative two here for y. So two comma negative two is our ordered pair. Just gonna copy those. Let's go to the coordinate plane. All right, so again, I've pre-drawn this to make it a little faster. So those are our three ordered pairs. So zero comma negative four, again, the x value is zero here. So what does that tell me? That's my y-intercept, right? That's where we're gonna cross the y-axis. So from the origin, just drop four, that's right there. That's gonna be zero comma negative four. And let me make that a little better. And again, notice how that's where we're crossing the y-axis, okay? That's the y-intercept. Then you have four comma zero. So that's gonna be up here, right? Go four units to the right, you don't move it all vertically. So this is four comma zero. Let me make that better. And again, this is my x-intercept because y is zero, right? So this guy is where we cross the x-axis. All right, so the last point is just for a check. So we have two comma negative two. So two units to the right, two units down. So that's right there. This is my two comma negative two, okay? So I've already sketched the line that goes through these three points. Again, just make sure it lines up and it's straight. If you get a point somewhere over here and you have these other two points there, you know, it doesn't make sense. It's not going to be a line. So then you know you made an error. You've got to go back and kind of recalibrate some things. All right, so let's go ahead and just sketch the line. Okay, and again, you want to put arrows at each end. And then a lot of times people like to label their line. So let me just kind of draw an arrow here and say this is the graph of f of x is equal to, again, this was x minus 4. All right, so as I alluded to, using a table of values is fine when you get started but it's very slow and it's very inefficient. You've got to go through and generate all these points. It's kind of a waste of time, to be honest with you. Once you learn kind of how to put an equation in slope-intercept form, it's the preferred way to graph a line, okay? So basically, slope-intercept form is like this. We have y is equal to m the slope times x plus b the y-intercept. So this guy's the slope, and the y-intercept will occur at 0, comma b. Okay, again, if I plug in a zero for X, that's how I find my Y intercept, this is gone, I'm just left with Y equals B. Okay, so that's why that works. Now, the reason we have M as slope, we'll talk about over the next two lessons, we're gonna talk about slope in general in the next lesson. And the lesson after that, we're gonna talk about equations of lines. So we'll talk about the standard form of the line, we'll talk about slope intercept form, we'll talk about point slope form. I'll show you where all this stuff comes from. But for right now, we just need to know the basics and that is that the coefficient of x is the slope, and this b right here is our y-intercept. All right, so what is the slope of a line? Well, again, we're going to go way more into detail on this in the next lesson, but slope is basically the ratio of the vertical change, which we call the rise, to the horizontal change, which we call the run. So let's say we had f of x equals 3 fifths x minus 2, or again, we can write y equals 3 fifths x minus 2. It makes no difference if you use this function notation or you use y. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. So the coefficient of x is my slope, and my y-intercept, again, is this guy over here. So it's this guy over here. So y equals mx plus b. This guy is my m, 3 fifths. My b, my y-coordinate for the y-intercept, is negative 2. So all you need to do is plot the y-intercept first. So the y-intercept occurs at 0, comma negative 2. So let's plot that guy. So from the origin, I'm just gonna drop down two. So that's gonna be right there. That's my zero comma negative two. And I'm gonna use my slope to get additional points. So slope is rise, it's rise over run, okay? So if this is three fifths, what this means is that my rise is telling me how much I move vertically to get to the next point. My run is telling me how much I move horizontally to get to the next point. So a rise of three tells me to move vertically three units. So go up one, two, three. A run of five tells me to go to the right by five. So one, two, three, four, five. So that would be the next point on the line. So you would have five comma one. Okay, so that's an ordered pair. And then you can do this backwards if you want. 
So I can also say this is negative three over negative five because negative over negative is positive. Now, I want you to think about this. When you think about rise or vertical movement, a positive means you're increasing, so you're going up, right? On the y-axis, we increase as we go up. A negative is gonna mean we're gonna go down, right? We decrease on the y-axis as we go down. So if I have a negative three, a rise of negative three is gonna tell me to decrease by three units or go down three. So one, two, three. Then a run of negative five, again, with the x-axis, you go to the right, you're increasing. You go to the left, you're decreasing. So what I wanna do now from here is go to the left five units because I have a negative five. So I wanna go one, two, three, four, five. And so this would be a point on that line. So this would be negative five comma negative five. So negative five comma negative five. And you can check these points to make sure that they work. We know zero comma negative two would work because if you plug in a zero for X, you get negative two for Y. But let's check these other ones. So five comma one, does that work? Well, if I plugged in, let me kind of do this down here. If I had y equals three fifths times, I plug in a five for x, would I get a one for y? Well, these cancel. Three minus two is one, so that one's good to go. Let's check the other one. So again, three fifths times x minus two. The other one was negative five comma negative five. So if I plugged in a negative five here, what would happen? So this guy would cancel with this guy, but it would be negative, right? So I'd end up with a negative three. So you'd have negative three minus two, which would give you negative five. So that one's good to go as well. So look how quickly we found kind of three ordered pairs. We're basically good to go now. And so we can draw a line connecting these points. Okay, let me just put arrows at each end. So that would be my line, right? And again, I can label it if I want. I can say this is f of x is equal to three fifths x minus two. OK, look how much quicker that is versus generating a table of values. And a lot of times it's not solved for y. So it's kind of hard to figure out what's going to be an integer answer and what's not. With this, you have your y intercept and you can plot additional points using the slope. Again, this kind of concept of rise over run. OK, let's look at another one of these. So we have f of x equals negative four thirds x plus one. Again, if you don't like the f of x, you can say y equals negative four thirds x plus one. And again, when it's in this format, we know y equals mx plus b. m is the slope, it's the coefficient of x. So it's negative four thirds. b is the y coordinate for the y-intercept. So it's gonna occur at zero comma one, okay? So let's plot the y-intercept first. Zero comma one is gonna be right there. And let me use a different color because that doesn't show up very well. So I can label that if you want, it's zero comma one. And then you get additional points using your slope. So m the slope is equal to negative four thirds. And again, this is my rise over my run, okay? So my rise is negative four. Again, if I'm talking about rising or moving vertically, if it's a negative, I'm gonna go down. If it's a positive, I'm gonna go up. So go down by four units. So one, two, three, four. My run is positive three, so that means I'm going to the right by three. One, two, three, so that's a point. So this is three, negative three. So three, negative three, that's a point. And then you can do this again if you want. So you can go down for one, two, three, four, to the right, one, two, three. So you can put a point there. That's gonna be at six comma negative seven. And you can also reverse this. Remember, if I have a negative over a positive, it's the same as a positive over a negative. So I could start here and I could go up four, I could rise four, one, two, three, four. And I could go to the left three, right? A run of negative three just tells me to go to the left three. So one, two, three. So that's a point there. It would be at negative three comma five, okay? And you can check all these points if you want. I've already checked them, I know they work. So it's up to you if you wanna pause the video. Again, you'd plug in a negative three for X, verify you get five for Y. Plug in a zero for X, verify you get one for Y. Plug in a three for X, verify you get negative three for Y and plug in a six for X, verify you get negative seven for Y. Okay, so now all we wanna do is just draw our line through these points. Okay, and again, you wanna put arrows at each end to indicate the line continues forever in each direction. And I'm just gonna label it. I'll say this is F of X is equal to, we've got negative four thirds X plus one. All right, let's take a look at an example where it's not solved for Y. In other words, we don't have y equals something or we don't have f of x equals something, right? So in this particular case, as a linear function, it's not solved for the dependent variable y. So we're saying it's in implicit form, right? So if we want it in the format of y equals m the slope times x plus b the y-intercept, we just solve it for y, okay? It's pretty simple. 
So I would just what? Isolate this term with y involved first, so the negative 2y. Just subtract 3x away from each side of the equation to do that. This part would cancel. You'd have negative 2y is equal to negative 3x and then plus 6. To completely isolate y, it's being multiplied by negative 2. So let me divide both sides of the equation by negative 2. And let me slide this down so we have enough room to kind of complete this. So we know this is going to cancel. You have y is equal to negative over negative is positive, so 3 halves times x. 6 over negative 2 is negative 3 or minus 3. Okay. So our slope here, m, is 3 halves. Our y-intercept will occur at 0, comma, negative 3. So now this guy is solved for y, or it's in explicit form. So in this form, we can replace y with f of x or g of x or whatever we want, right? If we want to use function notation. So f of x equals 3 halves x minus 3. Okay, so let me erase everything, and let me just write my slope up here. m, the slope, is equal to 3 halves, and again, this is the rise over the run. Okay, so just one additional step when you get this format. Not very difficult, still faster to solve for y, and just kind of use the slope and y-intercept to get your kind of line graphed. So the y-intercept is at 0, comma, negative 3, so I would go down 3 units from the origin, so that's right there. And then my slope is 3 halves. So again, the rise is 3, the run is 2. So I'm going to go up 3, 1, 2, 3, to the right, 1, 2. So there's a point. Rise 3, 1, 2, 3, to the right, 1, 2. So there's a point. So this guy is going to be 0, comma, negative 3. Again, that's the y-intercept. That's on the y-axis. This guy is going to be 2, comma, 0. So this is 2, comma, 0. That's the x-intercept. It's on the x-axis. And this guy is going to be 4, comma, 3. So 4, comma, 3. All right, so let's sketch our line real quick. Right, let me just put an arrow at each end. And then we're basically done. If you want to label it, you can use the 3x minus 2y equals 6, or you can use the y equals 3 halves x minus 3, or you can use the f of x equals 3 halves x minus 3. It doesn't really matter. You're just labeling it and saying, hey, this equation or this function goes with this line. So I'll just say f of x is equal to 3 halves x and then minus 3, and we'll be done. All right, so now that we know how to work with most of the cases, the special cases that come up, you have horizontal and vertical lines. These are very easy to draw, okay? So a horizontal line occurs when y, or you could say f of x, is set equal to some constant. In your book, you'll probably see it called k, or it could be called something else, it doesn't matter. So basically, you have f of x is equal to some number. Let's just say it was 5, okay? Or you could see this says y equals 5. These are the same. I just replaced y with f of x. So basically what you can do here, to think about this as a linear equation in two variables, if you had y equals 5, you could say you have 0x plus y equals 5, okay? No matter what you choose for x, when you multiply it by 0, it goes away. So you're still just left with y equals 5. So what happens here is that no matter what value you choose for x, if you're thinking about ordered pairs, y will always equal 5, so I can choose a million for x, y equals 5. I can choose 3 for x, y equals 5. I can choose negative 1 trillion for x, y equals 5. So what happens is you end up with a horizontal line that basically crosses the y-axis at this value here. In this case, it's 5. It could be, you know, whatever you have. If it was 7, it would cross the axis at y equals 7, you know, so on and so forth. So to see an example of this, let's say we had f of x equals 3, okay? Or again, you could write y equals 3 if that makes you more comfortable. So all you need to do to graph this line is go up to 3 on the y-axis. So let's just say right there. And we draw a horizontal line that crosses through that point, 0, comma, 3. Let me make that a little better. I'm just going to use my eraser and just kind of knock that part off. And I'll just put an arrow at this end and an arrow at this end. It continues indefinitely in each direction. So if you wanted to kind of prove this to yourself, again, you can write this as 0x plus y equals 3. And you could pick values for x and kind of generate some ordered pairs. So think about this. If I picked, let's say, negative 3. So negative 3 times 0 is 0, so that's gone, so y equals 3. So you go to negative 3, 3, so that's a point on the line. You could say if x was 0, y equals 3, so 0, 3 would be this. You could say if x equals 3, okay, plus 3, 0 times 3 is 0, you'd have y equals 3. So no matter what you choose for x, it's not going to matter because y is always going to be 3. So that's what creates this horizontal line, again, that impacts the y-axis at 3. All right, let's look at another example. So suppose we have f of x equals negative 4. Again, all I've got to do is go down to negative 4 on the y-axis. So that's going to be right there. This is my negative 4. And just draw a horizontal line that impacts that y-axis at negative 4. 
So let's do that real quick. Okay. So this would be f of x equals negative 4. All right, let's wrap up the lesson and talk about the last special case scenario. This would be when we encounter a vertical line. So this is going to occur when x is set equal to some constant value. In this case, we're not going to have a function. So this is the only case where you have a linear equation in two variables where you don't have a function. And you might say you don't have two variables. But again, you could write it as x plus 0, y equals a if you wanted to. So you have two variables involved. This is the only case where you're not going to have a function. This one single x value, in this case, it's a, but it could be whatever, right? You replace that with 3 or 10 or a million or a trillion, whatever it is. Basically, that one single x value is going to be associated with or paired up with an infinite number of y values, okay? So it's definitely not a function. So let's say we had x equals negative 6. And again, you could write this as x plus 0 y equals negative 6 if it makes you feel more comfortable. So for anything that I plug in for y here, it just goes away, right? So I'm left with x equals negative 6. So essentially for this guy, you go to negative 6 on the x-axis now, and I can kind of just highlight that. Basically, I'm just going to draw a vertical line. Okay. And I went a little bit over, so let me just kind of erase some of this. And I'll put my arrow at each end. So this is x equals negative 6. Again, just find out where this number here, whatever it's equal to, is on the x-axis, draw a vertical line right? Because no matter what value I choose for y, x will always be negative 6. If I choose 9 for y, x is negative 6. If I choose 6 for y, x is negative 6. If I choose 0 for y, x is negative 6, right? If I choose negative 1 trillion for y, x is negative 6. All right, so for x equals 8, how would we graph this? Again, look at 8 on the x-axis. 8 is going to be here, right? It's one notch to the left of 9. So again, I'm just going to draw a vertical line. Okay, and that one's pretty good. So we'll put an arrow at each end, and this is my x equals 8. So again, for a vertical line, x equals some number, find the number, in this case it's 8, on the x-axis, draw a vertical line that crosses through that on the x-axis. That's all you need to do. In this lesson, we want to review finding the slope of a line. In our last lesson, we reviewed how to graph a linear function. Or you could say we reviewed how to graph a linear equation in two variables. Here we're going to go one step further, and we're going to review how to find the slope of a given line, which is just a measure of the line's steepness. Now, officially, when we talk about the slope of a line, it's nothing more than just the ratio of the vertical change, which is known as the rise, to the horizontal change, which is known as the run, as we move along the line from one point to another. So generally speaking, we're going to use this lowercase m to denote slope, okay? So this is denoting slope. So we have here that our m, our slope, is equal to the rise over the run, or we could say it's equal to delta y over delta x. So before we go any further, let's just kind of explain this for a minute. When we say the rise, we are talking about the vertical movement on our coordinate plane. So from one point to the other, how far did we move vertically? We know that the vertical axis is the y-axis, so that's why we have this delta y here, which just basically tells us the change in y values. Now, when we talk about run, we're talking about a horizontal movement. How much did we move left and right? We know the horizontal axis is the x-axis, and so that's why we're saying the change in x. Okay, This symbol right here, in case you're unfamiliar with it, is the Greek capital letter delta. And in math, we generally use it to say the change in. So don't let this scare you. It just says the change in y over the change in x. Or again, you can remember this as the rise over the run. So using this concept of rise over run, or again, delta y over delta x, we can come up with this little slope formula, which allows us to find the slope of any line given two points on the line. So m, the slope, is going to be equal to the change in y values, y sub 2 minus y sub 1, over the change in x values, x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And this is given the fact that we have this restriction, x sub 2 minus x sub 1 cannot be 0. Why can't this be 0? Because you'd be dividing by 0, and that's undefined. And this scenario here, where you have x sub 2 being equal to x sub 1, is only going to happen when you have a vertical line. So you can just remember when you have a vertical line, the slope is undefined, because you'd be dividing by 0 in your slope formula. All right, so let's use this slope formula real quick. It's a very easy formula to kind of work with. The first thing that you might struggle with, if you haven't worked with kind of notation where you say, you know, x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2, this might be foreign to you. You might be asking, what does this mean? 
Well, essentially, we know that an ordered pair is what? It's x comma y, okay? And this one is x comma y as well. So how do we keep track of kind of which x I'm talking about, which y I'm talking about, if I'm working with multiple order pairs? Well, I can just use the kind of sub one, sub two notation, okay? So I can just call this first point x sub one, y sub one. So the x value I'm talking about here, if I say x sub one is two, the y value I'm talking about here, if I say y sub one is negative seven. And then this guy, I can just say it's x sub two, y sub two, okay? And then for the purposes of this formula, it doesn't matter which point gets labeled as which, you get the same answer either way, and I'll prove that to you in a second. So the slope formula, let me just copy it down over here. M is equal to, again, the change in y values, y sub two minus y sub one over the change in x values, x sub two minus x sub one. I'm not gonna write the restriction that x sub two can't equal x sub one. You know that, that's basically gonna give you division by zero. So that's something easy to remember. Okay, so let's go ahead and find out what the slope is. So I'm just gonna plug into the formula. So M is equal to, for my y sub two, I have what? I have a three. So just plug that in. Then minus, for my y sub one, I have a negative seven. Here's where you gotta be careful. It's a very common mistake to just put seven in because you already had a minus, but that's wrong. I have a minus and then I have a negative seven. So I want minus a negative seven here, okay? Then this is over. X sub two minus X sub one. X sub two is negative three. Then minus my X sub one is going to be two. So three minus a negative seven is the same as three plus seven, and that's gonna give me 10. Then over, Negative three minus two is going to be negative five. 10 divided by negative five is negative two, okay? So the slope of the line that passes through these two points is going to be negative two. And I'll show you that in a moment graphically, but really quickly, I just wanna show you this works the same if I do it in the opposite way. So I'm just gonna change the labeling up. I'm gonna say this is x sub two, y sub two. I'll say this is x sub one, y sub one. And basically we're gonna get an answer of negative two. Okay, so if I do y sub two minus y sub one now, y sub two has changed, it's now negative seven. y sub one has changed, it's three. x sub two minus x sub one, x sub two has changed to two. x sub one has changed to negative three. Again, minus a negative three is plus three, so be careful there. Okay, let me make that better. So negative seven minus three is negative 10. This is over, two minus a negative three is two plus three, that's five. Negative 10 divided by five is negative two you see we get the same answer either way. All right, so to think a little bit more deeply about this concept of slope, let's go ahead and look at the graph of the line that passes through those given points. So again, the points we were working with, we had negative three comma three, and we also had two comma negative seven. So let me just plot those real quick. Negative three comma three, starting at the origin, if I went three units to the left and three units up, that would be here. So that's your negative three comma three. And then two comma negative seven, starting at the origin, I could go two units to the right and seven units down. So that would be your two comma negative seven. So this line that we've already graphed, that passes through those two points. And basically what we can see from this graph is that our slope M, when we say it's equal to negative two, again, when we think about this in terms of rise over run, so M is equal to the rise over the run, I'm gonna say this is negative two over positive one. So let me explain. When we think about the rise, it's the vertical movement or the vertical change as we move from one point to the other. So let's say I'm going from this point to this point. Well, how far do I move vertically? Well, from three to this guy is gonna be one, I'm moving down by two units, okay? I'm moving down by two units. So on the y-axis, if I'm going down, that's a negative, so it's really negative two. Then how much do I move kind of horizontally? Let me erase this because it's kind of tight. This here is negative three, and this guy here is negative two. So I'm only moving one unit to the right. And again, if I'm moving to the right on the horizontal axis, it's a positive, okay? So basically I can say that it's negative two over positive one. That's my rise over my run, okay? So every time I move from one point to another, I can just drop by two units. So I can drop one, two, and then I can just go to the right one and I'm back on the line. Drop two, one, two, go to the right one. Drop two, one, two, go to the right one. Okay, so that's what a slope of negative two is telling me. If I had a slope of negative four, I could drop four units and go to the right one. If I had a slope of negative 10, I could drop 10 units, go to the right one. Now, another thing you can do is you can change this up. We know that negative over positive in terms of a fraction is negative. So I could also say this is positive over negative because this is also gonna be negative. So you might be confused by that and say, how is that possible? Well, if I start at a given point on the line, 
let's say I start right here. Let me use a different color. If I rise two, so positive two means I'm going up, so one, two, and then I run negative one, it means I'm going to the left one, okay? So a negative one run is to the left. So that's right here, so I'm back on the line. Up two, one, two, to the left one. Up two, one, two, to the left one, right? I'm kind of going backwards. So you can always use that trick to kind of get additional points. If you have a positive over negative or a negative over a positive, the net result is it's going to be negative. Now, one last thing I wanna draw your attention to, as we move to the right, okay, as we move to the right, you'll notice that this line is falling. So as we go this way, the line is going down. This is known as having a negatively sloped line. And again, you see that you have a negative two there, okay? If this was a positively sloped line, as we move to the right, the line is going to rise. And we'll see an example of that in a minute. All right, let's take a look at another example, and I'll show you this graphically as well. So we have these two points, zero comma negative two and five comma negative six. Again, let's plug into the slope formula. So let's just say this is x sub one, y sub one. And let's say this is x sub two, y sub two. So again, my m, my slope is what? It's the change in y values over the change in x values. So y sub two minus y sub one is what? y sub two is negative six, y sub one is negative two. So negative six minus a negative two is gonna be negative six plus two. And then x sub two minus x sub one, x sub two is five, x sub one is going to be zero. Five minus zero is just five. So negative six plus two is going to be negative four, and this is over five. Okay, so m here, our slope is equal to negative four fifths. So what this means is my rise is negative four. So from whatever point I'm at, I can drop four units, my run is five. So I would run to the right five units. So again, to look at this graphically, the points where we're looking at, we had zero comma negative two, and we had five comma negative six. So zero comma negative two is right here, and five comma negative six, if I go five units to the right, and six units down, that's right here. And you can label this, we'll say this is five comma negative six, and we'll say this is zero comma negative two. And again, to get from this point to this point, I can fall four units, one, two, three, four, and then run to the right, one, two, three, four, five. So again, my M, my slope is negative four fifths. Another thing you can do, as we talked about, we could say this is four over negative five. So if I started at this point, I could go up four, one, two, three, four, right, a positive rise, and I could go to the left five. I could go one, two, three, four, five units to the left, and that gets me to another point. So remember, if you're in a situation where you have a positive rise, that means you're going up. If you have a negative rise, you're going down. If you have a positive run, you're going to the right. If you have a negative run, you're going to the left. And if that gets confusing, just think about how numbers increase and decrease on the x-axis, right? They increase going to the right, decrease going to the left. And on the y-axis, they increase going up and decrease going down. And then once again, you'll notice as we move to the right, this line is falling. So this is another example of a negatively sloped line. And of course you can see that because the slope itself is negative. All right, let's look at one more of these. And this guy's gonna have a positive slope. So as we move to the right, the line is gonna rise. So M is equal to Y sub two minus Y sub one. Again, change in Y values over X sub two minus X sub one. Again, change in X values. So let's just label this as X sub one, Y sub one, and this as X sub two, Y sub two. And what are we gonna have? m my slope is equal to, we have y sub two, which in this case is four, minus y sub one, which in this case is negative six, minus the negative six is plus six. Then we have x sub two, which in this case is two, and then minus x sub one, which in this case is negative two, minus the negative two is plus two. So we get four plus six, which is 10, over two plus two, which is four. 10 divided by four, we could basically say is five halves, right? Each is divisible by two. 10 divided by two is five, four divided by two is two. So my slope M is positive five halves. So essentially my rise is five, my run is two. So from any point in that line, I can go up by five units and to the right by two and get to another point on the line. All right, so again, the points we were working with, we had negative two comma negative six and we had two comma four. Okay, so negative two comma negative six, starting at the origin, two units to the left and six units down, that's gonna be right there. Again, negative two comma negative six. And then two comma four, again, starting at the origin, two units to the right, four units up is right there. So that's two comma four. Okay, so again, if you think about this, the slope we found M is equal to the rise over the run 
and we said this was five halves. So starting at any point in this line, I can go up five units. So let's say we start here. One, two, three, four, five. So that's my rise. And I can run two. So that means I'm going to go to the right two. One, two. So I'm back on the line. I can go up five. One, two, three, four, five. To the right, one, two. Back on the line. And again, you can do this in reverse. So this might be something you haven't thought of. You can say m is equal to the rise over the run. And negative over negative is positive. So I can really say negative 5 over negative 2. This is the same thing as positive 5 halves, right? Negative over negative is positive. So that means if I start at this point in the line, I can fall 5 units, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and go to the left 2 units, 1, 2, back on the line. Fall 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, go to the left 2, 1, 2, back on the line. OK, so it's just as simple to kind of use that trick to get extra points as well. Now, you'll notice that as we move to the right, this line is increasing, right? It's going up. So again, this is an example of a positively sloped line. And again, you see that you have a positive slope, right? It's positive five halves. All right, so let's look at these kind of special case scenarios, and then we'll move on and talk about slope intercept form. So you're going to have horizontal lines that you're going to encounter, and you're going to have vertical lines that you're going to encounter. I'll tell you right off the bat, a horizontal line has a slope of zero and a vertical line has an undefined slope. But we want to think a little bit more deeply about why that's the case. So horizontal lines, we know they're of the form either in function notation f of x equals k or kind of normally we just see y equals k, right? But we could write this as a linear equation to variables if we wanted to. We could say zero times x plus y equals some value k. Right, so an example I'm going to give you is y equals 4. So I could say this is 0 times x plus y equals 4. And the reason you can write it like this is this allows you to kind of think about some ordered pairs you could get going. And basically, no matter what you choose for x, you're multiplying it by 0, so it's gone, and you're just left with y equals 4. So in other words, I could say, let's say I plug in a negative 1 for x. Negative 1 times 0 is 0, so you're just left with y equals 4. So negative 1 comma 4, that would be an ordered pair. Right, so another one would be, let's say I choose, I don't know, positive four. Positive four gets plugged in for x, get multiplied by zero, it's gone, you're left with y equals four, so four comma four. So any value you choose for x doesn't matter, right? The y value will be four. So let's go look at this on a coordinate plane. So this is the graph of y equals four. And again, it just crosses through the y axis at four. And again, it's just a horizontal line, right? So any x value I choose, let's say I choose an x value of six, the y value is four. Let's say I choose an x value of negative 5, the y value is 4. Let's say I choose an x value of a million, the y value is 4, right? So what happens is the vertical change is always going to be 0, right? In our slope formula, we think about, again, the rise or the change in y values over the run or the change in x values, okay? So delta y here, the change in y values is 0, and delta x can be whatever you want it to be, okay? It's not going to matter because 0 over any non-zero number is always 0, so in this case, for a horizontal line, the slope is zero. And I'll prove this to you mathematically. Let's just pick two points on the line and plug into the slope formula. So y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. And again, two points, let's say we use the ones we have here. So this guy is gonna be six comma four. So you have a point six comma four. And then you also have a point over here. I have negative five comma four. So negative five comma four. Okay, so those two points. Let me kind of slide this down and let me slide this down. Okay, so let's go ahead and say this is x sub one, y sub one. And let's say this is x sub two, y sub two. And again, when you plug in here, your y sub two is four, your y sub one is four. Four minus four is zero, right? So you automatically have zero in the numerator. And again, as long as you don't have zero in the denominator, you know the result there is zero. For this one, x sub two is negative five. So it's negative five and then minus x sub one, which is six. If I had a negative five minus a six, I'd have negative 11. But again, it doesn't matter. As long as this isn't zero down here, zero divided by any non-zero number is zero. So again, the slope for any horizontal line will just be zero. All right, so for a vertical line, basically you're gonna have an undefined slope. So this is a line where we have x equals some value, right? So x equals a, could be x equals 10, it could be x equals a million, it could be x equals a billion, it could be x equals negative two trillion, right? Whatever it is, it's not gonna have a slope as we normally think about it because you end up dividing by zero, which is undefined. So as an example, suppose we had x equals negative two. Again, you think about the fact that the x values here are always the same. It's always gonna be negative two. 
So let's say you pick two points on the line. So again, my slope formula, m equals y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. Again, if you pick two points on the line, let's say you pick negative two comma three and you pick negative two comma negative three, just as an example. Go ahead and plug that in. So negative two comma three, and you have negative two comma negative three. So let's just say this is your x sub one, y sub one. This is your x sub two, y sub two. Let me make that a little bit better. And if I plug in here, y sub two minus y sub one, you have negative three minus three. So negative three minus three would be negative six. So that's negative six. And here's where you have the problem. For x sub two minus x sub one, you're gonna have negative two minus a negative two, which is the same thing as negative two plus two, which is zero. So this part right here tells us it's undefined, right? This is gonna be undefined. So anytime you have a vertical line, you end up with division by zero in your slope formula. So the slope for a vertical line is undefined. All right, so something we talked about in the last lesson when we were graphing linear equations of two variables, or you could say graphing linear functions, we talked about how to get the slope and the y-intercept directly from kind of the equation of the line, okay? So this is pretty popular, something you need to know how to do. This is known as slope-intercept form when you solve the equation for y, and it comes directly from the slope formula, right? So basically, if you have m the slope is equal to y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. And we'll go into more detail on this in the next lesson, but essentially, let's say I know a point in this line. Let's say I know the y-intercept occurs at zero comma b. We know that the x value for the y-intercept is always zero. So one point is gonna be zero comma b, and I'm just gonna let another point just be x comma y, okay? So my normal notation is what? It's x sub one, y sub one, and x sub two, y sub two. I'm gonna let this guy take the place of x sub two, y sub two. I'm gonna let this take the place of x sub one, y sub one. And I'm just gonna plug in. So what we would have is what? For y sub two, I'm just plugging in a, a y. For y sub one, I'm plugging in a b. For x sub two, I'm plugging in an x. And for x sub one, I'm plugging in a zero. Minus zero is just nothing, you can get rid of it, right? So essentially this turns into m, the slope, equals y minus b over x. And all I'm gonna do from this point is just solve for y. And what's gonna happen? If I multiply both sides by x, I get that mx is equal to y minus b. This guy right here has canceled, right? That's gone. So to solve for y, I just add b to both sides of the equation, and we get our slope-intercept form, which is that y is equal to mx plus b. So what do we know? We know that m is the slope because we got this directly from the slope formula. So the coefficient of the variable x is my slope when it's solved for y, right? y equals m the slope times x plus b. b is going to be the y coordinate for the y-intercept. So the y-intercept, when you have it in this form, is gonna occur at zero comma b. And again, you can see this because if you plugged in a zero for x here, what would happen? Zero times whatever m is, it doesn't matter, is zero. So you're just left with y equals b right? So that's my y-intercept. So this is my y-intercept. Okay, so let's try two of these. I'm going to show you that it's the same either way. We'll solve it for y, we'll get the slope, and then I'll show you kind of generating two points and using the slope formula. It's the same thing. So let's erase this, and let's kind of try this out. So the first thing I want to do is put it in slope-intercept form. So that's y equals m the slope times x plus b. Let me just label this again. This is my slope. So how do I do this? I wanna solve the equation for y, and to do that, I wanna first isolate the variable term with y involved. So start by isolating the negative two y. So I have this three x that's out here. Let me just subtract that away from each side of the equation. I'll have negative two y is equal to negative three x plus 12. And then to get y by itself, I just need to divide both sides by negative two. And what I'm gonna get is that y is equal to, negative three over negative two is three halves, times x, and then 12 over negative two is minus six. So what this tells me is that the slope is three halves and the y-intercept occurs at zero comma negative six. So m, my slope is three halves. Now, that was pretty quick. Let's suppose we were given two points on the line and we had to use the slope formula. So I'm just gonna give you two points. I'm gonna give you a point that's zero comma negative six, and I'm gonna give you a point that's two comma negative three. You can easily verify those two points work. If I plugged in a zero here, you'd have negative two times negative six, which would give you positive 12. 
If you plugged in a 2 for x and a negative 3 for y, you would have 6 here and you would have 6 here, right? So 6 plus 6 would give you 12. So those are two valid points. So again, if I use my slope formula, I would have x sub 1, y sub 1, and I would have x sub 2, y sub 2. And again, I'm just plugging in. m the slope equals what? y sub 2, which is negative 3, minus y sub 1, which is negative 6, minus a negative 6 is plus 6. This is over x sub 2, which is 2, minus x sub 1, which is 0. So you can just erase this. And essentially, we have what? Negative 3 plus 6, which is positive 3 over 2, which is exactly what we found right there by just solving for y. So if you have an equation, okay, and you have the option of generating points and plugging into the slope formula, it's a lot quicker to just solve it for y and observe the slope as the coefficient of x. All right, let's wrap up the lesson and just look at one more of these. Again, I can find my slope by just solving for y. y equals m the slope times x plus b. Again, this is called slope intercept form. And we'll talk more about this in the next lesson. So to solve for y, I wanna first isolate the variable term with y involved. So I'm just gonna subtract two x away from each side of the equation. I'll have negative five y is equal to negative two x minus 60. Let me divide both sides of the equation by negative five. And what we're gonna have is y is equal to negative two over negative five is two fifths. And this is times x, and then negative 60 over negative 5 is plus 12, okay? So the slope here is 2 fifths. Let me make that a little cleaner. Okay, that's my m. And my y-intercept occurs at 0, comma 12, okay? And again, I'll just prove this to you real fast. I'll give you two points on the line, and we can use our slope formula. So one point we could use would be 0, comma 12. Again, if you plug in a 0 for x, you'd have negative 5 times 12. Negative 5 times 12 would give you negative 60, so that's a valid point. And another point is 5, 14, okay, 5, 14. If I plug in a 5 for x, 2 times 5 is 10, then minus, you have 5 times 14, which is 70, and this does equal negative 60, right? 10 minus 70 is negative 60, so that's a valid point as well. Okay, so let's say I label this as x sub 1, y sub 1, and this is x sub 2, y sub 2. Again, m the slope equals y sub 2, which is 14, minus y sub 1, which is 12 over x sub 2, which is 5, minus x sub 1, which is 0. 5 minus 0 is just 5. 14 minus 12 is going to be 2, so you get 2 fifths. Again, the same thing as you got here. So once again, putting it in slope-intercept form is a really quick and efficient way to find the slope of a line. Again, it's just going to be the coefficient of the variable x. In this lesson, we want to review equations of lines. So a pretty common task in algebra is being able to write the equation of a line given certain information. So additionally, you may have to change between different forms of a line to perform a specific task. So as we kind of progress through the course, you'll see that in some cases you need one form of the line, it's more advantageous. In other cases, you will need a different form of the line. So what we're gonna to do today is discuss the slope intercept form the point slope form and the standard form. And we'll show how to kind of go back and forth between those different forms. So we're gonna begin with slope intercept form, which we previously talked about. So basically slope intercept form allows us to immediately know the slope and the y intercept by kind of observing the equation, okay? So we have y equals m, which is our slope. This is our slope, times x plus b, which is the y intercept, right? You can see that if you plugged in a zero for x, you would get zero comma b as the y intercept. All right, so where does slope intercept form come from? Well, essentially, if you take your slope formula, which we already talked about, m the slope is equal to the difference in y values. So you have y sub two minus y sub one over the difference in x values, x sub two minus x sub one. Again, where you say x sub two minus x sub one is not equal to zero, because this, if this is zero, you have a vertical line and the slope is undefined. But following this slope formula, if I just say I know that the y-intercept would occur at zero comma b, so let's just say I have that, and let's say my other point is just x comma y, okay? So let's say I replace zero comma b with my x sub one, y sub one. So let's say this is x sub one, y sub one. Let's say this is x sub two, y sub two. And we're just gonna plug in, okay? We're just gonna plug in. So for y sub two, I'm gonna have just y, right? So that's what I'm plugging in. So m equals y minus, for y sub one I have b, this is over. For x sub two I have x, and then for x sub one I have zero. x minus zero is just x, right? So we can go ahead and just write that like that. 
And then what I can do is I can multiply both sides of the equation by x to clear that denominator. So this will be gone. And what I have is I have m times x is equal to y minus b. So how can I get y by itself? I can just add b to both sides of the equation. Let's just kind of finish this up. We would have what? We would have mx plus b is equal to y, which I could flip around and put y out in front and say y equals m the slope times x plus b my y intercept. So pretty simple to derive that. And we know our slope is m since again, this came from the slope formula. And we know that b is the y coordinate for the y intercept. Since we plugged in a zero comma b, the y intercept that got plugged in as a point. All right, so a pretty common task in this section is to be given a slope and a y intercept and to be asked to write the slope intercept form of that line. So suppose we're given a slope m of negative 3 fourths and a y intercept of 0 comma 7. So again, this right here, this is my b. We already know what m is. So just match up the format y equals m times x plus b. Again, just plug in. It's very simple. y equals m, which is negative 3 fourths, times x, and then plus b. b is 7, right? It's the y coordinate for the y intercept, so plus 7. All right, what about m equals 4 fifths and a y intercept that occurs at 0, comma, negative 4? So again, this guy right here, the y coordinate for the y intercept, that's your b. So you get y equals m the slope times x plus b. So y equals m, m is 4 fifths, times x. And then you could do plus negative 4, or you could just do minus 4. So y equals 4 fifths x minus 4. All right, so in some cases, we're not given enough information to immediately write the equation of a line. And sometimes we're just given the slope and a point on the line, or we might be given two points on the line. When this occurs, we can use point slope form. And then from there, we can go into slope intercept form. Okay. So point slope form, this is something you should remember, a point on the line and the slope. Okay. That's the normal situation to be given when you want to use this form. So this kind of X sub one and Y sub one, that's going to be our known point and M our slope is going to be known or sometimes we'll get two points on the line. And from that, we can use one of those points and we can calculate the slope using slope formula. All right, so where does this guy come from? Well, if we start with our slope formula, and let's say we say M is equal to, again, Y sub two minus Y sub one over X sub two minus X sub one. And let's just say that X sub one, Y sub one is the known point and X comma Y is the unknown point. So I'm just going to change this notation up just a little bit, but it's the same thing, right? You've got the difference in Y values over the difference in X values. All I'm going to do, let me just kind of slide this down. To get this, I'm just going to multiply both sides by the quantity X minus X sub 1. So I multiply this by X minus X sub 1. And again, I can put the M out in front. So put that out here. And this cancels with this. And what I'm going to have is I'm going to have M times the quantity X minus X sub 1 is equal to y minus y sub 1, okay? It's exactly what we have here. It's just in a different order. I can erase this and kind of flip this around. It makes no difference. I can say this is y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub 1, okay? So this came straight from the slope formula. All right, so let's suppose we wanted to write the equation of a line given the following information. We're given the slope m, which is 3, and we're given one point on the line, which is 5 comma 7. So all we need to do is just plug into the point slope form. So again, that's y minus y sub one is equal to m the slope times the quantity x minus x sub one. Again, m is three, so I would just plug in a three there. Let me put y minus y sub one equals, I'm gonna put a three there, times the quantity x minus x sub one. Now this is my given point. This is what you would label as x sub one, y sub one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna erase this. I'm gonna plug in my y sub one, which is seven. I'm gonna erase this and plug in my x sub one, which is five. And then from here, I can just solve for y, right? So I'd have it in slope intercept form. So y minus seven is equal to three times x is three x, then minus three times five is 15. And let me scroll down and get a little room going. So let me add seven to both sides of the equation and I'll be done, right? So this is gonna cancel. So my slope intercept form is y is equal to three times x and then negative 15 plus seven is gonna be negative eight. So you just put minus eight. So y equals three X minus eight. So again, if you get confused by this, just remember for point slope form, just follow the name. 
I know a point and the slope, or it could be that you get two points, right? You can calculate the slope from that. So you would still know a point and the slope. If you're given a y-intercept and a slope directly, then you can immediately put it in slope intercept form. Okay, so that's the difference between these two and where you're going to use it in which situation. So again, I've given another situation where I have a point, which is two comma negative four, and the slope m equals one fifth. So again, I have a point and the slope, so I want to use point slope form. So y minus y sub one equals m times the quantity x minus x sub one. Okay, so just plug in y minus for y sub one. Again, just label this as x sub one, y sub one. So y sub 1 is negative 4 minus the negative 4 is plus 4. And then m is 1 fifth. And then times the quantity, we have x minus x sub 1, which is 2. And then I can just solve this for y, and I'll have my slope intercept form. So y plus 4 is equal to, we'd have 1 fifth x. And then minus, you'd have 1 fifth times 2, which is 2 fifths. OK, so let's go ahead and solve this guy for y. So y is going to be equal to what? If I subtract 4 away from each side of the equation, let me do this over here as getting a common denominator. If I multiply 4 by 5 over 5, it would be minus 20 over 5. Okay, 20 over 5, again, is the same as 4. So I just subtracted 4 away from each side. So I'm going to have 1 fifth times x. And then you'd have basically negative 2 minus 20, which would be negative 22. So I'll put minus 22. And then over the common denominator of 5. All right, so a more tedious scenario occurs when you're just given two points on the line and you're asked to write the equation of a line. So this is one of those scenarios that can get kind of confusing. You still want to use point slope form because you know a point, right? You have two of them. You can use either one. And you know the slope because you can calculate the slope using a slope formula. So m is equal to what? It's the change in y values. So y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over the change in x values, x sub 2 minus x sub 1. Right, So the change or difference in y values over the change or difference in x values. So I can label this as x sub 1, y sub 1, and this is x sub 2, y sub 2. Again, you can change that up. It doesn't matter. So for y sub 2, I have 7. So let's plug that in. For y sub 1, I have a negative 5. Then for x sub 2, I have 7. And for x sub 1, I have 3. So what I'm going to have here is what? 7 minus a negative 5 is 7 plus 5. That's 12. This is over. 7 minus 3 is 4. So 12 over 4 is 3. So now I know my slope is 3. So let me erase this and just put m equals 3. So here's where it can get confusing. A lot of students will at this point be confused as to which point they need to plug in. And the answer is you can plug in either one, right? They're both points on the line, so it doesn't matter which one you choose. But this labeling will get a little confusing. So let me just show you this. I'm going to use each one. I'm going to say this is x1, y1 to start. And I'm going to plug into my point slope form, and then I'll do the other point. I'll show you it's the same. So y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. Okay, so we're just going to plug in. So let me just do this above. y minus y sub 1 is going to be negative 5. So that's plus 5. And this equals m is my slope. It's 3 times the quantity, we're going to have x minus, again, for x sub 1, I have 3. So let me erase this real quick. Let's solve this for y. So y is going to be equal to what? If I subtract 5 away from each side of the equation, over here on the right, 3 times x is 3x, and then minus 3 times 3 is 9, and then minus 5. Negative 9 minus 5 is going to be negative 14, okay? So you get y equals 3x minus 14. So let me erase this. So we have, let me just kind of put this over here. We have y equals 3x minus 14. Okay, so let me use this guy as a point now. Now I'll show you, you get the same thing. So x sub 1, y sub 1. Okay, so when we plug in, we have y minus y sub 1 equals m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. Okay, so y sub 1 is 7. So this is 7. And x sub 1 is going to be 7 as well. And m, my slope is 3. So at this point, you might say, hey, that doesn't look the same. But when you solve it for y, you're going to get the exact same equation as you got using this point over here. Okay, So y minus 7 equals, you'll have 3x minus 21. Add 7 to both sides of the equation. And again, you're going to get that guy. You would have what? This cancels. You'd have y is equal to. You'd have your 3x. And then negative 21 plus 7 is negative 14. So again, either way, it's the same. Right? So don't get confused about which point to use. 
no matter what point you use, you end up with the same equation when it's put in slope intercept form. All right, let's try another one. So now we're given two points, two comma 14 and six comma four. Again, just go ahead and calculate your slope first. So M is equal to, I'm gonna go as this one with X sub two, Y sub two, and I'll say this one is X sub one, Y sub one. Again, it doesn't matter. So we'd have Y sub two minus Y sub one. So 14 minus four is gonna be 10, right? So I'll just write 10 here, just save a little time. And then X sub two is two, X sub one is six. So two minus six, X sub two minus X sub one, so two minus six is negative four. So my slope here is gonna be what? If I divide each by two, I get five over two, and then it's negative, so negative five halves. Okay, so now that I know my slope and a point on the line, so a point on the line, and pick either one, again, it doesn't matter, I just showed you that. Let's just pick this one. We'll say this is x sub one, y sub one. And again, m, my slope is negative five halves. Plug into the point slope form. So we have y minus y sub one is equal to m, the slope, times the quantity x minus x sub one. So for y sub one, I'm plugging in a 14. For x sub one, I'm plugging in a two. For m, I'm plugging in a negative five halves, okay? So let's just solve this for y and we'll be done. So we'll have y minus 14 is equal to negative five halves times x is negative five halves x. And then negative five halves times negative two. Let's just do this off to kind of the side. Let's put plus negative five halves times negative two. We can clearly see the twos would cancel. Negative times negative is positive, so you basically have positive five there. Okay, so we'll put plus five. Let me scroll down and get some room going. So at this point, I just wanna add 14 to both sides of the equation. So we can see that this would cancel over here. And now you have y is equal to negative five halves times x, and then plus five plus 14 is 19. Okay, so that would be your equation in slope intercept form. Y equals negative five halves x plus 19. All right, let's talk about something that's a little bit confusing because the definition is gonna vary from textbook to textbook and also based on which class you're in, okay? So something known as the standard form of a line, this is something very useful, it looks like this. You have a times x plus b times y is equal to c, where a is the coefficient of x, b is the coefficient of y, and c is some constant, okay? So an example would be something like 5x plus 2y equals three, okay? My a here is five, my b here is two, and my three here is C. So we need to understand what A, B, and C represent because they're gonna be used a lot in our formulas. So for most textbooks, when we talk about A, B, and C, we say that they need to be integers, okay? This is kind of a stricter definition. So we would say A, B, and C are integers, okay, are integers. But as you move higher in math, this is kind of relaxed, okay? And we say A, B, and C are just any real numbers, okay? It just needs to be in this format. Now we also say that, again, in the stricter definition, this is something you generally see in high school, that A is greater than or equal to zero. So A, the coefficient of X, B, the coefficient of Y, and C, the constant are integers, and A, the coefficient of X, is going to be non-negative, right? So it's zero or some positive number. Now from this form, we can quickly get a lot of information. We can see that if I plugged in a zero for X, Okay, a zero for X, this would go away. I would have B, Y is equal to C. I would divide both sides by B and I would find out that my Y intercept occurs at what? So there, Y would be equal to C over B. So C over B would be the Y coordinate for my Y intercept. Now I can also get the slope pretty quickly from this as well. If I start with AX plus B, Y equals C. I know if I solve this for Y, the coefficient of my variable X is my slope. So if I subtract AX away from each side of the equation, I would have what? I would have BY is equal to negative AX and then plus C. So if I just divide both sides of the equation by B, what do I get? Well, what I'm gonna have is what? This cancels, I'll have Y is equal to the negative of A over B times X and then plus C over B. Again, if you match this up with slope intercept form, we're using different kind of letters, but it's the same thing. Y equals M the slope times X plus B the Y intercept. M here is negative A over B. And then B here, my Y intercept occurs at zero comma C over B, 
which we just talked about a minute ago. And I'll prove this to you later on with some examples that we can get the slope either as the coefficient of x when this guy solve for y, or if it's in standard form, we can just have the negative of a, the coefficient of x, over b, the coefficient of y. All right, so let's take a look at an example. So suppose you're given y equals 5 thirds x minus 3, and you're told to write this in standard form, again, with the stricter version, where a, b, and c are integers, and a is non-negative. So ax plus by equals c. Just want to put in this format. So here's my something times x. This is my ax, right? So let's subtract this away from each side of the equation. And that's going to give me y. I'll do this over here. You'll have negative 5 thirds times x and then plus y is equal to negative 3. Now, at this point, okay, at this point, if you were using kind of a looser definition where a, b, and c are real numbers, then you're basically done, right? This is in standard form. And I can show you really quickly, okay, I can show you really quickly that the slope is the same. Again, my slope, when it's in standard form, m is equal to the negative of a over b. In this case, a is negative 5 thirds, and b is going to be positive 1, right? This guy has an implied coefficient of 1. So negative of negative 5 thirds, so the negative of negative 5 thirds is positive 5 thirds, and this would be divided by 1, Anything divided by one is just itself. So you see you get a slope of five thirds, which is exactly what you get here, right? The coefficient of x. So it's a quick way to calculate the slope if it's in standard form. It's the negative of a, the coefficient of x, over b, the coefficient of y, okay? But again, for our purposes, if we want a, b, and c to be integers and a to be non-negative, we need to do a little bit of work, okay? So the first thing is to consider, how can I make this into an integer? Well, I can multiply both sides of the equation by three to clear the denominator. But at the same time, I want it to be non-negative. So what I could do is I could just multiply by negative three, and that would fix both problems, right? So if I multiply this side by negative three, and this side by negative three to make it legal, negative three times negative five thirds, the negative times negative would be positive, and then the denominators would cancel, right? Three over three is one, so I would just have five times x, and then you'd have negative three times y, which would be negative three y. And this equals negative three times negative three is positive nine, okay? And again, even though I transformed it to look different, the slope is still the same. It's again, m is equal to negative a over b. What is a? a in this case is five now. What is b? b is negative three. What is negative five over negative three? Again, that's five thirds. So either way, our slope is the same, right? We have five thirds here, we have five thirds here. All right, so let's put everything together in one kind of last example. So suppose you're given two points on a line and you're told to write it in standard form. And again, you're gonna use the stricter definition. So you're given points 10 comma six and negative five comma negative 12. Well, you're not gonna immediately put this in standard form and you can't immediately put it in slope intercept form. You gotta use your point slope form. Again, if you know a point and the slope, you use point slope form. In this case, I can generate a slope and I know a point. So my slope formula, again, m equals y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. So let's label this as x sub one, y sub one. Let's label this as x sub two, y sub two. So let's go ahead and plug in. So for y sub two, I have a negative 12. For y sub one, I have a six. For x sub two, I have a negative five. And for x sub one, I have a 10, okay? So if I think about negative 12 minus six, that's negative 18. So this is negative 18. Negative five minus 10 is negative 15. So I know immediately this is gonna be positive, right? Because negative over negative is positive. Each here is divisible by three. If I divide 18 by three, I get six. If I divide 15 by three, I get five. So it looks like my slope is gonna be six fifths. Okay, so my slope is six fifths. Okay, so from here, I can just use a point. It doesn't matter again, which one I use. Let's just go ahead and take this one. We'll say this is x sub one, y sub one. And I'm gonna plug into my point slope form. y minus y sub one is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub one. So for y sub one, it's six. For m, it's six fifths. And for x sub one, it's going to be 10, okay? Let me scroll down just a little bit. All right, so we'll have y minus six is equal to six fifths times x is six fifths x and then minus six fifths times 10. We can cancel this five with this 10, that'll be a two up here. Two times six is 12. So we'll have minus 12 there. And again, to finish this up, 
Let me add six to both sides of the equation. This will cancel and we'll have y is equal to six fifths x and then negative 12 plus six is minus six, okay? So let me just scroll down. So now we want it in standard form. And to do that, again, I want ax plus by is equal to c. So let's move this over here on the left. So we're gonna subtract six fifths x away from each side of the equation. And of course, on the right side, it cancels. You'll have negative six fifths x and then plus y is equal to negative six. So again, at this point, it matches this format. If you were using a definition where a, the coefficient of x, b, the coefficient of y, and c, the constant, were real numbers. But again, we wanna use the stricter definition. So what I'm gonna do is a little bit of additional work. So if I wanna clear this denominator here, right, because I don't want this to be a fraction, I want it to be an integer. And I wanna get rid of this negative here, because again, I want it to be non-negative. I can just multiply both sides of the equation by negative five, right? It would change the negative to positive and it would clear the denominator. So let's multiply this by negative five to make it legal. So negative five times negative six fifths would just be positive six then times x. Negative five times y would be minus five y. This equals, you have negative six times negative five, which is 30. Again, you can use this, six x minus five y equals 30. I can show you that everything is the same, right? We found that y was equal to six fifths x minus six, okay? Again, my m, my slope is what? It's the negative of a, the coefficient of x, over b, the coefficient of y. Okay, so make sure you take the negative and the five. What do we get? We get six fifths, right? Which is exactly what we got here, okay? So that's pretty quick. And then again, the y-intercept occurs at C over B. So the y-intercept is C over B. So then here we know it's negative six. C is 30, C is 30, B is negative five. And again, you get the same thing. 30 over negative five is negative six. So I know the y-intercept would occur at zero comma negative six, just as it tells me here in slope intercept four. In this lesson, we wanna review parallel and perpendicular lines. So usually when we study linear functions, we come across the topic of how to determine if two lines are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. So for the lesson today, we're gonna to start by thinking about parallel lines. So most of you already know that parallel lines are any two lines on a plane that will never intersect. We can determine if two lines are parallel by examining the slope of each. And essentially the rule is any two non-vertical parallel lines are gonna have slopes that are equal. And again, the reason I say non-vertical is because when we have a vertical line, we know the slope is undefined, okay? So let's start out with an example here again with parallel lines. So I'll go through and show you how to determine if you have parallel lines, and then I'll show you this graphically. So let's suppose you're given this and you have 25X minus five Y, it equals negative 20. And then you also have five X minus Y equals three. So in each case, we have a linear equation in two variables. And what we wanna do is solve each equation for Y and put it in what is known as slope intercept form. So we've been talking about this form for a while now. And in case you don't know, slope intercept form occurs when we solve for y. So we have y equals m the slope times x plus b the y-intercept. So this m right here, the coefficient of x is known as the slope. And again, this b, this is going to be the y-coordinate for the y-intercept. So we'll say this is the y-intercept. All right, so let's start with the first one. We have 25x minus 5y equals negative 20. So we have 25x minus 5y is equal to negative 20. I'm gonna scroll down and get some room and I'll come back up. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is isolate this y here, right on one side of the equation. So to do that, I wanna start by isolating the variable term with y involved. So I'm gonna isolate this guy. So I'm just gonna subtract 25x away from each side of the equation. And so what's gonna happen is this will cancel we'll have negative 5y is equal to negative 25x and then minus 20. All right, so to complete this, I want y by itself. So think about what's multiplying y. That's gonna be negative five. So I'm just gonna divide both sides of the equation by negative five. And let me get a little bit more room going. So this is gonna cancel and we'll have y is equal to, you have negative 25 over negative five, that's positive five then times x 
and then negative 20 over negative 5 is plus 4. So again, this is in the format of y equals m the slope times x plus b the y-intercept. So my slope here is 5, right? That's the coefficient of x. And my y-intercept will occur at 0, 4, right? So b, again, the y-intercept is 4. All right, so let's erase everything and bring this equation up to the top. All right, so let me just drag a line over here and say this is y equals 5x plus 4. Again, in slope-intercept form. And I'm just going to label 5 as m, my slope. And you can label 4 as the y-intercept if you want to. Okay, let's do the same thing for this one. It's going to be less tedious. So we have 5x minus y equals 3. So 5x minus y is equal to 3. Okay, so with this guy, again, if I want to solve it for y, the first thing I want to do is just get this guy by itself. So let me subtract 5x away from each side of the equation. That's going to give me what? This will cancel. You'll have negative y is equal to negative 5x and then plus 3. Let me go ahead and divide both sides of the equation by negative 1, right? So I can get rid of this guy. And let me scroll down a little bit. All right, so this will cancel with this. I'll have y is equal to, if you have a negative 5 over negative 1, that's positive 5, and then times x, and then 3 over negative 1 is minus 3. So we have y equals 5x minus 3. So again, this coefficient of x, this 5 here, that's going to be my m or my slope. And the y-intercept would occur at what? 0 comma negative 3. So negative 3 there would be my y-intercept, right? And you can make that more clear by just putting plus negative 3 if you wanted to, or you can leave it in this form like we have, okay? Either way. All right, let me erase everything. All right, so let me drag a line over here, and I'll just say that we have y equals, we have 5x and then minus 3. Okay, and I can just kind of match this up and say my m here, my slope is 5, my y-intercept would occur at 0, comma, negative 3. Let me make this kind of line going to it a little bit more accurate. And so we have our two equations there. One is y equals 5x plus 4. The slope is 5. One is y equals 5x minus 3. The slope is 5. So again, I said that two parallel lines, if they're non-vertical, would have the same slope, and obviously they would have different y-intercepts, right? If you have the same slope and the same y-intercept, then you have the same line, okay? But with parallel lines, again, they're never going to intersect, so it's going to have different y-intercepts and the same slope. Now let's look at this graphically real quick, and then I'm going to come back up and show you a little trick that's going to make this a little faster. So looking at the graph of this guy, we can clearly see what parallel lines look like, right? You can see they have the same slope or steepness, so that's what causes them to never intersect or never touch each other. So again, I can put down that we have y equals 5x plus 4, and that's going to be this guy right here, right, the one on the left. I can go through and plot the y-intercept, which occurs again at 0, 4. This is my y-intercept. This is my slope, my m. So 0, 4 is right here, right? That's my y-intercept. The slope is 5, so I can either go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and to the right 1 to get another point, or I could start here and go down 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and to the left 1 to get a point. So you can see this is, again, the graph of you have y equals 5x plus 4, okay? Then this guy on the right here, you can see this is the graph of y equals 5x minus 3. Okay, so my m, my slope is 5, which is the same, and then my y-intercept occurs at 0, comma, negative 3. So 0, comma, negative 3 is here. Again, slope is 5, so I go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the right 1, go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the right 1. Okay, so this guy right here is y equals my 5x minus 3. So that gives you a little insight into what two parallel lines look like. Again, they don't intersect because they have the same slope or steepness. All right, so I want to show you a little shortcut. Generally speaking, when you work with these problems, the problems are given to you where the lines are in standard form. Okay, so what is standard form? Again, we talked about the different forms of a line in the last lesson, but in case you don't know, basically standard form is where we have A, times x plus b times y is equal to c, our constant, okay? So usually we'll define a, b, and c to be integers, and we'll say a is greater than or equal to zero. But for what I'm going to show you here, a, b, and c could be any real number that you want it to be, okay? So generally speaking, 
let's say that we solve this equation for y and we put it in slope intercept form, we're gonna get a little insight here. So let's subtract ax away from each side of the equation. I'll have that b times y is equal to negative ax plus c. Let me go ahead and divide both sides by b. And we're gonna find here that y is gonna be equal to the negative of a over b times x plus you have c over b, okay? So what we can say is that if the line is in standard form, the slope is gonna occur at what? This coefficient on x is negative a over b. So it's the negative of the coefficient of x over the coefficient of y, right? The negative of a over b. And the y-intercept would occur at c, the constant, over b, the coefficient of y. So let's try this out real quick on this example, and I'll show you how easy this is. So for this first one, the coefficient of x, again, that's considered a, that's 25 in this case. So a is my 25. The coefficient on y is b, so b is negative five. Let me erase this. And then c is my constant, so that's negative 20. Okay, so that's the first case. So how can we find the slope? Again, it's negative a over b. So let me write that rule down. m is negative a over b. So the negative of a would be negative 25 over b, b is negative five. So this is my m and what does it give me? Positive five. So look how quickly we found the slope versus having to solve it for y. Now you can still solve it for y, it's still valid. This is actually a little bit quicker. Now let me erase this and we'll do the other one. So we would have what? An a value here, that's gonna be five a B value here that's negative one, and a C value here that's three. Again, A is the coefficient of X, B is the coefficient of Y, and C is your constant. So in this case, M is what? It's the negative of A, A is five, so negative five, over B, B is negative one. Again, negative five over negative one is positive five, so that's my slope. So again, for your Y-intercept, you can find that quickly as well. So for the Y-intercept, for the first one, it would be what? C over B, C is negative 20 negative 20 over B, which is negative five. So that gives me positive four. And that's what we found, right? In the first case, it was Y equals five X plus four. So the Y intercept occurred at zero comma four. Then for the second case, what do we find? It was Y equals five X minus three. So again, if I have C over B, C is three, B is negative one. Again, we get negative three there. It occurs at zero comma negative three, just as we found. So this is a very quick way to kind of work with lines when they're in standard form if you're trying to perform this task. Let's talk a little bit about perpendicular lines now. So with perpendicular lines, they're gonna intersect at a 90 degree angle. So if we have two non-vertical perpendicular lines, they're gonna have slopes whose product is negative one. So let's take a look at this example. So we can do this the long way, we could solve for y, or we could just really quickly get our slopes again if it's in the format of ax plus by is equal to c, then the slope is gonna occur where? m is gonna be equal to the negative of a over b, okay? So that's how quick we can find our slope. So a in each case is the coefficient of x. So this is a and this is a. b in each case is going to be the coefficient of y. So this is b and this is b, okay? So what is the negative of a over b for the first case. So the negative of four over negative seven. So my slope here is what? Negative over negative seven is four sevenths. So that's for the first one. And then m is equal to, again, negative a over b. So for the second one, you'll have negative seven is my a over four, which is my b. So this is negative seven fourths. So much quicker than solving for y. So let's erase this and let's think about this. We know the slopes are not the same. Four sevenths is not the same as negative seven fourths. So immediately you can rule out that you have parallel lines. But what we notice is that these guys are negative reciprocals of each other, right? If I multiply them together, I end up with negative one as my product. So four sevenths times negative seven fourths. We know that this seven would cancel with this seven and leave me with a negative one. And this four would cancel with this four and leave me with a one, right? So you basically have one times negative one, which is negative one as your answer. So that tells me these lines are perpendicular. Now, 
If I want, I can get my y-intercept, and we'll look at this graphically. So let's get the y-intercept for each one. Again, that occurs at c over b. So c is your constant, right? So in this case, it would be 14 over, b is the coefficient for y, so negative 7. So 14 over negative 7 is negative 2, right? So the y-intercept would occur at 0 comma negative 2 for the first one. Using that information, I can go ahead and write this in slope-intercept form. I can say this guy is going to be y equals m the slope, which is 4 sevenths, times x, and then minus 2, right, my y-intercept part. Then let me just erase this. We have the information now. For this one, the y-intercept occurs at, again, c over b. So c is 28 over b, which is 4. 28 over 4 is going to be 7. So this guy would be y equals m the slope, which is negative 7 fourths, times x, and then plus 7, your y-intercept. And you can pause the video and solve each one of these for y, and you will completely verify that I got the correct answer in each case. Okay, so let's look at this graphically. Again, one equation was y equals 4 sevenths times x and then minus 2. The other was y equals negative 7 fourths times x plus 7. So if we look at 0 comma negative 2, which is the y-intercept for this first one, so 0 comma negative 2 is going to be right there, and then my slope is 4 sevenths. So I would go up 1, 2, 3, 4, and to the right 7. So that would put me right there. And again, I could start at this 0 comma negative 2 and go down 1, 2, 3, 4, and to the left 7. Okay, so that's right there. So that's this line here. Again, this is going to be y equals 4 sevenths x and then minus 2. For this other line here, again, we have a y-intercept that occurs at 0 comma 7. So that's right here. And my slope is negative 7 fourths. So I can drop 7. So drop 7 and go to the right 4. So that's there. I can drop 7, go to the right 4. So that's there. So that's this line here, which is y equals negative 7 fourths x plus 7. So what you notice is that where they intersect, you'll have a 90 degree angle. So that's that guy right there. Again, that's a 90 degree angle. So that's how you know you have perpendicular lines. All right, let's look at a few examples real quick. We have 2x minus 3y equals 3, and we have 6x plus 4y equals 44. So again, you have your choice. You can solve each one for y, or you can use my little shortcut for lines that are in standard form. Either way you want to do it. I prefer to use the shortcut. So we'll say m, our slope, is equal to the negative of a over b. Again, where a is the coefficient of x and b is the coefficient of y. So for this first one, my a is equal to 2 and my b is equal to negative 3. For the second one, my a is equal to 6 and my b is equal to 4. So for m, again, it's equal to the negative of a over b. So a is 2 and b is negative 3. So negative 2 over negative 3 is just 2 thirds. Okay, so that's for the first case. So let me just kind of erase this and put right here that m is equal to 2 thirds. Okay, for the second case, again, my m is equal to negative a over b. a is 6, so let's put 6 here. And b is 4, so let's put 4 here. So what we have here is going to be negative 3 halves. Divide 6 by 2 and you get 3. Divide 4 by 2 and you get 2. Right, so m here, my slope, is equal to negative 3 halves. So these guys are negative reciprocals of each other. So these are perpendicular lines. So we can say that 2 thirds times negative 3 halves is equal to negative 1, right? Because this cancels with this and gives me negative 1. This cancels with this and gives me 1. So you'd have 1, right? This guy's completely canceled times negative 1. That will give you negative 1. Okay, so once we know this is perpendicular, we can just state that. We can just say these are perpendicular lines. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 5x minus 12y equals 20. We have 12x minus 5y equals 20. Okay, so let's determine, again, if they're parallel, perpendicular, or neither. So what I want to do, again, if it's in standard form, which generally it will be, you can solve it for y, or you can use the shortcut. So the slope m is equal to the negative of a over b. So this is a, my coefficient of x, that's 5, over, this is b, it's going to be negative 12, my coefficient of y. 
So the slope here is 5 twelfths. For the second guy, what's my slope? Again, negative of A, which is 12, right, coefficient of X, over B, which is negative 5, coefficient of Y. So this is going to equal 12 fifths. Now you see these guys are reciprocals of each other, but they're not negative reciprocals of each other. So basically what you have is 5 twelfths. If I multiply this by 12 fifths, it's going to give you positive 1, not negative 1. Okay, so these are not perpendicular lines, and obviously the slopes are not equal, so they're not parallel lines. So we can go ahead and say these are neither. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 9x minus 4y equals 48. We have 18x minus 8y equals negative 120. So again, for my slope m, it's equal to the negative of a. a is the coefficient of x, so that's 9, over b. b is negative 4, that's the coefficient of y. So the slope is just 9 fourths. Then in the second case, again, the negative of a, a is 18, the coefficient of x, over b, b is the coefficient of y, that's negative 8. So this would give me y. So each would be divisible by negative 2, right? So if I divide negative 18 by negative 2, I get positive 9. If I divide negative 8 by negative 2, I get positive 4. You can see the slopes are equal, right? And the y-intercepts are going to be different. So we're going to have parallel lines, right? These are parallel lines. Okay. All right, so another scenario you might see in this section, you might be asked to write the equation of a line given that it is parallel or perpendicular to some other line. So let's write the standard form of the line that passes through this point, negative 1, negative 4, and it's parallel to 3x minus y is equal to 5. All right, so to tackle this task, basically what I want to do is I want to figure out the slope of this line here. Because once I have the slope of this line here, I'll know the slope of the line that passes through this point, negative 1, negative 4, because they're parallel lines, right? So they're going to have the same slope. So I can solve this for y, or again, I could use my shortcut, and the slope occurs at the negative of a over b. a in this case is 3, right? The coefficient of x over b. In this case, that's going to be negative 1, the coefficient of y. So the slope here will occur at 3. So again, the slope for this line that passes through this point, negative 1, negative 4, will be 3 as well. Okay, so now that I know my slope and a point, I can get rid of this, okay? This is what confuses people. So just cross this out, forget that it exists. So with a slope and a point, I can use point-slope form. Hopefully you saw the last lesson when we talked about equations of a line, but if not, when we look at point-slope form, form, it looks like this. y minus y sub 1 is equal to m the slope times the quantity x minus x sub 1. So your given point is x sub 1, y sub 1. So this is x sub 1, y sub 1. So I'm just going to plug in. So we have y minus, for y sub 1 I have negative 4. Minus the negative 4 is plus 4. This equals m my slope, which I found was 3, times the quantity x minus x sub 1, which in this case is negative 1, minus the negative 1 is plus 1. All right, so I want this in standard form. So let me erase this, and let me drag this up here. So again, standard form, we want kind of ax plus by equals c. And again, typically a, b, and c would be integers, and a is greater than or equal to zero. So to match this format, let me just distribute this on the right side first. Three times x is three x, then plus three times one is three. And we have y plus four over here on the left. Let me subtract. 3x away from each side of the equation. And let me just kind of move down a little bit. So what I'm going to have is this cancels. I'll have negative 3x plus y plus 4 is equal to 3. Let me subtract 4 away from each side of the equation. So this is going to cancel. And let me just kind of write this up here. We'll have what? We'll have negative 3x and then plus y. And this is equal to negative 1. Now, typically, we want a, the coefficient of x, to be a non-negative integer. So in this case, it's a negative integer, right? So we have negative 3 here. But we can fix that by just dividing both sides of the equation by negative 1. That's going to give me what? Positive 3x minus y is going to be equal to positive 1. And you can erase this. You don't need that anymore. So it follows that format of ax plus by equals c. And again, if you want to check the slope real quick, again, the slope should occur at what? m should be equal to the negative of a, which is the coefficient of x, so negative 3, 
over b, which is negative 1, write the coefficient of y. So this is negative 3 over negative 1, which is 3, which is exactly what we found there. All right, let's try another one. So we have a given point that's negative 5 comma negative 3, and it's perpendicular to 3x plus 9y equals 36. So again, perpendicular lines have slopes whose product is going to be negative 1, right? So when we think about this, if I have 3x plus 9 equals 36, again, the slope will occur where? It's going to be at the negative of a, which is 3 in this case, right, the coefficient of x, over b, which in this case is 9. So this would be what? If I divide each part here by 3, 3 divided by 3 is 1, 9 divided by 3 is 3, so my slope is negative 1 third, okay? So my slope is negative 1 third. Now, negative 1 third times what gives me negative 1? Well, most of you can understand that it would be positive 3, right? But if you didn't know that, you can use a variable. And to not confuse ourselves, let's just use z. So to solve this, I would multiply both sides of this equation by the reciprocal of this, which is negative 3 over 1. And so this would cancel, and z would be equal to what? Positive 3, okay? So that tells me that my slope is going to need to be positive 3, because again, 3 times negative 1 third is going to give me negative 1. Okay, so m is going to be positive 3. So now that I have my slope in a given point, you can line this out. Don't think about it anymore. Don't consider it. It's just going to confuse you. So plug into the point slope form. So we have y minus y sub 1 is equal to m the slope times the quantity x minus x sub 1. Okay, so for m, we have 3. For x sub 1, again, that's this guy right here. We have negative 5. Minus the negative 5 is plus 5. For y sub 1, again, that's this guy right here. Minus a negative 3 would be plus 3. Okay, so let me distribute. So we have y plus 3 is equal to, on the right side, 3x plus 15. And again, if you want this in standard form, I want ax, I want ax plus by equals c. Again, a, b, and c, we want those to be integers, and we want a to be greater than or equal to 0. So what I can do to kind of make this a little quicker, let me subtract 15 away from each side of the equation, and that's going to cancel over here. And 3 minus 15 is going to be negative 12. And let me subtract y away from each side of the equation. So that's going to cancel over here. And I know this is a little messy, but let's scroll down and get some room going. So what's going to happen is on the left side, I just have my negative 12. On the right side, I would have 3x minus y. And you can flip this around and say this is 3x minus y is equal to negative 12. So a, my coefficient for x is 3. That's positive. B, my coefficient for y is negative 1, and C, my constant is negative 12. So I basically fit my definition, right? So let me erase this. Okay, so you can check the slope again. Make sure that it is 3. Again, it's going to be m occurs at the negative of a, which is 3, over b, which is negative 1. Negative 3 over negative 1 is 3, so we're good to go there. And we can say this line is going to be 3x minus y equals negative 12, again, in standard form. In this lesson, we want to review the graphs of basic functions. So at some point in a college level algebra course or pre-calculus course, you're going to come across a section where they talk about how to graph the most commonly occurring functions that you're going to kind of come across. Now, there's more of these than what we're going to show you today, but essentially the functions here are known as elementary functions, or some books will say basic functions or parent functions. It's important to kind of look at these functions because they just keep coming up over and over and over again. So if you know the basic shape and you know the domain and range, it's just going to help you a ton when you have to keep considering problems like this, you know, with these functions. Now, as we progress through the course, we'll kind of add some of these to our list. We're not going to talk about exponential functions and logarithmic functions and kind of sine and cosine. These are things we're going to talk about later in the course once we have the foundation. OK, but for right now, we're going to look at some ones that you should be comfortable with, things that we've already kind of seen up to this point. So let's start out today by looking at something known as the identity function. So this is just where y equals x. It's a very simple linear equation in two variables. And again, I can write this in function notation and say this is f of x is equal to x. So whatever I plug in for x, I get for y. So that's why it's called the identity function. 
And it's very easy to graph this. Remember, if we have a line in slope intercept form, it's solved for y. It's y equals m the slope times x plus b the y intercept. In this case, we don't have a visible coefficient for x. So we can really just say it's y equals one, right? I can write anything times one. So one times x plus, I don't have anything visible here, so I just put plus zero. So lining things up, I can see that my m, my slope is one, my b is zero. So this tells me that the line has a slope of one and a y-intercept that occurs at zero comma zero. Well, in fact, the x-intercept is also gonna occur at zero comma zero. So this is essentially a line that passes through the origin. You can see that right there. And it has a slope of one, right? So if we wanted to graph this, we could graph that zero comma zero, the origin. We could go up one to the right one. We'd have two points and we could draw our line. It's already drawn for us, so I'm just gonna skip that part. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the domain and range, and then we'll kind of move on. We know that when we work with a linear equation in two variables, that's not a special case scenario. So that's not a horizontal line and not a vertical line. We're going to have a domain that's all real numbers as well as a range that's all real numbers. So you can see this graphically, and you can also see this by just kind of inspecting the equation. If I look at X, you think about that for your domain. Is there anything I can't do? The answer is no. So the domain, the domain is all real numbers. So from negative infinity to positive infinity, as well as the range, right? Because whatever I plug in for X, I get for Y. So I can make X as small as I want. I can make it zero. I can make it as large as I want. So the range is all real numbers as well. Now, you can also see this graphically. Although we're limited to kind of the space that's available on this kind of graph that I drew, you see that you have an arrow at each end. So that's telling me I'm extending to the right forever, to the left forever, up forever, and down forever, okay? So I'm going in all directions forever. So the domain, again, I can have anything for X. My range, I can have anything for Y. All right, now let's move on and talk about the squaring function. So this is Y equals X squared. Essentially, I plug in something for X, I square it, I get Y. Again, I can write this in function notation. So F of X equals X squared. We haven't talked about how to graph quadratic equations yet in this course. I know most of you saw it in Algebra 2. Essentially, this is the shape of a quadratic equation. This graph is known as a parabola. We'll do a deep dive into parabolas in the next section of the course. For now, we just want to kind of observe what it looks like and think about the domain and range. And I put two arrows there because that is going to extend this way and this way kind of forever. Okay, so we want to think about those arrows to indicate that. Now, if I think about kind of some points that would be on this graph, we know that squaring something gives me a result that's non-negative. So if I plug in a zero for X, Y would be zero. So that's this point right here. And notice how that's the lowest point that Y goes. And that's because if I plug something in for X that's negative, I get a positive. If I plug in a positive, I get a positive. So plugging in a zero is going to be the smallest result I can get for Y. Okay, so that's why this zero comma zero is on the graph and it's the lowest point. Now, for every other Y value other than zero, it's going to be linked up to more than one X value. It's gonna be linked up to two X values. So let's see what's going on and why it's going on. So you see this point here, you have negative one, one, and you have this point here, one, one. So two different X values, one is negative one and one is positive one. They're both linked up to the same Y value. So this one is one and this one is also one, okay? Remember, this doesn't violate the definition of a function. Two different X values can link up to the same Y value. You just can't have the same X link up to multiple Y's, okay? But we could really save some space here and just say plus or minus, plus or minus one like this for X and then a Y value is one, okay? And then you can see the same effect as we kind of move up this graph. If I had an X value of two, I'd have a Y value of four. Also, if I had an X value of negative two, I'd have a Y value of four, okay? And it's just because of the square, right? If I take one and I square it, I get one. If I take negative one and square it, I get one. If I take two and square it, I get four. If I take negative two and square it, I get four. Same thing goes for three comma nine and negative three comma nine. Same thing, so I could put plus or minus three, and then this is nine. I forgot to write four here, but you know that's gonna go there. Okay, so that's how we get some ordered pairs. That kind of gives you an idea of the shape and we can sketch our graph. You already see what it looks like, so I don't need to kind of draw that in. Let's think about the domain and range of this guy. So the domain 
and the range. Now, again, you can do this graphically if you have it already drawn, or you can just think about the kind of equation of what's going on. So for the domain, I always think about, is, is there something I can't do with X? Am I restricted? Or is there something illegal? Well, in this case, I'm squaring X. So there's, there's nothing wrong with plugging in a zero, nothing wrong with plugging in a negative or a positive. So the domain is all real numbers. So from negative infinity to positive infinity, and the graph confirms that, right? We're going to the left forever. We're going to the right forever. But where we're limited is our range, right? Because it's the result of squaring something. So we know that kind of the lowest or the smallest it can be is zero. We see that on the graph. If we think about the vertical axis, the Y values, the lowest it is is right here. And that's going to be a Y value of zero. So from zero and including that out to positive infinity. OK, so the domain, all real numbers, the range from zero and including zero out to positive infinity. All right. Now let's talk about the cubing function. And let me put these arrows in here now so I don't forget. So y equals x cubed. So obviously I'm plugging in a number and I'm cubing it and I get my y or again, my f of x if you want to write that notation. So when I think about this guy, OK, it's kind of harder to get points because when you look at this, your graph is usually constrained to what you can fit on a sheet. OK, so I always go up to 10 and down to 10, to the left to 10 and to the right of 10. So I can really only get about five points on this guy. Right. So if I plug in a zero for X, I get a zero for Y. So one point that I didn't put on here would be zero comma zero. And let me just kind of list this out. So zero comma zero. Another point, if you plug in a one and you cube it, you get one. So one comma one. And then another point, if you plugged in a negative one, you'd get a negative one. OK, and then you can kind of do two and eight and you can do negative two and negative eight. OK, so that's the points that we have. Again, we have zero comma zero. We have one comma one. We have two comma eight. We have negative one comma negative one and we have negative two comma negative eight. So from those five points, you get an idea of what the shape looks like and you could sketch it that way. Again, it's already pre-drawn, so we don't need to kind of draw that in. And let's just think for a minute about the domain and range, because this one isn't very complicated. You can see that because we're cubing this guy and cubing something does not affect the sign, right? It's an odd exponent. So it's not going to change a negative to a positive, like when we square something. So I can plug in anything for X and I can also get an output of anything for Y, because let's say I squared, for example, negative two, well, I'm getting negative eight, right? I squared a negative, I got a negative, okay? So for this guy, the domain, the domain is, again, all real numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range is also going to be all real numbers because, again, this exponent is odd. So it's not going to have an effect on the sign like it does when we square something. So from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, again, you can see this graphically. This guy is obviously rising forever and it's falling forever. And although it doesn't look like it's going to the right forever and to the left forever, it is. It's just doing it kind of slowly. Right. So it is going to the left forever. It is going to the right forever. So the domain is all real numbers and the range, again, is all real numbers. All right. Now let's talk about the square root function. So this guy is y equals the square root of x. Let me put my arrow in. And again, you could say f of x is equal to the square root of x if that's better for you. And again, all I'm doing here is I'm plugging in something for x. I take the square root. I get y. OK, so you can see some points that we can make here. If you plug in a zero, you get zero. So again, if I kind of think about it this way, a zero gives me a zero. And then if I plug in a one, I get a one. So that's why this point is here, one comma one. To get more values, you got to kind of think about what I can plug in here that's going to be a perfect square. So you can plug in a four, four is a perfect square, and you would get a two, right? So four gives me two. Plug in a four for x, get a two for y. And then the next perfect square, not five, not six, not seven, not eight, you'd come to nine. And so nine, if I took the square root of that would be three, okay? So that's where this nine comma three comes in there, okay? So that gives you a general idea of the shape and you could sketch it from there. And you can keep going if you wanted to. The next perfect square is gonna be 16. So you could have 16 and then four, but obviously I don't have enough space here to kind of plot that point. So that's our, that's our graph, that's our general shape. And I erased that and I should have. So let me just erase this. And now let's think about the domain and range. So let's think about the domain and our range. Okay, so what do we got going on here? Again, if I just look at the equation, I'll look at the graph in a second. The square root of x, is there anything I can't do? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm restricted in the real number system from taking the square root of a negative, 
We know that we worked problems when we're talking about the quadratic formula where we ended up with the square root of a negative, we used our complex number system, we involved the imaginary unit i, but when we think about domain, we're thinking about the real number system. It's very important that you know that because a lot of students will kind of mess that up. The domain is always the real number system unless your teacher specifically tells you otherwise, okay? So we can't take the square root of a negative, so that means the domain is constrained to be non-negative. So it's from zero out to positive infinity. You can confirm that by looking at the graph. If we think about horizontal values, if we think about on that x-axis, this guy is zero, that's where it starts, and it goes out to the right forever. So from zero, including zero, out to positive infinity. It's the same thing with the range, right? It's from zero out to positive infinity. Again, graphically, here's the y value, kind of think about things going up and down, starts at zero and increases forever. Now, we know that just looking at the equation, we can see the same thing because if I plugged in a zero for x, that's the smallest I can plug in for x, y would be zero. And I can't make it any smaller, right? Because I can't go negative. And as I increase x, y is going to increase. So the domain is from zero to positive infinity, including zero, so is the range, right? From zero, including zero, out to positive infinity. All right, now let's talk about the cube root function. So we have y equals the cube root of x, or again, you could write f of x equals the cube root of x. Let me make that three a little bit better. Now, let me put these arrows in here. So here and here, okay. So what you'll notice here is that when you make ordered pairs, let's just make some real quick, so x and y, if you plug in a zero, you get zero, right? So if you plug in a zero for x, you get zero for y. If you go through and plug in a one for x, you get a one for y. If you plug in a negative one for x, you get a negative one for y. So that's these points here. I didn't put zero comma zero, but here's one comma one, and here's negative one comma negative one. Now, for these points, they're gonna start to seem very familiar. Let's say you do eight and then two. So if I plug in an eight for x, I take the cube root, I get two. If I plug in a negative eight for x, I take the cube root, I get a negative two. Why does this look familiar? Let's go back up. Notice how with y equals x cubed, I plugged in a two for x, I got an eight for y, right? That's because I'm cubing two and I get eight. Well, if I take the cube root of eight, I go back to two. Same thing goes for this negative two comma negative eight. So these points kind of seem familiar and the graphs also look familiar. So what you're gonna find is that these guys are inverses, okay? And we're not gonna talk about this now, but later on in the course, we're gonna talk about inverses and we're gonna see how we can quickly graph inverses and kind of all these things that are related to inverses. But essentially the X and Y values are just swapped. So in Y equals X cubed, you plugged in an x value of two and got a y value of eight. Here you plug in an x value of eight, you get a y value of two, okay? Same thing goes here. You plug in a negative eight for x, you get a y value of negative two. In y equals x cubed, it's reversed, right? You plug in a negative two for x, you get a negative eight for y. So we get the general shape of this. Again, it looks just like the other one. It's just sideways now. And essentially what we wanna think about is the domain and range. So the domain and the range. But again, I'm working with kind of an odd number here for the index. So the domain is all real numbers, right? I can plug in anything for X and take the cube root. There's no constraints there. And obviously on the graph, you can see this goes kind of to the left forever, to the right forever. So from negative infinity to positive infinity. The range is the same thing. And a lot of students don't kind of get that. They think this is constrained on the graph, but this is falling over here and this is rising. It's doing it at a slow pace, but it is doing that. So it's from negative infinity to positive infinity. And again, you can think about the equation here. Can I make Y as large as I want? Well, yeah, I can plug in as big of a number for X as I'd like. So I can make Y infinitely large. Same thing goes for making y infinitely small, right? I can plug in a negative there, there's no problem, and take the cube root. So I can make x as small as I want and make y as small as I want by plugging in these gigantically large negative numbers. So the domain is all real numbers and the range is all real numbers. All right, the last one we're gonna look at is known as the reciprocal function. So we have y equals one over x. And again, I could write this as f of x equals one over x. So it's essentially the reciprocal of x, right? If I take the reciprocal of x, I end up with one over x. So that is why you call this the reciprocal function. Now, obviously, when I think about this guy, I can't divide by zero, okay? So if I think about restrictions here, I can't divide by zero, and I'll also never get a result of zero. 
If you have one over X and you say this result, how can I make that zero? I can't, right? Because if I divide here, I know X can't be zero. That's undefined. But I have a fixed numerator here of one. Think about how you get zero from a division problem. You have to take zero and divide it by something that's not zero. This is fixed at one, so this has no solution, right? So it's not possible for one over X to give you a Y value of zero. So I want you to notice two kind of things that are going on with this graph. So let me put my arrow here and my arrow here and my arrow here and my arrow here. To make this simple, I'm just gonna think about the positive for right now, okay? When I get an X value that's really, really, really large, let's say I erase this and put something like, I don't know, let's say 100. One divided by 100 is 0 0.01, okay? But we can make this number as large as we want. And the larger we make it, the closer we actually get to zero. So that's what's going on kind of here where we go to the right. You're noticing that the X values are getting bigger and bigger. We're getting closer and closer to a Y value, okay, a vertical value here of zero, but we're never gonna touch it. So that's where this dashed red line comes into play. This is a horizontal asymptote. So we're approaching that value where y equals zero, but we're never going to touch it. We'll talk more about this later on in the course. In the next section, we're gonna talk again a lot about quadratic and rational functions and how to graph them. For now, you just need to know that this is an asymptote and that the graph is approaching that, but will not touch it. Now, the same thing is happening when we go in this direction in terms of trying to reach an x value of zero. We know we can't divide by zero, but as we get closer and closer to an X value of zero, Y becomes infinitely large, okay? But X never actually can get to zero. So what happens is, as I put in something like, let's say 0.5, for example, one divided by 0.5 is gonna be one times two, which is two, okay? We know that. But if I put in something smaller like 0.1, well, now I'm multiplying by 10. So now I've got 10. If I put in 0 0.01, I'd be multiplying by 100, right? And I can keep going, I can keep getting closer and closer to zero without touching it, and Y gets infinitely large, okay? It gets as big as you want to make it, just as you get closer and closer and closer to zero. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. We're approaching an X value of zero. So that's this vertical asymptote here at X equals zero, okay, that vertical line. We're approaching that, but we're not going to touch it. Again, we'll talk more about this in the next section of the course. All right, let's think about the domain and range. It's pretty obvious what they are. Again, from what I just said, and then also from kind of looking at the graph, we know we can't divide by zero. So the domain is kind of the set of all X such that X can't be zero, or we could also use our interval notation. So from negative infinity to zero, the union with zero to positive infinity. Again, zero is not included in either. Okay, so that's how we kind of restrict that. Now for the range, it's gonna be the same thing, okay? The range can't be zero because again, one over X will never produce zero because one is fixed, okay? So this guy from negative infinity to zero, not including it, the union with, again, zero to positive infinity. Again, you can see this from the graph that all the Y values are covered going from not zero, but anything larger up to positive infinity. Again, not zero, but anything less, right down to negative infinity. All the X values are covered except for zero. So starting kind of anything larger than zero out to positive infinity, and then starting here on the other side. So from anything less than zero out to negative infinity. So the domain and range just both exclude zero. In this lesson, we wanna talk about the piecewise defined functions. All right, so in the last lesson, we talked about some of the most commonly occurring functions that we're gonna come across. We examined the graphs, and then we talked about the domain and range. Here, we're just gonna go a step further and talk about the absolute value function, the greatest integer function, and piecewise defined functions in general. So we're gonna start out today with the absolute value function. So we have y equals the absolute value of x, or we could write this as f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. Now I've already graphed this guy for us so we can see what it looks like. And let me put an arrow here and an arrow here. Those two are going to indicate that they extend in each direction forever. And essentially you can see that you have this V-like shape. And what's creating this is the absolute value operation itself. If you think about what happens here, we can say that Y really equals X if X is a non-negative number. 
So in other words, if I plug in an x that's greater than or equal to zero, well then y just equals x. That's this part of the graph right here, okay? We saw this in the last lesson where we talked about y equals x, that's the identity function, okay? But what happens is if x is less than zero, so if x is less than zero, then y really equals negative x, okay? So what happens is instead of this guy continuing on this path down here, it gets flipped up because of the absolute value operation, okay? So it takes the negative that you're plugging in here for x and it flips it and makes it positive. So what happens, let me kind of erase this. Let's say I plug in something like a negative two. Well, it flips it and instead of it being a negative two down here, like you would have had with y equals x, well, it flips it up here and then you get this point there, okay? So you get negative two comma positive two because it made it positive, okay? So let's think about some ordered pairs here. This is already graphed, but I want you to see something. So let me make an x, y table here. So we see that the lowest point occurs at zero comma zero right here. So a zero for x gives me a zero for y. That should make perfect sense for you because the absolute value operation is going to make things non-negative. So the smallest I can make y is by plugging in a zero for x. If I plug in a zero for x, I take the absolute value, I get a zero for y. If I plug in something positive, I'm gonna get a positive. And if I plug in something negative, I'm gonna get a positive. So absolutely the lowest we can go with y is by plugging in a zero for x. Now, another thing you can consider with this V-like shape, every Y value other than zero is going to be linked up with or associated with two different X values. So in other words, if I pick an X value of two, it's associated with a Y value of two. So an X value of two is associated with a Y value of two, but then also the negative two, that X value is associated with a Y value of positive two as well. So again, I can say plus or minus two for X, gives me a y value of two. You could do the same thing as you kind of move up the graph. So if you go to four, you have four comma four. So an x value of four gives you a y value of four. And then an x value of negative four gives you a y value of positive four as well. So again, that's how you're ending up with this V-like shape. It's taking this line right here. And as you go to the left of zero, right on the x-axis, it's kind of flipping this graph back up. So instead of you having y equals x, when x is less than zero, you have y equals negative x. All right, so let's talk a little bit about domain and range. I think it's fairly obvious from looking at the graph that for x values, it can basically be anything, right? And thinking about this from the equation, you always just think about what you can plug in for x. That's your domain, right? What can I plug in? What am I restricted from doing? The answer here is nothing, right? I can do whatever I want. So the domain is all real numbers. So from negative infinity to positive infinity, and then for the range, okay, for the range, what am I gonna have? Well, now I'm constrained because this absolute value operation is gonna make things non-negative. So the smallest it can be is zero, and then anything out to positive infinity. And again, you can see that clearly graphically. If I look at my y-axis, the lowest point here is going to be at zero on the y-axis. So my lowest y value would be zero. And then of course it extends out indefinitely going up. So it's out to positive infinity. All right, now let's go through kind of the definition of a piecewise defined function. So let's again, stay with f of x equals the absolute value of x. And essentially what happens with a piecewise defined function, or some people will say just piecewise function. Some people will say split definition function. Essentially with this type of function, it's defined by different rules over different intervals of the domain. So I kind of already showed this to you earlier. So essentially you could say y is equal to this absolute value of x, which kind of splits into two different rules. If x is greater than or equal to zero, then really y just equals x. So I can say it's just x if x is greater than or equal to zero. And then really it's the negative of x if x is less than zero. Because again, what happens is if I have a positive number or a zero that I plug in there, I just get the same thing for y. So if I plug in six, I get six for y. If I plug in 144, I get 144 for y, right? So on and so forth. But if I plug in a negative there, I take the negative of the negative. That's why you have a negative out in front of that and you end up with a positive. So if I wanna plug in a negative 144 there, Again, all I say is it's the negative of negative 144, and I get 144 as my output or my y value. 
So this is an example of a piecewise defined function. It's got different rules over kind of different intervals of the domain. Here we have one rule where we're kind of at zero or to the right of zero and another rule if we're to the left of zero. All right, so let's look at another common function that you're gonna come across. This guy is called the greatest integer function and it's also known as the floor function. Essentially, the greatest integer function is going to pair every real number x with the greatest integer that's less than or equal to x. So when we think about this guy, the floor function is actually a better name, in my opinion, because what you're doing is you're actually rounding it down to the nearest integer. Sometimes you hear greatest integer function, you get a little bit confused about what it's doing. So we have y equals the greatest integer of x here, and there's a few different ways we can write this. Let me just start by saying it's f of x equals, I can use the brackets here around x to indicate this. You might also see these kind of lines drawn in. Okay, that might be a way that you would see it. Another way you would see it, this is pretty common as well, you'll see something that kind of looks like an L. Essentially, it's a bracket where the top part's cut off. So all of this is doing is just telling you that you have the floor function. Okay, this is for the floor function, or again, the greatest integer function. For the purposes of what we're gonna do today, I'm just gonna use the brackets. So let's think a little bit about what happens here, and then we'll look at the graph. So if I plug something in for x, again, it's gonna round it down to the nearest integer. So let's say I plugged in 2.5 as an example. Well, just think about which two integers this guy is between. It's between two and three. So it always rounds it down, so it's gonna round it down to two. If I plugged in something like, let's say 1.7, okay, 1.7. A lot of people make the mistake and think that it's gonna round normally. It always just rounds down, okay? So it's gonna round down to one. So we can really write some rules here to kind of define what's going on. And you're not gonna write all of them because there's an infinite number, but let's just write a few. We can really say that if X is, let's say greater than or equal to negative one and less than zero, then what's gonna happen? If I'm in that range, it's going to round it down to negative one, right? So we can say that our f of x here is gonna be equal to negative one. If x is now greater than or equal to zero and less than one, again, if I'm in this range, I'm gonna go round down to zero. So here, f of x will be equal to zero. And we can continue this pattern. So if x is greater than or equal to one and less than two, Again, it's gonna round it down to one, so f of x will equal one. So let's think about this graphically now. So if we think about, let's just start with values that are greater than or equal to zero and less than one. So if we kind of come here and say, okay, if I choose a value for x that's zero, I know y is gonna be zero. So let's just say we have that point zero comma zero that's filled in. Now, as I choose values for x that are larger than zero, but not one, okay, not one, I'm just kind of filling this in because I'm staying at zero for my y value. Then when I get to an x value of actually one, what happens is my y value is now going to be one, so I've got to jump up here. So when x is one, y is one. So that's why that's filled in and this is not filled in. And then again, it continues. So y is going to be one as we increase x going up to but not including two. So that's why that's not filled in. We've got to jump up here. If x is two, now y is two. And again, it's always gonna be two up to the point where we get to three, then I've gotta jump up here. And again, this process continues forever and ever and ever, and also going down here as well. So that's why you see these three dots here and these three dots here. That just tells you that the pattern continues forever. It's similar to seeing arrows when you're graphing a line or some other kind of shape. Now, let's talk a little bit about the domain and range. Let's talk a little bit about the domain and range. Let me erase all of this. So we can write that in, let me put this back. Okay, so what's the domain and what is the range? Well, the domain is all real numbers because I can plug in anything for X, I'm not restricted there. So it's going to be from negative infinity to positive infinity. But for the range, I'm always going to get an integer value. If I plug in an integer for the domain, I get an integer, but if I plug in something that's not an integer, it gives me an integer, right, as an output. So the range we could say is the set of all y such that y is an integer, okay? So that's one way to write that. Now, let's talk about something else real quick and then we'll look at a few more of these. 
we want to talk about the fact that there's something known as a discontinuity in this graph. So this is a concept that you're going to need to know for calculus. And in fact, you're going to get a much more advanced definition when you get to calculus. But essentially, a function is continuous over an interval of its domain if we can sketch the graph of that interval without lifting the pencil from the paper okay, or pen or whatever you're using. When you get into calculus, again, you're going to get a more advanced definition that generally is going to involve limits. There's some other ways to think about it, too. But for now, this is going to give us a basic understanding. So when a function is not continuous at a given point, we can just say that it has a discontinuity there. So notice how when the greatest integer function is graphed, again, we've got to keep picking up our pencil. I start here. I go here, I gotta pick up my pencil, start here, go here, pick up my pencil, start here, go here. So everywhere there's an integer value for x, I have a discontinuity. All right, let's look at another example of a piecewise defined function. And what I want you to do here, and this is a common task, we wanna look at the graph and we wanna determine the domain and range and we also wanna come up with kind of the rules that are associated with this function. So what we can see here is that there's a discontinuity at x equals 2. Here's x equals 2. You see that if you were graphing this guy, you could graph this going down. You're not lifting your pencil. And then all of a sudden you get here and you've got to pick up your pencil and come up here. Okay. So there's a discontinuity at x equals 2. So what this shows me is that there's some kind of border here where essentially you have one rule on one side and another rule on the other. So if I'm writing a rule, I can say f of x is equal to, and let me just kind of put a bracket in there. So let me do that. So on one side, again, the border is 2. So I know this guy is including 2, and this guy is not. So we'll say one rule is where x is less than or equal to 2, and then another rule is where x is going to be greater than 2. Okay. So those are the two scenarios we're considering. Now, they're only going to give you stuff at this point that you know how to find, so you can see that this guy is basically a line and this guy is a line. So we just need to figure this out again from slope intercept form. This guy is going to cross at negative two on the y axis. So if I have y equals mx plus b, this guy crosses at negative two. So I know my b is negative two and we have y equals what's m? Well, to get from this point to this point, I go up one, two, three and to the left one. So it's negative three over one, which is just negative three. Right. So I have y equals negative three X minus two. So essentially my F of X or my Y is equal to negative three X minus two. If X is less than or equal to two. So negative three X. Let me kind of slide this down a little bit. And let me move this down. And I can just say minus two. OK, so what about this guy over here on the other side? We don't have a visible Y intercept. But that's okay, we can still go through and figure this out. We can see that our slope here, if I start here, I would go up one, two, and to the right, one, two. So the slope is one, right? It's two over two. So y equals one x plus, what's the y intercept going to be? Well, I can continue with this slope. I can just go down one to the left one, down one to the left one, down one to the left one. I know that I would impact the graph here. Right? You can see that that would be the case. That would be that line. So the y-intercept would occur at y equals 4. Okay, So this would be a 4 here. So essentially what I'd have is y or f of x equals x plus 4. So x plus 4 if x is greater than 2. Okay. Now let's copy this real quick. And we're going to look at another task that you'll come across. And then we'll come back up and talk about the domain and range. So you might be asked to kind of evaluate this guy. And so you'll have f of 3, f of 0, and f of negative 1. Essentially, what you have to do is go through and think about where do I fall in the domain. If I have f of 3, does 3 fall in the category of less than or equal to 2 or greater than 2? Well, it falls in this category here, so I follow this rule. So f of 3 is equal to 3 plus 4, which equals 7. And that's something you can verify on the graph. If I go back up and look at 3, this is an x value of 3, I have a y value of 7. Okay, so that's true. Then we look at the next one, which is f of 0. So f of 0. 
So now I'm in the category of here, which is less than or equal to two. So I have negative three times zero minus two. Negative three times zero is zero. So I just have negative two. And I can verify that when x is zero, I do have a y value that's negative two, right? That's negative two right there. So let's go back. For the last one, we have f of negative one. So f of negative one. And again, I'm in this category here. So I'd have negative three times negative one minus two. Negative three times negative one is going to be three. Three minus two is going to be positive one. And again, we can check that. So f of negative one, that's here, and that is positive one. So we're good to go on that. All right, so let's think about the domain and range for a second. That's something that does trip students up. So the domain and the range. We're gonna look at the graph and then we can also verify that by looking at these kind of pieces here. So for the domain, a lot of students incorrectly say that two is not included. That's wrong. You go to the left forever, you go to the right forever, two is included, it's included right there. The kind of closed circle means it's included, the open circle means it's not. So every real number is going to be part of the domain, including that two. So from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, the range is going to be limited. It continues up forever here and it continues up forever here, but the lowest point is right here, right? Where y is negative eight, okay? So I can see that negative eight is included and it's out to positive infinity. And looking at the equations here, this should make a little bit of sense. So we know that if x is greater than two, we use this guy, so x plus four. I can't plug in a two, but if I did, I would get six here. And then anything larger than two would give me a larger result. So this guy is going up. Now, if I think about the lowest I can make this, this negative three X minus two, what happens is the smallest I can make this is actually when X is two. If I plug in a two here, negative three times two is negative six. Negative six minus two is negative eight. If I keep decreasing X going this way, you can see that Y is actually increasing right? And the reason for that is because I'm multiplying a negative times a negative. So that gives me a positive, And then I'm just subtracting away two from that. So as this negative gets bigger and bigger, the result of this is going to get larger and larger. So that's why this guy's increasing as we move to the left on the X axis. All right, let's go ahead and look at one more of these and we'll just kind of wrap up the lesson. So let me put an arrow here. So this one's a little bit more tricky and involves a lot of different stuff. So you'll notice that in this case, we have a discontinuity here at x equals zero. Again, if you were graphing this, you would have to pick up your pencil here and jump up here. And then you have another one where x equals three. If I was graphing this, I'd have to stop here and jump up here, okay? So we know that there's kind of two different borders involved here. So we'll have f of x is equal to, let me kind of make my rule here. So we know that one of these guys, let me kind of slide this down because I'm gonna need some room. We know that one of these guys is going to be where x is less than or equal to zero. So if x is less than or equal to zero, another one is going to be if x is what? It's going to be equal to three and then less than that up to but not including zero. So we could say it's greater than zero and less than or equal to three. So that's gonna be another interval. And then lastly, we would say if x is greater than three, okay? Now let me use different colors here make this a little bit better. So I'll say if, and then I'll say if, and then I'll say if, right? Three different colors. So three different intervals we're gonna be working with. Let me make this a little bit better. So what are the rules here? Well, essentially, if X is less than or equal to zero, I'm dealing with this graph here, okay? And this shape here, you might remember from the last lesson where we talked about a parabola, the Y equals X squared, right? So f of x is gonna equal x squared. You can see that because again, if you start with zero, you get zero. If you plug in a negative one, you get one, right? So if I took negative one and squared it, I get one. If I plug in a negative two and I square that, I get four. If I plug in a negative three and I square that, I get nine. So you just have to go through a few points there and it becomes obvious that they're taking the x value and they're squaring it to get a y value. So this is f of x is gonna equal x squared if x is less than or equal to zero. Now, when x is larger than zero up to and including three, so zero is not included here, you see that's why there's an open circle. Three is included, that's why that's filled in. You have just a straight line here, and it's a horizontal line. 
So y is constant there. It's just equal to 3. So f of x is just equal to 3 if x is greater than 0 and less than or equal to 3. That's all it is, okay? Then what happens is if x is greater than 3, okay, that's why this is, again, not part of this. So if it's strictly greater than 3, we have this here. Again, I don't know what the y-intercept is, but I can determine the slope pretty easily. I can look at this and this and say I'm going up 1, 2, and to the right 1. So I would have y equals 2 over 1 or 2 times x plus, what would my y-intercept be? Well, if I continue moving down, I would go down 1, 2 to the left 1, down 1, 2 to the left 1, down 1, 2 to the left 1. Okay, so that would be my y-intercept. It would occur at negative 1 on the y-axis, so I can say 2x minus 1 would be my rule here, okay? And it's hard to kind of fit this in, so let me just slide this down a little bit. So I'll say 2x minus 1 if x is greater than 3. So these are our rules here. Again, x squared if x is less than or equal to 0. It's going to be just 3 if x is greater than 0 and less than or equal to 3. And then it's going to be 2x minus 1 if x is greater than 3. Okay. Let's, again, take this and evaluate some stuff, and then we'll look at the domain and range. So f of negative 2, how could we find that? Again, figure out where it comes into play. So that falls into this category where x is less than or equal to 0. So f of negative 2, I'd plug in a negative 2 for x and square it. f of negative 2 is going to be negative 2 squared, which is 4. Again, you can verify that. Here's negative 2. Here's 4. This is negative 2 comma 4 on the graph. Now, the next one is f of 1. So f of 1, and that falls in the category of being greater than 0 and less than or equal to 3. So here it's just 3, right? And you can verify that again by just looking at the graph. Here's 1. If I go up, I'm at 1 comma 3. That's where I'm going to be. All right, let's look at the last one. So f of 7 is going to be 1. Well, in this case, if x is greater than 3, I fall in this category. So it's 2 times 7 minus 1. 2 times 7 is 14. 14 minus 1 is 13. So I'd have a y value of 13. Now, we don't have that value on our graph, unfortunately, because it stops at a y value of 10. But if it did, you could verify that. And you could do a computer-generated graph if you wanted to and verify that. All right, so let's think about the domain and range and just kind of wrap things up here. So the domain and the range. So again, the domain is going to be all real numbers, okay? Because this is going to the left forever. This is going to the right forever. Again, where you get confused, let me kind of erase all this stuff I drew in. Where you get confused is these open circles here, they throw you off. Notice how you have this guy is closed at x equals 0. This guy is closed at x equals 3. So we do have 0 and 3 represented on the graph. It's just that we jump in each case, right? There's a discontinuity at each of those. So the domain, again, is all real numbers. So from negative infinity to positive infinity, we're covered. For the range, we are limited, right? So what happens is the smallest value here is 0. Okay, we can see that from the graph. And then a lot of students get this messed up as well because they see this open section right here and they think it's not involved. It's involved here in this graph there. So it is covered. And then it's going all the way up from there. So you're covered for every y value from 0 out to positive infinity. So that's going to be your range, okay? So you can say the domain here is all real numbers, and the range is from 0 to positive infinity. In this lesson, we want to determine where a function is increasing, decreasing, or constant from its graph. All right, so when you start talking about functions in their graphs, you're going to come across a section where you want to look at the graph and find the intervals where kind of the graph is increasing, it's decreasing, and then where it's constant. Now, this is something you can do without looking at a graph. When you get to calculus, you're going to talk about derivatives, and you're going to find methods where you can kind of use the derivative to determine this same information without looking at the graph. But that's a bit beyond what we can do at this point. So we're just going to stick to looking at the graph and observing the intervals where, again, we're increasing, decreasing, or constant. Now, you won't get any linear functions in this section of your book, but I want to start by talking about linear functions because they're very easy to work with. And they're going to demonstrate kind of something that's fundamental to what we're talking about here. 
So for this guy right here, this line, let's just get the equation going. We know the y-intercept occurs where. Let me make that better. The y-intercept occurs where. It's going to be right here. So it's 0, comma 3. So 0, comma 3. And the slope is what? If I started at this point right here, and I wanted to go to this point, I would rise 1, 2, 3, 4, and I would run to the right 1, 2. So m, my slope, again, is rise over run. And in this case, it's going to be 4 over 2, which is 2, right? And specifically here, it's positive 2. So we can say the equation is y equals 2, my slope, times x plus 3, my y-intercept. Or if you want to use function notation, you could say f of x equals 2x plus 3. That's up to you. But the main takeaway here is that with a positively sloped line, essentially as x increases or as we move to the right, y also increases. Okay, And with a line, because the slope is always the same, it's always increasing, it's always constant, or it's always decreasing. Right? It's one of those three things, unless you have a vertical line where the slope is undefined. But in this particular case, again, because we have a positively sloped line, as x increases, right, as we move to the right on the x-axis, y is going to increase. So we can say that this function, this y equals 2x plus 3 or f of x equals 2x plus 3, is increasing kind of over its whole domain, okay? So the way we want to write this, let me just erase all this. When you get in this section, they're going to ask you for the intervals where it's increasing, decreasing, or constant. So we're going to say increasing and I'll say on the interval. Well, for here, it's gonna be from negative infinity to positive infinity, again, across its entire domain, right? So if I go all the way to the left, as far as I can go, we have this arrow here that indicates it continues forever in the negative direction. As I go to the right, as far out as I can go, it's always increasing, okay? So from negative infinity to positive infinity, it's never decreasing and it's never going to be constant. All right, we also have negatively sloped lines. And for this guy, the reverse is going to be true. So for its entire domain, this function is going to be decreasing. As x values increase or we move to the right, y is going to decrease. So let's kind of do this formally. So this guy right here, the y-intercept is going to occur at 0, comma, negative 1. And the slope m is going to be what? If I want to go from this point to this point, I've got to fall 1, 2, 3, run to the right 1. So that's negative 3 for the rise, and it's a positive 1 for the run. So this is just negative 3. So I would say y equals negative 3x and then minus 1. Or again, you could say f of x equals negative 3x minus 1 if you want to use your function notation. But the main takeaway here is that, again, as x increases, as we move to the right on the x-axis, y is always decreasing. Okay, And this is from negative infinity out to positive infinity. So I'll say decreasing, again, on this interval from negative infinity to positive infinity. Again, it's not increasing anywhere and it's not constant anywhere. All right, so just to recap, when working with lines, the process is really easy. In fact, you're never gonna get a line in this section. I'm just showing you this for the purposes of getting our thought processes going. But it's easy because the slope is always the same, okay? So when the line has a positive slope, it increases across its entire domain. Again, from negative infinity to positive infinity. And when a line has a negative slope, it decreases across its entire domain. And then with a horizontal line, it's constant across its entire domain. Now, in most cases, and I would say pretty much in every case, you're going to be dealing with something that's not as simple as a line. So sometimes our graph is going to make all these weird twists and turns. And so over the span of its domain, you may have several changes between increasing, decreasing, and constant. Again, when you get to calculus, you'll be able to use the derivative to kind of find the increasing intervals, the decreasing intervals, and the constant intervals. But for right now, that's a bit beyond us. So let's just observe this kind of general definition, and then we'll move on and look at some kind of graphs. So f, our function is increasing if, across this given interval that we're looking at, for any two x values, let's call them x sub 1 and x sub 2, we could say that x sub 1 is less than x sub 2, and f of x sub 1 is less than f of x sub 2. So what this means is that, this x value is smaller than this x value. So this x value is to the left of this one, okay? Then plugging in this x sub 1, this smaller x value for the function and kind of getting the output results in a smaller value than using the larger x value as an input, right? The output there is larger. So to see this graphically, 
we see again that x sub 1 is to the left of x sub 2. So we know that means that x sub 1 is less than x sub 2. And we see that, if I kind of go up here, the f of x sub 1, or the y value associated with plugging in an x sub 1 for each occurrence of x in that function, is smaller than f of x sub 2, right? The y value associated with plugging in the larger x, or the x sub 2, for each occurrence of x in that function. So we can say that this function is increasing, right? As we go from left to right, the function is increasing over that interval if the y values are increasing over that interval. All right, now also you'll see f is decreasing if kind of the reverse is true. So we have x sub 1 is less than x sub 2, so this part's still the same, x sub 1 is still smaller. But now f of x sub 1 is greater than f of x sub 2. So plugging in the smaller x value results in a larger y value or a larger output than when we plug in the larger x value, right? Now we're getting a smaller output here. So when we look at this again, x sub 1 is less than x sub 2. We see that f of x sub 1 is higher than f of x sub 2. So this graph is falling as we move to the right. So it's decreasing over this interval. Now, lastly, we might see where it's constant. So we could say f our function is constant if x sub 1 is less than x sub 2, and f of x sub 1 is equal to f of x sub 2. So we all know what a horizontal line looks like. And essentially, over this interval, you have any given x sub 1 and x sub 2. x sub 1, again, is less than x sub 2. And the y values here are the same. So f of x sub 1 is the same as f of x sub 2. This generates a horizontal line. So here, the function is just constant. All right, let's take a look at the first example here. So I'm just going to put some arrows on this. And I'm going to say that this is y equals x squared. We've already seen this graph before in a previous lesson. So with this guy, again, I want to determine the intervals where it's increasing, decreasing, or constant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from kind of out here all the way to the left. From negative infinity to kind of going this way, what happens? Well, if I look at my y values, if I kind of think about it, I'm decreasing, right? As I'm going to the right, I'm decreasing, 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 until I get to zero, okay? And then after zero, then I'm increasing, 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 increasing. A lot of people will draw like a stick figure or a car or something like that to kind of illustrate. I'm not a good drawer, but I'll try my best. So my stick figure there would be walking downhill until he gets to zero. And then after zero, he'd kind of be walking uphill. So let me do that. So you can see that there. It's not a good drawing, but you get the idea. Another way you can think about this is, if I kind of think about an x value of negative 3 corresponds to a y value of positive 9, if I increase the x value by 1, if I go to negative 2, well, now my y value is positive 4. So increasing x resulted in me decreasing y. So again, that's how I know I'm decreasing Again, until I get to zero, and then I start increasing, right? If I look at an x value of 2, I get a y value of 4. If I look at an x value of 3, I now get a y value of 9, okay? So that's another way you can kind of think about this. So we can say that in terms of the intervals, we are decreasing on the interval from a negative infinity up to but not including zero, and then we're increasing we are increasing on the interval, again, not including zero out to positive infinity. So you might be asking, why didn't I include zero? And you might also be arguing, saying that your book includes zero. So these are both valid points. So the first thing is that I didn't include zero because if you think about what happens to this function when you're at zero, you're not increasing and you're not decreasing. In fact, the slope there, if you took the derivative and you looked at it specifically where x was 0, you'd find that the slope is 0, okay? So it's not positive, it's not negative, it's 0. So that means it's not increasing and it's not decreasing, so that's why I didn't include it. I just used the open notation so that it's excluded. The second point is your book might show this. Your book might do this. Now, is this wrong? The answer to that question is I would go with whatever your teacher tells you to do because ultimately they're grading your test. Most books, I would say the majority of them, and most teachers are gonna want you to use this notation here for the point that I just made, right? At zero, it's not increasing and it's not decreasing, so it's not included in either of these intervals, okay? But if your book uses this kind of bracket notation, follow your book, follow your teacher, go with what they tell you. 
Now, the other thing that you want to consider here is that when we list the intervals, it's in terms of X values. We're not listing ordered pairs and we're not listing Y values. So don't make that mistake. I am considering what is happening to the function, what is happening to kind of the Y values as I kind of look at these intervals on the X axis. So from the interval negative infinity up to but not including zero, the function is decreasing. Right, so the Y values are decreasing. Then when X is larger than zero, we can say the Y values are increasing again. So the function is increasing over that interval from zero out to positive infinity. So it's always in terms of the X values, that's what you're writing. All right, let's take a look at another one. So this is the graph of Y equals, we're gonna have X cubed minus, we're gonna have three X and then plus two. For right now, we just wanna observe from the graph where it's increasing, where it's decreasing, and where it may be constant. Well, again, if I kind of think about things coming from negative infinity, going to positive infinity. So again, I'm thinking about what's happening as I move across the X axis, as I go to the right. So starting from negative infinity, going up to this kind of negative one on the X axis, I'm increasing, right? So I can, again, draw my little stick figure. This guy would be walking uphill the whole time. When he gets to an X value of negative one, he would kind of change and then right here, he would be walking downhill. So he'd be walking downhill until he got to an X value of positive one, and then he would be walking uphill again from positive one, that X value, out to positive infinity, okay? So if you think about it this way, for the increasing intervals, so we would be increasing on, okay, the intervals, one interval would be from negative infinity, up to, but not including negative one. And then another interval would be from positive one and then out to positive infinity. Now, let's talk about the decreasing. So we'll say it's decreasing on what interval? So that's gonna be from negative one to positive one. Again, I'm not gonna include either one of those. So at negative one and positive one, you kind of have these turning points here. And the slope here, the derivative of the function, when x is negative one and when x is positive one, it's going to be zero. So I'm not gonna say it's increasing and I'm not gonna say it's decreasing. Okay, before we move on to the next problem, I wanna talk about another common source of confusion. So if your book specifically asks you for the intervals where this function's increasing, decreasing, or constant, you don't wanna put a union symbol in here. Okay, you see that a lot. So sometimes you have more than one interval involved in one of your answers. So you'll see students go, okay, it's this guy and then union with this guy. That's not correct. So if I'm asking you for an interval, what am I asking you for? Let's go to a number line real quick and think about this. Let's say I had an interval from three to six with three and six not included. So that's this interval here. Essentially, it's a set of numbers that's kind of between two numbers where the endpoints could be included or not included. You can't have a gap, right? So you can't say, well, I have another interval from negative five to negative one, and let's say I have this guy right here. I can't just use a union symbol and say, okay, this is now one long kind of interval. Okay, that doesn't make sense. This is a set that contains the union of those two intervals, okay? But it's not one long interval. That wouldn't make any sense, okay? You can't have a gap like that. So if they're asking you for the intervals, okay, intervals, plural, then just put a comma between them or use the word and, okay? This is a common trap question because they might give you a multiple choice and they might put a union symbol in between the two and they might give you a choice like this and you might be scratching your head and say, okay, well, I've used this a lot. So you might check this one as correct, but what happens is this one would be wrong, okay? Because they asked you for the intervals, okay? So if we go back, we wanna list it like this or just put the word and kind of in between them. If the question is asked differently, okay, this is the thing that gets confusing, then you might be able to use your union symbol. If we're just talking about where's the function increasing and there's no mention of give the intervals, well then you could give it with that kind of union statement because you're just looking for the set that kind of satisfies that answer and that set would contain these two intervals and you could join those with a union symbol, that would be fine, okay? So if you're given the question in that way, it's okay. But if you're specifically asked for kind of the intervals where the function's increasing, decreasing, or constant, you wanna make sure to just kind of use a comma if you have kind of two different intervals there or use the word and.
Okay, and that's all you want to do. All right, let's look at another. So this guy is going to be y is equal to the square root of the absolute value of x. So where is it increasing, where is it decreasing, and where is it constant? Well, again, as I move to the right, again, if I draw my stick man figure, this guy is going to be walking at a slight decline. Okay, it's not a massive decline, but it is decreasing. So as I move to the right, it's decreasing from negative infinity up to the point where I get to zero, and then he's going to be increasing out to positive infinity. Okay, so we can say that it's decreasing on the interval from negative infinity to zero, again, with zero not being included, and then increasing, okay, on the interval from, again, zero not being included out to positive infinity. What about this guy right here? Let me draw some arrows in here. We should recognize this guy as being the function y equals one over x. Or again, you could say f of x equals one over x if you want. So essentially, what's happening as I move to the right? Well, from here, remember, we're infinitely close to zero. And as we move to the right, we start decreasing, 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 decreasing as we approach zero, but we'll never touch it, okay? So I know to kind of the left of zero, I'm always decreasing, okay? So from negative infinity to zero, I'm decreasing. So decreasing on. And from this guy right here, as we move to the right, what's happening? Well, my y values start out up here, basically going to positive infinity, and I'm coming down, 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 down as I move to the right, and I'm still decreasing, right? I'm going towards a y value of zero, but I'm never gonna touch it. I'm gonna keep decreasing forever and ever and ever. So I can also say comma, again, I'm gonna have another kind of thing to list here. We're gonna say anything larger than zero out to positive infinity. Okay, so from negative infinity to zero, not included, and then from zero to infinity, again, zero not included. Again, don't put a union symbol in there, that's not correct. All right, for the final example, I'm gonna give you one that's just kind of made up. This is a drawing that I came up with. You'll see a lot of these in your textbook, just to give you a couple of examples where you have some kind of constant, some decreasing, some increasing, a lot of stuff going on. So if we look at this guy, again, if I use my little stick figure, What's going on here is that we start out, as we come from negative infinity, we're going to be increasing up to the point where we get to an x value of negative four, okay? So let me just write this. We're gonna say increasing on, so from negative infinity up to not including negative four, and then let me put decreasing on, so decreasing on. So next, the stick figure is going to be walking downhill, right? Starting at negative four, that x value going all the way up to an x value that is negative one. Okay, this is negative one here. So we'll say from negative four to negative one. Again, neither of those is going to be included. Let me make this a little better. So negative four, negative one. And then this guy right here, again, let me kind of change colors. He's going to start walking uphill now. Starting at an x value of negative one, he's walking uphill until he gets to an x value of two, okay? So it's going to be increasing. The other interval is going to be from negative one up to positive two. Again, neither of those is included, okay? And then once he gets here, he's walking flat, okay? So from an x value of two to an x value of six, it's flat or it's constant, okay? So we'll say constant on, okay, the interval is going to be from two to six. Again, neither is included. And then lastly, as we get past an x value of six and we go out to positive infinity, this guy would be walking downhill. So we could say it's decreasing over another interval. Again, anything larger than six. So again, six is not included out to positive infinity. In this lesson, we want to talk about graphing techniques. We're going to focus on stretching or shrinking a graph. So what we wanna to do today is we wanna to start to think about ways where we can graph functions that are defined by altering the equation of one of our elementary functions. So over the course of the next few lessons, we're gonna develop techniques for graphing these types of equations. Collectively, we refer to these graphing techniques as transformations. 
So we're going to begin by looking at stretching and shrinking a graph. Then on kind of our following two lessons, we'll talk about reflections. We'll also talk about horizontal and vertical shifts. So we're going to begin with f of x equals x squared. So you'll remember this is our squaring function. So we plug something in for x, our input. We square it and we get our y or our f of x as our output. So we already see that I've kind of pre-plotted some points and graphed this guy. But let's just go ahead and fill in this kind of table of values. Let's choose an x value of negative 2 to start. I know that if I squared negative 2, I would get 4. And if we did negative 1, we'd get 1. 0 would give me 0. 1 would give me 1. And 2 would give me 4. Now, I've plotted additional points here. I have my negative 2, 4 here. I have my negative 1, 1 here, my 0, 0 here, my 1, 1 here, and my 2, 4 here. I also have my negative 3, 9 right there, and my 3, 9 there. So I can't fit all that here because I'm out of space, and we only need a few of these values to kind of compare in our next section anyway. But I just want you to get the idea here. These are the kind of basic points that you should associate with y equals x squared or f of x equals x squared. So every time you want to graph this guy, you know these points by heart, and you can kind of sketch this graph very quickly. Now, knowing that we've committed f of x equals x squared kind of to memory, we know the points associated with it, we know the shape. Suppose we had a new function where we take this original function and we multiply the right side by 2. So in other words, we have f of x equals x squared, so focus on this x squared part. Now we have g of x equals 2 times this x squared. So essentially I can write g of x by saying it's 2, this number right here, times f of x. What's f of x? It's x squared. So times f of x. You'll see this notation in your textbook. And what's going to happen is this is going to give us a vertical stretch. Okay, and I'll explain why in a minute. But essentially for the same x value, the y value is now going to be twice as large. So we filled out this table of values before. We said negative 2, 4. We said negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 4. So if I keep the same x values, so negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, the y values here now for g of x will be twice as large as the y values for f of x, again, given the same x value. So instead of a y value of 4 when x is negative 2, now it's going to be 8. And again, think about why that's the case. I plug something in for x, I square it. Now, instead of getting my output, I still got to multiply it by 2, okay? So the original output is multiplied by 2, and now I have my output, okay? So that's why I can take this y value of 4, multiply by 2 to get 8. Negative 2 squared is 4, then times 2 would give me 8. So this guy, 1, would now be times 2, so that's 2. 0 times 2 is still 0. Then 1 times 2 is going to give me 2, and of course, 4 times 2 is going to give me 8. So again, for the same x value, y is going to be twice as large. So this is going to create a graph that is vertically stretched. When compared to f of x equals x squared, you're going to see that it's skinnier or narrower. So let's take a look at this visually. So the guy in orange, this is my original f of x is equal to x squared. And this guy in light blue, this is my g of x is equal to 2 times x squared, or really we could say g of x is 2 times f of x, okay? So this multiplication of 2 times this function f of x is what's creating this vertical stretch, okay, this vertical stretch, which just means that we are pulling the graph away from the x-axis. A lot of times we like to think about it by saying, okay, well, if this point here originally on f of x equals x squared was 2 comma 4. So let's kind of highlight that real quick. Now that same x value of 2 is associated with a y value that is twice as high. So it's up here. So you see how that's pulling the graph away from the x-axis. Okay, so that's what we talk about when we say that we have a vertical stretch. Again, it's being pulled away from the x-axis or the horizontal axis. Now, let's look at the other scenario. So we have f of x equals x squared, and now we have g of x is set equal to 1 half times x squared. So now what I have is g of x is really 1 half times f of x. Again, f of x is x squared, so 1 half times x squared is this g of x. So what's going to happen is for a given x value, now my y value is going to be half as large. So instead of having a vertical stretch, right, where it's narrower or skinnier, right, it's being pulled away from the x-axis, 
Now what we're going to have is we're going to have a vertical shrink or a vertical compression, okay? So if this guy, again, is negative 2, 4, negative 1, 1, if it's 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 4, these guys, if I stay with the same x values, so negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, these guys are going to be half as large as these guys. So I would have 2 instead of 4. I would have 1 half instead of 1. 0 would be the same, right? Because 0 times a half is still 0. And then 1, again, that would be 1 half. And then 4, that would be 2, right? Everything I did here was I just took these y values and I just multiplied them by a half to get these y values. Okay, that's all I did. Now, if we look at this visually, we can see that this guy right here is my f of x equals x squared. And then this blue guy, this is my g of x equals 1 half times x squared, okay? 1 half times x squared. Let me make, let me make that a little bit clearer. And again, let me show you this with a point. So if we have 2 comma 4, that's here. Now the x value of 2 is associated with a y value that's only 2. So what happens is this creates a vertical shrink or vertical compression. It's a movement towards the x-axis, okay? It's a movement towards the x-axis. All right, so let's talk about the general rule. This is something you want to write down in your notes. And then from here, it's very, very easy to kind of answer questions about whether there'll be a vertical stretch or a vertical shrink. And then also it's easy to kind of graph things if you already know what the parent function looks like. So g of x equals a, okay, some number a, times f of x. Now for the purposes of what we're going to do today, a is going to be positive. Okay, I'll talk about negative scenarios when we get to reflection in the next lesson. So A, if it's greater than 1, it's a vertical stretch. We saw that if we had 2 times f of x, in this graph here, we had a vertical stretch. Again, it was a movement away from the x-axis. Then if A is greater than 0 and less than 1, we're going to have a vertical compression. Right? We saw this with 1 half times f of x. We can see that here. Again, we had a movement towards the x-axis. All right, so suppose we look at f of x equals the square root of x, and then g of x is equal to 2 times the square root of x. So really, again, g of x can be defined as 2 times f of x. Okay, that's all it is, because f of x is the square root of x. Well, 2 times the square root of x, well, it's 2 times f of x, right? That's what g of x is. So what's going to happen is for a given x value, the y value is now twice as large, right? I can just multiply it by two. So this will give me a vertical stretch, right? Or a movement away from the x axis. So if we look at the two graphs here, this guy is the graph of f of x is equal to the square root of x. Then this guy here is gonna be g of x. Let me make that g a little bit better. The g of x is equal to, again, two times the square root of x. So the way to graph this kind of quickly, if you don't want to use kind of like a T table or something like that, if you already know f of x equals square root of x, if you already know what that looks like, then essentially what happens is you take each y value, okay, for the same x value, you just multiply it by 2. So 0 comma 0 is still there, okay? But if I go to 1, right, I know that square root of 1 is 1. So that's this point here, 1 comma 1. But now in the g of x function, if I take the square root of 1, I get 1, but now I multiply it by 2. So now I have an x value of 1 corresponding to a y value of 2. And as we move to the right, this point here that's 4 comma 2 would now be 4 comma 4, right? Because I took that y value of 2 and multiplied it by 2 to get a y value of 4. And here where we have 9 comma 3, just multiply the y value of 3 by 2 to get 6. So now it would be 9 comma 6. So once you have these kind of four points, you can sketch the graph of this g of x very, very quickly, right? But the main thing here is to understand that you have a vertical stretch here, or again, a movement away, okay, a movement away from the x axis. All right, so now let's look at f of x equals the absolute value of x, and then g of x equals one half times the absolute value of x. So again, g of x can be defined as what? I've got this one half that is multiplying f of x, right? f of x is the absolute value of x. One half is multiplying f of x. So g of x is one half times f of x, okay? So we know at this point, because this guy is between zero and one, it's going to create a vertical compression or a vertical shrink. So looking at this guy, this is the original f of x equals absolute value of x. Then this guy right here is what? It's g of x is equal to one half times the absolute value of x. So again, thinking about this, if I want to graph it quickly without a t-table, for a given x value, the y value is now half as large. 
So zero, zero is still gonna be there, right? Because if I plug in a zero, I get zero. Zero times a half is still zero. But if I move out, let's say I do two, well, two is associated with a y value of two here, okay? But in the new g of x, I just cut it in half, and so two is associated with a y value of one. You can just keep doing this to get enough points to kind of graph this pretty quickly. But one of the main things is to understand that you would have a vertical compression here because this number right here that's multiplying f of x is going to be between zero and one, right? It's greater than zero and less than one. So that's what's creating this kind of vertical compression or movement towards the x axis. All right, so we're also going to come across horizontal stretching and compression. So with a horizontal stretch now, it's going to be a stretching of the graph away from the y-axis, okay? We saw with a vertical stretch, we stretch the graph away from the x-axis. With a horizontal stretch, we're now stretching it away from the y-axis, okay? With a horizontal compression, this is now going to be a squeezing or compression of the graph towards the y-axis. Again, with a vertical compression, we were compressing it towards the x-axis. Now with a horizontal compression, we are compressing it towards the y-axis. Now, what's going to happen is we have g of x that's defined as being equal to f of ax. So let's think about this notation for a minute. I know we've all seen this at this point. If we see something like f of 2, we know we just plug in a 2 for each occurrence of x and f of x. So this is no more challenging. I just take ax, plug it in for each occurrence of x and f of x. So if I had something like, let's say, f of 2x, let's say I had that. Wherever where I have an x in my function, just plug in a 2x. That's all it is. Okay, nothing fancy. Now, here comes the confusing part. And I'm just going to tell you in advance, it's a little bit more challenging to understand a horizontal stretch and a horizontal compression versus a vertical stretch and a vertical compression. What's going to happen is, to obtain this g of x based on our original function f of x, we can essentially just multiply each x-coordinate of that original function by 1 over a. So let me write that down. So 1 over a. And this part's going to be confusing. We'll see when we get to the example that it takes a minute to kind of wrap your head around where this comes from. So if a is greater than 1, now we're going to have a horizontal compression. And if a is greater than 0 and less than 1, now we're going to have a horizontal stretch. So the first thing that makes it confusing, it's kind of hard to keep track of kind of what's going on. Okay. And the second thing is this 1 over a is really confusing. Where did this come from and why does this kind of happen? Essentially for a given y value now, the x values are obtained by kind of taking those x values from f of x and multiplying them by this 1 over a. So let's look at an example so this can be more clear. So we have f of x equals x squared. We already know this function. We've committed the points to memory. So we know negative 2, 4. We know negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 4. But essentially what I just told you was that for this g of x here, it's equal to this 2x and this is being squared. Well, what I can write this as is what? This guy right here is essentially just plugged in for x. This guy is plugged in for x. So what I can say is that I have g of x being defined as f of this 2x, okay, this 2x. And notice that it's this 2 that's multiplying the x, so this is my value for a, okay? That's my value for a. If I go back, it's a times x that's inside these kind of parentheses. In this case, that value is going to be 2. Okay, so let me write this off to the side, just say a is 2. Now, I told you that for a given y value, I can find kind of the new x values that's associated with this g of x by taking these x values and multiplying them by 1 over a. So in this case, a is 2, so 1 over a is going to be 1 over 2 or 1 half. And this is the part that's going to be tricky. It's not going to make sense at first. So let's copy these y values. We have 4, 1, 0, 1, and 4. And then I'm going to just find my x values by kind of taking these and multiplying them by a half. So let's just put times 1 half there. That kind of looks like an x, so let me just put a times like that. So negative 2 times a half is going to be negative 1. Negative 1 times a half is going to be negative 1 half. 0 times a half is still 0. 1 times a half is 1 half. And then 2 times a half is 1. Okay, so the intuition here is that for a given y value, the x value should have been doubled, right? Because this guy is a 2, but in fact, they were cut in half. So what caused that? Well, what's going on here is that, let me kind of erase this for a second. We have this 2 here that is multiplying x before it gets squared, okay? So now what's going to happen is this y value 
is associated with an x value that is half as large as it was before. Again, this is really tricky to wrap your head around at first, but if you think about it, the one half is just what's needed to kind of undo this multiplication by two and get this kind of new x value that's associated with that y value. So in this example, if x is one, y is one. But here, if y is one, well, x needs to be one half. And the reason for that is I have one half that gets multiplied by two first, and then it's squared. So what's gonna happen is because of this, we have that same y value that's associated with an x value that's half as large. This is compressing the graph horizontally or moving it towards the y axis. So let's look at the graphs. So this is going to be my original f of x equals x squared. And then in blue, we have our g of x, which is equal to 2x, and this amount is squared. So let's just take a point, right? Let's just take, let's say this 2 comma 4. So this 2 comma 4 on the original f of x equals x squared. Well, now what's gonna happen is this y value of four is associated with an x value of one now instead of two. And I know it's also associated over here on the left, but let's just focus with these points right here on the right. So what's happening is we're getting a horizontal compression or a movement towards this y axis, because again, we have this two that is multiplying x before it gets squared. Okay, so that y value is now associated with an x value that is half as large. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Now, let me kind of address a point of some confusion. You might be scratching your head and telling me that this graph is stretched vertically. Well, in fact, you would be correct because in this particular case, it does work out because we could say that really g of x is what? If I squared two, I would have four. If I squared x, I'd have x squared. Well, I can also say that g of x is really just four times f of x, right? If f of x is x squared. So if I look at, let me kind of erase this. If I look at this this way, well, really for a given point, let's say I chose the point one comma one on the original. Well, now that x value is associated with a y value that's four times as large, right? One comma four. But I want you to kind of not get into this method of thinking. Okay, you wanna stay consistent with how the problem is presented. So if they give it to you as g of x equals f of ax, then you wanna show this as a horizontal compression or a stretch, okay? So in this particular case, the way we got this problem was in this format. It was g of x is equal to f of 2x. So we're gonna show this as a compression or a movement towards the y axis, okay? And again, this is something you gotta stay consistent with because if you don't, you're gonna get problems later on when you get more challenging functions. So suppose we have f of x equals x cubed minus x, and then g of x is one half x cubed minus one half x. Okay, so this guy right here is just plugged in essentially everywhere I have an x. So what I can say is that this guy, g of x, can be defined as f of one half x, okay? So if I plugged in a one half x here, I would have one half x, that amount cubed, and then minus, if I plugged in a one half x here, I'd have just one half x, which is what I have, okay? So what I'm gonna do is just get some points going. We don't work with this one very often, so we have to kind of go through the operations. So if I had a zero for x, I'd have a zero for y, right? That's pretty easy to see. If I had a negative one for x, I'd have negative one cubed, minus negative one. So negative one cubed is negative one, minus a negative one is plus one, this would be zero. Then if I had, let's say a positive one, what would I have? So if this was plus one and this was plus one, I would also get a zero, right? Because one cubed is still one, and then I'm subtracting away one, which is also zero. So then let's just do negative two and two. So let's do negative two and two, if I had negative two and that was cubed, that would give me negative eight. And then minus a negative two is plus two. So this would be negative six. Then if I had positive two cubed, that would be positive eight. And then I would subtract away this two here and that would give me a positive six. All right, so we have some kind of ordered pairs going. We have five of them. And essentially what I wanna do now is use my rule. We know that for a given y value, so let's copy those. We have this zero, zero, zero again, negative six and six. For these given y values, I can just take the x values that are associated and I can just multiply them by one over a. In this case, my a 
the guy that's multiplying the x is one half. So one over one half is what? This is division with fractions. It's basically one times two over one, which is just two, okay? So now what's gonna happen is I'm gonna multiply each of these guys by two. So zero times two is still zero. Negative one times two is negative two. One times two is two. Negative two times two is negative four. And two times two is four. So we have all these points here that are going to be associated with this kind of g of x function. And again, for a given y value, the x values have just been multiplied by two from that f of x function. So what's gonna happen is we are gonna horizontally stretch, okay? We're gonna horizontally stretch this function. So let's take a look. So we've already kind of plotted the points and sketched everything. This guy is f of x equals x cubed minus x. And this guy in blue is g of x is equal to, let's just go ahead and say it's f of one half x to make it a little bit more simple. And essentially what I see is that what? Let's say I take an x value of positive two. Well, here it's associated with a y value of six. Well, now that same y value of six is associated with an x value that's twice as large, right? So this guy over here, this x value is four. So you can see that this guy has been horizontally stretched, right? It's moving away from the y-axis. So that's what's going on, and it's by a factor of, again, one over this, one over one half, which is two. So when you work with this horizontal stretch and horizontal compression, you've gotta be able to keep this straight in your mind. You've gotta remember that this guy right here, this ends up being a, okay? And it stretches it horizontally by a factor of one over a. So what happens is if a is going to be kind of larger than one, then you're gonna end up with a fraction here, right? You're gonna end up with some amount that is kind of smaller than one. So you are horizontally shrinking or compressing it. If your a value is less than one and greater than zero, well then what happens is you're dividing by a fractional amount. Let's just say this was one fourth as an example. One divided by a fourth is the same thing as multiplying by four. And so we're kind of horizontally stretching this guy by a factor of four. So those are the things you have to keep in mind when you work with a horizontal stretch or horizontal compression. In this lesson, we wanna talk about graphing techniques. And here specifically, we're gonna focus on reflecting a graph across an axis. All right, so in our last lesson, we discussed the concept of stretching or shrinking a graph. Now we're just gonna go a step further and discuss the next type of transformation. This is where we're gonna reflect the graph across an axis. So we're gonna to begin today by looking at our square root function. So we have f of x equals the square root of x. This is a function that at this point you've probably committed to memory. If you haven't, it's something you should commit to memory because you're gonna see it a lot, okay? So let's just get some ordered pairs going or some points if you wanna call it that going because we need to compare them to something on the next page. So I know my input x, I'm gonna plug something in there. I'm gonna take the square root of that and I'm gonna get my output y or f of x. So if I plug something in for x, I want it to be a perfect square so I get a nice clean answer. So I'm gonna start with zero. Take square root of zero, I get zero then one, take square root of one, I get one. And then for four, I would get two. For nine, I would get three. And then for 16, I would get four. Okay, so kind of looking at this, I've already plotted the first four points. I can't fit 16 comma four on the graph. It's just too, too small, right? It's just gonna be cut off. So if I look at zero comma zero, that's going to be here. And then one comma one is here. And then four comma two is here. And then of course, nine comma three is here. So these are the points that you should kind of commit to memory so that you can quickly graph this kind of square root function, okay? And it's already done for, so I don't need to trace over it. You just need to understand the general shape of this guy. Now, suppose we introduce something g of x that looks very similar to f of x. So first let's study these two functions. So we have f of x, again, it's just the square root function. It's the square root of x. And then g of x is now the negative of the square root of x. So this part right here and this part right here, those are gonna be the same. The difference is this negative out in front. So really based on this, I could define g of x, I could define g of x as being this negative of f of x because f of x is the square root of x and here I have the negative of the square root of x. So this is the negative of f of x. Now, how is this going to kind of affect or change the graph? 
when I have this negative out in front? Well, let's make a table of values for each one and then we can compare the two. So we know this was zero, zero, it was one, one, it was four, two, it was nine, three, and 16, four. So what's gonna happen here? I plug something in for X, I plug something in for X, I take the square root, okay? So that was my original output here, but now I need to take the negative of it. So there's an extra step. So essentially for a given X value, the Y value will be its opposite. So let's copy these X values. We've got zero, one, four, nine, and 16. And then just take these corresponding Y values over here and change them into their kind of opposite. So the negative of zero is just zero. The negative of one is negative one. The negative of two is negative two. The negative of three is negative three. And then the negative of four is negative four. All right, so kind of looking at these two tables here, we should get an idea of what's going on. Essentially, for the same X value, I now have two different Y values, okay? So I have one that's positive and one that's negative. So let's look at this graphically. And what we see here is that this is the original guy right here. This is my F of X equals the square root of X. Then this guy down here, let me just change colors. This is my G of X is equal to the negative of the square root of X, okay? Or again, you could say this is G of X is equal to the negative of F of X if you want to define it that way, that's fine. What we see here, again, for a given X value, let's just say I have an X value of four, I now have a Y value of two and then also negative two, okay, negative two. So what happens is you can think about this as if we flipped the graph or folded the graph over the X axis, okay? And this is what is known as kind of reflecting the graph across the X axis. I took this original guy here in orange and I flipped it over the X axis or I folded it over the X axis. And so it creates what's known as a reflection across the X axis. So let's look at another scenario now. So suppose we have f of x and g of x, and now g of x is defined just a little bit differently. So f of x is the same, it's the square root of x. It's the square root of x. But now g of x is the square root of negative x. So this is a bit different. Essentially, this negative is what's making it different. So really, I could say if I plugged in a negative x, for x in that function, I'd have my g of x, right? So I could now define g of x by saying it's what? It's f of negative x. Again, if I take a negative x and I plug it in for x, I'm gonna have my g of x. g of x is the square root of negative x. Okay, so now that we understand that, let's think about what's gonna happen with this guy. So again, these guys we should know by memory, zero, zero, one, one, we have four, two, we have nine, three, and 16, four. So what's gonna happen is again, I'm gonna plug something in for X. I'm gonna take the opposite of it now before I take the square root. Well, I want you to think about the fact that with this guy right here, it's defined for X values that are greater than or equal to zero, right? I can't take the square root of something that is negative in the real number system. Of course, we can do it with kind of complex numbers, but we're not working in that kind of frame right now. For this guy, I've got to think about the fact that this one right here is going to change things. I plug something in for X, I take the opposite of it. So really, I'm going to be restricted to values that are going to be zero or less. So zero or less. So we can say that X needs to be less than or equal to zero here, okay? So thinking about that, what's gonna happen is for a given Y value, now I'm gonna have kind of the opposite X value. So if I copy these Y values down, zero, one, two, three, and four, what I can say is that this would still be zero because the negative of zero is just zero. This guy would now be negative one, this would be negative four, this would be negative nine, and this would be negative 16. And if you don't believe me, try that out. Let's say I plugged in a negative one. The negative of negative one is one. So I would have the square root of, again, the negative of negative one. So that would give me the square root of one, which is one. Okay, so that's how I get my answer there. If I had the negative of negative four, okay, of negative four, that becomes the square root of positive four, which is two. So that's how I get that answer there. So on and so forth. So this kind of negative that's plugged in here with this X, what it does is for a given Y value, now I'm gonna have the opposite X value, okay? So let's look at this graphically. 
So now this graph is gonna be reflected across this Y axis, okay? And again, when I say reflected, you could just think about folding the graph. So if I start with this orange graph here, if I fold it across the Y axis, I'm gonna end up with this guy over here. That's what we mean when we say we're reflecting it across the Y axis. It's a folding or flipping a graph over the line of reflection. In this case, the line of reflection is the Y axis. The main thing here is to understand that for a given Y value, I have X and then negative X. So let's say I take a Y value of let's say three. Okay, so here's three. So I have an X value of nine, right? Nine with this point here. And then I also have an X value of negative nine with this point here, okay? So that's what you need to understand. When you reflect over the x-axis, you're going to have for each given x value, a y and then a negative y, okay? When you reflect over the y-axis, for any given y value, you're gonna have an x and then a negative x, okay? And let's break this down to a general rule. So as a general rule, if g of x is equal to the negative of f of x, so notice how this is outside, it's the same as the graph of f of x reflected across the x-axis. So again, that just means folded across the x-axis. So if you have f of x, and on that f of x you have x comma y, well then on g of x you're going to have x comma negative y. Again, here was that scenario, right? This was reflected across the x-axis for a point on f of x, like let's take this point here, where it is 4 comma 2, so this is 4 comma 2, on g of x, the same x value, which is 4, now corresponds to a y value that's the negative of this one. So it's 4 comma negative 2. So that's what that means. Now, alternatively, if g of x is equal to f of negative x, so notice how this is inside now. This is the same as the graph of f of x reflected across the y axis, okay? So if you have f of x and there's a point on there x comma y, well then for g of x, it's gonna be the negative of x comma y. And again, we saw this right here, right? And I already showed you this. So for this given y value of three, you have this point here that is going to be nine comma three. And then you also have this point here, which is negative nine comma three. So for that given y value of three, you have negative nine and you have positive nine as x values that are kind of associated with that y value of three. All right, so let's suppose we wanted to work with g of x is equal to the negative of x squared. And for reference sake, I included this f of x equals x squared, our squaring function. As you kind of progress, you're just gonna be given one function and you have to kind of pair it up with this parent function. This is one that you're gonna know, you're gonna have it committed to memory. Again, this is the squaring function. So essentially, I can define g of x as being the negative of f of x. Notice how this guy, again, is outside. OK, it's multiplying the outside. So the negative of x squared. So how can we graph this really quickly? Well, essentially, I know that by rule, if I go back up, if g of x is equal to the negative of f of x, it's the same as the graph of f of x reflected or again folded across the x axis. So all I need to do is graph f of x equals x squared and then just flip it over the x axis. So I've already kind of done this. And essentially you should know what this graph looks like at this point. This is again my f of x equals x squared. And this is going to be my g of x, which you could define as negative x squared, or you could say negative of f of x. Either way is fine. But essentially you'll notice that this graph is just folded over the x-axis. So it's folded over this guy right here, or you could say reflected across the x-axis. And again, all you have to do is if you know this graph by memory, just take these kind of points. Zero comma zero is gonna be on there, you know that. But let's say I take something like this one comma one here. Let me highlight that. Well, I know that for a given x value, now the y value is gonna be its opposite. So instead of one comma one, now it's gonna be one comma negative one. So I have that. So instead of negative one comma one, it's negative one comma negative one, right? So on and so forth. So this guy right here, instead of two comma four, it's two comma negative four. Instead of negative two comma four, it's negative two comma negative four. And you can do that, get enough points going and you can quickly sketch your graph. All right, so let's look at one that's a little bit tricky. And this is gonna come up again in our next lesson. But suppose we have f of x equals one over x and g of x equals one over negative x. 
So how can we define g of x? So g of x is equal to what? Is it the negative of f of x or is g of x equal to f of negative x? Let's think about this. Again, f of x is one over x and g of x is one over negative x. Okay, so if I plugged in a negative x there, would that get me here? Well, yeah, it would. g of x could be defined as f of negative x. Now, you might see that and say, okay, I'm done, but there's an extra thing here. Because this is a fraction, I could also define it this way, okay? Why does that work? Suppose I said that I had the negative of one over x. Well, really, this just means that I have what? I could have negative one over x, or I could have one over negative x. Both of those would really be negative one over x because a negative in the numerator with a positive in the denominator, or kind of flipping that, a positive in the numerator and the negative in the denominator, doesn't matter as long as one sign is negative, one sign is positive, you're gonna end up with a negative overall. So you can actually define this function either way, okay? And we're gonna talk about this scenario in the next lesson when we talk about even and odd functions. For now, you can just grab either method you want and kind of sketch the graph. It will work out either way. So let me show that to you. So this is our graph kind of pre-drawn. This guy again is f of x equals one over x. So that's the orange. So you have this and then you have this over here. Okay. Again, because of the way this guy reacts, because you have this X in the denominator, you can't ever get an X value of zero. So that's why this guy has this behavior. As you get closer and closer to zero, kind of going towards zero, coming from the right, going to the left, you notice the Y values get really, 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 really big, right? They approach infinity. Because as I'm dividing by something that's kind of getting closer to zero, you can think about dividing by something really, really small, like 0. 0.0000, let's just say one. If I divide one by this number, it's gonna be a really big number, okay? And I can keep making that infinitely close to zero as far out as I want, right? So I can make this as high as I want. Or over here, if I think about it in the negative direction, I can make it as low as I want, okay? The other thing also, you'll see that this guy approaches a Y value of zero, but doesn't touch it. And from this direction, it also approaches a Y value of zero and doesn't touch it. And that's because one over X can never be equal to zero, okay? If I'm going to get zero as a result of kind of this fraction here, well, one is fixed, right? I need for zero to be in the numerator and for the denominator to not be zero to get this result, okay? And that's never gonna happen. So getting zero as a result for one divided by X is impossible, okay? So that's why this function kind of looks like this. We've talked about this previously, but now what we want to do is reflect it over either the Y axis or reflect it over the X axis. Again, it's the same either way. So I'm going to say this is, let me kind of use a different color. I'm going to say this kind of pink color is my G of X is equal to, and we'll start out by just saying it's negative one over X. So this is, and let me define that a little bit better. So the negative of F of X, so this will cause us to reflect this guy across the X axis. So this is gonna be my line of reflection. And so let's say I take this point right here. This is going to be one comma one. If I reflect it over here, it would be here, right? This point would be here, 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 and this point would be here. So you can see that allows you to kind of sketch this graph. Now, the other way you could do this, because it can be defined either way, I could also say that g of x is again, f of negative x, and now it's gonna be reflected over the y-axis, okay? So then for kind of this point, it would go here. This point would go here, right? This point would go here, this point would go here, you know, so on and so forth. So you can sketch your graph that way. The main thing is to understand what's going on here, again, if it's g of x is equal to the negative of f of x, then it's reflected across the x-axis. If it's g of x is equal to f of negative x, it's reflected across the y-axis. All right, let's look at something really quickly that you might see as kind of a practice question, or you might get this on your test. Suppose that f of x is defined as negative two x squared minus five, and then you're given these kind of g of x, h of x, and l of x. So you gotta figure out what they are. So g of x is defined as the negative of f of x. And essentially all they want you to do here is just multiply a negative by this right here, the right side of the function.
okay? That's how you're going to find g of x. So I'm going to say this is equal to, if I multiply a negative by this right side, just wrap it in parentheses and perform the operation. And this is going to run over, but I'll come back to it. So I'm going to distribute a negative to each term. I'm going to have 2x squared plus 5. Okay, that's all it's going to be. So let me erase this and drag this up. And let me do this one now, and I'll do it in a different color. So now we have f of negative x. So what would happen if I plugged in a negative x where I have that x there? Well, the answer to that is nothing, right? Because the negative is going to be squared. It's going to have no effect, right? So essentially, I can just write this as negative 2x squared minus 5. So negative 2x squared minus 5. Essentially, f of negative x is equal to f of x. And there's a special name for this. Again, when we get to even and odd functions in the next section, we'll talk about this specifically. All right, the other one is the negative of f of negative x. Okay, and you might see this. You might be told to graph something in this way. Essentially, what happens here is that first you're going to plug in a negative x everywhere you see an x. So we already know that that results in this. So you have negative 2x squared minus 5. It's the same thing. Then if I take the negative of the whole thing, well, I wrap it in parentheses and put a negative out in front, that gets me back to this first one here. So I already know that's going to be 2x squared plus 5. Okay? So that's what you would do if you get that scenario. All right, so before we kind of wrap up the lesson, I want to revisit stretching and compressing a graph. When we did this lesson, we didn't talk about kind of the scenario where you had a negative number involved. So if g of x was defined as a times f of x, we said that if a was greater than 1, this would be vertically stretched. And if a was greater than 0 and less than 1, it would be vertically shrunk or be compressed. Now, what happens if a is negative? Well, you follow the same rules. You just use an absolute value sign here. If a ends up being negative, you have to reflect it across the x-axis, right? Because let's say I put a negative a there. Let's just say it was a negative 2 as an example. Well, what happens is it's vertically stretched by a factor of 2, but it's then reflected across the x-axis. Another way you can think about this too is, for a given x value, the y values are going to be changing by a factor of negative 2. Okay, so you can take the old y values and just multiply them by negative 2. Those would correspond to those kind of original x values in f of x. So let's look at an example of this, and then we'll go on to the kind of horizontal stretching and compression. So suppose we had f of x equals the absolute value of x, and g of x equals negative 1 half times the absolute value of x. So again, I can define, I can define g of x as being this negative 1 half times f of x. So I've got this negative right here. Again, if I had a negative and no one half, this is a reflection across the x-axis. But now when I put this one half in here, I know that I am vertically compressing this guy. Okay, And that just means you're moving towards the x-axis. That doesn't necessarily mean that I have to move towards from the top towards the x-axis, which is this way. It could also mean I'm moving from the bottom coming up towards the x-axis, right? Either way is going to be appropriate for that definition. Okay, so let's erase this. I want to compare kind of some tables here. So I know that 0 would be 0, 1 would be 1. We could do negative 1 and 1. We could do negative 2 and 2. And we could do, let's say, 2 and 2, right? I plug something in for x. I take the absolute value. I get y. Essentially, anything I plug in here just becomes non-negative. With this guy here, I can take these same x values, so 0, 1, negative 1, negative 2, and 2, and I can just multiply the corresponding y values by negative a half, right? So 0, there's no change. Multiply 1 by negative a half, it's negative 1 half. Multiply 1 by, again, negative a half, it's negative 1 half. Multiply 2 by negative 1 half, it's negative 1. Again, 2 times negative 1 half is negative 1. So let's look at this graphically real quick. And you have multiple things going on because I want to show you that there's a lot of different ways to kind of do this. The first way you could kind of do it is, again, for a given x value, you could just multiply the y values by negative a half. So 0, 0 would still be there, okay? If I took an x value of, let's say, 2, right now the y value is 2, okay? But now if an x value of 2 
goes on this guy, the y value is going to be cut in half and it's going to be made into its opposite. So instead of it being 2, multiply it by negative 1 half, you get negative 1. So you're down there. And that color is the same. So let me change the color of that. Let me use like an orange so it stands out. And I can use a point over here. So in this situation, I have an x value of 4 and a y value of 4. Now that y value would be multiplied by negative 1 half. So it would be negative 2, right? Same x value. Let me change the color again so that it's clear. So that's one way to do it. You can get some points and sketch the graph. The other way to do this, we could compress the graph vertically first. Again, that's a movement towards this x-axis. So in other words, for a given x value, my y value is now kind of shrunk or multiplied by half. So for a given x value of 4, the y value of 4 would now go to 2. Okay. So once you go through and get these points, you can then take this guy right here, this green graph. Let me kind of sketch over it. And you could reflect it across the x-axis, okay? Reflect it across the x-axis, and you would get this red graph here, okay? So two ways to kind of go about that. There's no right or wrong way to do that here. You're going to get the same answer either way. You just go with what is more comfortable for you. All right, let's quickly go over the horizontal stretch and horizontal compression again. This is one that was a little bit confusing. So in general, if you have g of x and this equals f of ax, we said in the lesson if a was greater than 1, now you had a horizontal compression. And it doesn't make sense because you have this number multiplying by x and you think that it's going to stretch or grow, but it doesn't, right? Because it's by a factor. Remember this, this 1 over a, okay, this 1 over a. So what happens is let's say a was 3 as an example. So I'd have a one third there. What this means is that for a given y value, the x values are now a third the size. So that has kind of the effect of compressing the graph horizontally, okay? And then we said that if a was greater than zero and less than one, well now we're gonna stretch the graph horizontally. And the reason for that is you end up putting a fraction in here for a, you have one divided by a fraction, so you're gonna get something larger than one. If I plugged in something like, let's say, 1 eighth. Well, 1 divided by an eighth is the same thing as 1 times 8 or 8. So now, let's think about this, and I'll erase that. We don't need this. Let's think about this when we have negatives involved. Well, all I need to do is just kind of say the same thing. I would put the absolute value bars around it. It's the same thing. I just need to reflect across the y-axis now. Okay, that's all I need to do. So to see this, let's take a look at an example. So in our last lesson, we had this f of x equals x cubed minus x. This is a good example to see kind of a horizontal stretch or compression. And then we have g of x now, which is f of negative 1 half x. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm plugging in a negative 1 half x here and here. Okay. So for the table of values, we can kind of use 0. That would give me 0. If I plugged in a negative 1, negative 1 cubed is negative 1. And then you'd have minus a negative 1, which is plus 1, so that's 0. We know that 1 would also give me 0, right? If this was plus 1, 1 cubed is 1, and I would subtract away 1, so I'd also get 0. And then we worked with 2 and negative 2. 2 cubed is 8, then minus 2 would be 6. So this would be 6 here. And then negative 2 cubed would be negative 8, and then minus a negative 2 would be plus 2, so this would be negative 6 here. Okay. So how could we get the values over here without kind of going through and actually writing everything out? Well, again, for a given y value, for a given y value, so 0, 0, 0, 6, and negative 6, I know the x values can just be multiplied by 1 over this number. Again, don't multiply them by negative a half. You need to do 1 over that number. Okay, very important to remember that. So 1 over negative 1 half is the same as 1 times negative 2, which is negative 2, okay? So what I would do is I would take 0 multiplied by negative 2, get 0. I would take negative 1 multiplied by negative 2, and I would get 2. 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. And negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. Okay, so now we have some points going. And this is something we probably don't know the shape of. So if I took these values, I could go to my coordinate plane and I could very quickly graph this guy. And let's take a look at that real quick. All right, so graphically, you're going to see three different graphs here. And I did that to show you the two different ways you could do this. 
The first way you can do this, you don't even need the original one. This is the original one in orange. This is f of x equals x cubed minus x. Again, if you know that and you're told this is your new function, you can just make your table of values, plot those points, and then sketch the graph. That's all you really need to do. But if you're specifically told that you kind of have to graph the original one and then reflect it, well, then you can use this process here. What you can do is you can horizontally stretch it first. So I can say, let's go with h of x. Let's say h of x now. h of x is going to be f of, and I'm just going to do 1 half x. I'm not going to include the negative yet, okay? So what that does is it stretches it by a factor of 2 horizontally. Again, it's 1 over this number, 1 over this number. 1 divided by half is 2, okay? So it's horizontally stretching it by a factor of 2. So you can see this because a y value of 6 used to correspond to a x value of 2. But over here, the y value of 6 corresponds to an x value that is 4. So it's gone from 2 to 4. So it's horizontally stretched or pulled away from the y-axis by a factor of 2. Now, once you've done that, now we can reflect it across the y-axis, okay? So that's where this graph comes in over here, this guy that's kind of in, I guess you would call this a teal. I might call it a green. I'm not sure what color it actually is. But let's just call this, this is our g of x. And this is what we're trying to find. This is our f of negative 1 half x, okay? And essentially, I got this by taking this guy and reflecting it across the y-axis. So notice how this point here goes over here, okay? So essentially I have what? I have four comma six. The y value of six stays the same, but my x value is going to get kind of the opposite put on it. So you put a negative on it. So you have negative four comma six now. So negative four comma six, and over here it's four comma six, okay? And you can do that everywhere, right? And I'll focus on these ones down here because in the middle it just gets kind of crowded. But if I focus on this one, this point was negative four comma negative six. So negative four comma negative six. Okay, well what happened to this point is it got flipped or folded or reflected across this y axis and it went right there. So now this is positive four comma negative six. So again, the y coordinate stays the same. It's negative six in each case, but we took this x coordinate and just made it into its opposite. So a lot of different ways to kind of do this. Either way, you're gonna get the same result. Some of these graphs do get kind of involved, but for now, in the section we're in, it's pretty easy overall. In this lesson, we wanna talk about symmetry, and we also wanna talk about even and odd functions. So what we wanna do is start out by talking about symmetry with respect to kind of the x-axis, the y-axis, and the origin. This is gonna lay the foundation for us to talk about even and odd functions. So we're gonna start out by talking about graphs that are symmetric with respect to the y-axis, okay, the y-axis. So this will occur whenever replacement of x with negative x yields the same equation. So let's look at an example. So here we have f of x equals x squared. And of course, this is our squaring function. We've worked with this a lot. We can visually see that this is symmetric with respect to the y-axis, right? The way you can think about this is, let me highlight the y-axis. If I folded kind of the right side of this graph over the y-axis, you would see that the right side and the left side would match up perfectly, okay? And the reason for this is, for any given y value, you're gonna have two x values that are kind of associated, with the one exception to that being zero, okay? So that's because of this kind of squaring operation here. Let's say I take this point here, and I take this point here. So this point on the right, this is going to be two comma four. This point on the left is going to be negative two comma four. So where does this come from? If I plug in a two and square it, I get four. If I plug in a negative two and square it, I also get four. So because of this squaring operation, essentially I can have two different X values that produce the same Y value, okay? A negative and then a positive. But that doesn't work for zero. So this guy down here, this Y value of zero is only kind of associated with an X value of zero because zero squared is just zero, right? So that's the only exception to that guy. Every other y value is gonna be associated with two different x values, but the rule still works with zero, right? If I put a negative in front of zero, I still get zero. Now, in a lot of cases, you're not gonna have a graph. You're gonna have something kind of complicated. You might not have time to graph or you might not be able to. 
So you want to kind of go through a process where you replace the x with the negative of x and you see if you get the same thing. So let's do that on a fresh sheet. So if I have f of x and this is equal to x squared, and what I want to do is see if f of negative x, that just means I'm plugging in a negative x for x, if that's equal to x squared, okay, is that the same? So what I'd have is the negative of x being squared. Now, one thing I want to call your attention to, I wrapped this in parentheses. Whenever you substitute in for a variable, you want to wrap whatever you're plugging in inside of parentheses. So I'm wrapping my negative x inside of parentheses, and then I'm squaring it, okay? That's the proper way to do that. If you make a mistake on this and just say it's negative x squared like that, well, this is negative one times x squared. That's going to give you the wrong answer, okay? So you want to wrap it in parentheses and then square that, okay? So really what I can do is I can break this up and I can say this is negative one times x that's being squared. Now, hopefully you remember your rules of exponents. If we have a times b and this is squared, this is a squared times b squared. Same thing here. I have negative one times x. These two guys, these factors, are both being raised to the second power. So what I can do is I can split this up and say I have negative one. Again, that's that whole thing is being squared, so I'm wrapping in parentheses. And then times, I have my x squared. We know that negative one, that amount squared is just one. So that would be one times x squared, which of course is just x squared. So these two guys are the same, right? If I replace x with negative x, I end up with the same guy. So we can say that it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Later on in the lesson, we'll hear this called an even function, okay? When this kind of property holds, it's called an even function, but we'll get to that later on. All right, so another good example of kind of an even function or a graph that's symmetric with respect to the y-axis is this f of x equals the absolute value of x. Again, if I kind of highlight the y-axis, you can see that if you folded the right side over the y-axis, it would perfectly line up with the left side. So again, we can prove this pretty quickly. We can say that f of negative x is equal to what? Well, if I plugged in a negative x there inside of the absolute value bars, again, I have another rule with absolute value. If I have, let's say the absolute value of a times b, this is the absolute value of a times the absolute value of b. Okay, by rule. So I can split this up and say that it's the absolute value of negative one, right? Because this is really just negative one times x, then times the absolute value of x. Okay, that's all that would be. The absolute value of negative one is always one. So this is just the absolute value of x. So these two are the same. So again, we proved that this guy is symmetric with respect to the y axis. All right, so now let's talk about symmetry with respect to the x axis. So this is gonna be the same concept, but now the x-axis is gonna kind of cut the graph in half. Again, where each half is just a mirror image or reflection of the other. Now, if a graph is symmetric with respect to the x-axis, okay, with respect to the x-axis, then replacement of y with negative y yields the same equation. One thing I'm gonna tell you in advance is that if a graph is symmetric with respect to the x-axis, for a given x value, you're gonna have this y and negative y that are kind of associated with it. So we know that from our definition of functions, this will not be a function, right? It will fail the vertical line test. Now let's look at an example of this. So we have y squared equals x, right? We're used to seeing y or f of x is equal to x squared. And we saw this earlier, but now we're seeing something a little bit different. So now I plug something in for y, I square it, and I get a result for x. So each x value now is going to be associated with two different y values, one positive and one negative. The only exception to that, again, is with this kind of zero here. And that's because if I plug in a zero for x, well, I know that what squared would give me zero, well, there's only zero that could do that, okay? But for every other situation, let's say I choose an x value of nine, okay? So that's here and then also here. So I know that a y value of three squared would give me nine, and then also a y value of negative three, if that's squared, it would also give me nine. So that's why we have this kind of scenario going on, but you can see that kind of the vertical line test would fail here, right? If I drew a vertical line here, it hits here and it hits here. So this is not the graph of a function, but it is symmetric with respect to the x axis, right? This guy is gonna cut it in half, where again, if we folded kind of this top part over the x-axis, it would perfectly line up with this kind of bottom part 
below the x-axis. Now, how do we prove this? Again, we plug in a negative y for y, and we see if we get the same equation. So it's the same kind of concept here. If I plugged in a negative y and I squared it, well, we saw earlier if I square this guy, I'm going to get positive 1. So really, this ends up just being y squared equals x. Same thing as I have here. So that's how we know that we have a graph that's symmetric with respect to the x-axis. All right, let's take a look at another one. So now we have x equals the absolute value of y. Again, this is kind of the absolute value function we're used to just turned on its side. Just like we saw the parabola we're used to turned on its side. So for this guy, I'm plugging something in for y. I take the absolute value, I get something for x. So in other words, if I take a negative and I plug it in, I get a positive. If I plug in a positive, I keep the positive. If I plug in 0, obviously I get 0. So with the exception of this point right here, which is 0, comma 0, anytime I plug something in for kind of y, I could plug in the opposite thing for y and still get the same x. So here's a good example here. We have 4, comma 4. And then we also have 4, comma, negative 4. Okay, so 4, comma, negative 4, and this is 4, comma, 4. Okay, so if I plug in a 4 for y, take the absolute value, I get 4. If I plug in a negative 4 for y, take the absolute value, I also get 4. So that's what's creating this kind of effect here. We know this is not a function because, again, it would fail the vertical line test, but it is going to be symmetric with respect to the x-axis because, again, if I plug in a negative, a negative y in the place of y, we know that this guy would end up being just x equals the absolute value of y, right? Because this guy right here, I could really just split it and say it's the absolute value of negative 1 times the absolute value of y. The absolute value of negative 1 is just 1. So I end up with this guy, which is exactly what I have right there. All right, let's take a look at one more of these. So this guy is x plus 2 quantity squared plus y squared equals 25. So we see this is the graph of a circle, and it's not symmetric with respect to the y-axis. We can see that, right? If I took kind of this guy and highlighted the y-axis, we can see that it's got less on the right side than it does on the left side. So if I folded this over the y-axis, those graphs would not match up, okay? So it's not symmetric with respect to the y-axis, but it is symmetric with respect to the x-axis. You can see if I folded kind of the top part, over the x-axis, I would end up with something that perfectly matches up with the bottom part. Again, we can prove this by just plugging in a negative y there, but you can see because of this exponent here that this guy, if it got squared, it would give me the exact same thing, so the equation wouldn't be changed. So that's how we know that it's symmetric with respect to the x-axis. All right, now the last one we're gonna look at is when a graph is symmetric with respect to the origin. So this one's a lot more difficult to kind of look at and see visually. But essentially, if we replace x with negative x and y with negative y, and we end up with the same equation, we have symmetry with respect to the origin. So what you're going to find is that on a given graph, if you have an x comma y, then you're going to have the negative of that x and the negative of that y on the graph. So let's look at an example. So we have f of x equals x cubed or our cubing function. This is the typical example you see when you first talk about kind of an odd function or a function that's symmetric with respect to the origin or just a graph that's symmetric with respect to the origin in general. So we can really write this as y equals x cubed. And what I can show you is that, again, if I replace x with negative x and y with negative y, I end up with the same thing. So if I plugged in a negative y and I plugged in a negative x, when I cube a negative 1, right, because this is really negative 1 times x, if I cube the negative 1 part, I get negative 1. So I can erase the parentheses. I don't need them. And I can erase these parentheses here. And all I want to do here is just divide both sides by negative 1. And this will cancel. And so will this. And I end up with my y is equal to, y is equal to, let me make that better, x cubed again. Right, so these are the same. So that's how we know it's symmetric with respect to the origin. So that's kind of the easy way to look at it. The harder way is when we start involving this kind of function notation. This is where it gets super confusing. So we define this as f of x is equal to the negative of f of negative x. So this is one way to define it. And then another way is the negative of f of x is equal to f of negative x. 
So if your function has this property, that the original function f of x is equal to the negative of f of negative x, or if it's the negative of f of x equals f of negative x, then it's symmetric with respect to the origin, and we could say it's an odd function. Now, these two kind of pieces of notation that you see are super confusing. What in the world does this mean? All it means is that for a given x comma y, you have the negative of that x and the negative of that y. So let me explain. Let's just take a given point. Let me just kind of start with this one, and then I'll work on the other one in a second. So let's say I take a point like, let's say, 2 comma 8. We can see that here. So 2 comma 8 is our given point. Now, according to what I just said, it should be true that the negative of 2 and the negative of 8 should be on this graph. So negative 2 comma negative 8 should be there. If we look, negative 2 comma negative 8 is there. So we know that's true. But we can use function notation to kind of show this. All we're saying is that if I pick something for x and plug it in, remember, if I have something like f of 2, it's just the function's value when x is 2. So f of 2 we know is 8. So what is the negative of f of 2? Well, I know f of 2 is 8, so the negative of that would be negative 8. Okay, so that's this part right here. That's this part right here. Okay, so we know that's negative 8. And then a highlighting kind of maybe makes that not show up so clearly, so let me not do that. So then the other thing is, what is f of negative x? Well, if x was 2, the negative of 2 is negative 2. So f of negative 2, we already know that if x is negative 2, y is negative 8. So these two are equal or the same. Okay, that's all that notation is, just a fancy way to say that, hey, for a given x comma y, you're going to have the negative of x and the negative of y on that. You can also do it with that other notation that I showed you. And this is much less common, but you can also say that if it's kind of symmetric with respect to the origin, then f of x is equal to the negative of f of negative x. Again, just using that 2 comma 8 and the negative 2 comma 8 as a reference, f of 2 we know is 8. f of 2 is 8. Now, what is the negative of f of negative 2? Let's think about this. f of negative 2 is negative 8. But then I want the negative of that. Okay, I want the negative of that. So the negative of negative 8 is positive 8. So again, those two are equal. Now, graphically, we have to think about this a little bit differently. Let me go to the next page. It's not as simple to notice if something is symmetric with respect to kind of the origin as it is to notice if something is symmetric with respect to the y-axis, the x-axis. It's very clear that something kind of is symmetric with respect to the y-axis because the y-axis, again, it cuts it in half. Same thing for the x-axis, right? The x-axis would cut the graph in half. But with something that's symmetric with respect to the origin, one way you could do it is you could kind of flip your graph upside down, right? So this orange guy is the original. This is my f of x equals x cubed. If I flip that upside down, if I took my graph paper and just flipped it upside down, if I end up with the same graph, okay, then it's symmetric with respect to the origin. Another way you can do this, okay, if I think about the negative of f of negative x, we said this is equal to f of x. And I might lose some of you with this definition. But essentially, if we remember from the last lesson where we talked about reflecting graphs, if I had something like, let me erase this for a second. If I had something like g of x is equal to f of negative x, we know that g of x can be graphed by just reflecting f of x across the y-axis. So that's the graph I have here in light blue. So let's just say this is g of x this is g of x, and it has this definition, okay? So I'm going to reflect it across the y-axis. And so for every given point that's on f of x, this orange graph, it gets reflected across the y-axis. So for a given y value, now every x is going to be the negative, right? So this guy right here was 2 comma 8. Now it's going to be negative 2 comma 8. This guy was 1 comma 1. Now it's negative 1 comma 1, right? So on and so forth. So from this point right here, we go to this point right here. From this point right here, we go to this point right here. So we end up with this kind of blue graph. So that's the first one. Now, let me further confuse you. And let's say that we had h of x, which was equal to the negative of g of x. What would this be? This would be what? If I want to graph the negative of g of x, well, then I just take g of x and I reflect it across the x-axis. Well, if we do that, what's going to happen? Let me kind of erase all this. Let me erase all this and let me 
draw that line back. Well, now I'm starting with the blue graph and I'm reflecting across the x-axis. So this point right here, we're gonna have the same x value now, which is going to be negative two, but the y value is going to be different. So we're gonna have, instead of negative two, eight, we're going to have negative two, negative eight. Okay, so it gets reflected across the x-axis. Instead of negative one, one, we're going to have negative one, negative one, right? So on and so forth. So down here, instead of two comma negative eight, I'm going to have two comma positive eight. Instead of one comma negative one, I'm gonna have one comma one. So what happens is all my points after I do this second reflection, go back to the original graph of f of x equals x cubed. So now we see that this h of x ends up just being the original function f of x. And I know this gets confusing, so let me kind of erase all these different function names and just go back to what we really kind of started with and saying that, hey, if I took this guy, this f of x, and I reflected it across the y-axis, so I had f of negative x, and then I reflected it across the x-axis, so the negative of that, those two would be the same graph, they would be equal to each other. So that's how, again, we know that it's symmetric with respect to the origin. All right, let's look at another example of something that's symmetric with respect to the origin. So we have f of x equals one over x. And again, we can show this graphically, or we can also show this kind of with function notation, or we can show it just by saying that, you know, y equals one over x. Again, by definition, I can replace y with negative y and x with negative x, because for a given x comma y, negative x comma negative y is going to be on that graph. So if I said I had negative y is equal to one over negative x, of course, I know that this guy, if I have a positive over negative, it's just a negative overall, right? So if I multiply this by negative one and this by negative one, the negative cancels over here and the negative cancels over here, and I'm back to my y equals one over x that I started with. So that's how I know this is an odd function, or again, it's a graph that is symmetric with respect to kind of the origin. Okay, now another way you can show this is again with that function notation. You can say that f of negative x is equal to the negative of f of x, or you could say the negative of f of negative x equals f of x. I'm gonna stay away from this definition for now. This is not something you really see in your textbook. This is just something I gave you so that you can see that if you kind of reflect the graph twice, you end up with the same thing, okay? So I'm just gonna use this one. So f of negative x would be one over negative x. And if I had the negative of f of x, this would be what? I would just take the right side of this and just multiply it by negative one. So it's the negative of one over x. These are the same, right? If I have a positive over a negative, it's a negative overall. I could really just say this is negative one over x. So because these two are equal or the same, we can say that we have an odd function, or again, we can say that we have a graph that is symmetric with respect to the origin. Now, again, if I thought about kind of reflecting this guy twice, if I reflected it once across the y-axis and then again across the x-axis, you can do that on your own. You'll see that you end up with the same graph. Another thing you can do is just take your graph paper. If you, if you sketch this, take your graph paper and flip it upside down. You're going to end up with the same shape. Okay, it's the same graph. Everything's upside down, but it's the same shape. But essentially, that tells you that it's symmetric with respect to the origin. All right, so we can officially just say that an even function is where f of negative x is just equal to f of x, okay? So if I plug in a negative x everywhere I have an x in that function, and I end up with the same thing as if I just had f of x, we have an even function, or again, a graph that's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Now, for an odd function, you're typically going to use this definition. This is what's given to you in your textbook. The negative of f of negative x is equal to f of x, or f of negative x is equal to the negative of f of x. Now, for the odd function, again, this is something that's symmetric with respect to the origin. Now, you might be saying at this point, you know, hey, where's the thing that's symmetric with respect to the x-axis? Remember, when we deal with that, we don't have a function. So we don't have kind of a name for that because we're dealing with kind of functions here. We have an even function that's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And then we have an odd function that's symmetric with respect to the origin. But we don't have anything that's a function that's symmetric with respect to the x-axis because those are not functions, right? They fail the vertical line test. All right, so let's look at these. So we have f of x equals 7x to the fourth power minus 2x squared minus 1. A lot of students will say, okay, I've got even exponents everywhere, so I know it's even. That's not always going to be true, okay? Certainly if you have just, you know, f of x equals x to some power, okay, let's just call that a. If a is even, then you have an even function. If a is odd, then you have an odd function. 
but there's all kinds of other things that can happen, right? You're not usually gonna get something that simple. So you do have to go through and do the work. So for this guy, I'm gonna start with f of negative x and see what I get. So I would have seven times, we'd have negative x to the fourth power, minus two times, you'd have negative x squared, and then minus one. So I know in each case that this negative is raised to an even power. So this guy is gonna be the same, right? So f of negative x would be seven x to the fourth power, minus two x squared, minus one. So these two are the same, so this guy is going to be even, okay? And clearly it's not odd, because again, for something to be odd, f of negative x is equal to the negative of f of x. Well, f of negative x is this, right? This is f of negative x. If I took the negative of f of x, this would be negative, this would be positive, and this would be positive. These two are not the same, so this function is even only, right? It is not odd. All right, let's take a look at another. So we have f of x equals x cubed minus x squared minus five. So I'm gonna start out by seeing if it's even. So f of negative x is what? So I have a negative x, and this is cubed, and then minus, I have a negative x, and this is squared, and then minus five. So the problem here is that this guy is going to change signs, right? This negative that's being cubed, that's going to change signs, but this one isn't going to change signs, right? Because I have a negative that's now squared. So f of negative x is gonna be what? It's gonna be negative x cubed, okay? Then minus x squared, then minus five. So this is different from this, right? Here we don't have a negative out in front, here we do, right? The rest of the signs are the same. So we did change this guy, so it's not even. Is it odd? Well, for it to be odd, again, f of negative x, which we have right here, should be equal to the negative of f of x. So in other words, if I multiply the right side of this by negative one, well, I'd have a negative, a positive, and a positive. Those two don't match up either, so this guy isn't odd and it's not even either. So it's going to be neither. All right, what about this one? We have f of x equals x squared plus the absolute value of x minus seven. Okay, well, what do we see here? If I had f of negative x, if I plugged in a negative x there and squared it, I know I just get x squared. Then plus, if I plugged in a negative x there, right inside the absolute value bars, I know I just have my x and then minus seven. So really this guy is gonna be even, right? So this would be x squared, this would be the absolute value of x, and then minus seven. So these two are the same, so this guy is even, okay? Again, you can quickly verify this is not odd because this guy right here is not gonna be the same as if you had a negative f of x, okay? These are not gonna be equal. Let me kind of slide this down. Let me make this in a different color. So I'll put that, this is even like this. So the negative of f of x would need to be equal to f of negative x. Again, we have f of negative x here, it's the same as this. If I multiply the right side here by negative one, this would be negative, this would be negative, and this would be positive. Those two don't match up, so this guy is definitely not an odd function. All right, what about this one? We have f of x equals five over x cubed minus x. So what is f of negative x? This would be five over, you'd have your negative x, this would be cubed, and then minus, you would have your negative x. Okay. So first and foremost, we know minus a negative is plus a positive. So I can go ahead and just say this is plus. This is plus. And then if I take this guy, this negative and cube it, I end up with a negative. So I can really just say this is negative x cubed like this. All right, so I know it's not even because this is different from this. But I can check to see if it's odd. So f of negative x should be equal to the negative of f of x. So I would multiply the right side of this guy by a negative. So really I would have what? I would have the negative of f of x would be the negative of five over x cubed and then plus x. Well, that's the same thing I have here. The negative's down here now, but I could move it up, right? A positive over a negative is just a negative overall. So these are the same. So we can say this function is odd. All right, here's a common one that trips students up. So you have f of x equals the kind of quantity x minus three squared plus seven. If you see an even exponent, a lot of people just assume that, hey, this is going to be an even function, okay? But in this particular case, it doesn't work out that way. Before we plug anything in, just think about this. If I plugged in a five there, five minus three is two, two squared is four. If I plugged in a negative five there, negative five minus three is negative eight. If I squared negative eight, I get 64. So that should tell you something's wrong, okay? So let's go ahead and erase this 
and I'll officially do it. So f of negative x is what? Well, I'd have a negative x there minus a 3, quantity squared, plus 7. Well, if I went through and kind of expanded this, I could use my special products formula. So I could say this is what? This first guy gets squared. So now I've got to square the negative and the x. So that would just be x squared. Then I've got minus 2 times this guy times this guy. Now, when we use this formula, we usually don't have a minus out in front. So you've got to account for that now. OK, usually we just bank on this sign being whatever this is. OK, but in this particular case, it's two times negative X times three. Those negatives are going to become a positive. So two times three is six. So you're going to have six X there. Then you get three squared and that's nine. OK, so then plus seven. So nine plus seven is obviously 16. So with this guy, you get X squared plus six X plus 16. OK, but if I expanded this one, we know that, let me kind of do this over here, you would get the first guy squared, which is x squared. You would get 2 times this guy times this guy. So 2 times 3 is 6. 6 times x is 6x, but it would be negative. So minus 6x. And then plus this guy squared, 3 squared is 9. And then your 7 comes along for the ride. 9 plus 7 again is 16. So these guys have a different sign. Right? This is x squared minus 6x plus 16. This is x squared plus 6x plus 16. So they are not the same. Okay, So this guy is not even. Is it odd? Okay, Is it odd? Well, if I go back to what I had, if I multiplied this guy right here in its expanded form by a negative 1, so if I had the negative of f of x, it would really be equal to what? It would be this guy right here. Let me erase this equals from here. And let me drag this down here it would be the negative of x squared plus 6x minus 16. So this guy is going to be neither. It's not even, and it's definitely not odd, because the negative of f of x is not equal to f of a negative x. All right, let's look at one more of these. So now we have f of x is equal to x times the square root of 1 minus x squared. OK, so if I did f of negative x, this would be negative x times the square root of 1 minus. You'd have negative x squared. So you know inside here, this isn't going to matter, right? Negative x squared, that's just x squared. But it does change things because I have a negative here and no negative there, OK? So these are not the same, so it's not even. Is it odd? Well, you can see that it would be, right? Because the negative of f of x would be what? I would multiply this thing by negative 1. So if I multiplied it by negative 1, I would just have negative x times the square root of 1 minus x squared which is exactly what I have there. So this guy is going to be odd. In this lesson, we want to continue to talk about graphing techniques. And here we're going to focus on horizontal and vertical shifts. All right, so the last type of function transformation that we're going to talk about involves horizontally or vertically shifting the graph. So these horizontal or vertical shifts are also referred to as translations. So to begin our lesson, let's start out again with our squaring function. So we have this f of x is equal to x squared. So we all know this function at this point. We're plugging something for x, we are squaring it, and we get our output, our f of x, or you could say y. So we already know what the graph looks like, and we already know the points that are associated. But just one more time, we know that if we plug in something like a negative 2, right, for x, and we square it, we get 4. If we plug in a negative 1, we square that, we get 1. If we plug in a 0 and square that, we get 0. Plug in a 1, we get a 1. Plug in a 2, we get a 4, right? So we should have committed these points to kind of memory at this point. And we also know stuff like 3, 9 and negative 3, 9. And a lot of you will know 4, 16 and negative 4, 16 as well. All right, let's look at the next kind of part. And what we're going to do now is just kind of compare tables. We're going to look at this other function that's very close to the original. So we have f of x equals x squared. We're going to call this the parent function, OK? And then g of x is going to be kind of this guy, but just a little bit different, OK? So g of x is x squared minus 3. So this part right here and this part, those are the same, right? You have that x squared, but now you have this extra minus 3 that's involved, OK? And the way your book is going to show this to you, they're going to say that g of x can be defined as f of x, which is just x squared. So f of x and then minus this 3, OK? So minus this 3. So let's look at these kind of two tables real quick. 
and I'll show you what's really going on here. So again, we know these by heart. So negative two, four, negative one, one, zero, zero, one, one, and two, four, okay? But what's gonna happen over here? We know that we got these values by plugging in something for X and squaring it. But over here, I plug something in for X and I square it, but then I subtract away three, okay? So whatever I got over here for Y, okay, for a given X value, now over here for Y, it's gonna be three less because of this minus three. So if I copy these same X values, so negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two, the Y values associated will now just be three units less, right? So instead of four, it would be one. Instead of one, it would be negative two. Instead of zero, it would be negative three. And then instead of one, again, it would be negative two. And again, instead of four, it would be one. Now, what effect do you think this will have graphically? Think about this real quick. For a given X value, now the Y values have been decreased by three units. Remember, the Y axis is a vertical axis. So what's gonna happen is, this is gonna shift the graph down, okay, by three units. Now let's take a look at that real quick. So the orange graph is my original, my original f of x is equal to x squared. And the graph in light blue, okay, the graph in light blue is my g of x is equal to x squared minus three, okay? So if you wanted to graph g of x, if you got this on a test and they said, hey, graph x squared minus three, you know that you just need to graph x squared and then just shift it down by three units. The easiest way to kind of do this is just to pick these points that you already know, something like, let's say zero comma zero, and say, okay, now it's gonna be at zero comma negative three. So that's my lowest point there. And then other points are just gonna be shifted down by three units. So something like one comma one is shifted down to one comma negative two, right? And so on and so forth. And that's how you would go about sketching your graph. But again, the reason this is happening is for a given X value, you now have a Y value that's three units less. So again, for example, here, if I plug in a zero, I square it and I get zero. Here, if I plug in a zero, I square it and I get zero, but now I've got to subtract away three. I've got this extra step here. So I end up getting a Y value of negative three or a Y value that is three units less for that given X value. So that's why all these points are being shifted down by three units. All right, now let's consider something that is a little bit more challenging. What I just showed you was very straightforward. What I'm gonna show you here, I'm gonna pretty much tell you that everyone that sees this for the first time does struggle with it, including myself. It's something that takes a lot of practice to kind of get used to, okay? And then the light bulb will go off for you, I promise. But when you first see it, it is a bit confusing. So suppose we have f of x equals x squared and g of x is now equal to the quantity x minus two squared. So if we really think about it, this right here could be plugged in for x in f of x, okay? So I could really define g of x as being equal to f of x minus two if I wanted to, right? Because if I plugged in an x minus two in for x and f of x, I would have this g of x, which is again, the quantity x minus two squared. Okay, so now that we know how to define that, let's think about what's gonna happen. So let's start with these points here. We have kind of negative two, four, we have negative one, one, we have zero, zero, one, one, and we have two, four. Now, what do you think is gonna happen? A lot of people think that this minus two here, okay, this minus two here, because it's associated with X, they think that kind of everything's gonna shift to the left by two units, right? Because the X values are occurring on the horizontal axis. So if we think about minus two horizontally, we intuitively feel like this should go to the left two units. But what's gonna happen is it's actually gonna go to the right by two units, okay? So let me fill in this table real quick and then I'll explain why. So for a given Y value, okay, for a given Y value, so four, one, zero, one, and four, these X values are now going to be two units larger, okay? So instead of negative two, it would be zero. Instead of negative one, it would be positive one. Instead of zero, it would be two. Instead of positive one, it would be three. And then instead of positive two, it would be four. Now, if you wanna check this, you can. Zero minus two is negative two, negative two squared is four, so that one's good. One minus two is negative one, negative one squared is one, that's good. Two minus two is zero, zero squared is zero, that's good. 
3 minus 2 is 1, 1 squared is 1, that's good. And 4 minus 2 is 2, 2 squared is 4, that's good. So for a given y value, right, these y values are the same, the x values have been increased by 2 units, okay? So let's think about what's going on here. Well, what's happening is I'm plugging in something for x, and then I'm subtracting away 2 before I square it. So what that means is that in order to obtain the same y value, my x value now needs to be 2 units larger, right? Because I have to undo what's being done to x. And that's going to be a key thing that comes up over and over in this lesson. So you want to remember that. You need to think about what undoes what's being done to x. Because I'm subtracting away 2 from x, for a given x value, I subtract away 2, so I'm really getting a y value that would have occurred with an x value kind of 2 units ago if I'm thinking about in the f of x function. If I'm thinking about maintaining the same y value, then x now has to be 2 units larger to undo that minus 2. And again, I know this is super confusing when you first hear it, but let's go ahead and look at the graph and see if it makes a little bit more sense. So I've graphed these already kind of side by side. So once again, the orange one, the orange one is my original f of x equals x squared. And my guy in light blue here is my g of x, which is the quantity x minus 2 squared. So again, what you can see, if I focus on this point 0 comma 0, it's been shifted 2 units to the right, and now it's going to be at 2 comma 0. Okay, let's think about why. Here, I could plug in a 0 for x, and I would get a 0 for y or f of x. Here, if I plug in a 0 for x, what happens? Well, essentially, I have negative 2, right? And then negative 2 squared is going to give me 4. So that no longer works. That doesn't give me a y value of 0 anymore. In order to get a y value of 0, x now has to be 2 units larger than it was before to undo this. So now I need to plug in a 2 there. Okay, 2 minus 2 would give me 0, 0 squared is 0. So what happens is for that same vertical value, that same y value of 0, x now had to be moved 2 units to the right. So what happens is everywhere on that graph is going to be shifted 2 units to the right because again, for that same y value, x now has to be 2 units larger, again, to undo this minus 2 right here. All right, let's go through kind of the textbook definition of this. This is something you're going to get in your course, and it's confusing a lot of times, so I want to break this down. So we have g of x equals f of x plus k, and the first situation is we say if k is greater than zero, so if k is some positive real number, that's all we're saying. So if this guy is a positive real number, then g of x is just the graph of f of x shifted up by k units. This is completely logical. It should make sense for you. For an example, let's just say f of x is again x squared. Okay, something really easy. Well, let's say we had g of x, and this is x squared, so this part's the same, and then plus some positive number, let's just call it 13, okay? So we should know by looking at that instantly that g of x is essentially just the graph of f of x, it's x squared, just shifted up by 13 units, right? Because for any given x value, you're going to plug it in, you're going to square it, and then you're going to add 13 to the result. So the y value is going to increase by 13. So every point on that graph of f of x moves up 13 units if you're going to graph g of x. Okay, that's all this plus 13 is doing. So later on, you're going to hear this inside the function, outside the function. This is happening outside the function. Okay, you have your f of x. Nothing's being done to that. It's outside. So you have the plus k happening on the outside. Let me write that. So this is the outside of the function. If something happens to the outside of the function, it's a vertical shift, okay? When it happens inside, it's a horizontal shift. Now, you also have the case where you're shifting down, okay? And we also saw an example of this earlier. So suppose g of x is equal to f of x plus k. Now we're going to say that k is less than zero, so k is some negative number. Now, the way this is written is a bit confusing, so let me explain that in a minute. For now, let's just say that g of x is the graph of f of x shifted down by the absolute value of k units. So they just want to give you something that's a generic rule. They don't cover kind of every scenario. Generally, we don't write stuff as plus negative. We just write minus a number, okay? So for example, earlier I gave you g of x was equal to x squared minus 3, okay? So following this rule, I don't have plus some number. I have minus some number. 
So I would have to transform it and say this is plus a negative three, okay? So we would say that the graph is shifted down the absolute value of K, in this case, the absolute value of negative three, so it's shifted down by three units. But that's a bit of an overkill. What I would just say is if you're subtracting something away, so if you're subtracting away a positive number, so minus three here, you should be able to look at that and say, well, I know that could be written as plus negative three, so I know I'm gonna shift down by three units. So if it's minus a positive, then you're shifting down by this number of units. So if it was, let's say h of x is equal to x squared minus 21, I know that again, I'm just gonna shift down by this number of units. Okay, that's all it is. All right, let's talk about the more difficult, the more challenging scenario, the one that everyone seems to you know, not understand at first, again, including myself. The first time I saw this, I was really confused. So let's say g of x equals f of x minus h. So now what's happening is our action is inside the function. I'm plugging something in for x, okay? So I'm plugging in the quantity x minus h in for x and f of x to get my g of x, okay? So if it's going on the inside, let me write that down. You gotta be thinking horizontal shift, okay? So now if h is greater than zero, again, this is the confusing part, g of x is the graph of f of x shifted right, shifted right by h units, okay? So let's say that we had g of x was equal to the quantity, let's say x minus seven, and this is squared. Again, a lot of people look at that and they say, okay, well, if my f of x is x squared, well, my g of x, they'll say, okay, it's x minus seven, so I'm shifting to the left seven units, but that's wrong. Okay, you've got to shift to the right by seven units. And the reason for that, once again, I've got to always think about what's going to undo what's being done to X. That's really how you get your shift. You can use this rule if you want. You can say, okay, well, I know in this case, H is going to be seven, right? If you want to match that up perfectly. And my rule said, hey, it shifts to the right by H units. So it's shifting to the right seven units. You can get it that way. But the easiest way to think about this is just to say, what undoes what's being done to X? Since what's being done to X is I'm subtracting away seven, to undo it, I've got to add seven. So that tells me if I'm adding seven on the horizontal axis, I'm moving to the right by seven units. Because to get the same Y value, okay, now X has to be seven units larger, okay? So to maintain that vertical position, I've got to move seven units to the right on the X axis because I've got to undo that minus seven, okay? That's what's going on. All right, now let's look at the more confusing rule. So we have g of x equals f of the quantity x minus h. Again, notice how we are plugging in for x and f of x. So this is on the inside again. This is on the inside. And now we say if h is less than zero, well, what's gonna happen is g of x is the graph of f of x shifted left by the absolute value of h units. Now, this can be quite confusing. So let's break this down. So suppose we had g of x and it was equal to the quantity, let's say x plus seven squared. Well, we know at this point that minus a negative is plus a positive. So you gotta be thinking this way, that to write it like this and follow this rule, I would say g of x is equal to the quantity x minus a negative seven, and that amount squared. So following this, let me just kind of erase this real quick. Following this, I've got my minus and I've got my minus. So I've written it perfectly in line with the formula they've given me. So I know that H now is going to be negative seven. Okay, H is negative seven. So just following the rule, G of X is the graph of F of X shifted left by the absolute value of H units. Again, because H here is less than zero, H is negative. So the absolute value of negative seven is seven. So it would shift to the left by seven units. But I don't recommend doing this. This is something you can do when you first start. The way I want you to think about this is, what do I need to do to undo what's being done to X? In this case, we're adding seven, okay? We're adding seven to X. To undo that, I need to subtract seven, okay? I need to subtract seven. And if I think about that, okay, for the same Y value, now X needs to be seven units less, okay? If I think about that on the horizontal axis, I would go seven units to the left, right? That's how I decrease on the X axis. So just figure out what you need to do to undo what's being done to X and then consider your shift that way. So let's just look at some examples real quick. We have G of X is equal to the quantity X plus four squared and then minus one. So our parent function here would be F of X 
is equal to x squared. And what you'll notice is that this part right here is happening inside the function, right? I could plug in an x plus 4, kind of in for x in f of x, and I could obtain that part. Then I have this minus 1. This is happening outside the function. If I wanted to think about this, I could say that g of x is f of x plus 4 and then minus 1, right? That would be the notation if you wanted to describe it. But essentially, once we have that down, right, we don't need to write that each time. We just think about what's going on. So this part's just inside the function. This part's outside. Now, if you want to use those rules that I gave you earlier, feel free. You can do that when you first start. But the quickest way when you're looking at this stuff is just to think about, okay, for the inside of the function part, what's going to undo what's being done to x? I have a plus 4 there. So to undo that, I need to subtract 4 away. Okay, so if I'm subtracting 4 away, what that's telling me is that for a given y value, x now needs to be 4 units less. So that's going to shift the graph left by 4 units. So I can say that we're going to shift, or we really just say shifts, left by 4 units. Okay, and again, this is kind of counterintuitive, right? You see this x plus 4, you're thinking, oh, I'm shifting to the right by 4 units, but it ends up being that you're shifting to the left by 4 units. Now, additionally, you have this minus 1 that happens outside the function. This one's very straightforward, right? If I'm subtracting away 1, then I'm just shifting down by 1 unit. If this was something like plus 1, I would just shift up by 1 unit, okay? But it's minus 1 in this case. So additionally, we're also going to say it shifts down by one unit. Okay, so those are the two things that are going to occur. So based on that original graph, f of x equals x squared, we would shift every point to the left by four units and down by one unit. So graphically, we can see this. Our orange graph is f of x equals x squared. Our blue graph, our light blue graph, is g of x equals the quantity x plus four squared minus one. So to kind of graph the blue one quickly, just take these points that you already know and love, like zero comma zero, shifted four units left and one unit down. So one, two, three, four, one unit down, right? You can do as many of these as you need to. So let's say I take this point, I'm going to go one, two, three, four, one unit down, okay? So on and so forth. That's how you could quickly sketch your graph. All right, let's take a look at another one. So now we have g of x is equal to the quantity x minus 3 cubed and then plus 1. So this guy is based on f of x equals x cubed, right? That would be your parent function. So this part right here is the inside the function part, right? I could plug in an x minus 3, kind of in for x in this original function. So if I had f of x minus 3, I would have the quantity x minus 3 cubed. Okay, so that would give you this part kind of right here. And then I have that plus one, that happens outside of the function, right? So really, we could say that g of x is equal to f of x minus three, and then plus one, right? If you wanted to define it that way. All right, so what's going on here is that, again, from the inside the function part, I think about what I need to do to undo what's being done to x. In this case, I'm subtracting three away from x. So to undo that, I would add three, right? So if I add three, then for a given y value, x now needs to be three units larger. Okay, so again, I'm adding three. So that means I'm shifting to the right by three units. So this shifts right by three units. Okay, now this plus one here, again, that's outside the function. It's just telling me we're shifting up by one unit. So we're just going to say shifts up by one unit. All right, so graphically, again, our graph in orange is our original f of x equals x cubed. And then this guy right here in light blue is my g of x equals x minus 3, that quantity cubed, and then plus 1. So every given point, let's just take this one, for example, is going to shift to the right by 3 units, and it's going to shift up by 1 unit. So this would go 1, 2, 3 units to the right, 1 unit up. You could take this point right here. You could go one, two, three units to the right, one unit up. This guy right here, one, two, three units to the right, one unit up, right? So on and so forth. If you already know the graph of kind of f of x equals x cubed, then it's easy to graph this kind of g of x graph. All right, let's take a look at another one. So suppose we have g of x equals the square root of x plus one and then plus three. So this part right here is what's going on on kind of the inside. 
This part right here is the outside, okay? So in other words, let me just write this one more time. So f of x equals the square root of x. If I plugged in an x plus one for x in this function, again, that's what's happening on the inside of the function. Can I replace x with that? So in this case, can I replace x with the quantity x plus one? Well, yeah, that's how I get that. Okay, so now we need to think about for the inside part, how can I undo what's being done to x? Well, I have this plus one, okay, I'm adding one. So I need to subtract one away to undo that. So again, for a given y value, x needs to be one unit less. So I would just say we're gonna shift left, or we'll say shifts left by one unit. And then this plus three on the outside of the function, that just tells me we shift up by three units. And then we'll say shifts up by three units. So graphically, the orange graph is f of x equals the square root of x. And then the light blue graph is g of x is the square root of x plus one. And then you have plus three on the outside. So again, every given point is going to be shifted one unit to the left and three units up. So let's just take this point zero comma zero on the original. It goes up one, two, three, and then one unit to the left, right? So on and so forth. So this point up one, two, three, one unit to the left. So again, if you know this graph and you should memorize the graph of f of x equals the square root of x, then you can quickly graph this kind of g of x. Once you figure out kind of what the shifts are, you can graph this guy if you need to real quickly and then shift the point and then sketch your graph of the other one. So for the last example, we want to look at this kind of purple graph and we want to determine kind of the function. So the orange graph is kind of a reference. It's our kind of parent function. So you should recognize this at this point. It has this V-shape. That's a very signature graph. It's f of x is equal to the absolute value of x, right? So this purple graph, again, the parent function will be f of x equals the absolute value of x. How can we define this graph of this purple function? Let's call it g of x. And let's just look at what happens. You just look at the points. We know this is the lowest point here, and that gets transferred to there. So I would go what? I would go down one, two, and to the left one. So we went down by two, and we went left by one. Okay, so let's see if we can figure that out. So down by two means I subtract away two on the outside of the function. So let's say we have the absolute value of x, and I'll just leave some space. Again, if I go down by two, I minus two outside the function, or you can put plus negative two if you want to, it doesn't matter. So what about this left by one? Again, a lot of us wanna just write minus one in there, but again, that's not correct, right? You wanna put plus one, why? Well, if the graph is shifting to the left by one unit, I need to put plus one in there because the shift left is really, I need to subtract one away, okay? That's what's creating that kind of shift. I need to subtract one away to undo what's being done to x. So that's why this would be g of x as equal to the absolute value of x plus one, and then we'd have minus two outside of the absolute value operation. So the purple graph, that would be my g of x function. In this lesson, we wanna review operations on functions. All right, so whenever we study functions, we're gonna come across this topic known as operations with functions. So we start seeing this in algebra one and we kind of carry this through to algebra two and college algebra, and you even see it in pre-calculus. So it's a very common topic to kind of work through. And essentially it's very easy. We're just asked to find the sum difference product and quotient of two functions, which in the end gives us a new function. The only thing that's kind of challenging here is just understanding the notation, understanding what you're being asked to kind of find. But once you see a few examples, it's very, very easy. All right, so let's start out by just going through kind of the textbook definition that you're gonna encounter in your course. Essentially given two functions, and for today's purposes, we're just gonna call it f and g. So those are our two functions, and for all values of x, where f of x and g of x are going to be defined, we're gonna talk about the functions f plus g f minus g, f times g, and f divided by g. So we have these definitions already written down. Essentially, if you see this notation, f plus g of x, this means we have f of x plus g of x. Okay, so these two are the same or equal. Same thing goes for f minus g of x. This is equal to f of x minus g of x. And then f times g of x, this is equal to f of x times g of x. 
And then f over g of x, this is equal to f of x divided by g of x. And I have a restriction here. Remember, you can't divide by zero. So g of x cannot be equal to zero, right? Because division by zero is undefined. Now, let's briefly talk a little bit about finding the domain. Again, we've been talking about that for a while now. And this always comes up when you're in this section. So for our functions f and g, the domains of f plus g, f minus g, and f times g are going to include all real numbers in the intersection of the domains of f and g. When we say intersection, we mean that the domain of the new function will only include values that are in the domain of both original functions. So it must be valid for both functions to be valid in the new function that is created. And we'll see this as we kind of go through the examples. We'll talk about the domain of each scenario we see. Lastly, we want to talk about f divided by g of x. So when we come across this scenario, the domain also includes all real numbers in the intersection of the domains of f and g. But with an additional statement, again, where we say that g of x is not allowed to be equal to 0, because again, division by 0 is not allowed. Okay, so very easy topic. Let's just jump in and look at some examples. All right, so let's say we have these two functions. We have f of x equals x minus three, and we have g of x equals two x minus five. So the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is find f plus g of x, and then tell me what the domain is. So let's start with that, and then we'll move on to kind of this other one. We'll talk about that in a minute. So f plus g of x, we said was what? It's f of x plus g of x, okay? Now, before I kind of move on, think about the domain of each one because we want the intersection of the two. So the domain here for x minus three, if I think about, is there anything I can't plug in for x? Is there anything I can't plug in for x and subtract away three? No, no restrictions there. It'd be all real numbers. Same thing goes for two x minus five. There's nothing I can't plug in for x there. So when I have f of x plus g of x, when I add those two together, that new function, the domain will just be all real numbers, okay? So we can list that down here if we want. We can say the domain, again, I'm gonna use interval notation, so from negative infinity to positive infinity. And then we could just sum these, f of x plus g of x. I would just replace f of x with this x minus three. So x minus three. I would replace g of x with this two x minus five. And it's really just as simple as that. All I'm doing is just kind of adding two polynomials together. So x plus 2x is 3x. Let me kind of do that down here. So this is 3x, and then negative 3 minus 5 is going to be negative 8. So essentially, f plus g of x is, again, f of x plus g of x. This gives us 3x minus 8. Let's say you're asked to find f plus g of negative 3. What in the world does this mean? You might be scratching your head and saying, I don't know what this means. Let me erase this so I have a little room, and I'm going to keep this 3x minus 8 because we're going to use this in a second. And I'm just going to drag this up here so it's out of our way and just put a visible kind of border there. Let's just use a little line. Okay, so f plus g of negative 3. What does this mean? We already know what function notation is. If I have f of x equals x minus 3, and I say what's f of 2, you plug in a 2 where you have x. So essentially, whatever's inside the parentheses, you plug it in for x. So in this case, 2 minus 3 would give me negative 1. So the function's value when x is 2 is negative 1. Okay, that's all it's really doing. So let's erase this and think about this now. So if I have f plus g of negative 3, all I really want to do is find out what is f of x plus g of x, and then plug in a negative 3 for x. Okay, that's all I'm doing. So kind of following the fact that I already know that it's 3x minus 8, all I really have to do is sub a negative three in there. Three times negative three is negative nine, and then minus eight would be negative 17, okay? So f plus g of negative three would be negative 17. Now there's another way you can do that. You can either go through this process and then sub in, or you could also do it this way, and you'll get the same answer. You could say this is f of negative three plus g of negative three, perfectly valid. So I would go through and say, okay, f of negative three, is what? If I plugged in a negative 3 here, then I'd have a negative 3 minus a 3 up here. So negative 3 minus 3 is negative 6. And then g of negative 3 is what? So if I plugged in a negative 3 there, I'd have 2 times negative 3, which is negative 6. Negative 6 minus 5 is negative 11. So what happens when I do f of negative 3 plus g of negative 3? Well, let's just replace. I'd have a negative 6 for that, and I have a negative 11 there. So I'd have a negative 6 
plus a negative 11, or you could say negative 6 minus 11 if you wanted to, it doesn't matter. And you get negative 17 either way, right? So if I plug in a negative 3 here, I get negative 17. If I kind of go through and say f of negative 3 plus g of negative 3, I also get negative 17. So again, either way, I'm going to get that negative 17 as my result. All right, let's look at subtraction now with the same two functions. So we have f of x equals x minus 3 and g of x equals 2x minus 5. Again, same two functions. We have f minus g of x. So again, all I'm doing here is I'm just saying that this is f of x minus g of x. Okay, that's all I'm doing. So f of x is what? It's going to be x minus 3. And g of x is 2x minus 5. But you got to be careful with subtraction. I am subtracting away g of x. I'm subtracting this whole thing away. So the best thing to do is just wrap this in parentheses to remind yourself that you've got to distribute this negative to each term, right? So essentially this becomes negative 2x plus 5. So this becomes minus 2x plus 5. And so we can go through and just combine like terms now. x minus 2x is negative x. So I'll just get rid of that. And negative 3 plus 5 is positive 2. So this becomes negative x plus 2. Okay, so that's the result there. Now, before I go any further, the fact that we're doing subtraction here, it doesn't matter. The domain is still all real numbers. If I look at f of x and I look at g of x, again, all real numbers here, all real numbers here. When you get this result here, it's going to be all real numbers. It's the intersection of the two domains. So the domain, I can just kind of put a bar again here and just say the domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, what about f minus g of 12? Again, you could do the same thing. You could do f of x minus g of x like we did here and then plug in a 12 for x. So essentially, if I plugged in a 12, I'd have the opposite of 12 plus 2, which would be what? You have negative 12 plus 2, which is negative 10. So that's the result. The other way to do it is, again, to do f of 12 minus g of 12. That's perfectly valid. F of 12 would be what? 12 minus 3 would be 9. Then minus g of 12, you'd have 2 times 12, which is 24. And then 24 minus 5 would be 19. So you'd have 9 minus 19, which again is negative 10. So either way you do it, you're going to get the same result. All right, let's look at one that's slightly more challenging. So we have f of x equals the square root of 3x minus 5. We have g of x equals 7x minus 2. So before we get started, let's think about our domain here. Okay, remember, we're going to work in the real number system. So we want values of x that we plug in that are going to produce real number results. Okay, so with a square root, you have a restriction because in the real number system, we can't take the square root of a negative number. Of course, we can do this with the complex number system. But when we're talking about domain, unless somebody specifically tells you to include the complex number system, we're working in the real number system, okay? So what we want to say here is that this radicand, this 3x minus 5, needs to be non-negative. So 3x minus 5 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. We solve this inequality to find out what the domain needs to be. We get 3x is greater than or equal to 5. We divide both sides by 3, and we get that x is greater than or equal to 5 thirds. So x here has to be greater than or equal to 5 thirds. So the domain could be written in set builder notation by saying what? The set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 5 thirds. Or again, you could use interval notation, which is generally what I prefer. So let's say that the domain, the domain is going to be from 5 thirds. And I'll put a hard bracket there because it's included. And then out to positive infinity. Okay, so that's my domain. All right, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's think about f plus g of x here. So in this particular case, I'm just going to drag this down here. So f plus g of x, f of x is what? It's the square root of 3x minus 5, and g of x is 7x minus 2, so plus 7x minus 2. I can't combine this at all, right? So all I can really do, and let me put my equal sign here, and I'm just going to kind of move this down so this makes more sense. So let's move this down here and let's move this up here. There we go. That's much better. So f plus g of x is just going to be equal to the square root of 3x minus 5. And then outside the square root symbol, we have plus 7x minus 2. Okay, so that's just summing f of x plus g of x. Again, nothing we can really combine. You can't combine this with this. So we're done. 
Now, if I have f plus g of negative 2, again, all I want to do is I can just take this guy and I can substitute a negative 2 in everywhere I see an x. So that's really simple. So I'll just have the square root of 3 times negative 2 and then minus 5 and then plus 7 times negative 2 and then minus 2. Now, before I go any further, do you see a problem? Well, yeah, we already said that the domain was from 5 thirds out to positive infinity. And I just plugged in a negative 2 there for x. Here it doesn't really matter, but over here is where you get the problem, right? 3 times negative 2 is what? It's negative 6. Negative 6 minus 5 is negative 11. So you get negative 11 here. Again, in the real number system, you can't take the square root of negative 11. So we would say that this guy is undefined. Right, this is undefined, okay? Now again, if you're working with complex numbers and you use your imaginary unit i, you can write a solution, but again, we're not doing that here. All right, let's look at the same two functions and do subtraction now. So we have f of x equals the square root of three x minus five and g of x equals seven x minus two. So we want f minus g of x and we want f minus g of seven. Again, my domain is gonna be the same, no change in that. So my domain, again, is going to be from hard bracket, 5 thirds out to positive infinity. Okay, so 5 thirds is included. That's why I have a bracket there instead of a parenthesis. So for f minus g of x, I'm going to take f of x, which is the square root of 3x minus 5. And I'm going to subtract away g of x, which is 7x minus 2. Now, again, when you work with subtraction, be very, very careful because you can make a sign mistake pretty easily. Wrap this in parentheses and then distribute your negative to each term. So you'd have minus 7x and then plus 2. Very important you do that, otherwise you will make a sign mistake. You can't combine this part with this part, okay? But you want to make sure that you have the correct sign because if you just put plus 7x minus 2, this is wrong. So this becomes minus and this becomes plus, okay? So very important you do that. All right, so for f minus g of 7, again, all I'm going to do is plug in a 7 for x. And again, because x can be anything that's 5 thirds or larger, it's going to be valid in this situation. So we'd have the square root of 3 times 7, which is 21, minus 5, which is 16. So the square root of 16 minus 7 times 7 plus 2. Square root of 16 is obviously 4. And we have negative 7 times 7, which is going to be negative 49. So what we have now is 4 minus 49, which is going to give me negative 45, then plus 2, which is going to give me negative 43, right, as a result. So this would be negative 43. All right, let's move on and look at some examples with multiplication and division now. So for the process, it's essentially the same. With multiplication and division, it does become a little bit more tedious. So for f of x, we have 6x squared minus 3x minus 9. For g of x, we have x plus 1. So the domain here, again, I have x squared, I have x, here I have x. There's nothing, it's not inside of a radical, it's not in a denominator, it's not in one of those things where you'd say, okay, there's a domain restriction. So the domain is just going to be all real numbers. So the domain, again, it's going to be from negative infinity to positive infinity, right? Nothing I can't plug in for x in either one of those. So f times g of x, again, I'm just multiplying these two together. So we would say what? It's 6x squared minus 3x minus 9 multiplied by x plus 1. You cannot use FOIL here because these are not binomials. One's a binomial, one's a trinomial. So you have to distribute each term from the binomial to each term of the trinomial. So I would have x times 6x squared, which is going to give me 6x cubed. I would have x times negative 3x, which is minus 3x squared. I would have x times negative 9, which is minus 9x. And then one times anything is just itself. So I can just put plus 6x squared minus 3x minus 9. Okay. So now let me erase this. And I can just kind of scooch this up here. Let's see if we can combine any like terms. So 6x cubed, nothing I can do with that. Negative 3x squared plus 6x squared would be positive 3x squared. So let's get rid of that. Negative 9x minus 3x is going to be negative 12x. So this is minus 12x. And then you have your minus 9. So that's going to be our answer here, 6x cubed plus, let me make that a little cleaner, plus 3x squared, let me make that a little cleaner, minus 12x, and then minus 9. Now, if I want f times g of negative 1, again, all I've got to do is plug in a negative 1 everywhere I see an x. 
So what I would have is six times, you'd have your negative one plugged in for X, and that's cubed, plus three times negative one squared, minus 12 times negative one, and then minus nine. Negative one cubed is negative one, so this just becomes negative six. Negative one squared is one, so you can just basically get rid of that because three times one is just three. Negative 12 times negative one would be plus 12, so this would be plus 12 here. And then you have minus nine. So negative six and negative nine would be negative 15. So this would be negative 15. Three plus 12 would be positive 15. So what we see is that we're gonna end up with zero. Okay, so F times G of negative one is zero. And again, you can prove this to yourself. You can go back and say, what's F of negative one? What's G of negative one? You can multiply those two together and you will end up with zero. And it's obvious because if you plug in a negative one there, negative one plus one is zero, zero times anything is zero. Okay, so that's why that happens. All right, so let's move on and look at the same two functions with division now. So what we have is f divided by g of x. And again, all I wanna do is take f of x and divide it by g of x. But again, when you work with division, you're gonna have an extra restriction. So if we're doing addition, subtraction, or multiplication with these guys, the domain is all real numbers. But when I start thinking about the division, g of x here, this guy cannot be equal to zero. So g of x cannot be zero. So what that means is that this guy x plus one cannot be equal to zero. Well, where is it equal to zero? It's equal to zero if I subtract one away from each side of the equation, it's equal to zero where x is negative one. So that's my domain restriction, okay? So I can say that the domain, the domain is, again, the set of all x such that x does not equal negative one. Again, that's your set builder notation, or as I prefer, and this is gonna be a little bit longer to write it this way, you can write an interval notation, so from negative infinity up to, but not including negative one, and the union with, again, from negative one, anything larger than that, out to positive infinity. So all real numbers except for negative one. Negative one's not included here, and negative one's not included here. All right, so now let's think about f divided by g of x. So all I'm going to do is grab f of x, which is 6x squared minus 3x minus 9, and put this over x plus 1, okay? Now, we already know how to simplify something like this. We can either use polynomial long division if we want, or in this particular case, we can think about this by kind of factoring the numerator and canceling with the denominator. Okay, but there's gonna be one thing that we need to think about here. Let me copy this real quick. We're gonna to go to a fresh sheet and we're just gonna work on this real fast. I'll get rid of this equal sign. And I want you to think about how we can factor this numerator. We can pull out a three. So I'd have two X squared minus X minus three. This would be over X plus one. And what can I do here? Can I factor two X squared minus X minus three? Well, this guy right here is a prime number, so it's perfect to use reverse foil with. So I can say this is 2x and this is x. Now I know this last term here, negative three. So this negative three can only come from a negative one and a positive three, or a positive one and a negative three. So those are our only two possibilities if we can factor this. So let's think about this. If I had 2x multiplied by negative one, so let's say I had a minus one here, and I had positive three multiplied by x, would that get me what I needed? No, because this guy right here in the middle is negative one X. What I would need to do is make this a plus one and this a minus three, because the outer now would be plus two X and the inner would be negative three X. So that would be perfect, right? Plus two X added to minus three X would give me my negative X and then negative three times positive one would give me my negative three. So this is the factorization we're looking for now we have this over our x plus one. So look how easy this is now. This is gonna cancel with this, and I'm just left with this three times the quantity two x minus three, which I can also write as six x minus nine. So let's go back up, and I'm gonna write this as six x minus nine. So six x minus nine. Now, here's where you really gotta pay attention because this is where the teacher is gonna throw a fastball at. We have talked about rational expressions before, and the same rules are gonna apply when you have a rational function like we have with this f over g of x. Before we simplified, we noticed that a value of negative one, we restricted that from the domain, made the denominator zero. 
So after we simplify, we see that with 6x minus 9, there's no restriction. Well, you've got to carry that restriction over, okay? It's still undefined when x is equal to negative 1. So in this next problem where it says f over g of negative 1, a lot of students will go, okay, 6 times, you have negative 1 minus 9, and they'll say this is equal to negative 15. That is wrong. This is wrong. Don't do that. This guy is undefined. Okay, this is undefined. This is a very common trap question. You've got to say this is 6x minus 9, and you can list the domain restriction that x is not allowed to be equal to negative 1. This gets carried over even though you simplified and it disappeared. All right, let's look at another one. So we have f of x equals the square root of 4x minus 1 and g of x equals 1 over x. So f times g of x, again, we're just multiplying these two functions together. So you'd have the square root of 4x minus 1 times 1 over x. You can really just write this as over x. Now, before we go any further, let's think about domain restrictions because here you've really got to think about things. With f of x, you have a domain restriction where the radicand, 4x minus 1, has to be greater than or equal to 0. So if I add 1 to both sides of the inequality, I get 4x is greater than or equal to 1. Divide both sides by 4, I get x is greater than or equal to 1 fourth. So that's one domain restriction. The other domain restriction is what? It's that this guy right here is 1 over x. Well, I can't have an x value of 0, but... This guy is more restrictive than this guy. So I can just take x is greater than or equal to 1 fourth, and I'm good to go, right? Because 1 fourth is already larger than 0, so 0 is already not included in the domain when I restrict the domain to these values. So I can just say that my domain, okay, for this new guy right here is going to be what? It's going to be from 1 fourth, again, including 1 fourth, that's why I have the bracket there, out to positive infinity. Okay, so that's my domain. And this is as simple as I can make this. I really can't do anything else here. If you want f times g of 3, just plug in a 3 everywhere you see an x. So for this guy, I'll just kind of do this over here. You'd have the square root of 4 times 3, which is 12. 12 minus 1 is 11. So the square root of 11 over, just plug in a 3 for x. So that's all that would be equal to. So f times g of 3 is just square root of 11 over 3. All right, let's look at the same two functions with division. So f of x equals square root of 4x minus 1, g of x equals 1 over x. So we want f divided by g of x. So again, all I'm going to do is take square root of 4x minus 1, my f of x, and divide it by 1 over x, my g of x. So divided by 1 over x. The quickest way to do this is just to say what? This is equal to square root of 4x minus 1 times the reciprocal of this, which is x over 1 or just x. So let me put the x out in front because that's going to be a little bit cleaner. So I'm going to put it in a different color. So x and then multiplied by the square root of 4x minus 1. So let's just erase this and just kind of slide this down. Now let's think about our domain. When we look at division here, we have to be extra careful that we're not dividing by 0. Okay, But we pretty much covered that already because we said the domain was going to be from 1 fourth and including that out to positive infinity. So in this situation, we're covered here and we're covered here. We're good to go. And even when we had it set up in the format of the square root of 4x minus 1 divided by 1 over x, we're still good to go. If I plug in a 1 fourth there or anything larger, I'm okay. The only value that's excluded there is going to be 0, and that's covered by this domain restriction here. So we are okay. All right, so let's talk about f divided by g of 1. So all I would do is take this guy here, this x, I'd plug in a 1 there, and then square root of 4 times 1 minus 1. 4 times 1 is 4. 4 minus 1 is 3. So all I have here is what? Just the square root of 3. All right, so let's look at one more kind of concept here, and then we'll just wrap things up. All right, so we have g of x equals 2x plus 4, h of x equals 3x cubed minus 4. This can be a little confusing when you first see it. Suppose you see negative 2g plus 3h of x. Now, it doesn't matter if you have addition here, subtraction, multiplication, or division. It's the same process. All I want to do, if I see negative 2 times g, it's just like if I saw negative 2 times g of x. Just multiply negative 2 by each part of this function. Okay, that's all I'm doing. If I see 3 times h, just multiply 3 times each part of this function over here. It seems a little bit challenging, but it's really not. So really all I'm saying here is that I have 
negative two times g of x plus three times h of x. That's all this is asking for, okay? Now for the domain here, two x plus four, there's nothing I can't do with x. Three x cubed minus four, nothing I can't do with x. The domain is all real numbers. So the domain, let's write that up here. We'll put from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now let's just crank this out real quick. So if I have negative two times g of x, well, essentially I'm doing what? I'm multiplying negative two by two x. So that's going to give me negative four x. And then I'm gonna have negative two times four, which is minus eight. And then I'm adding this to, and I'm just gonna wrap this in parentheses just to kind of separate things. I'm adding this to three multiplied by h of x. So three times three x cubed is going to be nine x cubed. Let me write that down here. So nine x cubed. And then three multiplied by negative four would be minus 12, okay? So let me erase this notation. Let me erase the parentheses. We're just using that to separate things. And essentially, what can I do? Well, my nine x cubed, I don't have anything to combine with that. Then I have my negative four x, nothing to combine with that. And I just have negative eight minus 12, which is gonna be negative 20. So I end up with nine x cubed minus four x minus 20. So it's just that simple. When you see these numbers out in front of kind of your function's name, either it's f or g or h or whatever you're using, just multiply that number by each part of that function and then proceed with the operation you're given. Okay, it's very, very simple. In this lesson, we wanna talk about the difference quotient. All right, so when we talk about the difference quotient, it's gonna be something we need to understand before we kind of get into our calculus course. You're gonna pretty much use this right away in calculus when you start talking about derivatives. So what is the difference quotient? Well, essentially this is just the slope formula that we're used to working with, with some fancy notation, okay? That's all it really is if you wanna boil it down. So let's say we revisit our slope formula let's say that we have a line and on that line we have two points. So one point is P, another point is Q. And the point P has the coordinates X sub one, Y sub one. The point Q has the coordinates X sub two, Y sub two. We already know that the slope M, and I'll specifically say lowercase m here, is equal to what? You could say it's the change in Y over the change in X, or you could say it's the rise over the run, or you could say it's the difference in y values over the difference in x values. Lots of different ways to kind of remember this. For the slope formula, it's just y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one, okay? And then we say x sub two minus x sub one can't be zero because again, division by zero is not defined. All right, so generically, if we look at this on a graph, we can kind of use this to get into our difference quotient. We'll see this is helpful in a minute. So let's say this is point P this guy right here, and this is point Q right here. So this is X sub one, Y sub one. This is X sub two, Y sub two. So we know again, the slope M is equal to what? The change in Y values over the change in X values, or you could say Y sub two minus Y sub one. So the difference in Y values over X sub two minus X sub one, the difference in X values. Okay, very, very easy formula to remember. Something you should know at this point. Now, let's say we start using function notation, okay? If we have this guy as again point P and this guy again as point Q, instead of saying that this is X sub one, Y sub one, using function notation, we can say it's X comma F of X. We know F of X is just a fancy way to write Y. Okay, so don't let that fool you. It's just, it's just Y, right? It's just X comma Y. We're writing X comma F of X. For this guy right here, it might kind of trip you up for a minute. You have this H here and this H here. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at this graph here, the horizontal distance from point P to point Q, we've said this is H, right? It's H units away. So if this is X, then this guy right here, this X coordinate, since it's H units away, is gonna be X plus H, okay? That's all it is. This just took the place of my X sub two comma Y sub two, okay? We just changed it with some fancy notation. And then we say comma F of, x plus h. So again, this is just taking the place of y. That's all it is, nothing that's too fancy. Now, we can take this kind of a new notation and we can get our difference quotient. So point P again is x comma f of x. Again, this just took the place of x sub one, y sub one. And then Q, that point here, x plus h is the x coordinate and f of x plus h is the y coordinate. So this guy, again, this was x sub two comma y sub two. 
So if we plug this in this way in our slope formula, m equals what? Again, we used to have y sub 2 minus y sub 1. Well, now we just say f of x plus h minus f of x. So it's just the difference in y values. It's the same thing, just fancy notation. Then down here, we used to say x sub 2 minus x sub 1. Again, it's just the difference in x values. So you have x plus h, this guy right here, minus x, this guy up here. Okay, so that's all it is. And we say h can't be 0 because what happens is this x minus this x leaves me with just an h in the denominator. So really I can say m is equal to, we have f of x plus h minus f of x. Okay, so this is just the difference in y values over your h, right? This is going to be the difference in x values. They're going to be different by h units, right? Because that was the horizontal distance between point P and point Q, okay? And again, we say that h, this guy in the denominator, cannot be 0 because division by 0 is undefined. All right, so when you encounter this in your course, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to be given a function, and you're going to be told to find the difference quotient. OK, so all this really is, is just kind of plugging things in and simplifying. Once you see a few examples, it becomes very, very easy. It's just something that you can make mistakes on because it is a little bit tedious. So suppose we see y equals 5x plus 4. OK, the first thing is if you don't have it in a format of f of x equals something, go ahead and put it in that format first. So we'll say this is f of x is equal to 5x plus 4. Now, if I find the difference quotient for this guy, what do I expect it to be? Remember, this is in slope-intercept form. I already know that the slope is 5, right? So I would expect that if I find the difference quotient for this function, I would get a result of 5, okay? So let's go ahead and try this out. And let me just write this formula out again. So it's f of x plus h minus f of x, and this is all over h. Now, what I'm going to do is, again, if I see something like f of 3, what does that mean? It means to plug in a 3 everywhere I see an x. If I see f of a, what does that mean? It means to plug in an a everywhere I see an x, okay? So if I see f of x plus h, I just plug in an x plus h everywhere I see an x. So for this guy, f of x equals 5x plus 4. If I had f of x plus h, that would be what? That would be 5 times... Where I have an x here, I'm just going to plug in an x plus h. That's all I'm doing, nothing fancy. So x plus h gets plugged in there, and then you have your plus 4, okay? Then the second part of this is to subtract away the original function, which is just this 5x plus 4. Now, be very careful here, because this is where people make these sign mistakes. You've got to subtract the whole thing away. So don't just put minus 5x plus 4. That's going to give you a sign mistake. You want to subtract the whole thing away, so wrap it in some parentheses. That's going to remind you to distribute. So this becomes negative 5x minus 4, okay? All right, so once we have this, we can write it over h, and then we can start simplifying. So let me scroll down. So let's go ahead and say this is what? 5 times x is going to be 5x, then plus 5 times h is 5h, then we have plus 4, we have minus 5x, we have minus 4, this whole thing is over h. What you're going to see with these is a lot of stuff's going to cancel. So 5x minus 5x is gone. We have 4 minus 4 is gone. So you end up with 5h over h. And we know that this is going to cancel with this and just give me 5. This is exactly what we expected to get because, again, the line was in slope-intercept form. And we knew that the slope of that line was 5 to begin with. Okay, so we got the expected result. All right, let's look at something a little bit more challenging. It's just more tedious, not necessarily more challenging. So we have 3x squared minus 5x minus y equals 1. Again, if you don't have f of x, if you don't see that, this guy is in implicit form, so it's not even solved for y. So you have an additional step here. What you have to do is solve this for y first, and then replace y with f of x, and then you can go through and find the difference quotient. Okay? So I would just add y to both sides, and I would subtract 1 away from each side, and that would give me y. So I would say this is equal to y. We know that this cancels. Over here, I would have my 3x squared minus 5x. We know that canceled, so minus 1. I like the dependent variable to be on the left. So let's go ahead and write it that way. Let's say that y is equal to 3x squared minus 5x minus 1. Now, I'm going to replace y with f of x. So let's just erase that and put f of x. And now we can find the difference quotient. 
We're going to do the same thing we just did. It's just going to be more tedious. So we're going to say that we want f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Okay. So again, if I have x plus h inside the parentheses, that's what I'm going to plug in here and here. That's all I'm doing. There's no trick to it. So what I'm going to have here is three times inside the parentheses, I'm going to put x plus h and this guy is squared. Again, I just plugged in for x. So I put x plus h there and then I squared that result. Then I have minus five times. Again, I've got an x, so plug in an x plus h and then I have minus one. Okay, so that's the first part. You've still got to do minus f of x. So I've got to subtract away and I'm going to put parentheses around this. I've got to subtract away this original function f of x. So this is 3x squared minus 5x minus 1. And then once that's done, I want to put the whole thing over h. All right, so let's see what this gives me. It's a lot of stuff to simplify here. So I would have three times. If I expand this, remember I can use my special products formula for that. This would be x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then over here, I would have negative 5 times x, which is negative 5x. And then negative 5 times h, which is minus 5h. Then I have minus 1. And then I have to distribute this negative to each term. So I'd have minus 3x squared. I'd have plus 5x. And I'd have plus 1. And this is all over h. Okay, so a lot of stuff there. All right, so let's keep going here. All right, so I'm going to distribute this to each term. So I'm going to have 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared. Okay, just distributed the 3 to each term there. Then I'd have minus 5x minus 5h minus 1 minus 3x squared plus 5x plus 1 all over h. Okay, and I know this gets kind of tedious. Okay, so what can we cancel? This will cancel with this. This will cancel with this. This will cancel with this. And that looks like it's about it, right? So we're going to be left with what? Let me put my equals here because I forgot to do it. And let me put my equals here. So I'm going to have 6xh plus 3h squared minus 5h over h. Now, can I make this any simpler? Well, the answer to that is yes. We have an h here. We have an h squared here. We have an h here. We have an h in the denominator. So what I can do is I can factor. So let me kind of copy this. I'm going to bring it to a fresh sheet. And let's just factor this guy. So in the numerator, I'm going to write this as h times the quantity. I'll have 6x plus 3h minus 5. Okay, all I did was I factored out an h from the numerator. This is over my h in the denominator. This is going to cancel and leave me with what? So you'll have your 6x plus 3h minus 5. Okay, so this is going to be your result. All right, let's take a look at an example with a fraction involved. So now we have our f of x equals 3 over x minus 2. Again, if we want to find the difference quotient, for the difference quotient, we have f of x plus h minus f of x, and then this whole thing's over h, okay? So in this first part here for the f of x plus h, again, where I see an x, I just plug in an x plus h. That's all I'm doing. So I'm going to have 3 over just x plus h, then minus 2. And then you have your minus, your f of x. So minus this thing right here. So 3 over x minus 2. What I'm going to do is just write this as plus negative, just to make it a little bit easier to keep track of what's going on. And then I want to write this over h. So I can just write it over h like this. Or if I wanted to, I could do this numerator part first and then write it over h kind of later on. It's up to you. It's the same result either way. All right, so looking at this guy, we have a complex fraction. And we already know how to simplify a complex fraction. We want to find the LCD of all the denominators involved. So what's the LCD of this guy and this guy? Okay, so it would just be the product of the two. So what I would do is I would multiply kind of this top part up here by x plus h minus 2, that quantity, times x minus 2, that quantity. And then this bottom part here by the same thing, so x plus h minus 2, again, that quantity, times x minus 2, that quantity. So again, this over this would give me 1. So I'm not doing anything illegal here, okay? So what happens is, let me put equals here. This guy 
when it gets multiplied by this guy, what's going to happen is that this denominator is going to cancel with this kind of guy right there. So I would just have x minus 2 times 3. So the first part of this is 3 times the quantity x minus 2. And then I have my plus here. Let me kind of undo this now. So now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this times this. So we're going to see that this is going to cancel with this now. And I'll have my negative 3 times this quantity. So I'm going to put negative 3 times this quantity x plus h minus 2. And then this whole thing is going to be over h times the quantity x plus h minus 2 times the quantity x minus 2. All right, so just working with this now, let me put equals here. So I'm going to use my distributive property. 3 times x is 3x. Then minus 3 times 2 is 6. And then you're going to have negative 3 times x, which is minus 3x. Then negative 3 times h is minus 3h. And then negative 3 times negative 2 is plus 6. And again, this is all over h times the quantity x plus h minus 2 times the quantity x minus 2. So don't go ahead and multiply that out. Just leave that in its kind of factored form. You don't want to do that because you want to end up with this in the end. Okay. So what you're going to see now is that you can cancel this with this, right? 3x minus 3x, that's gone. You can cancel this with this. Negative 6 plus 6 is gone. So you're just left with this negative 3h here in the numerator. So let's go ahead and write that. So we'll say we have this negative 3h over, you have this h times the quantity x plus h minus 2 times the quantity x minus 2. Okay, so now I can cancel this h with this h, and I'm going to get a final result. So we're going to have negative 3 over, we're going to have the quantity x plus h minus 2 times the quantity x minus 2. Okay, let me make this fraction bar a little bit longer. And so that is my result here negative 3 over, you have x plus h minus 2, that quantity, times the quantity x minus 2. All right, let's take a look at this one here. And you're going to see that when you work with kind of the square root operation, you have to do a little bit of extra work. So f of x equals, you have the square root of 7x minus 1. So what I want to do again, find the difference quotient. So f of x plus h minus f of x, and this is over h. Okay, so I'm going to plug in for x here. Again, if I want f of x plus h, I'm just going to plug in an x plus h. So I would have the square root of 7 times the quantity x plus h, and then I'm subtracting away 1. And then minus, for f of x, I'm going to have the square root of 7x minus 1, and then this whole thing is over h. Now, at this point, you might stop and say, well, really, I can't do much to simplify. I can distribute the 7. All right, let's go ahead and do that real fast. And then I'll show you what else you need to do. So the square root of, you'd have 7 times x, which is 7x, and then plus 7 times h, which is 7h, and then minus 1. And then minus, you have the square root of 7x minus 1. This whole thing is over h. So you might say, okay, well, I can't combine those two radicals there, and I can't really do anything with the h in the denominator, so I'm done. But in fact, what you need to do here is kind of rationalize the numerator, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right, at this point. But when you get to calculus, it's going to make more sense for you. Essentially, what you want to do is get rid of the h in the denominator. So that's the expression we're going to be looking for, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, rationalize the numerator. I'm going to end up with radicals in the denominator, but that's okay in this situation. What I would want to do to do that, remember, if we have a plus b, if I multiply by a minus b, remember these are conjugates, I end up with a squared minus b squared. Okay, it's exactly what I want to do here. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to take this guy plus this guy. Okay, so I want to multiply top and bottom by that. So let me kind of make this a little cleaner. So this is minus the square root of 7x minus 1. So times, and I don't know if I can fit this all on the screen. We're going to try. So the square root of 7x plus 7h minus 1. Instead of a minus there, I'm going to use a plus, And then we're going to have the square root of 7x minus 1. So again, same two terms here. Square root of 7x plus 7h minus 1 and square root of 7x minus 1. Those two are the same. It's just a difference in sign. Okay. So then this is over. I'm going to do the same thing. So square root of 7x plus 7h minus 1. And then plus square root of 7x minus 1. Okay, so let me wrap this in parentheses here. And you can wrap this in parentheses. To multiply the numerator, you would use FOIL, right? So essentially what you're doing is the first terms and the last terms only because the outer and the inner are going to cancel, okay? 
So the first terms, we know that it's this guy times this guy. So it basically becomes this, the square root of 7x plus 7h minus 1 squared. So this cancels with this, and I'm just left with the radicand. Okay, so that's all I have. Let me kind of slide that down so we have room. And then you're going to have minus, right? Because you have a negative and a positive. So you're going to have alternate signs here. The last times the last. So again, you get in this situation where you have the square root of 7x minus 1 quantity squared. So this cancels with this. I'm left with the radicand, okay? Now, again, you've got to be careful here because you're subtracting away this whole thing. So make sure you wrap it in parentheses, and you'll end up with negative 7x plus 1. So negative 7x plus 1. All right, then in the denominator, we have h times this quantity here. So we have this quantity, square root of 7x plus 7h minus 1. And then plus, you have the square root of 7x minus 1. Okay, so what we're going to find is that in the numerator, this cancels, this cancels. So what I'm left with is 7h over this h times this quantity here. The important thing is that the h here will cancel with the h there, and you're just left with 7 in the numerator, okay? So let's scroll down and write that. So the numerator is now 7, and this is over. Just this part here, this square root of 7x plus 7h minus 1, and then plus you have the square root of 7x minus 1, okay? So this is going to be your difference quotient for this guy. Again, the reason we did that is so we could get rid of the h in the denominator. When you get to calculus, it's going to make more sense. For right now, just take it as a given. And whenever you have a square root involved in one of these problems, take the extra step to go ahead and do this. In this lesson, we want to talk about composition of functions. So at some point when you study functions, you're going to come across this topic known as function composition. And essentially, this topic just boils down to plugging one function in as the input for another. That's all it really is. So if you understand function notation, this is really no more difficult. It's just a little bit tedious because you've got to plug some things in. Now, related to this topic, we're also going to talk about domain. And we're also going to talk about decomposing functions, which is essentially kind of going in reverse. But we'll get to that at the end of the lesson. So let's just start out by talking about this simple example here, and then we'll get into some stuff that's more complicated. So we have f of x equals 2x minus 5. We have g of x equals 3x squared minus 7. So the first thing you'll come across in your book is this kind of weird notation. Some students call it fog, right? So we have f composed with g. Okay, so that's how that's read. So f composed with g. So this symbol right here is not multiplication. It means composed with. Okay, so f composed with g. So let me write that out. This is composed with is what we could say. Let me make that e a little bit better. So f composed with g. So essentially, if I wanted to write this in a cleaner format, I can say this is f of g of x. Okay, and most of you have already seen this in algebra 2. Essentially, I'm just working from the innermost set out. So I'm going to take g of x and plug it in for x in my function f of x. That's all I'm doing. So let's go ahead and just try that out real quick. The process is really, really simple. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that f of g of x is equal to what? So here's my f of x here. It's 2 times x minus 5. And what I want to do is I want to plug in for x. I want to plug in the function g of x. So g of x is equal to 3x squared minus 7. So that's what I'm going to plug in right there for x. Okay, that's all I'm going to do. So let me scroll down and get a little bit of room going. So 3x squared minus 7, that's what we're going to plug in. Let me just put this up here. So 3x squared minus 7. So what I'll have is f of g of x is equal to 2 times, I'm going to wrap this in parentheses because the 2 is multiplying the whole thing. So 3x squared minus 7 and then minus 5. So all we have to do is simplify this, pretty simple overall. You're just going to multiply the 2 by the 3x squared. So let's say this is equal to 2 times 3x squared is 6x squared, and then minus 2 times 7 is, of course, 14, and then you have minus 5. To kind of finish this up, all we can do here, we know the 6x squared is not going to kind of simplify or combine with anything. The negative 14 minus 5 is going to be negative 19. So f of g of x is 6x squared minus 19. So very, very simple, very, very easy to get that. Now, you might also see them kind of reverse things on you, okay? So you might see g composed with f. 
So essentially all this is, is now G is going to be kind of on the outside and the F is going to be on the inside. So we're taking F of X and now plugging it in for X and G of X. So this is G of F of X, okay? So you've got to think about this as starting on the left side here. This guy's going to be your outer one and going to the right, that's going to be your inside, one. okay? So this is G of F of X. So the order here does matter. So again, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my f of x, which is 2x minus 5, and I'm going to be plugging that in for x in g of x. So this is going to go in there. So what we'll have here, I'll just put equals here. We're going to have 3 times, and again, for x I'm plugging in, so let me wrap this in parentheses. I'm plugging in my 2x minus 5, and this guy is squared. So let's make sure we square this guy. And then we're going to subtract away 7. Okay, so let's work on this real quick. Now, all of you know at this point, this deep into the course, that we have to expand this, right? We can't just say it's, you know, 2x, that quantity squared, minus 5 squared. That is wrong. We need to expand this. So we're going to say 3 times. We're going to use our special products formula to make this quicker. So 2x, that amount squared. 2 would be squared, that's 4. x would be squared, that's x squared. Then we have a minus here, so we'd have a minus. You have 2 times the first term times the second term. Okay, so 2 times 2x is 4x. And then 4x times 5 is 20x, so minus 20x here. And then plus the last guy squared, 5 squared is 25. Close the parentheses, and then you have minus 7 here. Okay, so what do we have? So we're just going to multiply the 3 by kind of each term. 3 times 4x squared is 12x squared. Then minus 3 times 20x is 60x. Then plus 3 times 25 is 75, and then minus 7. So what is this equal here? What is this going to be equal to? Well, we have 12x squared, can't do anything with that. You have minus 60x, can't do anything with that. But then you have 75 minus 7, which is 68, so then plus 68. Okay, so g of f of x is 12x squared minus 60x plus 68. All right, so I'm just going to do one example with this because this is a very easy concept and something you would have covered in Algebra 2. You might also see a number given as the kind of inner set of parentheses. So in this example, we have f composed with g, and then it's of 3, right? So essentially what this means is that we have what? We have f of g of 3, okay? Again, just start with the innermost set and work your way out. So this is g of 3 that's being plugged in for x in f of x. Now, there's multiple ways to do this. You can find f of g of x, which we already know what that is, and then you can plug in a 3 for x in that new function. Or what you can do is you can find g of 3, and then plug that in for x and f of x. So two different ways to do it. Let's just do it both ways so you see that it's the same. So let's find g of 3 first. So what is g of 3? Just plug in a 3 for x there. 3 squared is going to be 9, so you'd have 3 times 9 minus 7. 3 times 9 is 27, and 27 minus 7 is 20, okay? So g of 3 here is 20. So really what I have is f of 20. Okay, because g of 3, the result is 20. So what is f of 20? Well, I go to my f of x, my function here, and I just plug in a 20 for x. So it would be 2 times 20, okay, 2 times 20 minus 5. 2 times 20 is 40, 40 minus 5 is 35. Okay, so that's my answer. f of 20 is 35, so that tells me f of g of 3 is 35 as well. Now, so we already found that f of g of x was 6x squared minus 19. So if I said, what is f of g of 3? So I can just take this f of g of x, I already know what this is, and I can just plug in a 3 for x. So I can say this is equal to 6 times, plug in a 3 for x, that's going to be squared, then minus 19. We should get 35 if I got the right answer, right? So 3 squared is 9, so I'd have 6 times 9 minus 19. 6 times 9 is, of course, 54, so you'd have 54 minus 19, which is 35. Okay, so you get the same answer either way. So you can either do it this way, find f of g of x first, and then plug in kind of the value you're given. In this case, it's 3, so we got a result of 35. Or we can do it this other way, where we find g of 3 first, and then we plug that result in, which in this case was 20, for f in the original function. Okay, so two ways to kind of do that. I'm not going to do another example of this because it's really easy. We want to move on to something more complicated, known as finding the domain. So let's look at finding the domain for a composite function. So this is kind of a really tricky thing. So we're going to spend most of our time in this lesson on this because the other parts are really, really easy. 
first and foremost, when we consider the domain of a composite function, we need to do two things, okay? The first thing is we need to consider the domain of the inside function. So this is the function that's being plugged in as the input for the outer function, okay? So that's very important. A lot of students mess that up, they forget to do it. So that's the first thing. Then we need to think about the domain of the new composite function that is built, okay? So we're gonna look at both of those and then we're gonna state the domain of this composite function that we're building as the intersection of the domain of the inside function and our composite function. We don't need to think about the outside function and I'll show you that as we kind of move on, okay? So remember, when I say intersection, I mean the overlap between the two. So this means it must be valid in the domain of the inside function and also valid in the domain of the new composite function that we've just created. I just wanna say this again, finding the domain for a composite function is really tricky and it's something that you'll probably struggle with when you first see it, okay? So in this particular case, if we think about the domain, whether I have f composed with g or g composed with f, it's gonna be all real numbers in each case. And the reason for this is, if we think about the inside function, well, for f composed with g, this guy is f of g of x, well, the inside function here is g of x and it's all real numbers, right? So I can plug in anything here for x and square it, multiply it by three and then subtract away seven from the result. There's no problem there. When I plug this in here, okay, I know that I end up with a result that's what? It's six x squared minus 19. In this new function that we've created, there's no restrictions on x as well. So the domain here for this guy is all real numbers. And it's gonna be the same thing with this guy as well. When we look at g of f of x, remember this was 12x squared minus 60x plus 68, okay? So when I look at f of x, it's 2x minus five, that's all real numbers. Then when I look at the composite function we create, the 12x squared minus 60x plus 68, that's all real numbers as well. So the domain in each case here, we could just say the set of all x such that x is a real number, okay? You could do it like that. Or again, you could do it in interval notation. Again, for each one, it's the same. So from negative infinity to positive infinity, all real numbers. All right, let's look at an example that's a little bit more complicated now. So we have f of x equals one over x, and we have g of x equals the square root of five minus x. So let's do f of g of x, and then let's determine the domain and then we'll flip it around and look at g of f of x and we'll look at the domain of that as well. So when we think about this, f of g of x is quite simple to find. So g of x is here, it's the square root of five minus x. f of x is here, so I'm just gonna plug g of x in for x and f of x, that's all I'm doing. So I would have one over, again, I'm plugging in for x, I'm plugging in the square root of five minus x. So that part's very, very simple, something you've done, again, in algebra two. Some of you even would have done it in algebra one. But finding the domain is a little bit tricky. So we want the intersection, again, for the domains of the kind of inside function and then of the newly created function. So this is f of g of x. You could even name it as something new. You could say this is h of x if you wanted to. And I'll kind of get to that in another example. I'm gonna like leave that off for now because I don't wanna confuse you. So what's the domain for the inside function, the g of x? So g of x, what's the domain? Well, if I think about the square root of five minus x, what can I do? I can't take the square root of a negative, so I would just take this five minus x, this radicand, and I would say that it has to be greater than, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. Pretty easy to solve this, just add x to both sides of the inequality, and you would have five is greater than or equal to x, okay? Or you could say x is less than or equal to five. So, let me erase this and say that we know that x needs to be less than or equal to five. So that's my restriction here on the domain for the inside function. Now, when we look at the newly created function, the f of g of x, we have one over the square root of five minus x. So we have a radical, the same one. So we have the same restriction here that x needs to be less than or equal to five. So that's still there. So for the domain of f of g of x, we have that same restriction that x needs to be less than or equal to five. But we have something else that we need to consider. We have division here and we have a variable in the denominator. 
So we need to make sure that something that gets plugged in for X doesn't create a zero denominator, right? We don't want to divide by zero, that's undefined. So where would the denominator be equal to zero? Well, what I can do is I can say, where is the square root of five minus X equal to zero? Well, there's a lot of ways to think about this. We know the square root of zero equals zero if this becomes zero. So I could just say five minus X equals zero, just solve that. I would just add X to both sides of the equation and find that X equals five. So if I plugged in a five there, five minus five is obviously zero, square root of zero is zero, so one over zero will be undefined. So what I have to do here is further restrict the domain for the composite function, the newly created function that we just built. And I have to say that not only does x need to be less than or equal to five, x needs to be strictly less than five, okay? And so what happens is I want the intersection of these two. This one right here is more restrictive. Right? So this contains all the same numbers as this one, except for five. So I've got to go with this one as the domain for this f of g of x. So again, the intersection of the two. So let me erase this. And we'll just state our domain here. Our domain is going to be from negative infinity up to, but not including five. Okay, so that's the domain. You could also say that it's the set of all x such that x is less than five. Right? And it's strictly less than, if you put less than or equal to, that would be wrong. Okay, so now that we understand that, again, we've got to consider the inside function and the newly created composite function. So this whole thing, this guy that we're looking at here, that's what we're looking at. Now, a common mistake is to look at this f of x function. This is a different function, okay? So students will start going, okay, well, x can't be zero. Well, x can be zero, right? If I plugged in a zero there, I'm fine. Five minus zero is five. I can take square root of five, that's not an issue. Also, I can plug in a zero here, right? It's the same thing. So don't look at this f of x function, this outer function in this kind of composite thing that we're building. You need to look at the composite function as a new function, okay? Something that we are creating based on taking the inside function and plugging it in for x in the outside function, okay? So I know that can be confusing at first, but after you work enough examples, it just becomes something that is kind of second nature for you, okay? So let's look at the other way around now. Let's think about g of f of x. So what is this now? So now I'm gonna take this f of x, which is one over x, and I'm gonna plug it in for x in this g of x, again, square root of five minus x. So this guy is going in right there. Now, this one will be a little bit more complicated. So we will have the square root of five minus, again, for x, I'm plugging in a one over x. Okay, so now let's think about the domain. And again, this one will be slightly more complicated. So my domain. Now the inside function is one over X, right? It's the F of X. So now I'm gonna restrict this to where X cannot be zero because one over X, we know that the domain restriction there would be X can't be zero because we can't divide by zero. So X cannot be zero. Okay, that's my domain restriction. Now, in this particular one, I have that five minus one over X is underneath the radical. Okay, so essentially I know that I want this guy to be non-negative. And so what I'd have to do here is say that five minus one over X needs to be greater than or equal to zero. So this is a rational inequality. It's an easy one, but we do need to solve it and figure out what our restrictions are going to be. So I'm gonna write this as a single fraction. So essentially I'm just going to multiply this guy right here by X over X. And so I'll have five X minus one over the common denominator of x. This is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so now what I wanna do is find the critical values. You guys all should remember this. So I know that one of them would be what makes the denominator zero. So here it would just be x set that equal to zero. So I know zero is a critical value. And I know because it makes the denominator zero, it's going to be excluded from the domain. And we already know that because it was excluded from the domain before. Okay, so nothing new there. Then we have our numerator. So we have our 5x minus 1. Set that equal to 0. Get our other critical value. So add 1 to both sides. We get 5x equals 1. Divide both sides by 5. You get x equals 1 fifth. Okay. So this critical value will actually satisfy this guy, right? Because if I plugged in a 1 fifth there, 5 times 1 fifth is going to be 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 over a non-zero number would be 0. 0 is greater than or equal to 0 is true. Okay, so one fifth is okay. Now, what we wanna do is take these two numbers. So we have X equals zero and then one fifth 
And we want to kind of think about this. Again, you've got to kind of test values in the intervals that you create with this. So one interval is going to be from negative infinity up to, but not including zero. The other interval is going to be between zero and one fifth. And then the other interval is going to be greater than one fifth out to positive infinity. Okay, so those are the intervals. So if I look at the inequality we started with, it was five minus one over X is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so let's choose something that's less than zero. Let's just choose negative one. It's pretty easy to work with. So if I did five minus one over negative one, I could really write this as plus negative if I want. Is this greater than or equal to zero? Yes, it is, right? Negative one over negative one is positive one. So this would end up being six. Six is obviously greater than or equal to zero. So this would be true, right? So values that are less than zero would work. Between zero and one fifth, we need to find something that we can plug in there. Let's just go ahead and use one tenth. So if I plugged in a one tenth there, I'd have five minus one over one tenth. Is that greater than or equal to zero? One divided by one tenth is the same thing as one times 10. So this would be five minus 10. You know that would be negative five. Negative five is not greater than zero. It's not equal to zero. So this would be false. Okay, nothing would work in that interval. In the last interval, I could just choose, let's say positive one. So let's put five minus one over one. This would of course be one. Five minus one is four. Four is greater than zero. So this is true, okay? So now we know what our domain's going to be. We know that zero is excluded, right? So zero is excluded. We know that values that are less than zero would work. So from negative infinity up to zero, we know that values between zero and one fifth do not work. And then we know that values greater than one fifth and also including one fifth would work. So I put a bracket there, one fifth out to positive infinity. So let me just copy this. So for my domain, I can just list it like this. We'll say from negative infinity up to, but not including zero, right? Zero is not included. Then the union with, we have that one fifth is included and then anything larger. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have f of x equals two over x minus one and then g of x equals three over x. Okay, so let's start with f of g of x and see what we get. So again, I'm just gonna plug g of x, which is this three over x, in for x and f of x. That's all I'm doing. So two over, I would have three over x and then minus one. Okay, so you can simplify this guy if you want. You can multiply, it's a complex fraction. You can just multiply the numerator here by x and the denominator here by x. And let me scroll down and get some room going. This would give me what? It would give me two x in the numerator over x times three over x would be three, and then minus x times one is just x. So you get two x over three minus x. Now, if I wanna think about the domain of this guy, again, if I go back up, the inside function g of x, g of x equals three over x. So that's not defined where x is zero, okay? So x can't be zero. When I think about the kind of new function that I've created, so let me erase this and just kind of drag this up so I can fit all this on the screen. When I think about this guy right here, this two X over three minus X, well, I can say that three minus X can't be zero, right? So I could just solve three minus X equals zero, add X to each side of the equation. And I find that X is equal to three there, right? So X can't be three as well. So X can't be zero coming from the inside function and X can't be three coming from our composite function, the one that we just formed. So let me erase this and I'll officially write that real quick for you. So the domain, the domain, you could write it using this format if you want. You could say the set of all X such that X does not equal zero or positive three. Okay, set builder notation, that's fine. Or if you want, you can use interval notation, which is a bit longer here. So from negative infinity up to, but not including zero, the union with, you'd have anything larger than zero up to, but not including three, and then the union with anything larger than three. Okay, so kind of gets really long with interval notation for this problem. All right, so two common mistakes, again, for this type of problem. The first one is forgetting to find the domain of the inside function. So g of x was the inside function. If we forgot about the domain here, you wouldn't have thought about zero being restricted from the domain. So that's the common mistake. 
Then the second mistake, again, is to think about the outer function, the one we plugged into, the f of x. A lot of students will say, okay, I've got f of x equals 2 over x minus 1. You'll see them say, okay, well, x can't be 1 there, and then they restrict that from the domain as well. That's not restricted from the domain here. We're only considering the new composite function that we formed and the inside function, right, the one that we plugged in. Okay, that's all we need to do. Now, let's look at g of f of x. So let's look at g of f of x now. Okay, so again, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take f of x, which is 2 over x minus 1, this guy right here, and I'm just going to plug it in for that guy right there. So you'd have 3 over, you'll have 2 over x minus 1. Okay, so how can we simplify this? Again, we've got a complex fraction. So what we can do is we can multiply by x minus 1 over x minus 1. So what we're going to get is what? Let's scroll down and get a little bit of room going. We'll have 3 times the quantity x minus 1 in the numerator over. In the denominator, the x minus 1s are going to cancel. So you would just have your 2 there. Okay. So you get 3 times the quantity x minus 1 over 2. So let me erase this real quick. And let me kind of scooch this up. And I want to think about the domain with you. And I'm going to show you a little trick on this one because a lot of people get confused with this. So let me kind of go through this this way and then I'll go through it a different way. All right, so the first way, I'll say that the domain is what? What did we plug in? We plugged in f of x. f of x is 2 over x minus 1. We know there that x minus 1, if we set that equal to 0 and we solved it, we would get that x equals 1. So we know that 1 is restricted from the domain of this inside function. So x can't be 1. Now, in the new function that we've created, are there any restrictions on x? Well, even if I multiply this out and say it's 3x minus 3, 3x minus 3, no, right? This is a linear equation, right? So we have 3x minus 3 over 2. There's nothing I can't plug in for x there. So the domain for this guy is just going to be all real numbers except for 1. So again, I can say that it's the set of all x such that x doesn't equal 1. Or you can use your interval notation. Again, doesn't matter. From negative infinity up to but not including 1. And the union with anything larger than 1. Okay, so you can do that as well. Now, let me think about a different way to kind of show this to you. Your book might show you kind of this technique. We already know the domain, so we don't need it up there anymore. Let's say I take my outer function, my g of x, and I write it. So I have my 3 over, and then I have x. So instead of writing x, I'm just going to put f of x here. I'm just going to put f of x here. Okay, so I have 3 over f of x. Now, let's consider the fact that this guy was plugged in. Okay, this guy was plugged in. So we know that we first need to find where f of x is undefined. Right, so we already know that it's undefined where x is 1. So we've already restricted that from the domain. So x can't be 1. Okay, so now we move on and say that in this form, we know that f of x can't be 0 because it's in the denominator. Okay, so let's think about that. f of x is 2 over x minus 1. We would say, where is this equal to 0? Okay, where is this equal to 0? Well, if I think about that for a while, I think about the fact that if I'm dividing here, how can I get a result of 0? Well, I've got to have a zero in the numerator, and I've got to have a denominator that's not zero. So it is actually not possible to get a solution here. You can go through and try. You will not, because 2 divided by x minus 1 will never give you zero, okay? You can't plug in a 1 for x. We already know that. But you can plug in anything else that you want, and it doesn't matter what you plug in. You will never get a zero over here because, again, you need zero in the numerator and a non-zero denominator to get a result of zero. So what that tells you is that there's no restrictions here on this kind of newly created function, which will be 3 over f of x. And again, f of x was 2 over x minus 1. And again, we multiplied the numerator by x minus 1 and the denominator by x minus 1. And we found that this was 3 times the quantity x minus 1 over just 2, right? So that's what we got. And again, you can write that as 3x minus 3 if you want over 2. Doesn't matter. But again, the domain, we know that this is from negative infinity up to but not including 1, and then the union with anything larger than 1. Okay, so either way you want to look at that. I know that the way that I just showed you where you kind of say, you know, the f of x there, which is being plugged in for x, 
can't be equal to zero. If you look at it that way, that's another way to kind of go about it. All right, let's look at one more of these, and then we're gonna get into decomposing functions, which is really easy, okay? So this is kind of the hard part. If you're good to go on the domain, you're good to go with everything with this topic because it's really, really simple, and the domain just takes a few tries to kind of wrap your head around what you need to do. But again, if you just remember, you want the inside function, you want the newly created function, you wanna look at those two domains, and you want the intersection or the overlap between those two domains, okay? That's how you get the domain of your composite function. So here we have f of x equals one over x squared plus two x minus 35. We have g of x equals one over x. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna do f of g of x. So I'm just gonna do f of g of x. So let's just start with that. So we have one over, and I'm plugging in a g of x everywhere there's an x. So I'm plugging that in here and here, okay? So I would have what? I would have one over x, that quantity squared, plus two times one over x, so it's basically two over x, and then minus 35, okay? So that's what I'd have there. Now, if you want to simplify this quickly, you can kind of square this first and say that this is one squared, which is one over x squared. You can go through and you can multiply the numerator and denominator by x squared, right? Because this is just a complex fraction and you have x squared, x, no denominator there. So I'm just gonna multiply this by x squared and this by x squared. And what I'm gonna get is x squared in the numerator over, in the denominator, the x squareds would cancel. So you'd have one there, then plus, x squared would cancel with x and give me x, x times two is two x. And then minus, you'd have x squared times 35, which is 35 x squared. So this is our f of g of x. So let me erase this. Let me just kind of move this up here. This is our f of g of x. Now, you can think about the domain, again, in a few different ways. You can first look at g of x. We know that it's one over x, so obviously x can't be zero. And then you can look at this composite function here, and you can say, okay, well, one plus two x minus 35 x squared, that can't be zero because that's in the denominator. Okay, so you can do that as well. So let's do it that way. So let's go through and say that one plus two x minus 35 x squared, where is that equal to zero? We're gonna restrict those values. To make this easier, to put it in a format that we're used to, go ahead and divide everything by negative one. It's just gonna change the sign of everything. So this would be minus, this would be minus, this would be plus. It has no effect on zero, right? So we would have 35 x squared minus two x minus one equals zero. You can factor this if you want to, or you can solve it with the quadratic formula, whatever you wanna do. It's gonna factor. So I know it would be what? It would be 35 is either gonna be 35 times one or five times seven. It's not gonna be 35 times one. So we're gonna to have to do seven X and five X. And then for negative one, that can only come from a positive one times a negative one. So you really just have to work out whether it's plus one here and minus one there or the opposite. So this way it would be minus seven X and then plus five X. And that's exactly what we want because negative seven X plus five X would be negative two X. So that's good to go there. Okay, so now I would just set these two equal to zero and solve. So seven X plus one equals zero, subtract one away from each side. You get seven X equals negative one. So seven X equals negative one, divide both sides by seven. You get X equals negative one seven. Okay, so that's one value we're gonna restrict. So let's erase this. And we'll just kind of keep this for a second. Then the other guy is five X minus one equals zero. Add one to both sides. You get five X equals one, divide both sides by five, you get x equals one fifth, okay? So x equals negative one seventh and then one fifth. All right, let's erase all this. Okay, so x can't be zero. We know that from the inside function. And then also x can't be negative one seventh or one fifth. So let's write our domain. So let's write our domain. And we probably wanna write this one down here because it's gonna be a little bit lengthy. So I'll start by writing it in set builder notation, the set of all X such that X cannot be equal to zero, one fifth or negative one seventh, okay? So an interval notation, this is going to be from negative infinity up to, but not including negative one seventh. And then the union with, you'd have anything larger than negative one seventh up to, but not including zero. And then you would have the union with anything larger than zero up to, but not including one fifth. And then you'd have another union with anything larger than one fifth. Okay, so this one is 
really long when you write that in interval notation, but that's generally how I like to do it. All right, let's wrap up the lesson and think about something that's pretty easy overall. It's called decomposing functions. This is another topic you're gonna see in this section, and it's very important because when we get to calculus, we're gonna have to treat a function as a composition of two functions. So in other words, when we compose functions, we're gonna compose two functions to form a new function. When we decompose functions, we're gonna express it as the composition of two functions. You're gonna see this right away in calculus, okay? So it's gonna be very important. So now here's where I'm gonna kind of change the name a little bit. You've seen that we created a new function, but you can give this new function a name. A lot of times you're gonna call it h, right? So we'll say h of x equals f of g of x. And this is equal to one over two x minus three. So essentially we've already done the function composition and we have the result of that and we wanna decompose it, okay? So we wanna find f of x and g of x. So very, very simple process. So h of x, is equal to f of g of x, and this is equal to one over two x minus three. Okay, so lots of different ways to kind of think about this, but essentially, if you really think about what could be the outer function, what could be the inner function, well, I could have plugged this guy right here in for x in one over x. Okay, so the outer function, the f of x, would be one over x, and the inner function, the g of x, would be what? It would be 2x minus 3, okay? So if I took 2x minus 3 and I plugged it in for x in this 1 over x, I would get 1 over 2x minus 3. So that would be an answer here. So find f of x and g of x. f of x would be 1 over x. g of x would be 2x minus 3. All right, let's look at another one of these, and then we'll just kind of wrap it up. Very easy topic overall. So a lot of times they give you these, they're very obvious. So h of x equals f of g of x. This is the cube root of x squared minus 2x minus 1. Find f of x and g of x. Well, we know that this guy right here would be the inside, what's being plugged in for x. And the outer would just be this kind of cube root operation. So essentially, the f of x, the outside guy, would be the cube root of x, okay? So that's my outer one. The inner one, the g of x, what I'm plugging in for this x here is just this right here, this x squared minus 2x minus 1, okay? So this topic is very, very simple. 